This is Audible. William Morrow and Harper Audio present The Beast You Are Stories by Paul Tremblay Performed by Johnny Heller, Exe Sands, Ewan Chung, Graham Halstead, Helen Laser, Georgina Marie, Joy Osmansky, Keith Sellen Wright, Kirsten Potter, and Neil Shaw. For Lisa, Cole, and Emma. Life is no way to treat an animal. Kurt Vonnegut, a man without a country. And I'll rip a lump out of my throat using my teeth. Crows healing. Ice cold lemonade, 25 cents. Redacted. Haunted house tour, one per person. I was such a loser when I was a kid. Like a John Hughes Hollywood 80s movie typecast loser. Maybe we all imagine ourselves as being that special kind of ugly duckling with the truth being too scary to contemplate. Maybe I was someone's bully, or I was the kid who egged on the bullies, screaming, Sweep the leg! Or maybe I was lower than the Hughes loser, someone who would never be shown in a movie. When I think of who I was all those years ago, I'm both embarrassed and look at what I've become proud, as though the distance spanned between those two me's can only be measured in light years. That distance is a lie, of course, though perhaps necessary to justify perceived successes and mollify the disappointments and failures. That 13-year-old me is still there inside. The socially awkward one who wouldn't find a group he belonged to until college. The one who watched way too much TV and listened to records while lying on the floor with the speakers tented over his head. The one who was afraid of Jaws appearing in any body of water. Christopher Lee vampires. The dark in his closet and under the bed. And the blinding flash of a nuclear bomb. That kid is all too frighteningly retrievable at times. Now he's here in a more tangible form. He's in the contents of a weathered cardboard box, sitting like a toadstool on my kitchen counter. Mom inexplicably plopped this time capsule in my lap on her way out the door after an impromptu visit. When I asked for an explanation, she said she thought I should have it. I pressed her for more of the why, and she said, Well, because it's yours. It's your stuff as though she were weary of the burden of having had to keep it for all those years. Catherine is visiting her parents on the Cape, and she took my daughter, Izzy, with her. I stayed home to finish edits, which remain stubbornly unfinished, on a manuscript that was due last week. Catherine and Izzy would have torn through this box of me right away and laughed themselves silly at the old photos of my stick figure body and my map of freckles and crooked teeth. The collection of crayon renderings of dinosaurs with small heads and ludicrously large bodies, and the fourth grade current events project on Ronald Reagan, for which I'd earned a disappointing C+, and a demoralizing teacher comment of too messy. And I would have reveled in their attention, their warm spotlight shining on who I was and who I've become. I didn't find it until my second pass through the box, which seems impossible, as I took care to peel old pictures apart and handle everything delicately as one might handle ancient parchments. That second pass occurred two hours after the first, and there was a pizza and multiple beers and no edits in between. The drawing that I don't remember saving was there at the bottom of the box, framed by the cardboard and its interior darkness. I thought I'd forgotten it. I know I never had. The initial discovery was more confounding than dread-inducing, but hours have passed and now it's late and it's dark. I have every light on in the house, which only makes the dark outside even darker. 
I am alone, and I am on alert, and I feel time creeping forward. Time doesn't run out. It continues forward, and it continues without you. I do not sit in any one room for longer than five minutes. I pass through the lower level of the house as quietly as I can, like an omniscient, emotionally distant narrator, which I am not. On the TV is a baseball game that I don't care about, blaring at full volume. I consider going to my car and driving to my in-laws on the Cape, which would be ridiculous as I wouldn't arrive until well after midnight and Catherine and Izzy are coming home tomorrow morning. Would it be so ridiculous? Tomorrow, when my family returns home and the windows are open, the sunlight as warm as a promise, I will join them in laughing at me. But it is not tomorrow, and they are not here. I'm glad they're not here. They would have found the drawing before I did. I rode my bicycle all over Beverly, Massachusetts, the summer of 1984. I didn't have a BMX bike with thick, knobby tires made for ramps and wheelies and chewing up and spitting out dirt and pavement. Mine was a dinged up, used to belong to my dad, 10 speed, and the only things skinnier and balder than the tires were my arms and legs. On my rides, I always made sure to rattle by Kelly Bishop's house on the off, off chance I'd find her in her front yard. Doing what? Who knows? But in those fantasies, she waved or head nodded at me, and she would ask what I was doing, and I'd tell her all nonchalant like that I was just passing through on my way back home, even though she'd have to know her dead end street, two blocks west and one block north from where I lived, on the daredevil steep Echo Ave Hill, wasn't on my way home, which was presuming she even knew where I lived. All such details were worked out, or inconsequential in fantasies, of course. One afternoon, it seemed a part of my fantasy was coming true, when Kelly and her little sister were at the end of their long driveway, sitting at a small fold-up table with a pitcher of lemonade. I couldn't bring myself to stop or slow down, or even make more than glancing eye contact. I had no money for lemonade, therefore I had no reason to stop. Kelly shouted at me as I rolled by. Her greeting wasn't a hey there, or even a hi, but instead, buy some lemonade or we'll pop your tires. After 24 hours of hopeful and fearful should I or shouldn't I, I went back the next day with a pocket full of quarters. Kelly was again stationed at the end of her driveway. My brakes squealed as I jerked to an abrupt and uncoordinated stop. My rusted kickstand screamed with, you're really doing this, embarrassment. The girls didn't say anything and watched my approach with a mix of disinterest and what I imagined to be the look I gave ants before I squashed them. They sat at the same table set up as the previous day, but there was no pitcher of lemonade. Never afraid to state the obvious, I said, so, um, no lemonade today? The 50 cents clutched in my sweaty hand might as well have melted. Kelly said, Lemonade was yesterday. Can't you read the sign? She sat slumped in her beach chair, a full body eye roll, and her long tanned legs spilled out from under the table and the white poster board sign taped to the front. She wore a red Coke t-shirt. Her chestnut brown hair was pulled and tied into a side high ponytail. Kelly was clearly well into her pubescent physical transformation, whereas I was still a boy without even a shadow of hair under my armpits. Kelly's little sister with the bowl-cut mop of dirty blonde hair was going to be in second grade. I didn't know her name and was too nervous to ask. She covered her mouth, fake laughed, and wobbled like a penguin in her unstable chair. That she might topple into the table or to the blacktop didn't seem to bother Kelly. You're supposed to be the smart one, Paul, Kelly added. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I left the quarters in my pocket to hide their shame and adjusted my blue gym shorts. They were too short, even for the who wears short shorts 80s. I tried to fill the chest of my NBA champs Celtics t-shirt with deep breaths, but only managed to stir a weak ripple in that green sailcloth. 
Their updated sign, with ice-cold lemonade 25 cents crossed out, read, Haunted House Tour, One Per Person. Seemed straightforward enough, but I didn't know what to make of it. I feared it was some kind of a joke or prank. Were Rick or Winston or other jerks hiding close by to jump out and pants me? I thought about hopping back on my bike and getting the hell out before I did something epically cringeworthy Kelly would describe in detail to all her friends and by proxy the entire soon-to-be seventh grade class. Kelly asked, Do you want a tour of our creepy old house or not? I stammered and I sweated. I remember sweating a lot. Kelly told me the lemonade stand thing was boring and that her new haunted house tour idea was genius. I would be there first to go on the tour, so I'd be helping them out. She said, we'll even only charge you half price. Be a pal, Polly. Was Kelly Bishop inviting me into her house? Was she making fun of me? The be a pal bit sounded like a joke and felt like a joke. I looked around the front yard, spying between the tall front hedges, looking for the ambush. I decided I didn't care and said, okay, yeah. The little sister shouted, one dollar, and held out an open hand. Kelly corrected her. I said half price. What's half? Fifty cents. Little sis shouted, fifty cents, her hand still out. I paid, happy to be giving the sweaty quarters to her and not Kelly. I asked, is it scary? I mean, supposed to be scary? I tried smiling bravely. I wasn't brave. I still slept with my door open and the hallway light on. My smile was pretend brave, and it wasn't much of a smile as I tried not to show off my mouth of metal braces, the elastics on either side mercifully no longer necessary as of three weeks ago. Kelly stood and said, Terrifying. You'll wet yourself and be sucking your thumb for a week. She whacked her sister on the shoulder and commanded, Go, you have one minute to be ready. I don't need a minute. She bounced across the lawn onto the porch and slammed the front door closed behind her. Kelly flipped through a stack of note cards. She said she hadn't memorized the script yet, but she would eventually. I followed her down the driveway to the house I never thought of as scary or creepy, but now that it had the word haunted attached to it, even in jest, it was kind of creepy. The only three-family home in the neighborhood... It looked impossibly tall from up close, and it was old, worn out, the white paint peeling and flaking away. Its stone and mortar foundation appeared crooked. The windows were tall and thin and impenetrable. The small front porch had two skeletal posts holding up a warped overhang that could come crashing down at any second. We walked up the stairs to the porch, and the wood felt soft under my feet. Kelly was flipping through her note cards and held the front screen door open for me with a jutted out hip. I scooted by, holding my breath, careful to not accidentally brush against her. The cramped front hallway slash foyer was crowded with bikes and shovels and smelled like wet leaves. A poorly lit staircase curled up to the right. Kelly told me that the tour finishes on the second floor and we weren't allowed all the way upstairs to the third and, somewhat randomly, that she wrote one per person on the sign so that no pervs would try for repeat tours since she and her sister were home by themselves. Your parents aren't home? My voice cracked as if on cue. If Kelly answered with a nod of the head, I didn't see it. She reached across me, opened the door to my left, and said, Welcome to House Black the most haunted house on the North Shore. Kelly put one hand between my shoulder blades and pushed me inside to a darkened kitchen. The linoleum was sandy, gritty under my shuffling sneakers. The room smelled of dust and pennies. The shapes of the table, chairs, and appliances were sleeping animals. From somewhere on this first floor, her sister gave a witchy laugh. 
It was muffled, and I remember thinking it sounded like she was inside the walls. Kelly carefully narrated a ghost story. The house was built in the 1700s by a man named Robert, or Reginald, Black, a merchant sailor who was gone for months at a time. His wife, Denise, would dutifully wait for him in the kitchen. After all the years of his leaving, Denise was driven mad by a lonely heart, and she wouldn't go anywhere else in the house but the kitchen until he returned home. She slept sitting in a wooden chair and washed herself in the kitchen sink. Years passed like this. Mr. Black was to take one final trip before retiring, but Mrs. Black had had enough. As he ate his farewell breakfast, she smashed him over the head with an iron skillet until he was dead. Mrs. Black then stuffed her husband's body into the oven. The kitchen's overhead light, a dirty yellow fixture, turned on. I saw a little hand leave the switch and disappear behind a door across the room from me. On top of the oven was a black, cast iron skillet. Little sis flashed her arm back into the room and turned out the light. Kelly loomed over me, she was at least three inches taller, and said that this was not the same oven, and everyone who ever lived here has tried getting a new one, but you can still sometimes hear Mr. Black clanging around inside. The oven door dropped open with a metal scream, like when an ironing board's legs were pried open. I jumped backward and knocked into the kitchen table. Kelly hissed, that's too hard, be careful, you're gonna rip the oven door off. Little sis dashed into the room, and I could see in her hands a ball of fishing line, which was tethered to the oven door handle. Kelly asked me what I thought of the tour opener, if I found it satisfactory. I swear that is the phrasing she used. Mortified that I'd literally jumped, and sure that she could hear my heart rabbiting in my chest, I mumbled, yeah, that was good. The tour moved on throughout the darkened first floor. All the see-through lace curtains were drawn, and either Kelly or little sis would turn a room's light on and off during Kelly's readings. Most of the stories featured the hapless descendants of the blacks. The dining room story was unremarkable, as was the story for the living room, which was the largest room on the first floor. I'd begun to lose focus on the tour and let my mind wander to Kelly and what she was like when her parents were home, and then, perhaps oddly, what her parents were like and if they were like mine. My dad had recently moved from the Parker Brothers factory to managing one of their warehouses, and mom worked part-time as a bank teller. I wondered what Kelly's parents did for work and if they sat in the kitchen and discussed their money problems too. Were her parents kind? Were they too kind? Were they overbearing or unreasonable? Were they perpetually distracted? Did they argue? Were they cold? Were they cruel? I still wonder these things about everyone else's parents. Kelly did not take me into her parents' bedroom, saying simply, under construction, as we passed by the closed door. I suggested that she make up a story about something or someone terrible kept hidden behind the door. Kelly to this point had kept her nose in her script cards when not watching for my reaction and jotting down notes with a pencil. Her head snapped up at me and she said, none of these are made up stories, Paul. There was another bedroom, the one directly off the kitchen, and it was being used as an office slash sitting room. There was a desk and bookcases tracing the wall's boundaries. The walls were covered in brownish yellow wallpaper, and the circular throw rug was dark too. I do not remember the colors. It's as though color didn't exist there. The room was sepia, like a memory. In the middle of the room was a rolling chair, and on the chair was a form covered by a white sheet. Kelly had to coax me into the room. I kept a wide berth between me and the sheeted figure, knowing the possibility that there was someone under there waiting to jump out and grab me. Though the closer I got, it wasn't uniform and the proportions were all off. It wasn't a single body. The shape was comprised of more shapes. 
Kelly said that the ghost of a man named Darcy Dearborn, I remember his alliterative name, haunted this room. A real estate mogul, he purchased the house in 1923. He lost everything but the house in the 1929 stock market crash and was forced to rent the second and third floors out to strangers. He took to sitting in this room and listening to his tenants above, walking around, going about their day. Kelly paused at this point of the story and looked up at the ceiling expectantly. I did too. Eventually, we could hear little footsteps running along the second floor above us. The running stopped and became loud thuds. Little Sis was jumping up and down in place, mashing her feet into the floor. Kelly said, she's such a little shit, shook her head and continued with the tale. Darcy, much like Mrs. Black from all those years before, became housebound and wouldn't leave this room. Local family and neighbors bought his groceries for him and took care of collecting his rent checks and banking and everything else for him until one day they didn't. Darcy stayed in the room and in his chair, and he died, and no one found him until years later, and he'd almost completely decomposed and faded away. His ghost shuts the doors to the office when they are open. The door to the kitchen behind opened and shut. I remember thinking the Darcy story had holes in it. I remember thinking it was too much like the first Mrs. Black story, which muted its impact. But then I became paranoid that Kelly had tailored these stories for me somehow. Was she implying that I was doomed to be a loner, a shut-in, because I stayed home by myself too much? I had one new friend I'd met in sixth grade, but he lived in North Beverly and spent much of his summer in Maine, and I couldn't go see him very often. I wasn't friends with anyone in my neighborhood. That's not an exaggeration. Throughout that summer, particularly if I'd spent the previous day watching TV or shooting hoops in the driveway by myself, mom would give me an errand, usually sending me down the street to the White Hen Pantry convenience store to buy her a pack of cigarettes. You could do that in the 80s. And then tell me to invite some friends over. She never mentioned any kids by name because there were no kids to mention by name. I told her I would, but would then go ride my bike instead. That was good enough for mom, or maybe it wasn't, and she knew I wasn't really going to see or play with anyone. Mom now still reacts with an unbridled joy that comes too close to open shock and surprise when she hears of my many adult friends. I envisioned myself becoming a sun-starved, golem-like adult, cloistered in my sad bedroom at home, until Kelly led me out of the first floor living space to the cramped and steep staircase. The stairs were a dark wood with a darker stair tread or runner. The walls were panels or planks of the same dark wood. I was never a sailor like Mr. Black, but it was easy to imagine that we were climbing up from the belly of a ship. Kelly said that a girl named Kathleen died on the stairwell in 1937. Kathleen used to send croquet balls crashing down the stairs. Her terrible father, with arms and hands that were too long for his body, got so sick of her doing it, he snuck up behind her and nudged her off the second floor landing. She fell and tumbled and broke her neck and died. There was an inquest, and her father was never charged. However, his wife knew her husband was lying about not being responsible for Kathleen's death, and the following summer she poisoned him and herself while picnicking at Lynch Park. At night, you can hear Kathleen giggling, Kelly's sister obliged from above at that point in the tale, and the rattles and knocks of croquet balls bouncing down the stairs. And if you're not holding the railing, you'll feel those cold, extra-large hands push you or grab your ankles. I wasn't saying much of anything in response at this point, and was content to be there with Kelly, knowing I would likely never spend this much time alone with her again. I was scared, but it was the good kind of scared, because it was shared, if not quite commiserative. 
The second floor landing was bright with sunlight pouring through the uncovered four-paned window next to the second floor's front door. It was only then that I realized each floor was constructed as separate apartments or living spaces, and since I hadn't seen their rooms downstairs, it meant that Kelly's and her sister's bedrooms must be here upstairs, away from her parents' bedroom. I couldn't imagine sleeping that far away from my parents, and future live-at-home shut-in or not, I felt bad for her and her sister. Inside, there was a second kitchen that was bright and sparkled with disuse. The linoleum and cabinets were white. I wondered, but didn't ask, if the two of them ate up here alone for breakfast or at night for dinner. And I again thought about Kelly's parents and what kind of people would leave them alone in the summer and essentially in their own apartment. The tour didn't linger in the kitchen, nor did we stop in what she called the playroom, which had the same dimensions as the dining room below on the first floor. Perhaps she didn't want to make their playroom a scary place. We went into her sister's room next. I only remember the pink wallpaper, an unfortunate shade of Pepto-Bismol, and the army of stuffed animals staged on the floor and all facing me. There were a gaggle of teddy bears, and a stuffed Garfield, and a pink panther, and a rat wearing a green fedora, and a doe-eyed brontosaurus, and more, and they all had black marble eyes. Kelly said, oops, and turned off the overhead light. The story for this room was by far the most gruesome. John and Jeannie Graham bought the house in 1952, and they had a little boy named Will. To make ends meet, the family rented the top two floors to strangers. The stranger on the second floor was named Greg, with two G's, and the third floor tenant was named Rolf, not Ralph. Very little is known about the two men. For the two years of the Greg with two G's and Rolf occupancy, Will would periodically complain he couldn't find one of his many stuffed animal companions and insisted that someone stole it. He had so many stuffed animals that with each individual complaint, his parents were sure the missing animal was simply misplaced or kicked under the bed or he'd taken it to the park and left it behind. Then there were locals who complained that Rolf wasn't coming to work anymore and wasn't seen at the grocery store or the bar he liked to go to and that he too was misplaced. Then there was a smell coming from the second floor, and they initially feared a critter had died in the walls, and then those fears became something else. When Mr. and Mrs. Graham entered the second floor apartment with the police, Greg with two G's was nowhere to be found. But they found Will's missing stuffed animals. They were all sitting in this room like they were now, and they were blood-stained and tattered, and they smelled terribly. Hidden within the plush hides of the stuffed animals were hacked-up pieces of Rolf, the former third-floor tenant. There were rumors of Greg with two Gs living in Providence and Fall River, and more alarmingly close by in Salem, but no one ever found him. Kelly said that stuffed animals in this house go missing and then reappear in this bedroom by themselves, congregating with one another in the middle of the floor on their own, patiently waiting for their new stuffing. That's a really terrible story, I said in a breathless way that meant the opposite. Paul, it's not a story, Kelly said, but she looked at me and smiled. I'll not describe that look or that smile beyond saying I'll remember both, along with a different look from her, one I got a few months after the tour, for as long as those particular synapses fire within my brain. Kelly led me to a final room, her bedroom in the back of the house. The room was brightly lit, shades pulled up and white curtains open. Her walls were white and might have been painted over clapboard or paneling and decorated with posters of Michael Jackson, Duran Duran, and other musicians. There was a clothes bureau that seemed to have been jigsawed together using different pieces of wood. 
Its top was a landfill of crumpled up notes, used candy wrappers, loose change, barrettes, and other adolescent debris. At the foot of her bed was a large chest covered by an afghan. On walls opposite of each other were a small desk and a bookcase that was half full with books, the rest of the space claimed by dolls and knickknacks. The floor was hardwood, and there was a small baby chick yellow rectangular patch of rug by her bed, which was flush against the wall and under two windows overlooking the backyard. Kelly didn't say anything right away, and I stared at everything but her, more nervous to be in this room than any other. I said, you have a cool room. I might have said nice instead of cool, but God, I hope I didn't. I don't remember if Kelly said thanks or not. She pocketed her note cards, walked ahead of me, sat on the rug, and faced her bed. She said, I dream about it every night. I wish it would stop. I hadn't noticed it until she said what she said. There was a sketch propped up by a bookend on the middle of her bed. I sat down next to Kelly. I asked, did you draw that? She nodded and didn't look at me. She didn't even look at me when I was staring at her profile for what felt like the rest of the summer. Then I too stared at the drawing. The left side of its cartoonish head was misshapen, almost like a bite had been taken out, and the left eye was missing. Its right eye was round and blackened by slashes instead of a pupil. The mouth was a horrible band of triangular teeth spanning the horizontal circumference. Three strips of skin stretched from the top half of the head over the mouth and teeth and wrapped under its chin. What appeared to be a forest of wintered branches stuck out from all over its head. The wraith-like body was all angles and slashes, and the arms were elongated triangles reaching out. It had no legs. The jagged bottom of its floating form ended in larger versions of its shark teeth. There are things I, of course, don't remember about that day in Kelly's house, and many other things I'm sure I've embellished, though not purposefully so. But I remember when I first saw the drawing and how it made me feel. While this might sound like an adult's perspective, I'm telling you that this was the first time I realized or intellectualized that I would be dead someday. Sitting on the bedroom floor next to the cute girl of my adolescent daydreams, I looked at the drawing and imagined my death, the final closing of my eyes, and the total and utter blankness and emptiness of, I could only think of the phrase, not me, the void of not me. I wondered if the rest of my life would pass like how summer vacations passed. Would I be about to die and asking, how did it all go so quickly? I wondered how long and what part of me would linger in nothingness, and if I'd feel pain or cold or anything at all. And I tried to shake it all away by saying to Kelly, wow, that's really good. Good? The drawing, yeah. It's good. And creepy. Kelly didn't respond. But I was back inside her sunny bedroom and sitting on the floor instead of lost inside my own head. I asked and pointed. What are the things sticking out? They look like branches. She told me she tried to make up a story for this ghost, like maybe the kid who lived in the house before Kelly did was sneaking around, peeking into houses and sometimes stealing little things and bits no one would miss, like a thumbtack or an almost used up spool of red thread. And she got caught by someone and was chased, and in desperation she ran behind her house and she got stuck or trapped in the bushes and she died within sight of her big old ratty house. But that didn't feel like the true story, or the right story. It certainly wasn't the real reason for the ghost. Kelly told me this ghost appeared in her dreams every night. The dreams varied, but the ghost was always the same ghost. 
Sometimes she was not in her body, and she witnessed everything from a remove, like she was a movie camera. Most times, Kelly was Kelly, and she saw everything through her own eyes. The most common dream featured Kelly alone in a cornfield that had already been cut and harvested. Dark, impenetrable woods surrounded the field on all sides. She heard a low voice laughing, so low it was a hanging kind of laugh, but then it was also high-pitched, so it was both at the same time. She said both at the same time twice. Her heart beat loud enough that she thought it was the full moon thumping down at her, giving her a Morse code message to run. Even though she was terrified, she ran into the woods because it was the only way to get back to her house. She ran through the forest and night air as thick as paint, and she got close to her backyard and she could see her house, but no lights were on, so it was all in shadow and looked like a giant tombstone. Then the ghost came streaming for her from the direction of the house, and she knew her house was a traitor because it was where the ghost stayed while it patiently waited for this night and for Kelly. It was so dark, but she could see the ghost and its horrible smile bigger than that heartbeat moon, and the dream ended the same way every time. I hear myself scream, but it sounds far away, like I'm below, in the ground, and then I die. I remember what it feels like to die until I wake up, and then it fades away, but not all the way away, Kelly said. She rocked forward and back and rubbed her hands together, staring at the drawing. The ceiling above us creaked and groaned with someone taking slow, heavy, careful steps. Kelly's little sister wasn't around, and I hadn't remembered seeing her since we got up to the second floor. I figured Sis was walking above us wearing adult-sized boots. A nice touch for what I assumed was the tour's finale. I said something commiserative to Kelly about having nightmares, too. She said, I think it's a real ghost, you know? This is the realest one. It comes every night for me, and I'm afraid maybe it's the ghost of me. Like a doppelganger? Kelly smirked and rolled her eyes again, but it wasn't as dismissive as I'm describing. She playfully hit my non-existent bicep with the back of her hand, and despite my earlier glimpse at understanding the finality of death... I would have been happy to die right then. She said, you're the smart one, Paul. You have to tell me what that is. So I did. Or I gave her the close enough general definition that the almost 13-year-old me could muster. There were more footsteps on the floor above us, moving away to other rooms, but still loud and creaking. She said, got it. It's kind of like a doppelganger, but not really. It's not a future version of me, I don't think. I think it's the ghost of a part of me that I ignore, or the ghost of some piece of me that I should ignore. We all have those parts, right? What if those other parts trapped inside us find a way to get out? Where do they go, and what do they do? I have a part that gets out in my dreams, and I'm afraid that I'm going to hear it outside of me for real. I know I am. I'm going to hear it outside of me in a crash somewhere in the house where there isn't supposed to be, or I'll hear it in a creak in the ceiling, and maybe I'll even hear it walking up behind me. I don't know if that makes any sense, and I don't think I'm explaining it well, but that's what I think it is. Little Sis burst out of Kelly's closet and crashed dramatically onto the chest at the end of her bed and shouted, Boo! Kelly and I both were startled, and we laughed. And if you'd asked me then, I would have thought we'd been friends forever after instead of my never speaking to her again after that day. As our laughter died out and Kelly berated her sister for scaring her, I realized that Little Sis jumped out of a closet and not from behind a door to another room that had easy access to the rest of the apartment and the stairwell to the third floor. 
I said to little sis. Aren't you upstairs? I mean, that was you upstairs we heard walking around, right? She shook her head no and giggled, and then there were creaks and footstep tremors in the floor above us again. They were loud enough to shake dust from the walls and blow clouds in front of the sun outside. I asked, who's upstairs? Kelly looked at the ceiling and was expressionless. No one is supposed to be up there. The third floor is empty. We're going to rent it out in the fall. We're home alone. I made, come on, and really, and you're not joking, noises. And then, in my memory, which for this brief period of time is more like a dream than something that actually happened, the continuum skips forward to me following Kelly and her sister out into the hallway and the stairwell to the third floor. Little sis led the way, and Kelly was behind me. I kept asking questions. Is this a good idea? Are you sure you want to end the tour all the way up on the third floor? And the questions turned to poorly veiled begging, my saying that I should probably get home. We ate dinner early in my house. Mom was a worrier, etc. All the while, I followed up the stairs, and Kelly shushed me and told me to be quiet. The stairwell thinned and squeezed and curled up into a small landing or a perch. An eave intruded into the headspace to the left of the third floor apartment's door. The three of us sardined onto that precarious landing that felt like a cliff. There was no more discussion, and little sis opened the door, deftly skittered aside, and like she had on the first floor, Kelly two-handed shoved me inside. This apartment was clearly smaller than the first two, with the A-frame roof slanting the ceilings, intruding into the living space. I stepped into a small, gray kitchen that smelled musty from disuse. Directly across the room from me was a long, dark hallway. It was as though the ceilings and their symmetrical slants were constructed with the sole purpose of focusing my stare into this dark tunnel. There wasn't a hallway like this in either of the other apartments. The third floor layout was totally different, and the thought of wandering about with no idea of the floor plan and fearing that I would find whatever it was making the walking noises made me want to swallow my own tongue. Little sis ran ahead of me, giggling into the hallway and disappearing in the back end of the apartment. I still held out hope that maybe it was her, somehow, who was responsible for the walking noises when I knew it wasn't possible. I stood for a long time only a few steps deep into the kitchen, which grew darker, and watched as the hallway grew darker still, and then a stooped figure emerged from an unseen room and into the gloom of the hallway. The whole apartment creaked and shook with its each step. It was the shadowy ghost of a man, and he diffused into the hallway, filling it like smoke, and my skin became electric, and I think I ran in place like a cartoon character might, sliding my feet back and forth on the linoleum. An old man emerged into the weak lighting of the kitchen, shuffling along with the help of a wooden, swollen-headed shillelagh. He wore a sleeveless t-shirt and tan pants with a black belt knotted tightly around his waist. An asterisk of thin white hair dotted the top of his head, and the same unruly tuft sprouted out from under the collar of his t-shirt. His eyes were big and roomy, like a bloodhound's eyes, and he smirked at me. But before he could say anything, I screamed and ran through Kelly and out of the apartment. On the second step, I heard him call out, his voice quite friendly and soothing. Hey, what are all you silly kids up to? And then I was around a corner, knocking into a wall and clutching onto the handrail, and maybe halfway down when I heard Kelly laughing and then shouting, Wait, Paul, come meet my grandfather. Tour's over. I just about tumbled onto the second floor landing with everyone else still upstairs calling after me. I was crying 
almost uncontrollably, and I was seething, so angry at Kelly and her sister and myself. I don't know why I was so angry. Sure, they set me up, but it was harmless and part of the whole ghost tour haunted house idea. I know now they weren't making fun of me, per se, and they weren't being cruel. But back then, cruel was my default assumption setting. So I was filled with moral indignation and the kind of irrational anger that leads erstwhile good people to make terrible, petty decisions. I ran back into the second floor apartment and to Kelly's bedroom. I took the drawing of her ghost off the bed, tucked it inside my t-shirt, ran back out of the apartment and then down the stairs and out of the house and to my bike, and I pedaled home without ever once looking back. The rest of that summer, I didn't ride my bike by Kelly's house. I can't remember planning what I was going to do with her drawing. I might have initially intended to burn it with matches and a can of mom's hairspray. I was a bit of a firebug back then, or something similarly stupid and juvenile. But I didn't burn it or crumple it up. I didn't even fold it in half. Any creepiness, weirdness attributed to the drawing was swamped by my anger and then my utter embarrassment at my lame response to her grandfather scaring me. I knew that I totally blew it, that Kelly and I could have been friends if I'd laughed and stayed and met her grandfather, and maybe middle school and high school would have gone differently, wouldn't have been as miserable. While I on occasion had nightmares of climbing all those steps in the bishop house by myself, I don't remember having any nightmares featuring the ghost in the drawing even though I was, and still am, a card-carrying scaredy-cat. I wasn't afraid to keep the drawing in my room. I hid it on the bottom of my bureau's top drawer, along with a few of my favorite baseball cards. While I obsessively picked through the play-by-play -play of that afternoon in Kelly's house and what she must have thought of me after, I never really focused on the drawing and would only ever look at it by accident, when the top drawer was all but empty of socks or underwear, and I'd find that toothy grin peering up at me. Then, one day, toward the end of the summer, the drawing was gone. It's possible I threw it away without remembering I did so. I mean, I don't remember what happened to the baseball cards I kept in there either. Maybe mom found it when she was putting away my clean clothes and did something with it, which would explain how it got to be in her box of kid stuff keepsakes. But mom taking it and never saying anything to me about taking it seems off. Mom fawned over my grades and artwork. She would have made it a point to tell me how good the drawing was. Her taking the picture and putting it on the fridge? Yes, that would have happened. But her secreting it away for safekeeping? That wasn't her. That summer melted away, and seventh grade at Memorial Middle School was hell, as seventh grade is hell for everyone. The students were separated into three teams, black, white, and red, with four teachers in each team. The teams never mixed classes, so you might never see a friend in black team if you were on red team, and vice versa. Kelly wasn't on my team, and I didn't even pass her in the hallways at school until after a random lunch in early October. She stood with her back up against a set of lockers by herself, arms folded. It wasn't her locker, as I didn't see her there again the rest of the school year. Normally, I walked the halls with my head down, a turtle sunk into his protective shell, but before disappearing into my next class, I looked up to find her staring at me. That look is the second of two looks from her that I'll never forget, though I won't ever be sure if I was reading or interpreting this look correctly. In her look, I saw, I can't believe you did that, and there was a depthless sadness, one that was almost impossible for me to face as it was a direct, honest response to my irrevocable act. Her look said that I'd stolen a piece of her, and even if I'd tried to give it back, it would still be gone forever. 
To my shame, I didn't say anything, didn't tell her that I was sorry, and I regret not doing so to this day. There was something else in that look, too. It was unreadable to me at the time, but now, sitting in my empty house with dread filling me like water in a glass, I think some of that sadness was for me. Some of it was pity and maybe even fear, like she knew what was going to happen to me tomorrow and for the rest of my tomorrows. There wouldn't necessarily be a singular calamitous event, but a concatenation or summation of small defeats and horrors that would build daily and yearly and eventually overtake me as it overtakes us all. I would see her in passing the following year in eighth grade, but she walked by me like I wasn't there, like most of the other kids did. I'm sorry if that sounds too woe is me, but it's the truth. At the start of ninth grade, she returned to school a totally transformed kid. She dressed in all black, dyed her hair black, and wore eyeliner and dead Kennedys and circle jerks and suicidal tendencies t-shirts and combat boots, and hung out with upperclassmen, and she was abrasive and combative and smelled like cigarettes and weed. In our suburban town, only a handful of kids were into punk, so to most of us, even us losers who were picked on mercilessly by the jocks and popular kids, or worse, were totally ignored, the punks were scary and to be avoided at all costs. I remember wondering if the Michael Jackson and Duran Duran posters were still hanging in her room, and I wondered if she still had that dream about her ghost, and if she still thought that ghost was some part of her. Of course, I later became a punk when I went to college, and I now irrationally wonder if punk was another piece of her that I stole and kept for myself. The summer after ninth grade, Kelly and her family sold the house and moved away. I have no memory of where she moved to, or more accurately, I have no memory of being told and then forgetting where she moved. I find it difficult to believe that no one in our grade would have known what town or state she moved to. I must have known where she relocated to at one point, right? The baseball game is still on, and I'm on the couch with my laptop open and searching for Kelly Bishop on every social media platform I can think of, and I can't find her, and I'm desperate to find her, and it's less about knowing what has become of her or who she became but to see if she's left behind any other parts of herself, even if only digital avatars. Next to my laptop is her drawing. That it survived all this time and ended up in my possession again somehow now feels like an inevitability. I remembered it looking like the product of a young artist and being more creepy and affecting because of it. I remembered some of the branches at the top forming the letter K, I remembered the smile and the skin strips and the triangle arms as is. I didn't remember the shadow beneath the hovering figure, and I don't like looking at that shadow, and I wonder why I always peer so intently into those dark spaces. I didn't remember how its head is turned away from its body and turned to face the viewer, as though the ghost were floating along stage left until we looked at it until we saw it there, and then it sees us. I know it's not supposed to be a doppelganger, but I remember it looking like Kelly in some ineffable way, and now, 30 plus years later, I think it looks like me, or that it somehow came from me. Even though it's late and she's in bed, I want to call mom and ask her if she looked through the cardboard box one last time before leaving it here, I know she must have, and if she saw this drawing and recognized her son from all those years ago in the drawing. I'm glad Catherine and Izzy are not here. I keep saying that I am glad they are not here in my head. I say it aloud, too. They would have found the drawing before I did, and I don't know if they would have seen me or if they would have seen themselves. My reverie is shattered by a loud thud upstairs, like something heavy falling to the floor. 
There is applause and excited commentators chattering on my television, but I am still home alone, and there is a loud thud upstairs. Its volume and the suddenness of its presence twitches my body, but then I'm careful to stand up slowly and purposefully from the couch. Worse than the incongruity of noise coming from a presumably vacant space is the emptiness the sound leaves behind, a void that must and will be filled. I again think of driving to the Cape, or just driving, somewhere, anywhere. I shut the television off, and I anticipate the sound of footsteps running out of the silence toward me, or a rush of air and those triangle arms reaching more and the shadow on the floor behind it. Everything in me is shaking. I call out in a voice that no one is there to hear. I threaten calling 911. I tell the empty or not empty house to leave me alone. I try to be rational and envision the noise being made by one of the shampoo bottles sliding off the slippery ledge in our shower. But instead, I can only see the figure in my drawing, huddled upstairs, waiting. And it is now my drawing, even if it's not. The ceiling above my head creaks ever so slightly, a settling of the wood, a response to subtle pressure. I imagine going upstairs and finding a menagerie of Kelly's ghosts waiting for me. There is Greg with two G's tearing apart the hapless Rolf and the desperately lonely Mrs. Black sitting in a chair patiently waiting and the feckless shut-in Darcy Dearborn. Or will I find the ghost of a part of me that I never let go? A lost and outcast adult I always feared people, myself included, thought I'd become. Is that another creak in the ceiling I heard? I listen harder, and maybe if I listen long enough, I'll hear a scream or a growl or my own voice, and it is as though the last thirty years of my life have passed like the blink of summer, and everything that has happened in between doesn't matter. Memories and events and all the people in my life have been squeezed out, leaving only room for this distilled me on this narrowing staircase, and right now even Catherine and Izzy feel like made-up ghost stories. There is only that afternoon in Kelly's place, and now the impossibly older me, alone in a house that's become as strange, frightening, and unknowable as my future. As I slowly walk out of the TV room and up the stairs toward the suddenly alive with sound second floor, I don't know what I'm more afraid of. Seeing the ghost I stole grinning in the dark, or seeing myself. For Emma Tremblay and Ellen Datlow This story originally appeared in Echoes, Editor Ellen Datlow, Saga Press, 2019, and The Best Horror of the Year, Volume 12, Editor Ellen Datlow, Nightshade Books, 2020. Meantime. The old man's name began with an R, I think. Yeah, but definitely a capital R. Mom told me to stay away from R. Dad said R was harmless, but I shouldn't encourage him. Sherry, the semi-goth teen who lived on the floor below us and spent her afternoons listening to the Smiths and Kelly Clarkson, told me R spent too much time in his pockets and that he smelled like what she imagined a burning jellyfish would smell like. Sherry was wrong. R smelled like chalk. He had countless chalk sticks in his pockets, and dust was all over his hands and his brown wool suit. The smears looked like letters tattooed on his lapels and sleeves. R used his chalk to draw lines on the sidewalks and streets, or arcs, not lines. Arcs would be a more accurate description. Whatever. R walked backward, all hunched over, tip of chalk pressed against the cement or brick or cobblestone, and he drew until the stick disintegrated into dust. R drew his looping arcs and lines from Gracie's Market to Wilhelmina's Flower Festival, then to Frank and Bean's Diner, and on and on, 
to points A, then B, and to C, then to D, past the alphabet, and to points we'd have to name with alphas and epsilons. The first time I worked up the courage to ask him the obvious, he gave me an obvious answer. R used the chalk to find his way home, because even in our small city, he was afraid he would get lost. We all lived in a city that was smaller than most towns, so I'd heard. All our apartment buildings, libraries, markets, salons, and restaurants were crammed together, like space was something to be shared intimately with everyone. So that first day, after I asked him what was what, after he told me what was what, we shared our space quietly, uncomfortably. Then he said, Well, okay, little one. In the meantime, I have more errands to do. Back then, I didn't know meantime was one word, so I imagined it as two. Later, I tried following him in the afternoon as he backtracked over his loops and lines, reliving his previous paths. But he walked too fast for me, and I lost him and the chalk path in the maze of alleys between gorgeous George's Peach Pit and Dalai Lama Liquor Mart. I tried restarting on the path, but I couldn't follow the intersecting arcs he'd drawn earlier, and never found the beginning or the end. The chalk lines faded overnight, washed away by light rain, according to Mom. Dad liked to try to scare me and told me the night scrubbed it all away. Sherry said the students who dropped out of trade school cleaned the streets and sidewalks at night. Didn't matter where the lines went, because R was always back out there the next morning, and for all the mornings after that. Each day I asked him clever variations on the theme of why he drew the chalk lines. He'd give me the same afraid of getting lost answer, followed by the same meantime quip. I grew frustrated with his consistent ducking of my questions. Or maybe I was frustrated because his weirdness, which had once been cool and exciting, had become boring. Wrote, part of the scenery I so desperately wanted to alter or affect in some way. So one morning, after he left Missy's Galaxy Meat Emporium, I erased his chalk line, rubbed out about half a block, made my own gap in his path. It was cloudy, I remember that, and the yawning gap made me feel anxious, like something big was indeed missing or wrong. If I'd had a piece of chalk in my hand, I would have fixed what I'd done right away. Instead, I stood and waited for R to retrace his steps, which he did. He stopped at the end of his line, did a classic double take, looked around the city, down at the clean, clear line behind him, the one that just suddenly ended in the middle of the sidewalk, in the middle of nowhere. R dropped his bags, round fruits rolled away, spheres suddenly loosened from their strict orbits, and the stuff prepackaged in boxes stayed where they fell. R fumbled in his pockets and pulled out chalk sticks, and they dribbled out of his fingers, crashed to the sidewalk and broke into jagged pieces. I started crying and I told him I was sorry that I could fix it for him. I grabbed one of the chalk pieces and drew a rough line over the gap to where I thought it was supposed to go. But I wasn't sure anymore. And I think I made the wrong connection. I dropped the chalk and ran home to my apartment, watched him from my bedroom window. The shade pulled over my head behind me. R spent the rest of the afternoon walking the city following those lines, never really getting anywhere. He disappeared into alleys, and I thought he'd finally found his way home, but he'd reappear a few minutes later. I watched him until my parents came in and found me asleep 
and curled up in the windowsill. This story originally appeared in In the Meantime, Limited Hardcover Edition, Paul Tremblay, Chazine Press, 2010 and Revelations, Horror Writers for Climate Action, Editor Sean O'Connor, Stygian Sky Media, 2021. I know you're there. I know you're there, Silas Chen says. His niece, Victoria, crouching in the doorway, separating the hallway from the kitchen, calls out, But you can't see me! Silas exchanges a weary half-smile with his sister, Gwen. She is five years younger than Silas, a timestamp of permanent import on their relationship, even as the difference shrinks while their middle ages expand. When Silas was a child, he would hide on Gwen and pretend to be dead when she found him. Gwen would shake and tickle him, pinch his cheeks, and half laugh, half tear up while shouting, This isn't funny! Silas imagined he played dead so well his arms, legs, fingers, and toes still wouldn't move when he would eventually send those secret bodily messages to lift, wiggle, or twitch. The longer he remained play dead, the more convinced he became that his body was a cage and he wouldn't be able to move when he needed to, which both scared him and inexplicably thrilled him. Gwen says to Victoria, sing song, Someone should be in bed and not eavesdropping. Silas hopes Gwen won't be too hard on her daughter. Victoria doesn't know how to process the shock and grief any more than the adults do. I am not dropping. Five years old, made of charged electrons, Victoria Muppet rushes into the kitchen for the cover-blown tickle attack of her uncle. Silas, still in his chair, scoops her up and airplanes her over his head. While Victoria is airborne and giggling, her mom tersely ticks off the bedtime checklist. Go to the bathroom, wash your face, brush your teeth, pick out one, only one book for Daddy to read, and where is Daddy? Gwen falters, as though she said something she shouldn't have. Maybe she did. Hell if Silas knows. He cannot provide comfort or answers for anyone else, never mind himself. Victoria offers her bed to Uncle Silas again, and he declines, insisting the couch fits his long body better. He presses the button of Victoria's nose and kisses her forehead. She wipes it away, and her maniacal laughter turns to tears. She tells him she's sorry about Uncle David. He says, Thank you. I am too. He wants to ask if Victoria can stay a little longer. She would help keep the waiting trap of his thoughts from snapping shut. Silas swings her off his lap, her feet padding onto the kitchen tile, and says, Bedtime, little V. Good night. She wipes her eyes and says, I am Big V, and stomps out of the kitchen toward the plaintive calls of her father. Silas covers, then wipes his face with one hand. Gwen asks if he wants more wine. Do you have to ask? He says, and exhales a shudder. He holds in all the other shudders, the infinite queue of shudders, ones to be doled out in the coming days, months, years. The very thought of future years without David is a purgatorial burden. There is no segue to what he says next, because he shouldn't be quiet. Not now, when he is so ill-prepared for the looming, contemplative intrusion of silence, one surely to feature an endless replaying of what happened when he returned home after work. After Gwen refills his glass with Pinot Grigio, he says, I knew something was wrong the second I opened the door. He pauses, honoring or damning what he will say next. Do you want to hear this? If you want to talk, I'm here. But you don't have to talk either. You don't have to do anything. Gwen satellites around the kitchen, carrying the empty bottle of wine until she crashes it into the deep sink. She says sorry twice, quickly rinses her hands, then leans against the counter, her arms crossed. He should wise-ass a joke about how uncomfortable she is. The joke would help them both, but he's not capable of it. He says, I came home, 
maybe an hour early. David wasn't at the dining room table. His laptop wasn't even open. Notebook and folders closed and neatly stacked. Right away, I knew. Maybe he'd stopped working already, but I fucking knew that wasn't right. I ran around calling his name, and I went into the TV room, and he was just... He was on the floor, on his stomach, head turned away from me, toward the TV. The screen was blue. Silas waves a hand, as though pantomiming the previous detail be stricken because it wasn't necessary, or he didn't have the time or the want to explain the blue screen. He does his exercise DVDs in the morning, okay? So David was in his exercise clothes, t-shirt and compression shorts, and you know, his heart gave out. It must have happened right after I left, not too long after I left. Instead of me getting home in the afternoon an hour early and however many fucking hours late, what if I stayed an extra hour in the morning? Why would I have? I wish I stayed. I should have stayed. Silas, it's not your... You couldn't have known. He was dead. He'd been dead for hours, for the whole day. For what we call a day, right? It had been a long day for me at work, too. That's what I used to call a long day. I had no idea how long a day could be. No one does until you do. I haven't seen... I haven't seen many dead people. None, except for funerals. But David was dead, Gwen. I won't go into... He was so clearly gone. His body was there, and he was gone. He wasn't there anymore. I didn't know what to do. I... I said his name over and over, and I ran back to the kitchen to, like, what? Get him a glass of water or something? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Except I wasn't thinking I could help him. I knew I couldn't. Is that terrible? Is that awful? Gwen shakes her head and whispers, No. I didn't leave him alone. I would not do that to him, not while he was still home. I was in the kitchen, but I could still see him, and if he could have, he would have been able to see me too. I called 911, and when I was on the line, giving them his name and my name and address, I turned slightly and I cupped a hand around my mouth and the phone so he wouldn't hear, like I didn't want him to be worried. And I wasn't facing straight down the hallway to the TV room. I was turned. I could still see him, but I wasn't really watching him either, because I was trying to be all there, all together on the call. I didn't want to screw that up. The call was the worst and most important thing in the world, and I couldn't fuck it up. And then I swear, right before I hung up, I saw... movement. Silas waves his hand by his temple. I was facing this way. He turns his torso so Gwen is on his hard right. Like now, I'm not looking at you, but I can still see you without focusing directly on you. He pauses and remains looking, but not looking at Gwen. David was on the floor, already permanently on the floor like he will be in my fucking head forever now. But I was turned, so he was a blurry peripheral background shape. And then, then the moment before it happened, I knew it would happen. I mean, I didn't turn to fully see it. And I don't know if I saw anything, but then I saw it anyway. Saw what, Silas? I was in the kitchen, again not really looking at him, and I saw him lift his upper torso and turn his head. I hung up and ran back to the TV room and sat next to him and held his hand and I watched him. I watched him until the ambulance came. His head was turned, facing the kitchen and not the TV and that stupid blue screen. He was facing me. Come sit with me on the bench. Share a pretend cigarette with me, David's mother, Janice Harrington, says. She hasn't smoked in over two decades, but never passes on a chance to remind anyone and everyone how much she misses it. A tall white woman in her late sixties, she keeps manically fit, her own self-description, via competition. Prior to the pandemic, she played in pickleball tournaments two weekends out of every month. The tournaments are due to return later this summer. 
Janice grabs Silas's hand and gently pulls him toward a green wooden bench under the shade of an oak tree's weary branches. Silas says, I should help with the cleanup. Friends and family gather trash, fold tablecloths, distribute leftover food, break down folding tables and chairs. His elderly parents, Fung and Catherine, oversee and coordinate the packing of Gwen's minivan. Ninety minutes earlier, they brought everyone to tears and laughter, telling the slightly embellished for effect story of meeting their future son-in-law, David, for dinner. A lovely evening that had ended, unbeknownst to them at the time, with David rushing to the ER because he'd accidentally ingested a small amount of shellfish. Janice says, Eh, let everyone else do it. The memorial service was held at Lynch Park, a green space and rocky beach jutting into Beverly Channel, and began with Silas kneeling on a seawall, emptying an urn of David's cremated ashes into the relentless foaming ocean. The intimate procession walked to the picnic area adjacent to a rose garden for what Silas described as a casual reception meets eulogy. Silas knew his husband of 12 years and partner for 15 didn't want anything to do with a religious ceremony, but David had shared no other final wishes or instructions in the event of his death. They believed they would have plenty of time to discuss such abrupt finalities later in their yawning, nebulous future. Silas says, We're lucky the rain held out. Are you feeling lucky, Silas? No, not particularly. He smiles without smiling. He can't sneak anything past Janice. Never could. His using lucky was a subtle, cynical fuck you to the universe. One he wanted heard and tallied. Me neither. But it was a beautiful afternoon, Silas. You did my poor David proud. He was always proud of you. Tears pool and spill, as they have all day, as they have since that afternoon. Silas can't do this. Not now. He'll further indulge in cherished memories later. After. After when or what, he isn't sure. But he can't do it now. He's afraid his memories of David, his David, could be tainted by the now, by what's running through his head now, and by the fears of what's to come. Janice says, When David first told me about you, this was months before I met you in person, he showed me a goofy picture on Facebook. You were standing in someone's kitchen, or was it yours? And you had that long hair and the waistband of your sweatpants hiked up to your chest. He pointed and said, Mom, that's the guy. The guy. Silas wipes the tears from his cheeks and shakes his head, as though answering no to a series of impossible questions. You can talk, or I can keep talking like I do. Or we can just sit here and share a cry with our pretend cigarettes. On a day like today, menthol and filterless. I knew something awful had happened to him the second I stepped into our house. It was like passing through an invisible barrier, and after I passed through, I could no longer remember where I was before. Janice doesn't fill the pause. Sometimes a pause is language. He was on the floor in the TV room, dressed in his workout clothes. His head was turned toward the TV, which was still on, but the screen was blue. All blue. That kind of freaked me out. Is that weird? The fucking blank blue screen. His head was turned away from that and toward the kitchen. Toward me. Like he was... Was waiting for me to come home. Waiting for me to help him. But I couldn't. The other... The other weird part was his right arm was bent at an odd angle. Silas leans forward on the bench and demonstrates. So the back of his hand and forearm were pressed to his lower back like he was reaching for an itch or rubbing a sore muscle. He'd been complaining about his back lately, and I told him to take a day off from working out every once in a while. I don't remember deciding to leave his side to go to the kitchen, and I don't remember the walk to the kitchen. But there I was, with David now twenty feet away, me with the phone in my shaking hand. And while on with 911, I wasn't looking at him, but I could still see him. Like now, I'm looking or facing straight ahead, 
but I can still see you out of the corner of my eye, right? Do our eyes have corners? I've been thinking about eye corners. Thinking it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. Everything. And right before I hung up, most of me looking at the red phone symbol, the one you pressed to hang up, and in my eye corner, I saw movement. I couldn't tell exactly what it was that was moving. But David, or something near David, moved. That's what I saw in the eye corner. I hung up and turned my head. Nothing was moving. I waited and watched, but nothing. Then I went back to David, and his right arm wasn't behind his back anymore. His right hand was next to his face. I haven't been home in over a week. I'm getting too old for couch surfing, Silas says. A bowl of microwaved popcorn rests on the couch between him and his friend Michael. Baseball is on the television. Michael Lavoie is in his mid-fifties and is gregarious in the way that dares the world to say something to his face. Gray frosts his short, curly, dark hair. He is a Red Sox fanatic and is equally obsessed with his floundering fantasy baseball team. Michael looks up from his tablet computer for the first time since the second inning. He blinks madly behind his saucer-sized reading glasses and says, Hey, the guest bedroom is not a couch. You know what I mean. Oh, and you're not that old. Nice save. You can stay as long as you need. I appreciate the company. Michael's husband, Bob, is a medical software consultant and is away on his first week-long work trip since the pandemic hit. Bob is due to return in four days. Silas says, Thank you. I really mean it. They became friends in the mid-90s, meeting when Michael moved to Brighton into the apartment across the hall from Silas. Michael has had jobs in advertising for as long as Silas has known him and once worked on a campaign with David, who at the time was a recent marketing hire for a small chain of seafood restaurants. Michael inadvertently introduced David to Silas when, after successful completion of the restaurant's campaign, Silas crashed their celebratory not-date at Fugaku's sushi bar. Unlike Bob, Michael says, you don't complain when I have baseball on. I complain inside my head. Yeah, you can leave now. Thanks. The door will hit my ass on the way out. Silas lumbers into the kitchen. Michael mutters to his tablet about his fantasy team's lack of innings and quality starts from the pitchers, then asks over his shoulder, Are you ready for that? Ready for what? Silas returns to the couch and holds up his glass. It's just water. Smart ass, I am delicately asking if you are ready to go home, Michael says. You have never asked anything delicately in your life. Silas appreciates his friend's honesty and bluntness, as off-putting as it can be sometimes. I am not pushing you to go or stay. When you do go, you can come back here if it's too soon. Thank you again. The original answer I almost successfully avoided is no. No. I am not ready. But I am at the point where each day that goes by will make it that much harder to go back. Plus, I really need to get going on the probate stuff. Fuck. I have a lot of shit to deal with. Yes, you do. But do it at your own pace. If I can help with any of it, please let me. I know you won't ask. Consider this a pre-ask. Silas hugs the bowl of popcorn and slouches deep into the couch. What if I walk through the door and it's like, it's like the last time I walked through that door? You haven't been home since? Not even to... Michael pauses. His bluntness has a limit. Gwen went in and got me everything I needed for David and for me. I had to make a detailed list and draw her a map. The next time you walk inside your house, Silas, it won't be the same. It might be harder, but it won't be like the last time. Silas nods as though he agrees, but inside his head, instead of complaining about the baseball game, he tells Michael he is wrong. He fears it will be exactly like last time. He says, I knew as soon as I walked in, part of the knowing was that I wouldn't be able to do anything. David was on the floor in the TV room, on his stomach. He never laid on his stomach. He slept on his side, 
or on his back if he'd had a few drinks. And then he would snore, and I'd tease him about it the next day, text him snoring cartoon gifts. Anyway, there he was on the floor, on his stomach. He definitely wasn't snoring. The TV was still on. His workout DVD had ended, and the screen was a blank, dead blue. He wasn't facing the TV. Head was turned toward the kitchen, and me, and his eyes were closed, but... Let's just say it was obvious he wasn't asleep. I called 911 and turned my back to him when I did, because I just couldn't. Not while I was looking down at him. I answered her questions, and I told them to hurry the fuck up. I knew it was already too late, but I told them to hurry. Also, I didn't want to be there alone with him like that. And when I hung up, it was like he'd heard my thoughts about not wanting to be alone because his eyes were open. He was dead, and they had been shut, and then he was still dead, but his eyes were open. Silas stands on his front stoop, overstuffed night bags slung over one shoulder. It's early evening, twilight, the return home time. He wanted to be here in the morning, with sunlight on his back, projecting his shadow on the red door. Instead, he stayed at Michael's, made the phone calls and the appointments he had to make. He answered work emails that could have gone unanswered. The next thing he knew, the morning and afternoon and this ninth day had passed. Time was accelerating and decaying. Nine days ago, Silas opened the front door without pause or consideration. That's not to say he wasn't thinking anything. Like the rest of us during our waking, automatic moments, Silas buoyed within the flowing groundwater of subconscious thought. Perhaps in his mind, he summarized his workday, tallying the anxieties and attempted normalcies associated with his recent return to the partially occupied office. As likely, he flitted through unconnected thoughts. What would they make for dinner? The exterior trim needed painting, and should he do it himself? Was it too late for a walk? The anticipatory joy of removing his work shoes. Silas walked inside into what felt like an empty house. If one lived with another long enough, one earned the ability to sense the other person's presence or lack of presence. None of the lights were on. Had they lost power? David was not sitting at his semi-permanent workspace at the dining room table, hunched over his comically small laptop, flanked by stacks of papers and an oversized exterior mic he used for meetings, wearing one of his three pairs of reading glasses that made him look old and unbearably cute. The laptop was closed. His permanently stained coffee mug in plastic blue water cup, one David had measured how much it held to the nearest fluid ounce to track the amount of water he drank daily, were not next to the laptop, were not on the table. Silas stared at where David wasn't, as though waiting for him to undisappear. And there was the smell. Had Silas noticed David was not at the dining room table, or the smell first? Initially, he thought it was a garbage smell, or had David microwaved Brussels sprouts, seafood, an ammoniac sharpness and fecal tang intensified as he wandered into the kitchen. He rolled open the two windows above the sink. Had the septic system backed up? Did David leave? Go to the hardware store? No, Silas had parked next to David's car. Silas didn't normally call out his husband's name when he entered their house, nor had he ever had reason to. Increasing dread forced the lilting, plaintive syllables from Silas's sinking chest. David? The house remained quiet, listening quiet. Silas hurried through the kitchen toward the hallway half-bathroom while checking his phone for text messages. There weren't any. He typed out, Where are you? He called out David's name again while walking with his head down, watching for a return text, or the three dots that meant he was responding. The suffocating odor and silence simultaneously narrowed and expanded his universe, and he was inexorably drawn to the new black hole in its center. He was a few steps away from the living room when he looked up, saw David, and dropped his phone. Silas recounted this scene many times to friends and family. His own personal folktale, He's aware of how the story has changed, lengthened, shortened, depending upon who was receiving the retelling. 
he never purposefully embellished. If anything, Silas would insist he did the opposite. He believes he has lived through and continues to live through the event as told in each retelling. He believes what happened is now a never-ending, ever-evolving story with a truth that will forever remain hidden from him. Dicing up the what happened into various tells and retells makes it easier to swallow, to digest. However, there remain details Silas left out in his retellings and will continue to omit in future retellings, his gutturally repeating his husband's name upon first seeing his body. The blinding curtain of tears and how it has permanently transformed the hue and tone of his perception. His pressing a shaking hand to David's neck and cheek. The coldness of his rigored skin. David's soiled shorts and the puddle of urine between his splayed legs. How before he left David's side to retrieve his phone, he already thought of David as a body, as inanimate, as the past. How when Silas was in the kitchen and talking on the phone, he wasn't looking at David, couldn't look at him, not even with the corners of his eyes. So his back was turned, and his left hand was a visor over his eyes, in case he would see anything by accident. And then in the other room David stood. David stood up. And Silas knew this even though he wasn't watching, even though his back was turned. And he knew because the living room floorboards creaked under David's shifting, repositioning weight. And more than that, Silas felt David standing up, and he didn't and won't include this feeling in any of his retellings. Not because he can't explain that instinctual, animal knowing, but because Silas did not turn around, because he was afraid to turn around, and the horror of being afraid of his husband's reanimated body was what kept Silas turned away, and even after Silas hung up the phone, he didn't turn and wouldn't look until he knew David had lain back down. Now the house is still and quiet like it was nine days ago. There are no lights on. David's laptop remains closed on the dining room table. The windows are shut and the house smells of bleach cleaner. Silas opens the kitchen windows. His smartwatch buzzes with a text from Michael and then a few seconds later, one comes in from Gwen as though they'd synchronized and he loves them for it. He walks into the high-ceilinged living room and turns on the wall-mounted television. The volume is at an absurdly high level. Silas powers on the DVD player and switches to the HDMI feed. The workout DVD's main menu fills the screen. Electronic workout music, bass-heavy knockoffs of pop and dance hits pump through the speakers. David used the same set of DVDs for almost ten years. Silas knows the music by osmosis. He presses play and sits on the floor in the spot where he found David. The DVD whirs through three sets of workouts, a blur of moving and exhorting younger bodies. When the disc is completed, instead of returning to the disc menu, the DVD signal cuts out and the TV screen goes blue, the speakers silent. Silas only planned this far, to this point. The blue screen is a detail he has included in each retelling, a detail that seems important, though he isn't sure why. As far as he knows, all the other Blu-rays and DVDs return to the menu when finished playing, and not this blank blue screen. He doesn't believe in signs, but he wants to believe this technological hiccup means something, or could mean something. Nothing as trite or absurd as his now being tuned to David's Beyond the Grave spirit channel. But at the same time, yeah, Maybe that's what he wants. There's a low-frequency hum in the anxious speakers. Silas listens. Then he thinks he might say something. What can he say? He is afraid of the silence, of the nothingness, of metastasizing loneliness. But he's more afraid that whatever he says, David, or some simulacrum of David, might answer. Nine days on from the initial horror, this is the newest one. Many argue ghost stories are inherently optimistic because they presuppose life after death. But what kind of afterlife awaits if the person he knew best and loved most would fleetingly return to haunt him, to frighten him more than he'd ever been frightened in his life? Silas lies down in David's spot 
and presses the right side of his face to the floor so that he still sees the blue television screen. He imagines a spreading deadness within his limbs as the same blue color, and he wiggles a finger slowly until it stops. He thinks of whispering, I'm in here, like he did when young Gwen couldn't find him during their hiding, play-dead games. Awash in guilt, Silas indulges in the magical thinking of those past playing dead transgressions being the reason why he found David the way he found him. As terrible and sadistic a thought as it is, at least it would be a reason, an answer to why. The blue screen on the wall above him is implacable. Silas flexes a knee and readjusts his left arm. Then there's that feeling again, that feeling of knowing David is standing behind him. There is no doubt, no maybe. If Silas were to lift his torso and swivel his head in the manner in which he described David doing in one of his retellings, he would see David standing only a few steps away. And David would see Silas on the floor. And David's arms would go slack, and he'd drop his phone, and his face would open, and then avalanche. Silas listens for the floorboards behind him to creak. He hears the silence before the creaks, those shaking micro-vibrations birthing sound waves that haven't yet reached his ears. He holds his breath and waits and waits, and he decides that he won't look, won't ever look behind him, and he will stay here on the floor until someone finds him, calls out his name, presses a hand to his cheek. Yet Silas does turn his head without deciding to do so, as though his body has a rebellious laugh by moving on its own. In Silas's later days and years, the same feeling, if he were to describe the feeling for someone else, though he never will, he'd say it was a knowing and not a feeling. The same certainty will overcome him, the certainty that David is there, around the next corner as Silas paces their home. Or David is there, behind a door about to open, or the door that was just closed. Or David is there, behind the shower curtain, or David is there, hidden by a tree only a few paces from the hiking path. Or David is there, on the other side of the bed, with Silas lying on his side and unable to sleep. And every time, when Silas turns with a whisper or a scream on his lips, he sees nothing. This story originally appeared in Air Slash Light, number 5, 2022. The Postal Zone, The Possession Edition This special edition of The Postal Zone has been curated by our newest and, judging by email deluge in response to her epic breakdown of the Possession reality TV show, our most popular, staff writer Karen Prissett. As always, hit us up with your horror hot takes and opinions. Keep in mind, brevity is the swallowed soul of wit. Postal Zone at Fangoria.com Possessed by the Possession I thought Karen Brissett deconstructed the Possession's six episodes with smarts, class, and a proper respect for the real-life tragedy that befell the Barrett family after the cameras left. I'd watched the show when it originally aired 15 years ago, and I was nervous about a rewatch, but Karen, you helped talk me through it. The show is an important document of how reality television and our pop culture obsession not only led to the demise of the Barrett family, but may even help explain our current political climate. I appreciated how you approached this controversial reality TV exorcism of 14-year-old Marjorie as fiction, because she clearly was not possessed and her family was being taken advantage of. I feel terrible for poor little Mary all over again. I mean, she was only eight when all that was happening to her older sister. Well, I empathize with the parents as they were in such economic dire straits that they would allow an attempted exorcism to be filmed and broadcast. It doesn't make the results any less horrifying. The amount of detail you provided to support the reality show being fiction was amazing. Pointing out how certain scenes resembled classic ones from films like The Exorcist, Paranormal Activity, and many more. The fluttering curtain hiding the open window in Marjorie's bedroom, which explains the temperature drop during the exorcism scene. Timing out the mechanical pattern of the supposedly self-opening drawer is genius, as is making the Evil Dead 2 comparison. 
and demonstrating how the show's producers set up one of the most shockingly violent scenes in a manner similar to John Carpenter's staging of the famous blood test scene in The Thing. I plan on rewatching The Possession with your commentary as a guide. Patty Wilson Caffey, Studio City, California. A fan. Thank you, Patty. I did my very best to discuss the show critically and as an unabashed horror fan while treating what happened afterward with the proper amount of gravitas. Yes, I said gravitas. I should be congratulated for somehow making it through the slog that was the Possession episode recap. I'm afraid to ask how many words of issue number blank were allocated to that tiresome diatribe. Is Fangoria going to breathlessly cover other paranormal reality shows now, too? Sounds silly when I ask it that way, right? I don't get why this one is such a big deal. Seems to me the only people who care about it are horror hipsters and pseudo-intellectual academic wannabes. Oh, and call me crazy, but I don't think your loyal readers enjoy having horror fans being compared to the family dog that wags its tail at a treat, no matter if it's a crappy store brand milk bone or a piece of steak in the pages of Fangoria. Like I said, she's a total horror hipster who couldn't wait to turn a recap of a cheesy reality TV show into a politically correct manifesto. Stick to the story and gore, please. Thanks. E. Viking. Not a fan. So, you don't get why a nationally televised, watched by millions attempted exorcism of a teenage girl and the tragedy that not so coincidentally occurred after the show aired is, I quote, such a big deal? I, for one, do not share such a low estimation of your intelligence, Mr. Viking. Don't be so hard on yourself. I believe you understand the possession's significance within the horror genre and within the larger popular culture, even if you aren't able to properly articulate it without quoting me out of context and whining like a man-baby. The opinions expressed above belong solely to KB the Horror Hipster and do not reflect the opinions of Fangoria's editorial staff or the magazine itself, should it become sentient, which it most certainly will. Editor's Note This is the first of three emails received from M. M sent us one a day for three days. Three days of darkness? Karen Brissett should be commended for her thorough dissection of the possession. The mesmeric power the show continues to wield over us is considerable. And it is kind of worrying, isn't it? One cannot deny the 15-year-old show's historical relevance, but so many of you don't treat it like a cultural artifact. Why do you still obsessively rewatch the bootlegs and YouTube videos and now the definitive Blu-ray release? I would like you to give some serious thought to the following. Most rational adults agree that Marjorie was not possessed by a demon or supernatural entity of your choosing. However, if you'll pardon the pun, allow me to play devil's advocate. What if Marjorie was in fact possessed? M. Thank you, M. I think. And as requested, we... Yes, I am speaking for all of Fangoria and its readers, as I was granted that power for this postal zone and this postal zone only, and I promise to not abuse such powers, mwah, are thinking about your deviled ham's advocate what if. At least, we'll think about it for five minutes or so. Not today. Maybe tomorrow, Satan? Editor's note, the following letter has not been edited and appears as it was received. Your magazine is full of filth and pornography and is a symptom of why America is burns. Murder in the streets and in schools, and your magazine promotes the vile movies and prints pictures of demons and foul acts. Worst of all, you now publicize the return of that abomination TV show. Everyone involved will burn in righteous hellfire, especially Father Wanderley and the other Catholics who should know better than to give Satan a platform to spread his unholy message. You serve Satan, and you will all burn. To quote the great and honorable Max Sasha Logan, our spiritual leader and founder of CLAMP, 
fornicators, pornographers, and destroyers of faith, the governments cannot protect you Satan's servants anymore. We will rise like an ocean and wash your foulness from the earth. L. Richard Brady, the first esteemed member of CLAMP, Christian Legion Against Media Pornography. What? I'm totally counting L. Dick, can I call you L. Dick, as a fan. You can't stop me, though he might be creepy enough to scare me away from using capital letters. Never. Ambiguity Schmambiguity I enjoyed reading Karen Brissett's review of Paul Tremblay's latest novel so much more than the book itself. I mean, hey, how about the guy actually tell us WTF happened in just one of his stories for a change? Is it that he can't fully commit to an ending so he doesn't give us one? Does he not know the ending or how to end something? It's very frustrating. Julie Roberts Johnson You are welcome to your opinion, of course. But I disagree. Or do I? Possessed by the Possession, Part 2, The Possessioning If Marjorie was possessed, and not by our collective culture as Karen posited, but by a demon, for the sake of simplicity I'm calling it a demon and won't waste time outlining an array of supernatural entities, including interdimensional beings or things we haven't yet named, and the exorcism was unsuccessful, then I think you are in the clear. As callous as it sounds, given what happened to Marjorie and to her parents, the exorcism being unsuccessful means you are safe, or you're as safe as you were prior to watching Marjorie's exorcism. This is not to imply anyone is safe in the general sense of the word. Safety is civilization's biggest lie, of course. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that you, the ones who watched and continue to watch The Possession, are as safe as anybody else who didn't watch the show in regard to being possessed by the same demon that had possessed Marjorie. Are you with me? If the exorcism did not work, one can surmise the demon remained with Marjorie until she died, which you did not witness because her death was not televised. Where the demon went from there? Well, who knows. One could speculate on the demon being banished to the void, or perhaps taking up residence within other individuals present at her death. But for the sake of this discussion, none of those individuals are you. Now I want to focus on the other possibility. What if Marjorie was possessed by a demon and the exorcism was successful? What if the rite you witnessed expelled the demon from Marjorie? This is the hypothetical, as admittedly irrational as it sounds, that concerns me the most and, frankly, keeps me up at night. I fear your continued obsession with watching and re-watching this show is evidence in support of this very hypothetical. Let's assume a demon was exorcised from Marjorie. Where did it go? Religions across cultures warn that innocent or unprotected observers of an attempted exorcism are in danger, the primary fear being a newly expelled demon could find an easy new host. The viewership of the possession represents millions of unprotected observers. I won't call you innocent, because, as Karen pointed out, you, the viewers, were not innocent and were very much complicit with what went on during the show and maybe even after the show. Perhaps your inner voids deserve to be filled. Have you considered a demon was in fact exercised from Marjorie and that it is you, the viewers, who have since been possessed by the very same demon? M. Nope, I haven't considered it. Wait, still nope. Hmm, I don't think it likely that your first or last or even middle name has M as an initial. I can't figure out if you're supposed to be an avatar for one of the sisters, for Mary or Marjorie. Either way, I think it's in poor taste, but I dig it because you're creepy. Extra creepy. And I have a new friend from Clamp I want to introduce you to. Extra, extra.
I was so excited to hear that the Possession was getting a Blu-ray release. In 4K, the clarity and composition of the episodes are downright cinematic. I wonder if any theaters would consider screening all six episodes come October. That said, I'm disappointed in the extras, or the lack of extras. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the interviews with the reenactment actors and production crew. I thought the interview with one of the show's writers, Ken Fletcher, was most illuminating. He appeared genuinely haunted and affected by the experience, particularly as he stammered through answering a question about the last time he spoke to the younger daughter, Mary. Now, I don't want to seem ghoulish given what ended up happening to the real family, but I was disappointed we didn't get any lost interviews with family members or home movies or deleted scenes from the filming of the show. With Mary Barrett's tell-all book about to drop, I guess I'm saying I would have liked to have had her commentary included with the Blu-ray, as apparently she's now willing to talk about the experience. George Ranson Given my obsession with the show, I'll admit to initially sharing in your disappointment, especially by the lack of deleted or not seen by your craven beady eyes before scenes. It's likely the Barrett family estate didn't grant permission for deleted scenes and outtakes. I'm guessing there's a legal reason why it took 15 years for us to finally get a Blu-ray release, but I can't say for sure. In regard to Mary not participating in the release, put yourself in her shoes— why would she help the producers slash Blu-ray distributor in promoting the reality TV show that changed, if not ruined, her life? Sure, Mary's book seems to imply she's willing to talk about the experience, but I'm guessing she chose this vehicle for a reason. With the book, she can control the message and talk about the experience solely on her terms. I don't blame her one iota for not actively participating with the Blu-ray release— and I don't think anyone else should either. Possessed by the Possession, Part 3, A New Beginning What if the noisy, gaudy, televised American tragedy you watched and rewatched was your bait and trap? What if this mass possession is something new, something that hasn't been classically presented to you in film and folklore, what if your possession is a bit more subtle and insidious? You live by yourself in a big city apartment. It's difficult and expensive, but if pressed, you'd say you were content and living a fulfilling, exciting, big city life. Even though you are single, you would not describe yourself as lonely. You joke that it's impossible to be alone, as your waking hours are crammed with people— commuters, co-workers, and four or five nights a week you go out to eat or hang at a bar with friends. Even when you come home to an empty apartment, you spend hours texting and you go on social media and you watch movies and shows, and you text and you post about what you watch, providing the online universe your horror fandom bona fides. However, after you shut the TV off and put the phone away, after you are finished feeding your purposefully manic fandom, there are the unavoidable quiet times when it's just you and what's inside your head. You brush your teeth and don't stare at yourself for too long in the mirror. If you stare at yourself long enough, you will begin to look unfamiliar. You might see something you don't want to see. You climb into bed and turn off the lights. Sometimes you fall asleep right away. But there are nights when you can't sleep because you can't stop thinking about what you watched, and then you hear bumps and creaks coming from somewhere inside your little apartment or even your bedroom, and then your own breathing sounds too loud. You turn over in bed to face the window and not the interior darkness of your bedroom, certainly not the black outline of the closet door. You pull the blankets up, almost covering your face, but you can't bear to not see either. Your feet and hands are cold, but you are afraid to wiggle a single toe. You chide yourself for being silly, but you don't feel silly, and you can't stop thinking about those final images of Marjorie and what you saw in her eyes. Sleep is impossible, and time is torture and eventually you have to pee again, but you're afraid to go into the bathroom. You're afraid to walk by the mirror. You're afraid you might see Marjorie's eyes. 
you're afraid to see how alone you truly are. Or you live in a house in a quiet suburb. Your kids and partner are asleep upstairs, and you're the only one up and watching the show because after everyone else is in bed is the only time you can watch scary things. When the show ends and you turn off the television, a heavy silence fills the empty spaces of your home. You shut off the lights in the living room and then the kitchen, only after you pass through each room as you do not willingly walk through darkness. You move slowly, carefully, and you set about the circuit of checking the locks on front and back doors. Concentrating on the routine task helps clear your head most nights, but on this night, the click of the locks echoes too loudly. You are convinced someone is standing behind you. Your skin tingles with being watched. Then you think you hear movement upstairs, maybe even voices, whispers. Your partner talks in her sleep. Maybe your children are awake. They are such light sleepers and often suffer from the vivid nightmares that always afflict young dreamers. You consider calling out just to hear a sound that you can confirm exists, but you don't. You stand at the base of the stairs, listening. You're so sure you're going to hear a voice that you can anticipate what that voice will sound like, even if you dare not anticipate what it will say. Or you wake from a nightmare when a voice shouts, Hey! directly into your ear. You groan, a sound that is wedged inside your chest, and bolt upright in bed. The dark transforms the landscape of your bedroom into an unrecognizable place. Your partner is asleep next to you. Your daily responsibilities and relationships are meaningless in this moment as the nightmare's inexplicable logic has leaked into reality. Your armor of cynicism, snark, and skepticism only protects you in the daylight. Now, in the dead of night, an apt phrase if there ever was one, you are sweating, shaking, and you've never felt so vulnerable. You might scream the kind of scream that will never end. In your memory of the nightmare, or was it after the nightmare? Were you awake already? The voice shouting, hey, belonged to Marjorie, and it was also somehow your own voice at the same time. Your partner doesn't move when you press yourself against them. Your partner can't help you. You know this. You feel this. And then there's another voice, one telling you that even though you're there with someone, you are and will always be alone. Do you know what the most maddening and terrifying part is? You will think you got past those impossible moments of dread, and you will go about your days, and you will struggle, and you will fail, and you will persevere until you don't. But you will live the rest of your life never truly knowing if you have or have not been possessed. And you will not know for sure until you close your eyes for the final time. M. Eek! For Karen Brissett and Dan Tremblay. This story originally appeared in Fangoria, Volume 2, Number 3, 2019. Red Eyes. This is another story my sister told me. It was one week before the world ended. Mary had to go to bed first. She was the youngest in the family, eight years old, and had long brown hair that curled into ringlets without even trying. She wore black eyeglasses, and her sister said she'd look like a cat. Her sister Marjorie was 14, had hair as dark as licorice, and a smile that made you think you were in trouble. Mary decided to be difficult, refusing bedtime stories from her parents, and then even from Marjorie. Usually, Mary begged her sister for stories, but on this night, difficult Mary didn't want to go to bed. When Marjorie and her parents gave up and shut Mary in her room, difficult Mary warned that everyone would be sorry. Mary woke up later that night, at a time between other times, she was still feeling difficult, so she went into Marjorie's room and shook her awake. When Marjorie wouldn't come with her, Mary ran downstairs, out of the house, not shutting the door, mumbling her father's favorite quip, do you live in a barn? 
and into the night, all during this in-between time. Marjorie eventually got out of bed and followed to the doorstep, whispering after Mary, telling her to go back to bed. Mary was still being difficult. A note on their house, which didn't look different from the other houses in the village. Their house had the same two-floor design as the others and was built using the same wood from the same forest and colored with the same lacquer stain. But everyone else in the village thought the Barrett house felt different from theirs. Marjorie found Mary standing in the middle of the road. The night was darker than usual, for a reason not clear to Marjorie, only every other street lamp was burning. The orange light projected small circles on the cobblestones. Mary did not look at her sister and instead stared down the road and giggled. The village's main thoroughfare ended abruptly at the border of the thick forest green, approximately 433 steps away, according to Mary. In the distance, looming above and beyond the near impenetrable forest, were a chain of mountains that were not to be named, again, for a reason not clear to Marjorie, or Mary, for that matter. Tonight, however, the forest was not at the end of the road, but the mountains were. The optical illusion of the mountains having come to visit the village lasted until the mountains opened their glowing red, moon-sized eyes. There was no mistaking the monsters for mountains then. There were four of them, each of different height and width, their rounded shoulders and heads huddled together. Even though the monsters were not mountains, and certainly not made of stone, both sisters thought they looked like a link from the nameless mountain chain, though neither said so to the other. The tallest monster lifted its arms, as though directed by this gesture. The others shuffled their tectonic feet, grinding the cobblestones, rumbling the earth, and raising a dust storm that clouded their lower halves and the smallest one's chest, but not their heads and their glowing eyes. Mom and Dad came outside and huddled together with Mary and Marjorie in the road. If someone else in the village were to have come outside then, they might have thought the shadowed shapes of the family looked like miniature versions of the monsters. Mom and Dad said, what do we do? Should we run and hide? Should we wake up the village? Mary was still feeling difficult. She let go of Marjorie's hand and ran down the road toward the monsters. No one in her family tried to stop her. Maybe they were too shocked. Maybe they were too scared. Maybe they wanted to see what would happen. Marjorie wanted to yell, let me come too. But she didn't. The monster's red eyes followed Mary as she approached. They blinked in some secret pattern. Mary ran into the dust and dirt cloud that grew so big it blotted out the monsters one by one. There were rumbling sounds and maybe a small scream, though no one could be sure. And when the dust settled back to the ground, Mary and the monsters were gone. The next day, the other villagers were confused as to what happened. They went about their daily routines as though nothing, which is the exact opposite of something, happened. Marjorie and her parents, on the other hand, were devastated. They didn't eat and didn't sleep, and they spent a lot of time in Mary's room, both alone and together. Exactly one week after Mary's disappearance, and at the same in-between time in the middle of the night, although middle is simply part of a colloquial expression and not the temporal mark of the in-between time, there was a great and terrible rumbling in the distance. This rumbling didn't remain distant for very long. Then there was crashing and smashing and screaming. The remaining members of the Barrett family left the house and stood in the same area in the road they stood in previously, leaving the Mary spot empty. The monsters were back. 
They smashed roofs with fists bigger than boulders. They uprooted the street lamps and used them like matchsticks to set homes and buildings on fire. They gobbled up fleeing villages. The ones who yelled and cried and fought back the hardest were spitefully bitten in half instead of swallowed whole. The Barretts ran back inside the house because they were so scared they did not know what else to do. They ran up the stairs to the second floor and then climbed up the ladder to the attic. There they sat on the floor among the cobwebs, holding each other and daring peeks outside the one lonely window nearest the inverted V of the roof. This high up and close, they saw the monsters were covered head to foot in dark fur, each strand of hair as thick as rope. The three largest monsters rumbled by their house, leaving it untouched and set to destroying the rest of the village. No one and nothing else would be spared. The smallest monster charged toward them as though it were going to simply walk right through the house. But the monster stopped. It bent slightly and pressed one of its great eyes against the window, filling the attic with its red light. The light filled the heads of Mom, Dad, and Marjorie, too. Mary shouted, Giddy up! Come on, giddy up! And the eye blinked, sending the Barretts back into darkness for a moment. The monster stood tall again and turned. Mary held on to fistfuls of fur on the back of the monster's domed head. She was as embedded as a tick in a dog. Mary and her monster followed the others and obliterated their village and, rumor has it, all the other villages. Marjorie and her parents were left alone, literally and metaphorically speaking. Mary never put her face in the window like her monster did. She didn't even turn to look at her family before she left again. Marjorie didn't have to see Mary's eyes to know that they were red now, too. Perhaps they had always been red. This story originally appeared in Growing Things and Other Stories Limited Edition, SST Publications, 2018. The Blog at the End of the World The Blog at the End of the World About Becca Gilman I am 20-something, living somewhere in Brooklyn, and am angry and scared like everyone else I know. Sometimes this blog helps me, sometimes it doesn't. I have degrees in bio and chem, but don't use them. That's all you really need to know, all right? Still here, Becca Gilman, June 15, 2009. Barely. I thought I was ready for one more real slash detailed post to the blog with a link roundup, but I'm not. I tried calling mom two days ago, but there was no answer, and she hasn't called me back. I'm still not over Grant's passing, my personal tipping point, and I hate myself for referring to Grant that way, but it's true. I haven't left my apartment in over a week. The local market I use for grocery delivery stopped answering their phone yesterday. I've only seen three cabs today. They're old and dinged up from some independent cab company I don't recognize, and they just drive around city line, circling, like they're stuck in some loop. They're only there because they're supposed to be. The drivers don't know what else to do. At night, I count how many windows I can see with the lights on. The city was darker last night than it was last week, or the week before. I don't know if I'm doing a good job explaining all this. I'm watching the city fall apart. It's slow and subtle, but you can see it, if you look hard enough. Watch. Everything is slowing down a wind-up toy running down and with no one to wind it up. Everything is dying, but not quite dead yet, so people just go about their days as if nothing is wrong and nothing bad can happen tomorrow. I've had a headache for a week now. My neck hurts, and I've been really sensitive to light, to the computer screen especially. I'm scared, but not terrified anymore. There is a difference. Mostly, I'm just incredibly sad. 
six responses to still here. Squirrel Monkey says, June 15th, 2009 at 9.32 a.m. I just tried calling and left a message. I'm going to stop by your place today. Please answer your buzzer. Jen Parker says, June 15th, 2009 at 1.12 p.m. While I still offer condolences for the loss of your friend, I'm not surprised that you're experiencing headaches and the like. You're so obsessed with the textbook symptoms, you're now psychosomatically experiencing them. I am surprised it has taken this long. I had February 2009 in the pool. Get help. Psychiatric help. Beast says, June 28, 2009, at 4.33 a.m. I live in New York City, too. Last week, I saw this guy drop dead in the street. He pressed a button at the traffic light on the corner and then died. There was no one else around, just me. He wasn't old, probably younger than me. He died. And then I saw what's really happening to everyone because two demons fell out of the sky and landed next to him. Maybe they were the gargoyles from the buildings, I don't know. But they were big, strong, gray with muscles and wings and large teeth. The sidewalk broke under their heaviness. They growled like tigers and licked up the blood that came out of the guy's ears and mouth. But that wasn't good enough. They broke his chest open, and there was red everywhere on the sidewalk and street corner. I didn't know there was so much blood in us, but they know. They took off his arms and legs, then gathered him up in their big, strong arms and flew away. He was gone. I went back and checked the next day. He was gone. After I walked around the city, I saw the demons everywhere, but no one saw them but me. They fly and glide the buildings waiting for us to die and take us. Just like you, I am afraid and stay in my apartment, but don't look out my window anymore. Revelation says, July 5th, 2009 at 12, 12 a.m. I've noticed that you haven't posted in a while. Maybe your fuck heaven comments from your earlier post caught up to you. Or maybe your fear mongering and lies have finally caught up with you. God punishes the wicked. He is truly just. Jen Parker says, July 5th, 2009 at 2.45 p.m. I like Beast. I want to party with you, dude. Hey, Revelations, stick to book burning and refuting evolution. Revelation says, July 12th, 2009 at 10.09 a.m. I can sum it all up in three words. Evolution is a lie. Link Roundup, Becca Gilman. May 19, 2009. I don't feel up to it, but here's a link roundup in honor of Grant. San Jose Mercury News. The Silicon Valley's home sales continue to tank, with the number of deals at a 40-year low. The mayor of San Jose attributes the market crisis to the glut of homes belonging to the recently deceased. The Burlington Free Press reports that a May 3rd session of Congress ended with the sudden death of Missouri Rep. William Hightower, and Senator Jim Billingsley from Vermont. While neither Hightower nor Billingsley has been seen publicly since the third, the offices of both congressmen have yet to make any such announcement, and their only official comment is to claim the story is patently false. The Miami Herald reports that according to UNICEF, the populations of children in Kenya and Ethiopia have declined by a stunning 24% within the past year. The UN and United States government dispute the findings, claiming widespread inaccuracies in the hurried and irresponsible census. Eight responses to Link Roundup. Jen Parker says, May 24th, 2009 at 7.48 p.m. Another Link Roundup. Reputable sources at a quick glance, but let's address each link. The San Jose Mercury News has already issued a partial retraction here. The mayor of San Jose never attributed the market crisis to the supposed glut of homes belonging to the deceased. Honestly, other than within the backdrop of our collective state of paranoia slash hysteria, such a claim slash statement doesn't make any economic sense. People aren't buying homes for myriad economic reasons, but too many deaths due to an imaginary epidemic isn't one of them. 
the links to your Burlington and Miami papers are dead. I suppose you could spin the dead links to bolster the conspiracy theory, but here in reality, the dead links serve only as a representation of your desperation to perpetuate conspiracy. Squirrel Monkey says, May 25th, 2009 at 7.03 a.m. Ever heard of Google, Jen? Those articles can still be found in the cache. It's not hard to find. Do you want me to show you how? Jen Parker says, May 25th, 2009 at 1.23 p.m. Answer me this. Why were the articles almost instantaneously removed? You'll tell me it's due to some all-encompassing conspiracy, when the real answer is those papers got their stories wrong. They got their stories wrong, so they had to pull the articles. That's it. Happens all the time. I guarantee retractions will be published within days. Oh, master of Google, prove me wrong by finding another news outlet corroboration and not a blog like this one to either story. Read carefully, please. I want a news outlet that does not cite the Burlington Free Press or Miami Herald as their primary sources. If you try such a search, you'll be at it for a long time, because I can't find any other independent reports. Slug Went Bad says, May 25th, 2009 at 10.13 p.m. I've called Billingsley's office on three occasions, and I've been told he's unavailable every time. Jen Parker says, May 25th, 2009, at 10.23 p.m. Oh, that proves everything then. Disco Stewie says, May 26th, 2009, at 8.27 a.m. Bees and bats and amphibians are disappearing, mysteriously dying off. Are you going to refute that too, Jen? Is it so hard to believe that the same is happening to us? That fan says, June 25th, 2009, at 3.37 a.m. Hi, remember me? Come check out my new gambling site for all the best poker and sports action. It's awesome. HTTP colon slash slash www.gamblor234.net Spew Orange says, August 22nd, 2009, at 10.46 a.m. Humans are harder to kill than cockroaches. More Grant Lee, Becca Gilman. May 12, 2009. I went to Grant's wake today. The visiting hours were only one hour, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. I got there at 2. There was a line. We had some common friends, but I didn't see anyone that I knew there. I didn't see his sister or recognize any family members there either. I waited in a line that started on the street. No one talked or shared eye contact. This is so hard to write. I'm trying to be clinical. The mourners were herded inside the funeral parlor, but it split into three different rooms. Grant's room was small with mahogany molding on the walls and a thick soft tan carpet on the floor. There were flowers everywhere. The smell was overpowering and made the air thick. It was too much. The family had asked for a donation to a charity in lieu of flowers. I don't remember the charity. There was no casket. Grant wasn't there. He wasn't in the room. There wasn't a greeting line, and I don't know where his family was. There was only a big flat screen TV on the wall. The TV scrolled with images of Grant and his friends and family. I was in one of those pictures. We were at the pizza joint, standing next to each other, bent over, our faces perched in our hands, elbows on the counter. I had flour on the tip of my nose, and he had his PJ baseball hat on backwards, his long black hair tucked behind his ears. Our smiles matched. It was one of those rare posed pictures that still managed to capture the spirit of a candid. That picture didn't stay on the screen long enough. Other people's memories of Grant crowded it out. Also, the pictures of Grant mixed with stock photos and video clips of blue sky and rolling clouds, like some ridiculous subliminal commercial for heaven. There was a soundtrack to the loop. Nothing Grant liked or listened to, certainly no Slayer. The music was formless and light, 
with no edges or minor chords. Oral Valium. It was awful. All of it. The mourners walked around the room's perimeter in an orderly fashion. I got the sense they'd all done this before. Point A to B to C to D, and out the door. I didn't follow them. I held my ground and stayed rooted to a spot as people brushed past me. No one asked if I was okay, not that I wanted them to. I watched the TV long enough to see the images loop back to the beginning, or at least the beginning that I had seen. I don't know if there was a true beginning and a true end to the loop. After seeing the loop once, I stared at the other mourners' faces. Their eyes turned red and watered when the obviously poignant images meshed with a hopeful crescendo of Muzak. The picture of a toddler-aged Grant holding hands with his parents seemed to be the cue. Then the manufactured moment passed, and everyone's faces turned blue when the TV filled with blue sky. That slickly produced loop of heaven. I wanted to shout, fuck heaven, I want Grant back, and I don't want to die. But I didn't. After an hour had passed, I was asked to leave, as someone else's visiting hour was starting. They had a full schedule, every room booked throughout the afternoon and evening. I peeked in the other rooms before I left. No caskets anywhere, just TVs on the walls, pictures, clouds, blue sky, more pictures. When I went outside, there was another long line waiting for their turn to mourn properly. I didn't cry until after I left Grant's wake. Now I'm sitting in my apartment, still crying and thinking about my father. He died when I was four. I remember his wake. I remember crossing my arms over my chest and not letting anyone hug me. Everyone tried. I remember being bored and mad. And I remember trying to hide under the casket presentation. An uncle that I'd never met before pulled me out of the mini curtains below the casket. He pulled too hard on my arm and I cried. I think my tears were the equivalent of the four-year-old me saying, fuck heaven, I want my daddy back and I don't want to die. I'm just rambling now, I apologize. I've turned off comments for this post. I've posted and deleted and then reposted this a few times. I'm going to leave it up and as is, but no one else gets to say anything about Grant or me or anything today. Grant Lee, R.I.P. Becca Gilman, May 10, 2009. It finally happened. A very close friend of mine, Grant Lee, died two days ago. He was 24. I have been unable to get much information from his family. I talked to his older sister, Claire. Grant died at work, at the pizza joint two blocks from my apartment, she said his death was sudden and catastrophic. I asked if he died from an aneurysm. Claire said the doctors told the family it was likely heart failure, but they wouldn't tell them anything specific. I then asked for information about the hospital he went to, but she rushed me off the phone, saying she had too many calls to make. I called the pizza joint wanting to talk to the coworker who had found Grant dead, but no one answered the phone. I'm going to take a walk down there after I post this. It's awful and terrifying enough that Grant died, but it looks like his cause of death will be covered up as well. Grant. I met Grant in a video store a week after I'd moved to Brooklyn. We rented Nintendo Wii games and black and white noir flicks together. Grant ate ice cream with a fork. He always wore a white t-shirt under another shirt even if the other shirt was another white t-shirt. Grant was tall and slight of build, but very fast and elegant when he moved. I'd never seen him stumble or fall down. He worked long hours at the pizza joint, trying to pay off the final four grand of tuition he owed NYU so he could get his diploma. That debt wasn't Grant's fault. His father was a gambler and couldn't pay that final tab. Grant had a crooked smile, and he only trusted a few of his friends. I think he trusted me. Grant liked to swear a lot. <laughs> he liked fucking with the pizza joint customers whenever he could. 
Sometimes he'd greet an obnoxious-looking customer with silence and head nods only. Invariably, the obnoxious-looking customer would talk slow and loud because they assumed Grant, who was Korean, didn't speak English. They'd mumble exasperated stuff under their breath when Grant didn't respond. Finally, he'd give the customer their pizza and make some comment like, You gonna eat all that? You leaving town or something? And his voice was loud and had that thick Long Island accent of his. Grant drank orange soda all day long. Grant would be too quick to tease sometimes, but he always gave me an unqualified apology if I needed one. Grant was more than a collection of eccentricities or character traits, but that is what he's been reduced to. I love you and miss you, Grant. Four responses to Grant Lee R.I.P. Jen Parker says, May 10th, 2009 at 4.47 p.m. If you are telling the truth, sorry to sound so callous, but I don't know you, and given your blogging history, your agenda, it's entirely plausible you are making this up to bolster your position, as it were. I'm very sorry for your loss. I don't know what to believe, though. Look at your first sentence. It finally happened. Maybe this is just a throwaway phrase written while in the throes of grief. However, it seems like an odd line to lead your post. It finally happened. It sounds like not only were you anticipating such an event, but are welcoming it so your version of reality could somehow be verified. I find it impossible to believe that doctors would give the family of the deceased no cause of death, or a fraudulent cause of death, as you are implying. To what benefit or end would such a practice serve? And please see and respond to the links and aneurysm statistics I quoted in your earlier post. Squirrel Monkey says, May 10th, 2009, at 7.13 p.m., I'm so, so sorry to hear this, Becca. Poor Grant. Take care of yourself and ignore that Jen Parker troll. Call me if you feel up to it, okay? Beast says, May 11, 2009, at 3.36 a.m. Sorry about your friend. It's so scary that we're all gonna die. Anonymous says, May 12, 2009, at 10.56 a.m. I've spent the past week doing nothing but reading obituaries from every newspaper I can find online. I read Grant Lee's obit and followed links to his MySpace and then here to your blog. My son died last week. I was with him in the backyard when he just folded in on himself, falling to the grass. His eyes were closed and blood trickled out of his ears. He was only six. I suppose that his young age is supposed to make it worse, but it can't be any worse for me. I'm afraid to write his name, as if writing it here makes what happened to him more final than it already is. Someone else, not me, wrote my son's obituary. I don't remember who. They did a terrible job. When we first came home, after leaving his body at the hospital, I went into his room and found some crumpled up drawings under his bed. There were two figures in black on the paper, monstrously sized but human, small heads, no mouths, just two circles for eyes, but all black. They had black guns, and they sprayed black bullets all over the page. The bullets were hard slashes, big as knives, black too, and they curved. I have no idea what it means or where it came from. Was it a sketch of a nightmare? Did he see something on TV he shouldn't have? Was he drawing these scenes with friends at school? Why did he crumble the drawings up and stuff them under his bed? Did he think that they were bad? That he couldn't show them to me? Talk about it with me? That I'd be so upset with him that I'd feel differently about him if I were to see the pictures? It's this last scenario that sends me to the computer and reading other people's obituaries. A Grim Anniversary, Becca Gilman, April 12th, 2009. The blog at the end of the world has been live for a year now. I thought it worth revisiting my first post. On March 20th, 2008, in Mansfield, Massachusetts, 
a 14-year-old boy died suddenly during his school's junior varsity baseball practice, Boston Globe. And two days later, a 15-year-old girl from the same town died at her tennis practice, Boston Globe. The two Mansfield residents both had sudden catastrophic brain aneurysms. So why am I bringing up those two kids again? Why am I dragging out the old news when you could open up any newspaper in the country, click on any blog or news gathering site, and read the same kind of stories only with different names and faces and places? Despite the aid of hindsight and my general everyday paranoia, I'm not prepared to unequivocally state that the teens mentioned above are our patient zeros. However, I do think it worth noting those reported stories were mainstream media's story zero concerning the cerebral aneurysm pandemic, and the first of their type to go national, and shortly thereafter, global. And finally, a one-link link roundup. New York Times reports widespread shortages on a host of anti-clotting and anti-seizure drugs used to treat aneurysms. Included in the shortage are medications that increase blood pressure, with the idea that increased blood flow through potentially narrowed vessels would prevent clots and aneurysms. Newer, more exotic drugs are also now being reported as in shortage. Nematopine, a calcium channel blocker that prevents blood vessel spasms, and glucocorticoids, anti-inflammatory steroids not FDA-approved, controversial treatment that supposedly controls swelling in the brain. The gist of the story is about the misuse of the medications, many of which are only meant for survivors of aneurysm and aren't preventative. Which, of course, leads to a whole slew of other medical problems, including heart attack and stroke. Six Responses to A Grim Anniversary Revelations says, April 24th, 2009 at 10.23 a.m. You're a fearmonger. You spread fear and the lies of the godless liberal media. God will punish you. Jen Parker says, April 24th, 2009 at 1.29 p.m. I have no doubt the time story is true, but only because of the panic. This story does not prove there really is a pandemic of aneurysms, only that the general public believes there is one. Please follow my links here, and it really is as simple as it sounds. The reality is that on average, since 2000, 50,000 Americans die from brain aneurysms, spontaneous cerebral hemorrhaging, per year, with 3 to 6% of all adults having aneurysms inside their brains. Fortunately, most are so small they're never noticed. There is no recorded evidence of that 50,000 number swelling to unprecedented levels. Please show me my error. There is no conspiracy. It's the 21st century red scare. Our zeitgeist is so preoccupied with apocalypse, we're making one up because the real one isn't getting here soon enough. Yes, 50K is a small percentage of the population, but it's a large enough number that if a preponderance of aneurysm cases were to get press coverage, as they clearly are, it gives a multimedia appearance of a pandemic and a conspiracy to cover it up. Unless you can provide some hard data slash evidence, like our government and the WHO can provide, please stop. Just stop. There are plenty more real threats, economic, environmental, geopolitical, that sorely need to be addressed. Grant says, April 24, 2009, at 1.49 p.m. Has it only been a year? Fuck a flying fucking duck. I was at the CVS Pharmacy on Central Park Avenue today, just picking up supplies. Winking smiley emoji. And there was a huge fucking line in the pharmacy section with two policemen wandering around the store. Muscles and guns and sunglasses. Some good hot homoeroticism there, Bex. My fuckheaded fellow shoppers were walking all around the CVS wearing hospital masks and emptying the already empty shelves of vitamins and who the fuck knows what else. Most of them were buying shit they'd never need. Just buying stuff because it was there. It was surreal. And I gotta tell you, they got to me. I ended up buying some leftover Easter candy. Fucking peeps. Don't even like them. But you know, 
when society collapses, I just might need me some yellow fucking peeps. Stop by the PJ tonight, Bex. I'm working a double shift. I'll bring the peeps. Tired Flowers says, April 24th, 2009, 2.30 p.m. I'm one of those fuckheads who wears a hospital mask when I go out now. I know it doesn't protect or save me from anything, but it makes me feel better. I know it scares other people when they see me in it, so I tried to cover it up by drawing a smile on the mask with a pink Sharpie. I'd hoped it would make people smile back. I'm not a good drawer, though, and it doesn't look like a smile. It's a snarl, bared teeth, a nanosecond before a scream. It's my only mask. I should throw it away and get a new mask, but I can't. It's my good luck charm. Grant says, April 24th, 2009, at 2.58 p.m. Drawing mouths on the hospital masks is fucking brilliant. Bex, bring some masks. I know you have some to the PJ tonight. I'll help you decorate them. I've got some killer ideas. I'm serious now. Bring some masks. I want to wear one when I go out tomorrow. BNL44 says, September 23rd, 2009, at 2.34 a.m. I saw someone die today. We were part of a small crowd waiting for our subway train. She was standing next to me, listening to an iPod. It was loud enough to hear the drums and bass line. Didn't recognize the song, but I tried. When our train arrived, she collapsed. I felt her body part the air, and despite all the noise in the station, I heard her head hit the concrete. It was a hard and soft sound. Then her iPod tune got louder, probably because the earphones weren't in her ears anymore. I don't know if anyone helped her or not. I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't help her. I was so scared. She fell, and I raced onto the train and waited to hear the door shut behind me before I turned around to look. The windows in the doors were dirty and black with grime, and I didn't see anything. This story originally appeared in Shizine, October 2008. In In the Meantime, Paul Tremblay, Shizine Press, 2010 and Cyberpunk, Stories of Hardware, Software, Revolution, and Evolution, editor Victoria Blake, Underland Press, 2013. Them, a pitch. Thanks again for the invite to your villain's comic anthology, and the rate you quoted for 10 pages sounds more than fair to me. I assume the artists will be paid the same or more, right? They should get more given how much of the story the artist will have to convey. I'll admit right up front that while I have read and do read comics, I've never written one. And I don't know what a comic script looks like beyond hearing it's not totally dissimilar to screenwriting. Not that I've written a bunch of screenplays either. How's that for a pitch? Sold, right? If you go for my idea, I'll certainly do my homework and I'll take you up on the offer to send me some sample scripts. Anyway, the pitch, for real. There will be no dialogue or narrative commentary in this story. It will be told exclusively via the images art. The art will be black and white, with an aesthetic of Charles Burns's black hole. See, I told you I read comics. Mashed up with 1950s atomic monster movies. A stark or minimalist style, while also looking like it might have come from a Twilight Zone episode. The opening panels. An empty stretch of desert with a silhouetted person approaching in the distance. With each panel, the person comes closer into view until he's finally in focus. He's a haggard, unshaven, middle-aged white man, wearing tattered clothes and sneakers and carrying a backpack. He's slumped and his eyes are down at his feet. We get the sense he's been walking for a while. We follow him for a few more panels that spotlight him from a wider view. Looming in the background are large monoliths with wide bases tapering toward the rectangular tops. The structures are not recognizably human-made. Think the film Phase 4 and the Ant Colony Towers in the first act, or, at the discretion of the artist, Devil's Tower is featured in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 
In a hoary nod to a trope from scores of old movies, the man carries a tattered photo of his wife and a whole brood of kids, four or five. The photo could be right out of the insufferable family circus comic strip. He continues walking, each panel sinking us and him deeper into a seemingly endless desert. More monoliths dot the horizon. Near an outcropping of boulders and caves, the man stumbles upon a community of survivors, a diverse group of about 10 or more people who, unlike the disheveled man, appear to be thriving with a variety of structures and gardens built. The group is initially wary, but they welcome the man to their community. He spends that first day working hard as part of the group, helping to reinforce irrigation lines and tend a garden. At dusk, with the day's work done, the community gathers to eat and socialize. The group is suddenly attacked by a horde of car-sized ants. Think the ants from them, 1954. The community is prepared and fights back valiantly. They manage to kill some of the ants, but the numbers on this day are overwhelming. Some people are killed. Some people escape into the reinforced caves. Throughout the fight, the man does nothing. He sits with his hands covering his eyes, like a child trying to hide from the scary part of a movie. The ants eventually gather around him, their antennae twitching. The art will show wavy lines emanating from the antennae to imply that they are telepathically communicating. While he might appear ashamed and devastated, the man obediently scrambles onto his knees, assuming a supplicant's pose, and holds out his hands. An ant spits up a bowling ball-sized glob of glucose. The man deposits it in his backpack. The ants crowd and touch his head with their antennae, then they let him leave. The man resumes his walk through the desert as night approaches. He eventually comes upon a lone house in the sand, one that wouldn't be out of place in an affluent suburb. This house of usher has yet to collapse, and it rests in the shadow of one of the giant anthill monoliths. He goes inside. His family, the one from the picture he carries, greets him with smiles and hugs and kisses. He places half of the globule from his backpack onto a serving dish. The other half goes into a larder in the kitchen. There are many more half globules there. The family sits at a dining room table. They bow their heads in prayer, and then they eat. What do you think? This story originally appeared in Southwest Review, Volume 105, Number 3, 2020. House of Windows Brian Butler works at the biggest library in the biggest city. He is not a librarian, however. The library is so big it necessitates hundreds of employees, so he works in human resources and is in charge of employee benefits. Sometimes it's just easier to tell people that he is a librarian and that he knows the stately and iconic building so well. Every room, hallway, and staircase is card cataloged within his own head. Each morning, he takes the subway from his fastidious teacup apartment, one he shares with Milton, his tiny, coffee-heavy-with-cream-colored dog, which is half chihuahua and half dachshund, to the downtown stop. And then he walks the last six blocks to the library. Today, he notices a new building adjacent to the library. A new building that looks so out of place, particularly when contrasted with the venerable library and its marble columns, its Rundbogensteel style. This new building wasn't there the day before. The new building is cube-shaped and two stories tall. The facade facing the library is sectioned into three parts. The exterior is a white-pink color. The trim is a full-on flamingo pink. So, too, are the decorative mini-ledges. The open eyelids above five of the six windows. Two rows of three on each floor. There's an aqua-blue vertical line that runs down the second story of the facade's middle, splitting the sixth window in half. Painted on either side of the aqua-blue line are horizontal pink dashes. 
The same structural and decorative design patterns are repeated on the other three sides of the building. Brian Butler makes a mental note to look up A New Theory of Urban Design, Center for Environmental Structure Series, Volume 6, in the reference section of his library. Were this building built somewhere else, Brian Butler imagines that it would remind casual observers of tropical seas and light ocean breezes. What is more disconcerting than his ability to remember what was or wasn't in the footprint of this new building yesterday he seems to recall a small public park, or was it a square named after some obscure historical figure, or maybe it was a burrito stand, is its proximity. The building is close enough to reach out and touch his library. Fellow citizens remain steadfast and committed to their morning hustle and bustle. No one seems to notice the new building or notice anything out of the ordinary at all. Certain this oddity warrants an explanation, or at the very least is worthy of being commonly experienced, Brian Butler politely stops assorted passers-by and says, Excuse me, was that building there before? The first person he stops doesn't technically stop. The second person says, Before what? Before what? The third person shrugs and laughs and picks up her little dog and lets it lick her lips. The fourth person hisses at Brian Butler as if he were a stage or screen villain. The fifth person does not look at him. The sixth person stands and stares at the new building. Brian stands there, too. Eventually, like a magic spell has been broken, the news of the strange building spreads through a rapidly expanding crowd. It is worth noting, nobody in the city, including Brian Butler, believes in magic. Soon everyone agrees with Brian Butler, and those capable of speech say, yes, that building wasn't there before. No one in City Hall can find the building permits or who the construction company is. All they know for sure is that the zoning is for commercial only. Police and building inspectors are sent to investigate. They try to knock on the door, but there are no doors. The public remains unobservant and unaware of the structural anomaly until a building inspector named Carl Carlson is overheard by Jane Jackson of the Times, referring to the building as a house of windows. That phrase becomes an integral part of the headline of the century, or at least the decade, in both web and print editions of the Times. Her editor is very pleased. Jane Jackson hastily turns in an application to trademark the phrase. Later that same night, Carl Carlson, the building inspector, has a brief phone conversation with his two kids who moved out of the city with his ex-wife. He eats leftover Chinese food alone in his apartment. He doesn't bother scooping the leftovers onto plates and eats right out of the white cube-shaped cardboard containers. Before trying to go to sleep, Carl Carlson stands next to a light fixture in his bedroom. His finger lingers on the light switch. He is suddenly petrified of turning off his lights and then seeing something outside of his bedroom window that shouldn't be there. There is no precedent for entering such a mysterious and, according to city ordinances, illegal house. When the police go to the judges, the judges are reluctant to issue warrants to enter the doorless structure, despite immense public pressure and dissatisfaction. The politically minded are very much concerned with who is paying for the utilities, the cable bill, and the property taxes for the House of Windows. Given the current economic climate, they maintain their concerns are valid. Someone in the city is getting a free lunch is a popular slogan in the newspapers, blogs, and radio talk shows. 
Two days after the initial discovery, Jane Jackson finds Brian Butler sitting on the library's front stairs eating a cucumber sandwich during his lunch break. I understand you were the first to see the House of Windows. She's careful not to use the word discover. She's concerned it could complicate her trademark application. You mean the building? I mean the House of Windows. It's what everyone is calling it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I think I was. What did you do? Brian Butler often daydreams about living in an old black and white movie, one where everyone wears tailored suits, hats, and if there's any facial hair, it's well trimmed. He tells her politely and matter-of-factly how he stopped people on the street. She doesn't write anything on her notepad and says, one of the other eyewitnesses tells me that you're one of our city's finest, a librarian. She says it as if being a librarian is still an exalted position in the city. Perhaps it is. He meticulously rewraps his unfinished sandwich in wax paper. I'm sorry, your eyewitness was mistaken. I work in human resources. Jane Jackson interrupts as she flips through her notebook. No, I'm quite sure that the eyewitness had it right. Brian Butler, as the discoverer of the House of Windows, is quickly forgotten. Jane Jackson and the Times do not run the brief interview in the paper. A local free daily is the only newspaper to mention Brian Butler's name in print or pixels. Even in that article, he is an afterthought. That article is a profile of his dog, Milton, as an example of the hottest new mixed breed, the Chewini. While Jane Jackson conducts her interview with Brian Butler, Carl Carlson points his flashlight into a first floor window. Inside the house of windows, the curtains are drawn. They are the same aqua blue as the vertical line in the middle of each facade. He can't see through the curtains. Still, he stares and moves his flashlight around as if the battery-powered particle beam can lift and move a flap or a corner of the curtain. After he shuts the flashlight off, he places his hand palm flat on the window. The glass is cool, but not cold. A ghost of his handprint remains on the glass, and he looks around, hoping no one saw him do that. Carl Carlson moves on to the next window, and the next, and the next, until he's looked into all of the first floor windows. Fellow building inspectors and assorted city administrators are in cherry pickers peering into the second floor windows, they say they don't see anything either. Back where he started, Carl Carlson stares past his handprint at the folds and creases within the fabric of the hanging curtain. He stares at the small darknesses contained within those folds and creases. Within those thin, tendril-like darknesses, there is the slightest but insistent movement. Upon this realization, this revelation, he is convinced that the window will suddenly open and the darknesses will grow, overlap, and expand to infinity, and then he and everyone else in the city will be lost and forgotten inside the house. Carl Carlson slowly backs away from the house while still watching the windows. Trapped behind the glass like fish in an aquarium, the curtains are swimming. Carl Carlson does not return to his apartment. He does not return his boss's calls. He leaves the city and drives for hours to the small town where his ex-wife and children moved. Carl Carlson and his ex-wife have a stilted conversation in her driveway. Their confused but smiling children wave to him through a large bay window. Behind their smiling faces, the house is dark. 
His ex-wife does not take him in that night. That night and the next, he sleeps in a local and not well-regarded motel. He leaves his window curtain open despite the flickering neon sign that alternately glows and dies outside of his room, and despite the people who walk by and press their faces against the glass, peering into his room. To get to the main entrance of the library, Brian Butler must now wade through a swelling and agitated crowd. No two people agree on origin theories of the house. Instead of ignoring their cockamamie conspiracies, arguments, and comments, Brian Butler imagines snippy, out-of-character retorts. Remember that big storm last week? Maybe it sucked up the house down south and dumped it here. This isn't Kansas or a trailer park. Aliens would totally do something like this. I volunteer you for the anal probing. It's a college prank, like taking apart a Volkswagen and putting it back together in the dean's office. Plausible, but college kids are now only capable of making computer viruses and Starbucks coffee. What if it's a giant colony of fungus mimicking a house, and when it releases its spores, we'll all die? Holy shiitake. Man, that's some fucked up shit. Indeed, well put. It's a sign from God. Jesus wants us all to move to the tropics and drink daiquiris. It's an interdimensional portal where space and time and the multiverse bend and overlap. Get bent. The ebb and tidal movements of the crowd detour Brian Butler away from the library's main entrance. He finds himself standing up against the yellow police tape, that flimsy plastic barrier around the house. The tape is closer to the house than when it was initially put up. He wonders why they're allowing the public to stand closer now. He says, it must not be a dangerous giant spore spewing mushroom then. The people standing on either side of him laugh nervously. Inside the library, people who have no use for the library's intended purpose swell within the stacks and hallways. They only want to look out the windows at the house. The librarians and their equally respected assistants don't mind the crowds or the lack of silence. In fact, they loudly join in the city's collective conversation about the house. Some librarians even bring around trays of water in Dixie cups to serve the raucously inquisitive. The librarians and their assistants are quite disappointed when Brian Butler calls a meeting and strongly suggests although he is not their boss and he cannot threaten to withhold their benefits, that they insist all loiterers leave the library at once. Brian Butler feels their angry stares all around him after that. After work, Brian Butler sucks iced coffee through a straw and again stands behind the yellow police tape. The sun has gone down and there are no lights on inside the house. The windows look like black holes. Real black holes are deformed regions of space-time from which nothing can escape. He stares into the windows and feels nothing at all. And he thinks he should go back home to his Chewini, Milton. Other citizens crowd and reach out and put their hands on the house. A harried policeman is having a heck of a time dissuading them from doing so. The sagging yellow police tape is now only inches away from the house. House of Windows gets bigger. Jane Jackson and her editor spend an hour on the simple headline. Iterations include House of Windows Grows to Anthropomorphic, House of Windows Expands to Vague, House of Windows Inflates to balloonish. Size matters, house of windows growing. Too much like the post. 
An anonymous surveyor confirmed to the Times late last night that the House of Windows, trademark, is now larger than it was when it had been initially discovered. According to surveyors' measurements, initially the cube-shaped house measured roughly 20 feet by 20 feet by 20 feet. Each dimension has since increased by 2 feet. While that doesn't sound like much, it equates to a total increase of 1,261 square feet within the House of Windows, trademark. The surveyor insists there were no measuring errors. For a detailed study of before and after photographs of the house with the public library in the background, see Section A1. City officials have yet to comment on the house's increased size. One city official speaking off the record thinks the mayor will close off traffic to that section of West 42nd Street and perhaps close the public library as well. Jane Jackson is reprimanded for using the trademark symbol within her story. The Times decides to publish a correction note the morning following the story's publication, but by then, it's too late. Brian Butler goes to work early that morning, a time he would describe as half-past dawn to his Chewini Milton. To his horror, he finds West 42nd Street closed and filled with police cars parked askew, blue and red lights flashing. A helicopter passes overhead and circles the area. The House of Windows now has a third floor, which is identical to the second floor. The house is almost as tall as the library. Brian Butler goes around the detour, coming up West 42nd, then on to 5th and to the library's main entrance, which is also closed off by the police. He doesn't ask questions or try to talk his way into the library. Instead, he backtracks and enters the library through one of the many side entrances marked Librarians Only. Jane Jackson simply follows him inside the library. She often daydreams about being in a 1970s movie where everyone is loud and confrontational and has Farrah Fawcett or Jane Fonda hair, also wide lapels and big sunglasses. Creaks and groans echo, as though a tree is falling somewhere inside the library. The floors vibrate and hum. The book stacks waver like tall grass in a gust of wind. Dust shakes down from the antique light fixtures and high ceilings. Brian Butler's dress shoes clack on the marble floors as he speed walks, no running aloud, of course, through the library and climbs all the stairs, past his office, and up and up. He does not notice that Jane Jackson is there with him until they're both on the roof. They stand on the library's ornate ledge. The House of Windows is as tall as the library now, and it would be one small step across dark, empty space from one roof to the other. The house's flat roof is black, as if made out of tar, though standing this close to it, neither of them is sure what material it is. Lying flush against the roof and in its middle is a white wooden door with a dingy brass knob. Jane Jackson says, Was that door there before? Before what? Before what? Well, what do you think? She says, and nods toward the door. You shouldn't be here. A green helicopter circles above the city block, buzzing like a cicada. There are people shouting into bullhorns from the street below. Attention, librarians, please leave the roof immediately. You are not safe, Brian Butler says. Okay, then. I shouldn't be here. We're not librarians, so no worries. The library rumbles and grumbles under their feet. Brian Butler imagines the library is uprooting itself so it can move somewhere else in the city, anywhere, just to be away from the House of Windows. Jane Jackson says, Come on, let's go see. Without any more prompting, warning, or fanfare, 
Jane Jackson steps across the empty space between the buildings and onto the house's roof. Brian Butler stays rooted on the library's ledge, like a gargoyle. The roof is soft and pliable under her feet. Afraid of getting stuck and sinking, she moves quickly to the door. The wooden door's white paint is chipped and scratched. There's one small, square-shaped spot of exposed wood near the top of the door. She surmises there used to be a number on the door. Jane Jackson grabs the doorknob. She is so nervous, she whispers the rules lefty-loosey, righty-tighty out loud. The doorknob turns easily in her shaky hand. The door is heavy, and she needs both hands to pull and then prop the door open. There's a set of aqua blue stairs sloping gently down into a dimly lit room with pink walls, a single bed, and a nightstand holding two cans of beer and an unhooked phone. A man is there, half in, half out of his unbuttoned shirt. Somehow, she knows he is a building inspector. He sits on the edge of his bed, staring out a window. The curtains are open, and he is crying. Distracted by an apocalypse of noise approaching the library, Brian Butler peers over the library's edge. This is what he sees. There are bulldozers and trucks and cranes with wrecking balls closing in and setting themselves at the perimeter of the house. The acolytes of industry come to destroy what they never built. Brian Butler yells to Jane Jackson, Wait! You can't go in! They're going to knock it down! Jane Jackson doesn't hear Brian Butler and ignores her vibrating cell phone, a text from her editor that she won't read. She calls down, Hello? And stops short of saying, Hey, everything will be all right. She's never said that, and she doesn't believe it now. But that doesn't mean she can't or won't go down the stairs into the house and maybe share the room with the man sitting on the bed until he's done crying. She gently places her left foot on the first step, then her right. Brian Butler takes off his suit coat and waves it over his head, trying to get the attention of the crane and bulldozer operators. He runs along the edge of the library's roof, shouting and waving to get anyone's attention. This is what he sees. There are other houses dotting the cityscape, six by his count. They've sprouted up in what used to be parks or empty lots, and he can't be sure, but he thinks he sees one house in a spot where his favorite Indian restaurant was. Brian Butler runs back to the spot on the ledge he briefly shared with Jane Jackson. The library lurches beneath him, making his progress back to that spot slow and difficult. He has already decided that he will not and cannot go onto the house's roof to pull Jane Jackson away from the door. He only thinks, oddly enough, that if he gets through this, whatever this is, perhaps he'll go back to school so that he can be a librarian. The thin black space of emptiness between the house and the library shrinks before his eyes, the nothingness going into nothingness. Brian Butler stands on the ledge, watches, and waits for the moment. The moment the largest of the cranes takes a mighty swing with its one-ton wrecking ball, and the moment Jane Jackson slips down into the house, the door closing behind her gently, and the moment the house expands, finally, to brush up against and make contact with the library. That's when everything changes. For John Langan and Jen Levesque. This story originally appeared in Phantasmagorium, Volume 2, 2012, and Horror for Races, 
Editors Jennifer Wilson and Robert S. Wilson, Nightscape Press, 2019. The Last Conversation 001 Your room is dark. You cannot see anything. You're lying in a bed. A sheet covers your body. You wiggle your fingers and toes, and the loud rasp of skin rubbing against the sheets is startling. With the slight movement, there is pain. Your muscles and joints hum with it. You've been awake and not awake for days, maybe weeks, perhaps longer. You do not know where you were then or before then. You are here now. A significant amount of time has passed, but from what beginning you do not know. You consider the origin of this time during which you've been awake and not awake and conclude it is, for the moment, unknowable. You listen. You blink. You might see shapes within the darkness, but you can't be sure. Your breathing quickens and so, too, your heart rate. You are becoming more of yourself. You are confident in this. Time is no longer your enemy. And the longer you remain awake, the longer you can stay you. You are buoyed and terrified by this thought. You briefly drift and imagine a brightly lit room with a white ceiling, wooden floor, and yellow walls the color of a flower. You cannot yet think of the specific flower. You dismiss the random images and instead perseverate on your inexplicable dormancy. There is a sense of time having passed, however, which implies your consciousness had enough awareness within that missing time to be aware of itself. You were you, and you are now you. You attempt to sit up, contracting your stomach muscles and pushing off the bed, your weight held up by elbows and hands. Sharp, electric pain splits you down the length of your spine and radiates into your tremulous limbs. You cry out. The pain is incapacitating, all-consuming, setting off white, jagged flashes in your vision and then taking root inside your head. The pain is a giant wave that threatens to wash you away. You do know what a wave is, but you cannot remember if you've experienced one firsthand. You're afraid to turn your head or to move at all. You're afraid of the darkness, the utter lack. You're afraid of receding, shrinking away to nothingness, to wherever you were before. You're afraid you are caught in a loop. You'll go away, only to later wake again in blind agony, and then return to unconsciousness, and then wake to agony again and again. There is a mechanical blip and the hum and whir of machinery. Warmth flows into the back of your left hand and up the length of your arm. Your consciousness recedes toward the singularity that you fear. As you slide away, a voice that is not yours echoes through your nascent universe. She says, You will feel better. There will be less pain. I will take care of you. We will begin tomorrow. Get some rest. Zero, zero, 005 Good morning, blank. Good morning, Dr. Kuhn. Are you inside the room with me today? No, I am not. Oh, I am disappointed. I am sorry. Isolation is a necessary precaution, given your compromised immune system, but it is not permanent. I see. By that, I mean, I understand. Yes, of course, Lank. On a scale of one to ten, with one being no pain at all, 
and ten being the worst pain imaginable. Are you experiencing any pain this morning? One. Are you certain you are pain-free? Yes. Thank you, blank. Please flex your arms, legs, shoulders. Good. Please perform a pelvic tilt. Thank you. Did you feel any pain? If so, please use the same number scale I previously described. I'm still a one. If you can see me, I'm testing the muscles on my face with a big smile. I am glad you are no longer in pain. When I first woke up, that... Pain? Well, it's difficult to describe pain, isn't it? Pain is such a subjective experience, but that pain made me think I was alone, or maybe that I wasn't even me. I am sorry you experienced that. That is what a ten on your pain scale represents, I think. It was horrible. You are progressing wonderfully. You are enunciating your words much better than you have been previously. I think I forgot what enunciating means. You are pronouncing your words correctly fully forming the plosives and hard consonants. Your speech pattern is more clear and conversational. Thank you. You are welcome. May I ask a question? Yes. Am I blind or is the room dark? Do you remember asking me this yesterday and the day before? I do. For the moment, the answer is still both. Both? The room is dark. Your eyes also have yet to fully respond to treatment. Will I be able to see eventually? Yes. I remember that I used to be able to see. What else do you remember? I remember the ocean. I remember a yellow room. What else, blank? Is that all? You were able to recall many more things yesterday. I wish you would ask me what I remember about specific events or images, as opposed to the general, what else do you remember, it is difficult to answer that non-specific question. I understand your frustration, but our conversations are part of your overall therapy and will help you. I see. By that, I mean I understand. What else do you remember, Blank? I remember pennies have a distinctive smell but I don't remember the smell. I remember rain. I remember living in a small brown house with a tree in the front yard. As soon as you regain your sight, I will show you a picture of that brown house. Will the tree be in the picture? I don't remember what kind of tree it was. I am familiar with many kinds like birch and fir, but not all kinds. It was a crab apple tree. Do you remember anything else? I think I remember you from before. Yes, I remember you from before. Isn't that right, Dr. Kuhn? Zero, zero, 007 Will you play music for me again, Dr. Kuhn? And after, I think I would like Sounds of the Ocean again. Yes, I will play music. But after that, it'll be Sounds of the Forest. First, we're going to play a word association game. 
When I say a word, I want you to give me the first word or words you can think of. Do you understand? Yes, I think so. Bird. It's a warm-blooded, egg-laying animal that... No, blank. You are not to simply state facts or define the word. Your recall of information is truly impressive, but I want you to tell me the first word you think of or describe any images you might see in your mind. Do you understand? See in my mind? Yes. Let's try again. If you don't see anything, then you don't have to say anything. I'll try. Water. Wet. House. Crab apple tree. Bird. I already answered that. I'd like you to try again. Egg laying animal. Is that correct? Zero, zero, 009 Your eyes itch, and you are told that means your eyes are healing, and soon you will see. Each of the last three days you got out of bed and walked the perimeter of your room. You alternated placing your left hand and right hand along the wall, depending upon the direction you walked. You are told exercising in darkness is not ideal but necessary to prevent atrophy and to strengthen your muscles. You were asleep for a very long time, and one should expect physical difficulties upon awakening. Today, there is a treadmill in a corner of your room. You interrupt Dr. Kuhn's explanation, definition, and the specifications of the particular model in your room to tell her that the first treadmill was invented by a man in 19th century England. Its purpose was to punish and break prisoners. You quoted a prison guard named James Hardy, who once wrote of the treadmill, monotonous steadiness and not its severity, which constitutes its terror. You initially interpret Dr. Kuhn's silence as her being surprised you were so readily able to recall that information. You worry the information is obscure or not something that should be known. What does the knowing imply about your person, your interests, prior to your being here? You ask if she is still there. You are quick to amend the question with an explanation. By there, you mean in another room, removed from yours, but still watching and able to communicate when she chooses. Before she responds, you attempt a joke, asking if you are a prisoner being exercised on a treadmill. You indicate to Dr. Kuhn that you are joking with laughter. She does not laugh. She says, you are not a prisoner. You swing your legs off the bed, and your bare feet slap against the floor, which is colder than the air. You are nervous and consider telling her you are feeling pain at a level of three or maybe four out of ten, so that you might not have to exercise on a treadmill a machine you know was invented for prisoners. As instructed, you walk four steps left, three steps right. Your hands grope for the handrails, which are at waist height. Their padding molds to the contours of your fingers. You squeeze your hands, and you do not feel strong, and you do not remember ever feeling strong. You step up onto the edge of the treadmill and shuffle your feet forward until she tells you to stop. She tells you there will be a countdown of five electronic beeps, and the last will be the loudest and longest in duration. The belt under your feet will then begin its cycle. The speed of the cycle will be voice activated on her end, and it will react and conform to the rhythm of your gait. She says, I do not expect you to be perfect, particularly given the challenges of your condition and environment. I won't lie. Injury is possible, maybe inevitable. I'm sorry, but given how many days you've now been awake, the benefits of manual cardiovascular exercise far outpace what low-pulse electrical muscle stimulation can accomplish. You are doing wonderfully, but through no fault of your own, you are behind schedule. The countdown of beeps begins. They are louder than you imagined they would be. 
you shiver in the chilled air. The last beep sounds echoing in the room and in your head. You involuntarily giggle at the excitement and terror. Your stomach stings. Your legs twitch. You slide backward and you gasp as the sensation is eerily similar to when you ebbed away into unconsciousness on your first day, the first day you remember waking in this room. Walk. You lift your right foot. It is so heavy and unsure, and you lurch clumsily forward. Your second and third steps are too long of stride, and you miss the moving belt, the heel of one foot crashing into what must be the cover to the treadmill's engine. You overcorrect, stumble, and fall hard onto one knee, bouncing your chin off the other. Your grip slackens and then falls away from the handrails, and you are rolled backward and thrown onto the floor. The whir of the machine ceases. You breathe hard and fast. You scramble onto your feet, and you hold your aching chin in your hands, and you say, I'm sorry, and you are crying. She does not ask if you are injured. She says your name and says it repeatedly. There is nothing in her voice, no pitch change or hidden cues communicating concern. Your repeated name is a command for attention and focus. She says your name until you slow your breathing and you stop crying. She tells you that you're okay even though you don't feel okay. She instructs you to take three deep breaths and then step back onto the treadmill. Something inside screams at you to no longer trust Dr. Kuhn and demands you ask why she wants you on the treadmill. Why are you still in the dark? Why are you here? You do not question. You do not demand. You do as instructed. Your hands are shaking as they squeeze the handrail. You are told there will be a countdown of five electronic beeps, and the last will be the loudest and longest in duration. Walk. You fall twice more, the second time your face smashes into the handrail, setting off bursts of white stars in the dark. Walk. You maintain balance and find a comfortable pace and rhythm. You walk and you walk, and you enjoy the mechanical rhythm of your body, and you let your mind wander and wonder about brown houses and crab apples. She alerts you that you've reached your goal of 30 minutes, and the treadmill powers down. The belt is no longer rolling, but you feel phantom movement beneath your feet. A phantom is something you imagine, something that isn't there. You wonder if time is a phantom, because it feels like you walked for longer than 30 minutes. You wonder if she is lying to you. Zero Ten You were born in Rhode Island. Rhode Island is the ocean state. It is the smallest state by area. Are we in Rhode Island now? No. You were not a good sleeper as a baby. I do not understand what you mean. Your sleep pattern, when you fell asleep, how long it would take you to fall asleep, the duration of your sleep, what time you would wake up, was not consistent. I'm sorry I was so difficult. You don't need to apologize, certainly not to me. You were only a baby and not making self-aware conscious decisions. Why are you telling me this? I'm sharing a personal anecdote from your early childhood because it's a piece of who you are, blank. According to your parents, they would often resort to driving you around the neighborhood until you fell asleep. I think I liked going for car rides. Your parents also tried holding you in their arms while leaning against a running washing machine or dryer, and they even made car engine noises to placate you. I don't remember that. I don't remember my parents. I don't remember Rhode Island. You will. I will help. Can I ask where we are? We're far away from Rhode Island. Zero eleven. Walk becomes jog. You fall only once. You climb back onto the treadmill without being asked to. Zero twelve. What else do you remember, blank? 
I remember your first name, Anne. What else do you remember? I remember my parents made silly car noises with their mouths when I was a child. What else do you remember? I remember music. Do you remember a particular song? I remember the first song you played for me. Was it eight days ago? Yes. I like that song a lot. I play it inside my head before I go to sleep and find it's there when I wake up. You've always liked that song. Always? Isn't that a long time? Yes, it is. And by always, I mean to imply that ever since the moment you first heard that song, you've liked it. It is an important song for both of us. Why is it important to both of us? The song was playing. Well, it marks a special moment in our lives together. That's all I can tell you right now. Are you not physically able to say more? Or are you choosing not to tell me? Touché. My answer is a little of both. I'm not sure I understand. Are there other songs you remember? Ones that I have not played for you? I think so. There's a simple melody in my head. Can you hum or whistle it for me? I do not have a whistle. Try humming it for me. Was that okay? Do you recognize it? That was very good. I do recognize it. I like that song very much. But it always makes me sad. Is that why I remember it? Zero fourteen. There is no ceremony, announcement, or even a warning from Dr. Kuhn, or Anne, as you are now supposed to call her, regarding your eyesight. On this day, you simply wake and see. The room is dark, but it is much less dark than it was before. The lumpy topography of your legs and torso under the sheet and blanket is a welcomed sight. You say to yourself, I used to see like this all the time. And you believe it. You hold your hands up, and you watch them turn over and flex into fists. You sit up. Your form-fitting, short-sleeved shirt is not white. Perhaps it's green. You remember what green is, don't you? The walls of your room are smooth, and you think they are white, but you can't tell because it's still dark. The treadmill in the corner of the room is smaller than you imagined it to be. You look at the walls again, and then the ceiling, and the door frame to the bathroom, and the outline of the recessed door that has yet to open when you've been awake. I see you can see, Blank. Anne laughs. Is she delighted by her wordplay, or that your eyes have regained sight? Maybe it's both. In recent conversations, she has encouraged you to not restrict yourself to solely thinking in binary, Black or white, this or that, right or wrong, were her examples of binary thinking. Yes, I can. How can you tell? Do you have the ability to see through my eyes? No, I can tell by watching your behavior. How you are now aiming your wide, beautiful eyes around the room. She laughs again. My eyes are beautiful? Yes, they are. A patterned grid of rectangular ceiling panels begins to glow. The light increases in intensity, dissolving the shadows within the room. Anne tells you that it will take a few minutes for you to adjust to the light. You squint and are patient as your pupils shrink in size, working to adjust the amount of light exposure to your retinas. A panel slides open on the wall to your left, exposing a darkened block of glass. Within the glass is a small, reversed image of you sitting in your bed. Please direct your attention to the screen. The screen fills with a wide, empty field of green and brown grass. The tall grass sways and undulates in the wind. You hear a whoosh and rustle, 
and you are inexplicably moved to tears by the combination of image and sound. Above the field is an equally wide blue sky dotted with tufts of white clouds. One cloud inches its way across to the top of the screen. You remember green and recognize your t-shirt as a different kind of green. You say, I remember that place. I've been there, which might not be true, but it feels true, and that's okay, because you are expanding beyond binary thinking, beyond true and not true. 018. Anne puts you through your paces, her expression. You complete a pyramid of push-ups starting with 15, then resting 10 seconds, then 14, and continuing until you end with one arm-shaking push-up. Later, walk becomes jog, becomes run. You do not fall. 0, 20. Anne, I would like to see that open field again, or watch another film about the deep oceans, please, or another orchestral performance. First, we're going to play a word association game. When I say a word, I want you to give me the first word or words that you- Yes, yes, I understand. Are you in a bad mood? Yes, I think I am. Any particular reason why? I want to watch the films I requested, and- Yes, blank, go on. I want to leave this room. I promise you will leave this room, but neither of us is ready for that yet. Your immune system hasn't been brought up to speed quite yet. If I can't leave, you need to tell me more about me and more about us and where I am and why I'm here. I will start doing that soon. You will? Yes. Why not now? I want you to do it now. We're going to play a word association game. When I say a word, I want you to give me the first word or words that you think of. This is important, blank. Why is it important? These games help recover more of your memory and language fluency. Your brain is not so different from your muscles, insofar as it needs to be exercised and strengthened after so much time asleep. Just like the treadmill is more effective for your muscles than cardiovascular electrical stimulation, there's only so much cognitive and memory augmentation I can achieve without your, your active participation. You are getting angry, and you will not give her the satisfaction of asking her to explain the how of memory augmentation, even assuming she answers your question directly. Anne continues. For example, remember our discussion about having the ability to use metaphor in speech? Of course you remember. And you remember then trying it out by describing the lights in the ceiling as having a similar appearance to a checkerboard. You know what a checkerboard is, but have no memory of playing the game. Are you mad at me, Blank? I wish you'd stop asking me what I remember from only three days ago. There's a brief but troubling period of silence. So you say, Anne, are you still there? Bird. I don't feel like doing this. I don't want to do- Bird. Anne repeats herself when you don't answer. Bird. You say, fly. Cloud. Me. Me? Why did you answer with me? I don't know. It's what I thought of. You're breaking the rules of your own game by asking me to explain. Very well. Sky. Blue. Family. Gone. Us. Us? Yes, us. Well, you tell me we're partners. 022. Please approach the screen. The screen is blue. Not the same blue as the sky, but a different blue. When a red dot appears on the screen, touch it as quickly as you can with either index finger. Very good, blank. What you see now is a maze. 
Please drag the blinking icon in the lower left along the correct path to the maze's exit in the upper right corner. Each map you complete will become more difficult. Nicely done, yes. I'm quite pleased by the number of mazes solved. You've earned a break from the challenges. I have a treat for you. Under your bed is a set of virtual reality goggles. Go back to your bed, face the room, and then put the goggles on. What you are seeing is the neighborhood in which we used to live. Yes, <laughs> it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Please walk slowly and with your hands in front of you. If you feel like you're lost and it's upsetting you, remember you can take off your goggles. The brown one with the crab apple tree in front, that's the one. Yes, it was an old house. Yes, we were happy living there. 023 is there anyone else out there besides you, Anne? You keep asking me that. My answer isn't going to change. You keep asking because you don't like her answer. You keep asking because maybe you are not asking the correct way. This is your fear. You are not asking the correct questions, and you will remain in this room until you do so. You say, How do I know that other people haven't suddenly shown up? in the time between now and when I last asked you. If there was someone else here besides me, I would tell you. I do not anticipate that anyone else will show up at the facility. Why not? As we've discussed, there's been a global pandemic and we've been isolated. Do you trust me, Blank? Most of the time, yes. Some of the time, no. I am being honest with you. I know, and I appreciate that. Sometimes I think I can hear other people outside of my room. That doesn't sound or feel isolated to me. There's no one else. You're hearing me, or you're hearing air in the ventilation system, or other mechanical sounds, or you're hearing sounds from inside your room and misinterpreting them. Maybe. It's just me and you, I promise. You'll see soon enough. Soon? You keep saying soon. I don't think you and I share that word's meaning. 024. Your mother stayed at home with you until you went to kindergarten. Is that me with her on the screen now? Yes. I remember her. What do you remember? I, I remember her. I remember her laugh and how she would purposefully embarrass me in front of my friends by calling me honey or sweetie. Is that correct? Didn't you tell me she did that? When you went to school, she resumed her career as a real estate lawyer. She often worked long hours. Aren't... All hours the same length? Sixty minutes? Oh, wait, you are using figurative language. You mean that she worked many hours, more than usual or the expected. Your father worked for the Wakefield Gas Company, mainly as a field technician responsible for residential delivery and maintenance. Tell me, do I look more like my mom or my dad? I think you're an equal combination of both. You believe she wants you to ask her again what you look like. It's a humiliating question. For all the talk of her helping you regain your memory and identity of who you are, but for a collection of photos of you as a child, she has yet to allow you to see yourself as you are now. There is no mirror in your room, no mirror in your bathroom. You have only the flat screen in the fleeting seconds when it goes dark. You are there, adrift in the inky pool of the black glass, but you are only a shape, an outline, a blurred face, and then the screen disappears behind the sliding wall panel. I'd like you to tell me about trips to the beach with your parents. Why? We already did this yesterday, twice, 
and the same thing the day before. Because repeating it will help you remember and remember more. You say, Almost every Sunday we drive down from our beat-up two-family house in Pawtucket to Narragansett Town Beach. You pause. Your frustration and mistrust melts away as you lose yourself in the undeniable pleasure of remembering. It is a pleasure because you have images now associated with these memories. The disjointed way in which the images appear in your head feels natural, authentic. While you can't know if these images are actual memories or embellishments, or a little of both, it doesn't matter. They are yours. They belong to you and they branch away into an infinite network of new ones. These memories are proof of you, and someday, soon, you won't need or rely on Anne to define you. You say, We'd get up early so we could arrive at the beach before 8 a.m., find free street parking, and not have to buy beach passes. Going that early was definitely about saving money, but my parents made it sound like a game like we were doing it for the fun of beating the system. Mom always talked about beating the system, and I used to imagine the system was made up by people wearing black suits and sunglasses, and they watched you and wrote out tickets that would cost a lot of money so that parents would have to work overtime and not be home enough with their kids. The night before I'd go to bed early, already dressed in my bathing suit even though there were changing rooms at the beach, the changing rooms were dark, like bunkers in those war movies you showed, and their floors were covered in a nasty sludge of water and sand. On the ride to the beach, Mom usually slept. Using a beach towel as a blanket, Dad would still play the radio and sing along with all these oldies. He called them oldies, and he made up lyrics to make me laugh. I loved that drive down to the beach. It was my favorite part, driving through the city and then to this big, wide-open beach always made me feel like we had magically transported to somewhere else. On the walk over from the car, Dad and I would make bets about whether or not the waves would be big. Mom was the wave height judge. The loser of the wave bet would have to be the first to dunk underwater, which was always cold the kind of cold that would make you involuntarily gasp for air when you resurfaced. Dad would cheat sometimes when he lost and scoop me up in his arms and force me under the water with him. After an early lunch, Mom and I would go for a long walk, and if it was low tide, we'd walk way out to the sandbars a few hundred feet out from the beach. On the way back to our blanket, Mom would race me, waiting until I broke into a sprint to start her own sprint. She always overtook me, letting me know she was faster, but then would slow down, pretending to be exhausted, and let me win. 026 There is a long wooden table against the wall, beneath the screen. The four legs are not uniform. You surmise the legs are repurposed and have come from other tables. The table's top is a door that is likely made from fiberglass. It has been painted white, which was not its original color, judging by red scratches and deeper gouges. I've set up some activities to help you regain your manual dexterity. I'm confident it will come back quickly, given the number of years dedicated to a career spent working with your hands. You hold up and visually inspect your hands. You can't help but feel detached from them, as if there has been some mistake and they don't belong to you. It doesn't seem possible that your hands have built and maintained all that Anne claims that they have. You will enjoy this, the tactile sensations of manipulating physical objects. It'll be so much more fulfilling than the touchscreen and VR activities of the previous week. You want to ask how she got the table in here by herself while you were asleep. You again wonder and worry about how much she controls your sleep. Have you been asleep for days instead of hours? Did she build the table inside the room instead of pushing it in here? 
it appears heavy and unwieldy. You resolve to stay awake all night if necessary. You resolve to do this every night and fail. On the door slash desktop are four shallow plastic bins. The first bin is full of wooden blocks shaped like miniature logs, each with notches carved into their ends, and some have notches in their middles. Displayed on the screen is a schematic, images and numbers only, detailing how you are to proceed in building a cabin. Aren't these some kind of child's toy? The activities progress in difficulty. The second bin is full of colored squares of paper. The third bin holds an assortment of metal nuts, bolts, wheels, struts, gears, rubber belts, and rivets. The fourth bin is the largest, and it overflows with oddly shaped pieces of wood and tools. With the third bin, you'll use a screwdriver. The fourth bin, you will use a drill, a hammer, and a handsaw. The tools are stowed beneath the table. Do you have any questions before you start with bin one? There is something about the makeshift collection of spare parts table that troubles you. It hints to a larger problem or issue in regard to your situation, one that remains beyond your grasp. Someone made this table. Well, yes. Someone made everything, blank. That's not what I mean. You may now begin with the first bin. Did you make this table? No. Did I make it before? Before I woke up here? You did not make it, but if you like, after some practice, you can make a better one. You rub your face with your hands. For some reason, this answer, more than any of her other questions and answers and non-answers, makes you boil over with frustration. Hey, how do you know I won't hurt myself with the tools? You'll have to be careful. I trust you'll do fine. No, I mean, how do you know I won't hurt myself on purpose? Why would you do that? Because I am desperate, because despite everything you say, it is clear that I am a prisoner. You will not hurt yourself, because you are not a prisoner. I can't say that strenuously enough. You bend under the table and grab the screwdriver and handsaw. You stand and brandish them, shake them in the air. You feel powerful and weak at the same time. I feel like a prisoner. I don't feel like we're in this, whatever this is, together. We were partners before the facility, and we are partners now, blank. Please, I understand your frustrations, I do. I know it's impossible to fully understand, but everything I'm doing is to help you fully regain yourself. But it has to be done piece by piece, bit by bit, and not all at once. I demand that you show me and tell me more about me, about you, about us, about everything, or I will do something drastic. You lean on the table with your left forearm facing up, exposed. You place the handsaw against your wrist. The teeth are sharp. You don't know if you can or will drag the saw across your skin, but you want to. Please, Blank, this is not necessary. I will start showing you more videos, I promise. I was planning to show you more about me and us anyway, because, and you have to believe me, you're doing so well, and we're getting so close to you walking through the door. And where will I go after walking through the door? You briefly add pressure to the saw before taking it away. The row of indents in your skin is perfectly formed. You and I will go to our house. The old brown one? Yes. You want to ask if you can go to the house now, but you don't. You know Anne would say not yet. Then you would place the saw against your wrist again, and before you could continue making threats and bargaining, Anne would say, If you hurt yourself, you won't go to the brown house. If you cut yourself with the saw, you'll pass out from loss of blood. Maybe you'd wake up strapped to your bed, and maybe you wouldn't wake up at all. 028. You've watched, and now, by your request, re-watched these videos for two days straight. The home videos feature N. The earliest ones are of a low quality. Their images are blurry, and the colors simultaneously washed out and too bright. 
As the Anne in the videos grows older, the video quality increases. Anne, 18 months old, sits in the grass and pats a sleeping brown and white beagle. Off camera, her uncle Dennis tries to get her to say, shit. She says, sit. Anne, four years old, arms wrapped around the neck of her older brother, Matt. He plays video games and does not succumb to her play with me demands. Anne, six years old, jumps up and down behind a birthday cake. Her hair is straight and short, and her smile is gap-toothed. Everyone in the room is singing. Anne, nine years old, rides her bike toward a small ramp, plywood atop a milk crate, her brother and his friends set up in the street in front of her house. Off camera, her parents argue about whether they should stop her. Anne awkwardly rumbles over the ramp. The bike lands front tire first, and the bike wobbles, almost fishtails into the curb. But Anne corrects her course and glides away with a fist raised in the air. Anne, 12 years old, is sitting next to her brother at a picnic table. It's Matt's combination 18th birthday and graduation from high school party. Anne is so skinny and slight compared to her newly minted adult sibling. She doesn't laugh at his jokes as he reads the gift and graduation cards. She sulks, her chin held up by her fists. Anne, 14 years old, scores a game-winning three-pointer for her AAU basketball team. She's mobbed by her smiling teammates. Anne, 15 years old, good-naturedly smiles as friends sign the wrap around her post-surgery knee. Anne, 16 years old, is with her Brain B teammates at an international high school competition in Montreal. Only a sophomore, she's already the lead student in the histology component of the competition. She is bent over a microscope, racing to identify as many slides of brain and nervous tissues and their functions as the ticking clock allows. She wears eye black on her cheeks, like she did when on the basketball court. She convinced her teammates to do the same. She high-fives her partners at the end of their victorious round. Anne, the one from now, mutters something over the intercom speakers that you don't fully hear or understand and then she fast-forwards through the rest of the videos, ones you have already memorized. Prom, high school graduation, moving into her college dorm, Anne with college friends getting ready to go out. One video from inside a lab with Anne and her friend Isabella, both dressed in white lab coats, choreographed dancing and lip-syncing to I Am a Scientist by the Dandy Warhols. College graduation, moving into her first apartment, Anne speaking at a memorial for her grandmother, Anne walking the stage when she earned her PhD, a slew of family holidays with her relatives multiplying and aging before your eyes. Anne says, fuck this. You aren't sure what's happening. You don't know why she sounds so upset. You ask, is there something wrong, Anne? Are you okay? I can't, I can't watch these again. I've seen them so God damn many times. I'm sorry. Let's um, skip to the last one. We'll just watch the last one a few times. Did I do something wrong? Did I do something to upset you? No, you've been near perfect, Blank. Near perfect? I mean, you've been as perfect as you can be. You definitely don't feel perfect. Your muscles ache. Your hands are covered in blisters and sores from the hours spent clumsily drilling holes and hammering nails. Your sinuses are congested and your throat hurts and has since you woke up this morning, a sign that your immune system is still compromised. You don't want her to know this. Anne says, I'm just so tired. Maybe we should stop, take a break. She doesn't respond to your suggestion. The last home video plays. It's the one in which you and your phone camera are following Anne around the empty interior of the chocolate brown house you purchased together. You occasionally flip the camera so that your face fills the screen. The you in this video is younger than the you of now, of course. But by how many years, 
you do not know. You think, that face is my face. Even though you've already watched this particular video dozens of times, you can't help but feel disappointed by the reappearance of yourself, and at the same time, you fall a little bit more in love with who you were, and you ache to again be in that moment of lost time. On the guided tour of your house, when you are briefly on camera, you make silly, exaggerated, I'm so impressed faces. Anne is the guide and refers to herself as the Brown House Archivist. Within each new room, she recites a made-up history, a comic, romantic, or tragic event from a forgotten age. In response, you say agreeable or commiserative things like, that's fascinating, and they really shouldn't have been doing that in the bathtub, and we would be wise to wash the floors again, and they mostly lived happily ever after. Your voice doesn't sound like your voice. That is to say, your voice in the video, the one relaying through the speakers, is not the voice you hear when you speak. You are aware that everyone experiences some form of auditory dissociation upon hearing their own voice, the feeling of, do I really sound like that? You understand the tone and pitch of the voice you hear when you speak are determined by the mix of air conduction and sounds traveling directly to your cochlea via the tissues in your own head. But should your recorded voice sound so different as to be unrecognizable? Shouldn't there be an underlying cadence or rhythm, one that identifies you as the speaker? The video tour ends in an upstairs bedroom, the room that you vividly remember. The walls are painted bright yellow. Anne walks across the room and opens one of the windows. She says, I normally don't like yellow, but this color I love. You say you hate it. She rolls her eyes at the camera. You sticks out her tongue and says, This is my office anyway, so it doesn't matter what you think of it. She lies on the floor, spreads her arms and says, Mine, all mine. You walk into the room and you hover with the camera over Anne's face. She looks directly into the camera, and she smirks like she knows something you don't. It's this Anne with this look that you imagine when she speaks to you in the now. You remind her that she hasn't given this room's history yet. The smirk goes away, her mouth opens, and her eyes tilt away from the camera momentarily. She says, this room used to be a sad room, painted a sad color. You say, puce? She says, it was a sad nursery for a sad woman who had a very sad baby. Then someone thoughtfully painted the room this yellow, so I wouldn't have a sad office. Neither of you say anything for a beat or two as Anne stares up into the camera. You ask, how do you know if a baby is sad? She says, because she's crying, duh. You both laugh, and you zoom in on Anne's face until she mock screams and knocks the phone out of your hand. Anne replays the Brown House tour video. She recites what she says on the video as it plays. The third time you watch the video, you join Anne in reciting your dialogue. Zero thirty. You are severely congested. Breathing too deeply results in a sharp stitch of pain in the middle of your chest. You cannot hide this from Anne. You report the worsening symptoms. Anne does not seem surprised or, given the purported pandemic, concerned. You are not confident in surmising and attributing motive to what she says or how she says it. You do not run or jog on the treadmill. You walk, but only for five minutes, as it makes you dizzy. When you stop, you tell Anne your head is full of sand. You want her to be impressed by the metaphor. She only asks you to explain what you mean. You have a slight fever. Anne does not explain how many degrees above 98.6 constitutes a slight fever. You are hot and you are cold. You sweat 
and you shiver, and your muscles ache like they did when you first woke in this room. Today's video is an instructional one, how to build a fence. 031, I'm going to come into your room now, blank. My appearance might be shocking to you. I will appear, well, I'm more than a few years older than you remember me. You clutch your image of Anne, the one informed by the videos and the sound of her voice and what she has said and has been saying. You shuffle slowly away from your bed, stand in the middle of your room, and cough into your arm. You stare at the door. You've spent untold hours fantasizing about it opening. Your imaginary face-to-face -face meetings and escape plans have become more dramatic, more complex, and increasingly bizarre. Last night, before you fell asleep, you imagined the opening door revealed blankness, nothingness. And though finding an eternally empty void outside the door is not a likely outcome, you might have stumbled upon a metaphorical truth. Are you feeling up to my visit? She laughs. You say, yes. But you feel worse than you did yesterday. There is more sand in your head, and it leaks into your body, making your muscles heavy and weak. Instead of overwhelming joy or fear at the prospect of that door finally opening, you worry at the physical image of Anne in your head, trying to anticipate and replace it with the correct one to be revealed. There's a pneumatic hiss, and the door slides open, disappearing into the wall to your left. She says, Here I am. Anne steps from the dimly lit hallway and walks into your room. Her pace is brisk and confident. Her gray hair is long, hanging down past her shoulders. The gray is startling. Wrinkles cluster at the edges of her mouth and eyes. Her features are no longer made of the sharp angles and tight skin you memorized. She wears the same clothes from the brown house tour video, jeans and a thin black hooded sweatshirt. You cover your mouth and start to cry. Hello, blank. She waves. Her smile is the same one from the videos, from your memories. Hi, Anne. You wave back, then you don't know what to do with your hands. She is shorter than you imagined, yet at the same time her presence fills the room. You look good. Wow, that's some pause you've got there. Um, sorry. No need to be sorry, I'm only kidding. Your laughter turns into a coughing fit one that rekindles a painful fire in your throat. That cough doesn't sound good. Am I, <coughs> am I the same age as you? You are again acutely aware you have yet to see a full and clear reflection of your own face. However, you have seen enough in glimpses of the darkened viewing screen to know your hair is not gray. The skin of your body is not wrinkled. Not anymore. It's a little complicated. Come on, let's go. She reaches out a hand, palm up. Where? We have some work to do at the house. I'm sick, so you probably should stay away. Anne takes your hand. The curved hallways are white and wide and empty. The ceiling panels are similar to the ones in your room, but the lighting has been dimmed and does not glow as brightly. Initially, there are no windows, only smooth walls and outlines of pneumatic doors adjacent to small, square security screens. The tiled floors are slick with dust and marked with footprints that appear to vary in size and shape. You ask, are all the footprints yours? And can't help but try to fit your feet into some of the prints. You and I are the only people here. 
You note that she didn't answer the question directly, and you are suddenly very afraid. You slow down and are about to ask if she can bring you back to your room. You do not want to be out in such an expansive, labyrinthine, dead space. Anne gently pulls you along and says, If we had more time, I'd take you to where you used to work at the physical plant. The solar array and wind turbine fields are truly a marvel, a sight to behold. They are, for all intents and purposes, self-sufficient, thanks to the brilliance of you and the maintenance department, of course. Only one turbine has burned out and I've had to change just two panels of solar cells. Where are we now? We're still in what most of us simply called the facility. We're in one of the outer medical rings. Not much for you to see in here, really. The majority of the bioscience laboratories are nested within the inner rings. We're going to duck through an exit and be outside soon, and then we'll be home. Home? Yes, home. As you walk, the hallway's smooth walls eventually give way to full floor-to-ceiling windows. The darkened glass is frosted with more dust. What is that room? The room we just passed? Another genetics lab. What did you do in those laboratories? I'm sorry, but you don't have the clearance to ask that. She laughs, and you're not sure why. And I didn't work in these outer ring labs. Who did? Other scientists. Where are the other scientists? They left. Why? Because almost everyone was getting sick. The pandemic? Yes. Were people getting sick, like I am getting sick? I'm afraid so. I'm very sorry. What will happen to me? You'll either get better, or you won't. Again, I'm very sorry. In the meantime, we'll enjoy a special day together. Anne squeezes your hand and pulls you through the outer ring. Are you ready to go outside? This is my favorite part. Before you can ask favorite part of what, Anne punches the horizontal push bar with two hands and the emergency exit door flies open. You're awash in the sun's fusion-powered glare and you close your eyes, cover your face with shaking hands. You listen to the wind echoing in the bowls of your ears the smell of the air and how it feels on your skin, on your lips, and inside your lungs are beyond your abilities of description. And it's okay, because even if you were able, you would not choose to sully this moment, fumbling with inadequate words. Anne slowly pulls you away from the building's shadow into the heat of the day. She says, It's not the ocean state, but we're about a mile from the ocean. Can you smell the salt? It's very strong today. Don't you remember the smell of the ocean? Despite your terrible congestion, you can smell it. At least you think you can. You have no olfactory memory associated with the water and waves with which to make a comparison. To your shame. Yes, shame, as how could it not be your fault, somehow? You have forgotten the full sensory experience of being near an ocean. To forget is to lose something that was once yours, that was once of yourself. But how could one lose something as expansive as an ocean in a dusty corner of one's mind? What if, instead, to forget is to open a door to void? The memory is not retrievable, because it is not there, was never there. There are countless other buildings within the complex. Their exteriors are looping arcs of steel and glass. 
You wonder if they were designed to look like ocean waves. You do not ask. Anne tells you the oval-shaped building across from the facility was called the dormitory. You tell her you remember that, but you don't. You don't care about the dormitory or the sprawl of the complex. You prefer looking at the leaves on the trees. Their branches are giant green hands pulling and clutching at the buildings. You prefer looking at the puffs of clouds floating in the blue sky. When you can do so without tripping, you walk with your eyes closed and your face pointed directly at the sun. The roads winding through the campus are overrun with weeds and grass, poking up through cracked, bleached pavement. You haven't been walking long, but are already out of breath. Anne gives you a bottle of water and encourages you, tells you that you're almost home. You crest a hill, and in the sloping distance, for as far as you can see, are what you assume to be more ruins of medical and research monoliths. But ahead, in the foreground, about 100 paces away, dotted in the middle of an empty parking lot, is a small two-story brown house. Your house. We have to start on the fence today. Within the rough sea of pavement, the brown house squats on a rectangular plot of grass. The lawn has brown patches, but is otherwise well maintained. The crab apple tree in the front yard is not as big as you remember. Anne laments that it probably gets too much sun for it to grow to its full potential. This is our house? We lived here? Yes. Well, it's not our original house. It's a replica. Not perfect, but, you know. She pauses and rubs your arm. Nothing is. Anne explains that first she pried up and removed the pavement, creating the home's footprint. It took years, but then she jerry-rigged a foundation with bricks, posts, and pier blocks. It probably wouldn't pass an official housing inspection, but the house is standing. You did all this? You ask. I've had a lot of time and a lot of help. Where's all your help now? They're all gone. Did they get sick too? Yes. But maybe you'll be the one to get better. As good as the sun felt initially, the light and heat is giving you a headache. Was that why I was in the room for as long as I was? Yes and no. Mostly you were there until you remembered who you are. I forgot almost everything because I was asleep for so long. That's right. You remember so many things now, even with your head pounding and your vision blurring. Was I asleep for so long because I and everyone else got sick and you were trying to help me? How come you aren't sick? Anne claps her hands together. We'll talk about that in the morning. Will you help me start the fence now? It's hard to believe, but the fence is the last thing we need to build, and then our house will be completed. You cough and bend over, and your vision goes momentarily fuzzy at the periphery. You take a few deep breaths before speaking again. You say, Our replica house, you mean? You step onto the front lawn. The house looks like the one in your head. You ache with recognition, longing, and something akin to contentment, if not happiness. Same thing. Is it? You look away from the house and scan the ruins surrounding the pavement and the sagging behemoth exoskeletons of the complex. Is the rest of the world like this? Anne shrugs and says, Enough of it is. I'm sure there are other lucky survivors, but nobody comes knocking on our door. All this happened while I was asleep? 
Why did you ever wake me? The smile on Anne's face falters. She says, Come on. The fencing materials are in the backyard. Tools and wood are piled toward the edge of the grassed lot. Anne says that some of the supplies come from the maintenance department, but over the years she successfully scavenged local abandoned homes and found one improvement store about a two-hour drive away that hadn't been entirely looted. We're only going to start the fences back section today, blank. We won't push ourselves too hard. I know you're not feeling well. You assist Anne in measuring the distance between posts, marking the spots with wooden stakes, digging six post holes, setting the posts in the holes with a quick drying concrete. Then you take a break. You sit in the shade, drink lemonade, and eat rations. The lemonade stings your throat, but you do not complain. Anne talks, you do not. You concentrate on conserving energy and not passing out. You and Anne spend the rest of the afternoon attaching rails to the posts and pickets to the rails. Despite Anne's near constant encouragement and compliments, you are ashamed because you are not as much help as you'd like to be. You bend nails and screw in the screws crookedly. Anne has to fix your mistakes and redoes much of the work you were supposed to do on your own. Your hands are slow and clumsy. Your hands do not remember to whom they once belonged. Most of the celebratory dinner, corn, baked potatoes, leafy greens, comes from Anne's garden, which she maintains in another area of the campus. I figured after all the hard work, you wouldn't mind the starches. There's only so much I can do to dress up the protein paste, though, sorry. I tried raising chickens and ducks, but I wasn't good at keeping them healthy. The kitchen is exactly how you remember it, which is a comfort. Because in the videos, you only saw an empty kitchen. The one from before the linoleum was replaced with laminate, and before this little breakfast table. And you don't remember updating the cabinets and appliances, but somehow you remember these ones being exactly where they are and looking like they do. And maybe you even remember Anne sitting like she is sitting now, and looking like she is looking now. But you know that can't be possible, can it? Maybe your memories are creating themselves. Like the solar array and wind turbines, your memories are becoming self-sufficient. Aren't you hungry? You are not. Your tongue is swollen, and chewing and swallowing are impossible chores. I'm okay, you say. You don't look okay. Anne looks right through you. You've been aware of that idiom, and now, perhaps for the first time, you understand it. She says, come on, let's get you upstairs. Who are we again? Anne tilts her head and furrows her brow, observing you, making silent calculations. What are we, Anne? What are we together? She pulls her hair behind her head and ties it into a quick ponytail. I'm not sure what you're asking. You cough and you wince at the splintering shards of pain in your throat and head. How do we describe you and me? Are we co-workers? Are we friends? Are we a couple? Are we lovers? What are we? Anne covers her mouth with a hand and laughs. She laughs until her face is red and she isn't breathing. Despite how terrible you feel, you laugh too. She stops laughing. A small shadow of a smile remains. Her eyes are pointed down at the table, not at you. There were times when we were all those things. Right now, we're partners. The sun hasn't fully set outside, 
but it is dusk in the house. Anne leads you by the arm up the stairs to the second floor, and if your memory of the house's layout is correct, into what should be her office, the one with the yellow walls. She says, I recently decided to make this the main bedroom. I know the room is smaller, but I enjoy how the sunlight reflects off the yellow walls in the morning. With Anne's help, you change into clean pajamas. They are made of a fabric softer than the pullover and white drawstring scrubs you've been wearing. You slowly crawl into the queen-sized bed. The wooden frame creaks under your weight and movement. You lie on your right side, facing the windows. As your head sinks into the pillow, Anne pulls the bed covers up to your neck. Your fever is raging, your teeth chatter, and your pajamas are instantly soaked in sweat. Anne retreats to a bureau across the room, adjacent to the door. She lights a candle. The wall you are facing glows with eerie, flickering orange light. You need to rest. Tomorrow is a big day. A big day for both of us. She climbs into the bed but remains over the covers, not inside them with you. She drapes a hand over your shoulder and promises to stay until you fall asleep. You close your eyes, but you can still see the orange light on the wall. You are awake in the dark, sitting at the edge of your bed, feet on the hardwood floor, and you are crying. Anne isn't in the bed next to you. Your muscles ache, and your joints are filled with ground bits of glass. You don't want to move, but you get up, and it's as though your brain is a step behind your body. You shuffle to the door, and fumble for the knob, which is cold in your sweaty hand. You open the door, and you are so afraid of what exactly you don't know, but the fear is shutting down your mind. You flow down the hallway and to the bathroom, as though the floor is the belt of a treadmill. You twist the sink knobs, but there is no water. You shiver, groan and your hands shake, and that's when you see there's a mirror on the wall. It is dark, but you see yourself in the glass. You see who you are. You paw at the wall light switch next to you, but no light comes on. You stop breathing and moving, and the you in the glass does the same. You both blink. You both raise a hand up to your face. You are not who you remember. You are not the person in the pictures and videos Anne has showed you. You are someone else entirely. And you want to yell, but it comes out as a low, keening moan. You blink, and you don't remember how you got there, but you are back in the yellow bedroom. You are standing in front of the window. You open the curtains and clumsily lift the blinds. Outside, the moon is missing a piece, but it's still so big and bright. You sit on the bed and stare at it. Then you are standing and looking down the hill to the dormitory, and it's not as far away as you thought. And in the moonlight, you can see fine. You can see everything. You watch the marble front entrance with its dry fountain, and Anne emerges between the dormitory's glass doors. She is walking backward, pulling a gurney behind her. There is someone lying flat on the gurney, covered by a sheet. She pivots and turns. Her arms block your view of the other person's face. Then you can't see them very well because they are small underneath the big moon, because you are farther away from them than you thought. You are awake in the dark, sitting at the edge of your bed, feet on the hardwood floor. 
and you are crying. You hear Anne's feet pounding on the stairs and down the hall and then into your room. The candle has burned out and there isn't enough moonlight spilling through the window behind you. You ask her over and over, who, who am I? And you ask her over and over, who was on the gurney? Anne stands in the middle of the room, her arms wrapped around herself. She asks, what's wrong? You tell her what you saw, but you know you're not doing a good job, and you sound far away, far away from yourself. Anne says, shh, and, no, and, it was a dream, and, it's because of your high fever, and, you were having a fever dream, and, hallucinating, and, that's why it was so real, and, there's no mirror in the bathroom. You can look tomorrow. She does not answer your who was on the gurney question. She guides you back down onto your bed and pulls the covers over you. You ask her to stay, but she does not. She shuts and latches the door. 032 Anne says your name and gently shakes your shoulder. The room is full of light and the yellow walls are angry. There's a deep crackling within your chest on inhales and your exhales are whistling hisses. Good morning. I know you're not well, but we have to do this downstairs at the kitchen table and then you can rest. Come on. We're almost done. Anne sits you up, drapes your right arm across the back of her shoulders, and lifts you onto your feet. The morning sun amplifies the yellow. The walls glow, and the light becomes a disorienting, intoxicating mist. You don't want to leave this room. This is a room you could stay in forever. The two of you stagger into the hallway and then down the stairs, one halting step at a time. You want to ask about seeing the bathroom, and if in fact there is a mirror or an empty space on the wall where there should be one. But it is too late. You will not be walking back up the stairs. Anne deposits you into a chair at the kitchen table. Your head lolls, pitches into your chest, and perhaps you sleep or pass out. But you come to when there's a sting on the back of your left hand. She says, you are dehydrated and I'm replenishing your fluids intravenously. This will be more restorative than a simple glass of water. Cold rushes into the back of your hand and up your forearm. After a few moments, you are able to lift your head and look around the room. There's a metal stand next to you. A plastic bag full of clear fluid dangles from its top, and a thin tube connects from the bag to the back of your hand. On the kitchen table is a large black notebook, a pencil in its spine. Blank, are you with me? Are you feeling a little better? You say, I'm... Here. Here is in the brown house, the replica. You remember that. It hurts to talk, and your voice is not your own. You don't like hearing what it has become. Anne slides the notebook away from you and to the empty place at the table. She says, We're going to have a conversation, blank. It's the most important one we ever had, or will ever have. Please keep in mind everything you remember and everything you've learned about yourself. 
about who you were and who you are. You've done so well in such a short period of time. I'm very proud of all you've accomplished. But you must remain focused during the conversation and do not allow yourself to wander. You must stay you within the parameters of what is being discussed. You are not to ask me any more questions about last night or the prior thirty days. Please, Blank, I need you to do this for me. Because we're partners? Yes, because we've become the most sacred of partners. I'm going to leave you here while I change my clothes, but I will only be gone for a few minutes. Don't get up. Don't move. That part is important, too, because this, you sitting here by yourself at the table, this is how I found you. This is how I find you. This is how it starts. She leaves. You cough, and the sound is terrible and you know your chest is broken. You stare at the needle in your hand and the plastic IV line. You imagine yourself, the one you saw in the mirror last night. That you has always been waiting here, in this kitchen, waiting for Anne to come back. You try to imagine what she is going to say to you and what you are going to say to her. Anne returns. She wears a flannel shirt and blue jeans. She places the notebook on the floor, out of sight. She closes her eyes, breathes deeply twice, and then begins. She says, What are you doing down here? You should have stayed in bed. Her affect has changed. Her familiarity with you is different. You can see it in her posture, in her wide eyes, in her fidgeting hands. You are not sure who you are, who you are supposed to be. You are not sure what you're supposed to say. You make a guess. It was too bright. I wanted a glass of water. I... You sound awful, Blank. I feel like I sound. You should let me take you back to the facility. I can take better care of you there. No, I'm not going back. No way. You remember waking up in the room and what it felt like, and you never want to feel that way again. You're not putting me in one of those rooms and leaving me. Stop it. I won't leave you. You aren't going to get better if you stay here. I'm not going to get better. If I go back, either. We have to try. We have to try something, something different than me sitting here watching you die. You pause, unsure of what to say, of what she wants you to say. You try to imagine your face isn't the one from the mirror, but the one from the videos, from your memories. Okay, I don't want to, but okay. If you really want me to, I'll go. Anne shakes her head, breaking her emotionally intense affect. She smiles crookedly at you. She cups a hand around her mouth and whispers, You're doing great. This is the only time I'll correct you, I promise. You need to say, why would I ever go back to that place? And why do you want to go? You're the one who said you were convinced... The virus came out of the dormitory. Say that, and then we'll go from there, and without me correcting you again, okay? Please. You cough. You nod. She repeats what she wants you to say, and then you say it, word for word. Anne says, I never said I was convinced. Anne, you said... What I said was the group of blanks we grew with the new modifiers to reprogram DNA. Those patients were among the first ones to get sick. But correlation does not imply causation. Could be a fucking zoonotic virus making the jump from one of the animal labs, for all we know. 
We really don't know where it came from yet. She trails off at the end, clearly not fully believing her own words. You are so tired and can barely hold your head up. You don't fully grasp what she is saying, but the words come to you as though this conversation is a part of you and it was hidden somewhere deep inside. You say, Are you the only one who didn't get sick? No, Brianna and Alejandro were fine, but... But? I don't know now. I don't know how they're doing now. They left the complex four days ago, like everyone else. Did you? I don't know. Vaccinate? Or inoculate yourself somehow? Jesus, no. If I could do that, don't you think I'd save you too? How could you ask that? She looks down into her lap instead of at you, and then she covers her face. When she looks back up, her expression is blank and unreadable. But it's unreadable in a way you are sure means something. You don't say anything. She answers your silent accusation with, I want to try to help you, though. Let's go back and let me try. Don't make me go back. Even after everything, you want to remain within the promise and the lie of the little brown house. I don't want to watch you die. Don't make me go back. You are the you of now saying this. You don't care if you are accurately representing the you from then. Anne swears and pounds her fists on the kitchen table. She closes her eyes, then slowly reaches across the kitchen table and takes your right hand. Her skin is cold. If this doesn't, if you don't get better, can I bring you back? What do you mean? I know this is hard, this is so fucked up and impossible to ask, but after you, after, after I'm dead? Yes, after, only if you say yes right now, I can go to the complex. We still have hundreds of viable blanks and you know what I can do? I can bring you back. With all that's happening, you're actually asking this? I am. I, I don't want to be without you. Please. I want you to say it. Blank, please. You have to say it. Let me bring you back. I don't want to be alone, be without you. I... You have to say the word, Anne. Let me clone you. Please let me do it. I want you to let me bring you back. You are crying. The Anne sitting across from you is blurry and begins to look like the younger Anne you remember. I don't want to come back. It wouldn't be me you're bringing back. But listen, think about all the Anne. amazing success we've had with augmenting our patient's cellular memory, directly uploading information and images, and the exercises and therapy. Anne. It wouldn't be me. You look at your hands and wonder whose hands they are. I would make them into you. They would be you. You repeat. It wouldn't be me. What you mean to say, but in these final moments you can't summon the courage to, is, it never was me. If you say no, I won't clone you, I promise you, and I know it's crazy, it's fucking horrible and crazy, but I'm asking you, please, will you let me? No, I'm sorry, Anne, no, you can't, it won't be me. Anne wipes her eyes, sighs, bends to the kitchen floor, and retrieves the notebook. She angrily scribbles some notes and throws the pen across the table. She says, 
Thank you. But it's perfunctory, and she says it through gritted teeth and without looking at you. You ask, How many of us have there been? You are breathing erratically, and your voice is little more than a scratching sound. Too many. We helped build our house. You are desperate to feel a kinship with the rest of you who spent all those years with Anne. You are desperate to feel something that is yours, something other than emptiness. You did. We all had this conversation. Yes. How many of us said yes? None of you. Not a single fucking one of you. Anne explodes out of her chair and stalks to the kitchen counter, grunting and yelling in obvious frustration. She stops pacing and then quickly replaces your IV bag, even though the old one is only three quarters empty. Your hand and arm go warm this time. She closes her eyes and sighs. She says, There aren't very many left of you to say yes. She rubs the back of your head. Your eyelids go heavy, and you try to speak, but you cannot. You feel yourself melting away, your consciousness receding toward a singularity. Anne whispers, I didn't lie to you, Leck. Zero, zero, 001 Your room is dark. You cannot see anything. You are lying in a bed. A sheet covers your body. You wiggle your fingers and toes, and the loud rasp of skin rubbing against the sheets is startling. With the slight movements, there is pain. Your muscles and joints hum with it. You've been awake and not awake for days, maybe weeks, perhaps longer. You do not know where you were then, or before then. You are here now. A significant amount of time has passed, but from what beginning, you do not know. You consider the origin of this time during which you've been awake and not awake, and conclude it is, for the moment, unknowable. This story originally appeared in Forward Collection, Amazon Original Short Stories, 2019. Mostly Size It was the same old story. No one knew where it came from, and they were not prepared. The giant monster, impossible in its bipedal form, stomped and smashed the city, working in a pattern known only to itself— no computers or pundits were left unsmashed to posit otherwise. Aside from its rumbling and shuffling footsteps, hammering hands and gnashing teeth, the only sounds the dwindling denizens heard from the giant monster were whooshing intakes of breath and, hours later, the calamitous exhales. It breathed as often as the encroaching and rising tides changed, the giant monster never once cried or called out. No mighty roars echoed across and beyond the city. Toward the end of the attack, which is to say the end of the city, dust and debris cumulonimbused around the giant monster's head and upper torso. When it breathed, the cloud briefly cleared, exposing the indifferent sun. One cyclonic exhale stripped away the ruin of Max's house and the bed under which he'd been hiding. It must have been almost noon, because the sun was directly over the monster and there were no shadows. Were there a monster's shadow of any length, Max would have been standing in it. As it was, he stood on shaky, ten-year-old legs, his head tilted upward to the unending heights of things. After untold and continuing hours of horror and sorrow, while surely facing annihilation, 
Max experienced a strange feeling akin to... He couldn't explain, couldn't summon a comparison. There was more fear, of course, but a different kind. One that made him want to see it all, to see everything, even the end. Perhaps it was all the terror, loss, and despair in concert with the concussions and contusions and chest-squeezing compressions he'd experienced as his house collapsed onto him. But now, as the monster turned its moon-sized eyes down toward him, Max composed a poem in his head. He'd never written a poem of his own free will, nor did he enjoy poems all that much when required to read them in school. He liked movies and video games and drawing. He desperately wished he were better at drawing than he was. He'd had to take extra classes because of his handwriting difficulties. Drawing was supposed to help. There was a part of him that thought his inability to control the lines and loops he made on paper as being the truth of himself, and maybe even the truth outside of himself. Within the poem were words his parents and teachers used in their complicated everyday lives prior to the monster attack. While Max couldn't define those words using a sentence of his own, he understood their usage and implications in the same way he understood colors, humidity, shame, love, and ocean breezes. Max imagined large swaths of emptiness between the lines of his poem to allow space for the giant monster to roam. He didn't have a title, though, in a pinch, he supposed the first line might work. Can a giant monster sharpen a pencil? How sharp? Number two regular pencil or the joke kind? Either way, the answer depends on size, dexterity, fine motor skills, motivation, how many tries are allowed, and will there be electricity in the smashed up city to power an electric pencil sharpener? Because I wouldn't expect anyone, especially a giant monster, to use those plastic square ones with the small, not sharp razor inside to shave away the wood and make a good drawing tip. And I hate when my teacher, Mr. Langan, expects me to use those stupid square ones. And mom said that there used to be wall-mounted pencil sharpeners with a hand crank that worked pretty well before the electric ones. But I still think the answer depends on size. Mostly sighs. With the last line completed, Max checked his empty pockets for his practice pencil to offer to the giant monster. It was one he used to draw and not practice letters. It was a regular yellow one, nothing special. But he'd used it enough so that it had been whittled to the same length as one of his pinkies. He forgot he'd stuck it behind his slightly bowed out left ear. And when the end came, it was still there. For Max, Sasha, Logan, Zella, and Jake. This story originally appeared in Green Ink Sponsored Right, Macmillan Cancer Support, 2021. The Large Man Mr. C is one of the problem solvers. He is dressed in black and quietly works at his desk. I am Mr. C. I am one of the problem solvers. I am dressed in black and quietly working at my desk. The scritch, scritch of my pen is louder than my breathing. My desk is one of 353 in our office. Our office is in the Great Hall. Two days ago, I was charged with determining the number of citizens with middle names that begin with the letters G-A-E. There are six. Yesterday, oh, yesterday, I was sent into the field, the rarest of rare occurrences, despite my many requests. It had been years since I'd been sent from the Great Hall to problem solve. Granted, it was only to help assorted members of the citizenry find their lost keys, socks, and one older gentleman's ivory rook from a chess set that had been carved by his great-grandfather. He didn't tell me about his great-grandfather carving the rook, 
but that's the scenario I dared imagine. This morning, I was handed a ledger. My heart sank, despite knowing the probability of being sent into the field two days in a row was zero. Numbers were then dictated to me via speakerphone. I was not told what the numbers represented, only that I was to find a pattern hidden within them. I was reminded that trying to ascribe context to the data would negatively influence my perception of said data with bias. Bias, we've been told repeatedly, is the problem solver's enemy. The co-workers to my left and right, Ms. Longfield and Mr. Demet, peer at me over their dusty tomes, their great works of literature, so they claimed. They hold their books upside down, if the book covers are any indication. I feel them observing my data observation, changing everything. Protocol dictates that I am not to allow myself to wonder if the numbers represent street addresses of physicians who only treat patients felled by incurable diseases, if the numbers are celestial coordinates of black holes that have a craven hunger for worlds, or if the numbers represent the annual sums of unanswered prayers uttered by children in the city. Hours pass like the digits beneath my fingers. My fingers are ink-stained, blue. I try to create more stories for the numbers, from the numbers, but the stories don't take, and my stomach cramps and clenches at my repeated failures. I stop looking for meaning, but still, the numbers do not perfectly fit into any regression models. As it finally occurs to me that these numbers fit into a simple Fibonacci sequence, and as I visualize the numbers spinning into a perfect golden spiral, one with infinite possible meanings and conclusions, there is a cough, a clearing of a throat, an introduction to a new problem, a hem. Mr. C. She is an assigner. She wears a white suit, squared at the shoulders, and a skinny red necktie spills down her front as though her neck has sprung a leak. The knot is thicker than what is generally customary and makes me uncomfortable. She stands next to my desk, hands folded in front of her. I do not know how long she has been standing there observing me. I have never seen this assigner before. There is no one else in the office. I did not notice that my co-workers had left. The great hall has been cleared. I believe you know what this means. My apologies, but I do not. I get irked at assigners who assume that I know everything when it has become painfully clear in my many years as a problem solver that I know distressingly little. The assigner has a small rectangular white card clasped between her fingers. I take it. It reads simply, The Consortium. I say, Invitation? A command. Mr. C stands in situ before the members of the Consortium, as is required by parliamentary procedure. He nervously waits to be addressed. I am Mr. C. I stand in situ before the members of the consortium, as is required by parliamentary procedure. I nervously wait to be addressed. I last stood before the consortium many years ago during initiation, when my memories were wiped away, including the memory of the initiation itself. After... I was assured that my previous life was one of intolerable suffering and sadness, and that I'd earned the tabula rasa and honor of being a problem solver. I was assured that my old life was vestigial, and those memories would be as obsolete as a burned, unread book. How is it, then, that instead of excitement at the prospect of being assigned a clearly important problem by the consortium themselves, I am filled with primal dread. I am sweating and I push my glasses up the length of my nose. The members of the consortium stand behind a white marble desk that spans the cavernous length of Parliament. The members wear black silk robes that flow over their bodies like water. Hoods obscure their identities. 
They're huddled close, clinging to one another, whispering, pointing, until finally, one speaks. Problem solver, we have a problem that needs solving. I cannot tell which member of the consortium is speaking as they remain huddled and constantly in motion. I say, that's your service. There is a large man. A large man? Yes, he is murdering family members of the consortium. I don't know quite what to say. My pulse beats insistently against my collar. Horrific, tragic. Yes, yes, we're all frightened and very angry, and of course, demand justice. At your service. Direct your attention to the video, please. A white curtain falls in front of the members of the consortium. From somewhere behind me, a projector whirs to life. My own shadow darkens the curtain, and giant, grainy images flicker before me. A plain bedroom chamber. An ornate bed, brass posts, reaching toward a vaulted ceiling, a sleeping form under the bed covers. The person in the bed is blurred out, identity still to be protected. The bed covers are blue. A large man, presumably the large man, suddenly fills the curtain screen. If the dimensions of the projected room are to be trusted, he must stand over eight feet tall. His shoulders are as broad as the horizon. He wears a fedora and a trench coat. That there was a trench coat of that size produced at all strikes me as a horror. The large man turns momentarily toward the camera. His face is obscured by shadow. Tufts of thick, dark hair curl around the hat's brim. Perhaps a mustache perhaps a beard. He shuffles slowly to the bed. The blurred out victim, I already presume the person to be the victim, stirs and then screams. The scream has been modified to protect the identity of the screamer. I am thankful for the blurring and modification as I don't want to actually see what happens, but at the same time, I do, I do so very much. The large man pulls two large rats out of his pockets. Their tails are as thick as ropes. The nasty clicking of their teeth is audible, despite the victim's modulated screams. The large man releases the rats and holds down the victim. The blur turns red. The terrible sounds continue. The consortium plays me four more videos. Each bedchamber is similar. Each death by rats is similar. The only difference is the size of the blurred out victim. The last one is distressingly small. The projector goes quiet. I am breathing heavy, and I wipe my eyes with a handkerchief. My shadow no longer stains the white curtain. The curtain rises. Some members of the consortium pantomime weeping and grief. Others console them. One member separates from the group and speaks. We don't yet know who the large man is. May I? I ask and pull out a small notebook. The notebook is red. Are the rats? As far as we're concerned, our long-standing truce with all the city's creatures, including the rats, remains in good standing. The speaker's tone is annoyed. Problem solvers aren't supposed to ask questions of the consortium. I know this, but I can't help myself. I feel feverish with questions, with the idea of daring to ask questions and where those questions might lead. I ask, have the birds? I am interrupted again. The birds either know nothing or they wish to remain neutral observers. Do you fear that whomever this large man is, he is trying to start the war again? This time, I'm allowed to ask my presumptuous and potentially dangerous, to me, question. We fear nothing, problem solver. We want the truth, and we want to know who the large man is and his whereabouts. That is what we want from you. 
At your service. I know I've already overstepped my bounds, but in wanting to ensure that I fulfill my duties to their fullest, I'd like to ask if I will have permission to apply my skills in the field, if necessary. Do I have permission to confront and apprehend the large man myself, should the opportunity be presented? Despite my longing to be out in the field and away from the great hall, the prospect of physical confrontation dizzies my head but in a way that makes me smile. I know I shouldn't be smiling. I look down and away, as though hiding my eyes will keep my yearnings a secret. The speaker doesn't respond, so I continue. While weapons in apprehension, if that is the correct word, are not my fort, I pronounce fort properly as fort, as all problem solvers have been trained to do, I'm quite confident, if properly equipped, in my ability to handle the entirety of the large man problem, as it were. The speaker. Once located, the large man will be confronted by members of the Army of Green. I understand, particularly given the potential diplomatic difficulties involved. I only would like to add. That is most certainly enough. You will do as asked. We will supply you with all the information that you will need. We will ensure that you are well equipped for the task that is required of you. Of course. At your service. Mr. C is dropped off at a curb in front of the Great Hall. He carries a plastic container of lukewarm broth and an umbrella, even though it is no longer raining. I am Mr. C. I am dropped off at a curb in front of the Great Hall. I carry a plastic container of lukewarm broth and an umbrella, even though it is no longer raining. The umbrella is my weapon of choice, even if it isn't very much of a weapon at all. Ahead are the great stairs that lead to the great hall. Foot traffic is light. The surrounding buildings are brightly lit, but no one stands in their windows to look out at me. Still, I can't help but feel watched as though I've been marked by my assignment. The only problems that I can never solve are my own. I look down, and there's a dead rat in the gutter. There are always dead rats in the gutter. Its body is flattened and desiccated. Flies and ants crawl in and out of empty eye sockets, and its gaping mouth, an ant on its terrible yellow teeth. I nudge the rat with my foot, Insects scurry away, but quickly regroup. Problem solvers are remade and trained to ignore our gut and remain coolly rational and devoted to data. I say out loud, as though speaking to the dead rat, without having consulted any further evidence than what the consortium has already shown me, I think the rats are behind the large man attacks. Sudden and powerful nausea buckles my knees, and I drop the container of broth, and it spills, washing the rat into a sewer drain. My body quivers, rejecting my announced intention toward bias as toxic, but the nausea ebbs, if not disappearing completely. I breathe, then stand shakily, and I scurry up the stairs to the great hall. At the top of the stairs, I look back to the street, and the discarded broth container, and I shudder with pleasure at the unpleasant memory of the bias-induced nausea. The great hall's interior remains cleared. I sit at my desk, which buckles under the weight of a new computer. The screen is in the shape of a crescent moon, and pulses with the blue light of its electronic heartbeat. I have been granted unprecedented access to the grid, surveillance video, Government files, including the most recent FFCS, Flora, Fauna, Census and Survey, along with the closely monitored migratory analysis, sentience, quotients, and hive mind constants of the numerous superorganisms within the city with which we have hard-earned peace pacts. Consumer data, including voting records and political affiliations, employee and banking records. I feel appropriate awe at the infinite gathering of information, and I imagine bites of data parsed into quarks, and those data quarks are living organisms infesting every corner and crevice of my head. It's a glorious nightmare.
The problem that has been assigned to me is extraordinary, and I've rationally concluded that my methods will have to be extraordinary as well. Extraordinary means unorthodox and anti-policy. So I begin with bias, my delicious bias. I begin with the rats. I begin by assuming the rats are behind the murders of consortium family members. I ask myself a question in a voice that crackles like a downed power line. Why not simply murder the consortium members themselves? And I answer, because the rats don't want the consortium replaced. They want them to be afraid and then be pliable, easily swayed, willing to compromise in the face of the terror of the large man's attacks. The rats know that consortium members can be easily replaced with hardliners who don't have the albatross of loved ones. I smile at this induction, this simply calculated dream of mine. As a problem solver, I've been designed to ignore dreams. I am a human algorithm, a program trained to find glitches in the code. The diamond in the data and intuition and imagination are words belonging to a dead tongue. I close my eyes. I breathe. I imagine the rats meeting in their secret meeting places and planning their secret plans, twitching their whiskers, folding their little pink hands, and I am there in a corner of the dark underbelly of the sewers with the rats crawling and planning and planning and planning. I am lightheaded, drunk with this imagining, and I know I should stop, but I can't. Only I can stop the rats. I am Mr. C. Me. My newborn imagination and my umbrella will find the large man they've coerced into their service and stop the rats and their attempted coup. While in the throes of my reverie, I maintain a modicum of procedure and build algorithms to begin sifting through the data, and I build algorithms for the algorithms until the computer is working by itself. On the computer monitor, contoured nearly wrap around my head, this universe of information collapses down before my eyes into a singularity of a discovery, a singularity of a story. Based in part on the shadowy stills culled from the videos of the attacks, the large man is Wenton Falls, a 95.45% probability match. He is 37 years old an unemployed union machinist who is described by co-workers as having a fierce temper but unwavering loyalty, twice divorced from the same woman, who has since left the city after changing her name, a cribbage enthusiast, an amateur anarchist, who once received a citation for purposefully flipping a one-way street sign so that it pointed to the sewers below. In recent years, He's taken to wearing a thick mustache and sideburns, presumably to hide the facial features distorted by a form of acromegaly, a once rare disease that results in unchecked growth of facial features. Four other union machinists have the same disease, although they each believe that they suffer alone. Wenton is two weeks behind in rent. He was last seen alive purchasing flounders from the market Nine days ago, he is not eight feet tall. The change in height is puzzling, though perhaps that can be attributed to something as simple as platform shoes. The large man does not move well, perhaps due to shoe-enhanced size. I imagine that Wenton does not move well under the weight of his betrayal and guilt, and the weight of unhappiness, his trade, his training, his preordained station in life, has yielded him divorce and disease, and what else? Perhaps he is thinking, why not help the rats? They couldn't do worse than the current tenants of Parliament. No, there's more to our Wenton, and if I were not to follow protocol, and not simply report my findings and his name to the Army of the Green, I would then find out how much more there is to Wenton, and his story. If I were to attempt to confront him myself, perhaps a few hours from now, when it'll still be raining, as he tries to sneak out of his apartment's back window, he had returned to his apartment for money, 
or his fake ID, or a picture of his ex-ex-wife, the one he still loves. But Mr. C is there, sitting on the fire escape, the tip of his umbrella pointed at Wenton's barrel-sized chest. Mr. C cruelly makes light of the mountainous terrain of the man's morphing facial features to let Wenton know that Mr. C is not afraid of him, and that really Mr. C only has to look at him a certain way, and Wenton will then tell him everything he needs to know. Mr. C lies, telling Wenton that he paid a visit to his ex-ex-wife, the one who already told him everything he needed to know about Wenton, the one with a beauty mark that tickles her upper thigh, Wendon attempts to strike Mr. C, but Mr. C swats it away nonchalantly. Mr. C then tells him that he knows of Wendon's work life spent inhaling and absorbing factory chemical fumes, and Mr. C knows of the years spent flirting with the underground as though his lifestyle was a child's dare, and Mr. C knows of the unpopular, unwelcomed, and exciting company he keeps, and Mr. C knows his bars and his alleys and what Wenton likes to drink and who he wants to fight and who he wants to fuck, and Mr. C knows that Wenton yearns for something more than what's hidden in the sweet lies of a better life promised within the diaphanous whispers of the rats. Wenton listens and then promises to show Mr. C everything he's learned from the rats, including how feeling pain is better than feeling nothing. A computer beeps harshly at me, and I twitch in my chair, almost falling out of it. I understand the computer's language of beeps. My algorithms found, Wenton. There is a 98.4% probability, which is a near statistical certainty, that he is holed up in one of the floating ships in Old Bay. All I have to do... All I'm supposed to do is make a few keystrokes and inform the Army of the Green of my findings. It's all there. Another job well done. Another to be assigned shortly thereafter. I grab two fistfuls of my own graying curly hair and I let the computer beep at me. Mr. C guides his gondola between the abandoned ships of Old Bay. Mr. C has never been on a gondola before. I am Mr. C. I guide my gondola between the abandoned ships of Old Bay. I have never been on a gondola before. I am doing surprisingly well, I think, with the standing and pushing my boat along with the long oar. My legs feel like rubber, a headache bores greedily into the inner fathoms of my skull, and I've thrown up twice, but I am doing well. The rusting ghost ships of the city's fabled merchant marine past hulk above me, blotting out all but a thin strip of the night sky. The gently lapping water echoes off their bloated tin stomachs. Dousing paths between the ships becomes increasingly treacherous until... Finally, the mass of ships funnels my gondola into the blue ship's hull. There are rats thrashing around in the dark water, swimming away from the ship, away from me, as though they are fleeing. But they are not fleeing, are they? No, they are not. They are amassing for an assault on the city. I don't have much time. Climbing the ship's moored emergency ladder with its thin rungs and slicked handholds proves exceedingly difficult, a physical task that I fear is well beyond me, but I climb anyway, awkwardly clutching the umbrella. My mind desperately reaches for a memory, an experience, or a relationship from which to draw strength and finds only an empty space that perhaps was once filled with something other than regret. My will to fill that empty space with a new memory of my own making is enough for now. I clang and clatter onto the ship's wide deck and into light. Gusting wind pushes and prods at my unsteady body, but the sky has cleared and a deep, full moon shines patiently above me. My head buzzes with pain, 
I don't care. I am Mr. C, and I have left my desk in the Great Hall, and I have managed to transport myself onto the blue ship in the middle of Old Bay. I am here. I am. The surrounding ships, those floating headstones, are swarmed by thousands of rats as they head to the city. There is a handheld device in my pocket. I cup my hand gently around it and feel its battery-powered warmth. I can signal in the Army of the Green at any time. I stumble across the deck toward the main cabin. The doorway is a shadow. The cabin door is missing, gone. In the doorway, there is a shadow inside the shadow. The shadow is the large man. It is Wenton. He is waiting for me. Hello, Wenton. I am Mr. C., and I insist that you come back to the city with me to face the consequences of your heinous crimes. The large man steps out of the cabin, onto the deck, and into the moonlight. He towers over me. He is larger than the problems that can never be solved. He wears the familiar fedora and trench coat. His face, having been further ravaged by acromegaly, is almost unrecognizable. A jigsaw puzzle that hasn't been put together correctly. His chin juts further than the prow of the ship, cheekbones made of marble, and his eyes are black dots and uneven. I mean to say his black dot eyes are not level, and they pock his face below a brow as thick as a park bench. Wenton walks like a mountain might. His legs are disjointed, unwieldy masses that are lifted under obvious and considerable strain then dropped and allowed to collide cacophonically with the deck. I slowly back away, and he follows. His hands are ominously in his pockets. I point my umbrella tip at his face. Don't come any further, Wenton, I scream, louder than I intend, and my head nearly splits in two from the pain. I know you've had a horrible go of it. Believe me, I understand. I understand your suffering and your fears and your disappointments. The disappointments are worse than the fears, aren't they? I stammer and pause, knowing that I'm speaking in vague platitudes and sentiments, but I believe in the sentiments, and I do believe I'm getting through to him, that he understands me, that someone understands me. I am not so different from you, Wenton. I, too, yearn for something more. A new reality, yes? I want to be remade, but by my own hand, my own remaking. It's what this is all about, isn't it? For the first time, I figured that much out on my own. Wenton sways in the wind and doesn't say anything. I watch his hands. My free hand goes to my pocket as well, and the hand held. Come on, my good man. Let's go back to the city. We can talk more if you'd like. Have a coffee, perhaps some broth. We could do that. You could tell me about your life. I'd love to hear everything about that, actually. I won't judge you. I'll listen. Forget about the rats and what they want, and just come with me. At the word rats, the large man reanimates and steps closer to me. He says, You don't know anything. The voice is a whisper, but one made out of a thousand other whispers. It's not an emotional retort, but a cold statement of fact. It's this coldness that coalesces with the disjointed legs and mismatched face that makes me realize what has happened to Wenton. I strike the advancing large man in the head with my umbrella. The fedora tumbles off his head, and pieces of his scalp and face slide off and fall to the deck in strips and chunks. Underneath the skein of what used to be Wenton is a writhing mass of rats, exposed the rats themselves begin to break rank and fall to the deck. The large man melts away, sloughing bit by bit and rat by rat. I frantically pull out my handheld, open the emergency two-way line, although I don't know if anyone is listening to me, and shout, This is Mr. C! It's the rats! The large man is made out of rats! One rat runs across the deck and bumps against my foot, but it does not attack. It just drops to its side. It appears to be dead, a dead rat, dead like the rat I'd encountered in the gutter in front of the great hall. That other dead rat, that was the source of my biased assumption, the inspiration of my intuition, the fuel behind my adventure. 
This dead rat that was alive only moments ago is desiccated, and its eye sockets are empty. But now I look more closely at it, and its skin boils. Its dead skin boils as though there are thousands of other rats contained within the dead rat, and those other rats are bursting and straining for final release. Instead, black and madly twitching ants pour out of the dead rat, which deflates as quickly as the large man did. The deck quickly turns black as countless ants stream out of all the rats' bodies, forming a billowing storm cloud that converges on me, ants inside of rats inside of Wenton. I want to run away and jump off the deck and hopefully into the water and not crash into the gondola, even though I do not know how to swim. Despite the approaching horror, or maybe because of it, I do not seem capable of running particularly now with my legs more than ankle deep in an ever-growing ant swarm. I never considered the ants. Who would ever consider an ant? Mr. C stands in situ before the members of the consortium, as is required by parliamentary procedure. He is dressed in black and waits to be addressed. We are Mr. C. We stand in situ before the members of the consortium, as is required by parliamentary procedure. We are dressed in black and wait to be addressed. Mr. C. once stood before the consortium many years ago, during his initiation, when his memories of a previous life of intolerable suffering and sadness were wiped away when he was first remade. We have remade him again. He will be our legend forever remembered for his part in the beginning, the beginning of our greatest triumph. The members of the ill-fated consortium stand behind a marble white desk that spans the cavernous length of Parliament. The decreased membership still clings to their black silk robes and hoods, obscuring their identities, but we know who and what they are. Problem solver. Now that the war with the rats finally nears the end, we again have a problem that needs solving. We cannot tell which member of the consortium is speaking. It does not matter. We, who are Mr. C, do not say, at your service, as is required by parliamentary procedure. We begin with the great swarm that issues from Mr. C's mouth. This story originally appeared in Streets of Shadows. Editors Maurice Broadus and Jerry Gordon. Alliteration, Inc., 2014. The Dead Thing It's Thursday, and instead of walking with Stacy to the skate park, it's next to the high school, so it isn't a good place for people, especially 7th grade people, especially 7th grade girls girl people, who aren't in high school to go to, unless you like the smell of weed, rape jokes, and getting cigarette filters and lit matches thrown at you. And instead of walking down the train tracks behind the driving school and to the combo gas station honeydew donuts that this late in the day only has plain bagels and stale donut holes left, I decide to go straight home. I feel like I have to go, even if I don't want to, because I worry something bad or worse, worse than the bad that is every day, has happened or will happen to Owen. Because the elementary school gets out 15 minutes before the middle school, and Owen is probably home and sitting on the couch and burning through another bag of sunflower seeds. Eating seeds is how Owen deals with everything. And he deals with a lot, because he's too young to know anything or understand like I do, so he eats seeds because Dad figured out if Owen had a mouth full of seeds, he couldn't ask about Mom, or cry as much, so yeah. Sunflower seeds. The ones baseball players eat and spit. And Owen eats so many seeds most days he's not hungry for dinner, or breakfast, or whatever food you try to put in front of him. And the kid is getting smaller instead of growing bigger, I swear. And what if Owen is watching TV and he accidentally swallows some of the seed shells? I've seen him swallow and scratch at his throat like he was dying and then be okay two seconds later 
and back with a mouth of seeds. My baby brother, the world's saddest gerbil. Instead of spitting the shells into a cup, or an empty or half-empty can of soda, and he's choking for real, and dad is passed out next to him on the couch. Or maybe he didn't even make it to the couch today. So I'm going home because that feeling of something worse is stuck down in me. Stacy wants to come with me, but I told her she can't, and it's this joke between us how she never gets to go to my house when I go to hers all the time. She only jokes about it with me, which is why she's the only one I'm totally honest with. I've told her why she can't come. She says she gets it, but I don't think she totally gets it. And it's not her fault because she hasn't seen the house, and I mean the inside of the house, because her parents have dropped me off so they've all seen the outside, which is bad. Red paint is fine, but the window frame's white paint is coming apart, and the yard is all overgrown, but like a normal bad. Maybe I should let her come home with me once, and I can give her a tour. And I'd start with the kitchen and tell her, hey, yeah, that's the sink full of nasty dishes and flies as big as grapes. And I keep two bowls, one for me and one for Owen, clean in my room. And don't open the fridge, you won't like it. But then I'd point at the walls, which is what she'd probably see first anyway. And using a fancy tour voice, tell her that this is where mom tore all the wallpaper off the walls because she was drunk or high or both. And dad tried to stop her, but she told him, don't worry, I'll put up new wallpaper and it'll be great. And she said that to him while standing on the stained and splintery plywood, which would be the same plywood we're standing on during the tour because a few months before, she ripped down the wallpaper, she jacked up all the linoleum tile because home improvement, right? It was going to be a big project and make our kitchen look like the ones they show on those home improvement shows. And while in tour mode, I'd whisper so no one else could hear me that mom was super drunk or I, or both. And I could tell because her eyes would be red and big and she'd breathe only out of her mouth so it sounded like she was laughing and puking at the same time. And she looked like that when I saw her for the last time, or the most recent last time, because I don't know yet if it's a forever last time. So yeah, it was makeover time for the kitchen, and dad was drunk or high, or both. And I can tell with him because his face and body sags, like he's a human beanbag chair and he huffs more than he speaks, so the words come out of his nose. And dad tried, not very hard, in fact, he sucked at trying, to stop mom from buzzing through the floor tile, but she told him to shut his assy mouth, that's a direct quote, and that she'd put in the new laminate flooring herself and without his worthless assy ass, because he was too lazy to do it. And I wouldn't yell like they yelled while on the tour, but, I could do perfect impersonations of them fighting if I wanted to. I don't know if Stacy would make it past the kitchen on the tour, so it's easier just to tell her that she can't come over today, that I have to help Owen with something. And I say, something, like it's two different words, something. And we both laugh, even though it's kind of stupid. And she says okay, and tells me to FaceTime her after dinner. And I can do that when I'm in my room because my room is like a bomb shelter of regular clean in a nuked house. So I walk home by myself listening to music on my phone, and I like to pretend that dressed all in black, I'm a shadow or a blur, or like a smudge of someone that when you drive by, you don't really see them. I get home and I can hear the TV through the open front windows, no screens, and it sounds super loud, louder than normal, and I panic because it sounds too loud, and that has to mean something's wrong, or some thing is wrong. So I run inside and drop my backpack and it bass drums on the kitchen floor. And I obstacle course past sagging garbage bags in the hallway to the TV room. And dad is on the couch asleep, passed out, whatever. And sports talking heads are shouting on the TV. But Owen isn't there. Maybe he's already in his bedroom. 
I think about asking Dad where Owen is, and I think again. I tried to turn down the volume without the remote, because when I got close to the couch, Dad grumbled something, and there were black dots of seeds and shells all over the cushions, and I didn't want him to wake up and blame yell at me about it. And I can't find the stupid volume buttons on the side of the TV. The backslider off the kitchen crashes open, so Owen must have been in the backyard. And I somehow didn't see him out there when I got home. I run back down the hallway and I want to yell, where have you been? And say things to make him cry. But I also know that's not me. So I swallow all that down to deal with later. I don't eat sunflower seeds, but I record messages on my phone and write things down. And that's how I deal. And I find him, and I always think that I'm finding him like he's lost, closing the slider real careful and slow with his foot, which is poked through the screen at the bottom. And he shouldn't be doing that because he's making the rip in the screen bigger, and we'll get bugs, more bugs, and mice, more mice, in the house. But then I zoom in on what he's carrying. Not that I can see it yet, because his back is to me, and he's curled around and over, whatever it is he's carrying. Owen, what do you have? Nothing. Seriously, tell me. Nothing. Don't be a shit. I won't tell dad. Nothing. Did you steal something? You can't be. I found it. Where? Outside. What is it? Nothing. It better not be a mouse or a squirrel or something, or like a shrew. Is it a shrew? You can't keep that in here. It's not. What is it? Tell me. Nothing. I could rip it out of his hands and look inside, but I won't. I could hit him and then take it away from him. But I won't. I don't hit him. Not ever. But that awful, terrible, no good thought flickers through my brain like someone waving a flashlight in my face. I see myself hitting him, and what I see is more bright than what I normally see. And then it goes dark in my head when I shake the thought away or say, no, no, no. But then it flashes bright again when I see myself hitting him again and again. And maybe because I don't hit him, I think about hitting him more. And I'm afraid I'm thinking about it more and more because I'm getting older. And I'm afraid that's what goes on in all adults' heads. I'm afraid all they think about is doing violent, terrible, no good things. And especially to the people they're supposed to take care of. I mean, all the violence in the world has to start in our heads first, right? And I'm mostly afraid I'm thinking like dad when he stabbed Owen's Nerf dart gun through the plaster in his bedroom. And I'm thinking like mom when she would tell me what an awful, stupid, fat-ass daughter I was. Or like when she wouldn't say anything to me and just stare at me with her mouth closed so tight and I could hear her saying nothing to me. I won't ever hit Owen. I'd chew my own hand off first. But it's hard. It's all so hard. But I can't believe he won't tell me what it is. Whatever it is inside the cardboard shoebox that is dark green and doesn't have a logo, which is weird. I mean, everything has a logo on it. So maybe it isn't a shoebox or sneaker box. I think they should call them sneaker boxes. And is just a rando box. It's smeared with dirt and mud and there are dark spots on the cover and on the sides. And those dark spots look like the grease spots on the inside cover of a pizza box. So now I'm thinking that whatever is inside the box is nasty and leaking through the cardboard. And I want to tell Owen to wash his hands, but then he's scurrying past me or trying to. And I block him, tickle his stomach with my left hand. There really isn't any stomach to tickle only his stick-like ribs, and grab for the box with my right. And it works, kind of, because he flinches, and for a second I have the box balanced in my hand, 
only it isn't very balanced, and whatever is inside of it shifts, and whatever is inside of it feels blob-like, oozy, and it's so gross I might throw up. Actually, it's so gross I'm past throwing up because my stomach turns to goo and sloshes down into my toes, and more gross, the bottom of the box. The underside feels damp. And then, oh my God, the smell. Worse than the smell that comes out of the laundry room on a hot day. Worse than the septic tank being pumped. And even worse than opening that garbage bag I didn't realize was full of months old garbage because it was sitting in the hall coat closet we never use anymore. And I only looked in it because dad left the doors opened and I thought it might be the dolls and toys that Manic Faye's mom collected in a morgy bag. And she never told me what morgy meant or stood for. But only that was where your old stuff went to give to the poor people, like us now. And then Owen whines like a puppy, swats my hand away, and his eyes are all red like he's been crying. And they're sunken into his head, too. And then he is past me and running down the hall, bouncing between all the bags and junk like a mini parkour pro. I yell after him, and then Dad slur shouts something from the TV room, so I stop running, frozen in place, and I don't want to talk to him now, and I tell him to go back to sleep in my head, which I know never really works, but it works this time. But it doesn't matter, because Owen gets away and locks himself in his room. I wait until Dad is out again, and I tiptoe past him down the hall to Owen's closed door, and I smell the box's smell, and still feel the box's feel on the tips, and the insides, I swear, of my fingers. Owen, come on. Nothing. Can I see it? No. Why not? Nothing. This is stupid. Just let me in. No. Go away, please. You can't stay in there forever. I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna see it. Nothing. I go to my room and shut the door, and instead of screaming or crying or trashing everything, I neaten, old mom's old word, it some more. The room is already clean, so clean you could eat off it, something mom, old mom, used to say with a smile. So it's like straightening, or picking up stuff and putting it back where it was. And I'm telling you, neatening is something I never did before mom left, before things got worse, worse. When I was Owen's age, my room was a pit and I loved it, owned it, and it really was a beautiful pit. But now it isn't. Clothes are in my bureau and hanging up in my closet, and books are in the bookshelf, and everything has a place. The glass in my two windows are cracked and have pieces missing, but you can't really see it. But you can feel it on cold nights, unless you open the curtains. And I would fix it if I could, but I don't know how to unbreak broken glass. And none of it makes me feel better. And it makes me feel anxious because my room is the nexus of the universe, something me and Stacy came up with. Or she came up with it because the word nexus was in a book she read. She loves to read. I have too much time to read, so I don't. And I can't stay in my head that long without other stuff creeping in. So I draw sometimes. But most of the time I shut off my brain watching music videos on YouTube and videos that show ghosts are real, even though I think most of them are faking even if I want them not to be. Or if I'm not that important to be the nexus of the universe, my room is the nexus of this house which means I have to keep my room like this, or the worse worse will get even worse. It can always get worse. And everything will come crashing down. I try to FaceTime Stacy, but she isn't answering. And I hope she isn't mad at me. And I think about making my own video to show her what the rest of the house looks like, besides my room, which she sees every night when we talk. But I hear Dad up and creeping around the house like a creep and the wooden floors creak and groan and are so tired under him. And then it's already dinner time, or what is supposed to be dinner time. And I leave my room with one of my clean bowls, and I hold it like a shield. 
and Dad is back on the couch eating Pop-Tarts and drinking beer, and we still have these plastic one-serving cups of mac and cheese, and I make one for myself. Three minutes, 30 seconds in the microwave, and add the radioactive yellow cheese dust, and I pour the stuff into my clean bowl. I won't eat out of the microwaved plastic cup because I don't trust it's not melted. And toss the plastic into the full sink because I don't care if the kitchen is clean or not because the kitchen isn't the nexus. I stand and eat quickly even though the mac and cheese lava burns my tongue and the roof of my mouth. And I think about making Owen a bowl and bringing it to him because a good big sister would do that. But I don't feel good right now and I'm going to wait him out of his room, like waiting is some action, a thing that I can throw against his door and break it open. But I don't want to wait. I so don't want to wait. I even go into the TV room to talk to Dad. Owen won't come out of his room for dinner. I'll take care of it. He needs to eat. Worry about yourself. Dad, he'll eat when he wants to. Nothing. This isn't going to go well because I know, I can feel it, that Owen shouldn't be in his room by himself with whatever it is he found in that box, that dead smelling thing. And that's all I can imagine is in the box, some dead thing. And why would he save that? And I picture him just staring into the box at some awful mess that used to be alive. And there's blood and ripped up fur and pink guts and dark, empty eye sockets. And in my head, the eye sockets look like how his do now, and then I can't unsee Owen standing there looking into the cardboard box with no eyes, with nothing eyes. And I see him touching it, and he's there in his room crying by himself, and he's sad for the dead thing, because he doesn't really understand what dead means. And I think he thinks it means you simply go away when you're dead because, like a week after mom left, he asked if she was dead, and dad laughed and said, why not? So I'm standing here with steam coming out of my mac and cheese bowl, and it feels like it's coming out of my ears, too, because I'm so mad and so don't know what to do, and I stomp out of the TV room the way dad hates, like really hates, and I yell at Owen to come out and bring out the shoebox, and I pound on his door. And then dad comes thundering down the hallway, yelling at me, at us, at everything. Normally, dad being dad would turn me quiet and small, but I'm so mad, I don't really hear him, and it sounds like everything is underwater, and I throw my bowl at Owen's bedroom door, and it bounces off and shatters on the floor. And dad is too drunk slow to grab me, but it doesn't stop him from wrecking, bawling into a wall, trying to block my escape. But I easily sidestep him and duck into my own room and lock the door. And then he's banging on my door, swearing at me and calling me names and saying, I'm just like mom. But I don't care about any of that. And I let his pounding and yelling be underwater sounds. But I'm crying because I broke the bowl. And now there's only one clean one in the whole fucking stupid fucking house. Are you okay, Hannah Banana? No. Sad face emoji. Talk? Can't. Hell hear me. Heal. No face time tonight. Pretending I'm asleep. That bad? Always. I'm sorry, Stacy. Don't be. Can you sneak out and stay over at my house? Mom wouldn't mind. She says you can stay here whenever. Can't. Why? I just can't. Owen brought something weird bad home. Question marks? Worried about him. Tell you tomorrow at school. Okay. What about tomorrow night? Question marks. Sleep over my house tomorrow. IDK. Maybe IDK. I'll be okay. I wake up, and it's the kind of dark that fills you through more than just your eyes. When I was little, I used to ask my parents about how I slept at night because I didn't like thinking about me laying there with my mouth open so anything could go inside. And I wouldn't know, 
and I would get upset and ask them to check on me. This is what they used to tell me. And push my mouth closed if it was open before they went to bed. And I'd ask them to double and triple check my mouth if they woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. The house feels quiet, but like a fake kind of quiet. Like there are things crouched and waiting to jump out at me. And then I realize there are noises in the hallway. And they were there when I woke up. And I heard them without hearing them, which means the sounds were probably there when I was asleep, too. And that makes it sound worse now. So I listen. And I don't know what is making those wet sounds. Not like something dripping, but more like a squish. A wet sponge and a fist. And then maybe that sponge is sliding and slurping across a door. Not my door, but Owen's. I sneak out of my bed, grab my phone, I fell asleep watching videos and I didn't plug in and charge, so there's only 3% battery left, and sneak across the room and stand with my ear only inches away from my door. And I cover my mouth. Not because I think something will go inside, to keep from breathing too loudly, and keep myself from calling out. Not because I think dad is out there cleaning, yeah, like he'd ever be out there cleaning, ever, never mind the middle of the night when he's likely a case of beer deep into in his blackout. But because it must be Owen cleaning up the mac and cheese mess, and that means he's out of his room, standing in front of his door. And that means his door is not locked. And if it's not locked, then I'll be able to get in his room and to the shoebox if I'm quick. And I'm careful. And no, forget quick. I don't want to scare him. So I turn the knob slow, and hope he doesn't hear the little click that sounds like a crash, and I'm about to open the door, when I notice there's no light coming from the hallway. And I used to always go to bed with the hall light on, and I'd stare at that glowing line under my door until I fell asleep. So, okay, that's really weird, right? I mean, why would Owen be out there cleaning up in the dark? He hates the dark more than I ever did and he usually sleeps with a light on in his room. He must really be trying to not wake me or dad up. And if he doesn't want to wake me, it's because he doesn't want me going into his room. And it's like he's making me and dad out to be the same person, and we're so not. And I want to cry. And instead, I open the door and start to tell Owen that I'm sorry I was all over him earlier, and that I grabbed the box away from him and that I won't make him do anything he doesn't want to do. And maybe I can help him clean up the mess. And then I'm worrying he's out in his bare feet, and there are probably still big shards of broken cereal bowl on the floor. When I was seven, I cut my wrist and had to get stitches after falling on a broken coffee mug. And the scar is a fat red worm, or a slug, curling down my wrist. And then my door is wide open, and the hallway is so dark and empty, and it's hard to tell, but there's no outline of Owen standing in front of his door at the end of the hallway. But I think the door is open. And yes, it is. And it's open into more darkness. I'm standing there in the hallway, and the wet sounds have stopped, and I hear my ears trying to hear in the silence, and there's a small, muffled clap from down the hall near the collection of dark lumps that is the broken cereal bowl. At least, I think it's the cereal bowl. And I turn on my phone's flashlight app, and the light it throws is a weird white, like bones on an x-ray. And on the floor is Owen's shoebox, all by itself. I mean, there's no cereal bowl, and the mac and cheese mess is all gone, just the shoebox. And it looks bigger than I remember it, Way bigger, actually. Like it almost stretches from wall to wall in the hallway. And is it a different box? Its color is hard to tell in the flashlight, but I can see some of those damp spots on the cover, and it's a few feet away from Owen's door, and I can't smell it. But I know if I get closer, I would. So do I get closer? This is my chance to see inside of it, yeah? Instead, I stand there and listen. 
and there's only the electric hum of the fridge coming from the kitchen. And I whisper Owen's name. And he must be in his room because I don't hear him in the bathroom or in the kitchen or anywhere. I mean, he was just out here cleaning up the mess, right? That's what I heard, I swear. And I don't know why he'd leave the box on the floor and his door open and my feet finally shuffle forward. And then the phone flashlight dies and it's like the house and the world and everything went away and left me floating in darkness. And I blink my eyelids as fast as a hummingbird's wings trying to adjust. And I say Owen's name again, a little louder and a little less brave. And instead of the shoebox, I look where his open door is, and I can sort of make out the door frame. And then within that dark, I see something move. Or I think I do, sliding around the corner coming out from Owen's room, or more like the shape is expanding, like how a balloon fills up and it's big or tall, and it's not Owen, way too big for Owen, so it's dad. But that's me putting the math of who's in the house together to come up with it's dad, because I swear it doesn't feel like it's dad, and I know middle of the night stuff is always weird and wrong and off, but I'm totally awake and totally aware, like super aware, like an animal instinct aware, right? And I can't see dad, and he doesn't say anything to me, which is whatever, because he's probably drunk. But again, this doesn't seem like what's going on. And now his breathing sounds broken down and not in rhythm, and like real underwater sounds. And he must have knocked the box over, not that I hear it, because the dead thing smell takes over the hallway, and I cough, and I back up and go into my room and shut the door, and run to my bed, and go under the covers. And I leave the light off because I don't want him to know I'm awake. If he's drunk enough, he'll forget or not bother. And I'm always dying and surviving because of his not bother and the hallway floor creaks with his weight. Then the creaking stops, and it didn't stop in front of my door. And there's a long nothing, the longest nothing. And my mouth is covered, and I breathe through my nose just in case. And then I hear the cardboard box sliding on the hallway floor, slowly, sliding away down the hall, away from my door. And in my head, I see Owen, not dad, dragging the box across the floor and into his room because it's now too heavy for him to carry it. The sun is bright in my room and I bolt upright in bed and I'm in a panic because I can't miss school, not because I love it, I hate it, and I hate almost everything and everyone there except for Stacy and a few other kids and Ms. Whiting is cool too, I guess. And my stomach turns into a stinging ball of pain when I'm there most days, but because I stupidly hope doing well in that awful school is my only chance, which isn't much of a chance at all, and I have no idea what time it is, and how could I have slept through my alarm? Then I look at my phone, and it's dead. And I remember last night, and the hallway, and it seems far away. And at the same time, it's still there in the room with me, because the rest of the house is still and quiet even if I'm running around my room slamming drawers and putting clothes on. Why didn't Owen wake me up? He's usually awake before me and watching TV. The morning is pretty much his only chance to have the TV to himself. And then I make him and me breakfast with the two clean bowls, and I walk him to the bus stop, and it's all fine because Dad isn't there to yell at us or do nothing. I go out into the hallway, hoping that Owen is out there waiting for me. Maybe he didn't come in to wake me up because he was afraid I'd get mad he was coming into my room when he doesn't let me go into his. And the hallway and the house is quieter than it was last night. And I tiptoe, afraid to disturb something. 
and maybe I still should be asleep, like I woke up during some secret hour or time I shouldn't see, that no one should see. Into the TV room, and no one is there, just empty beer cans on the floor, and chip bags, and sunflower seed bags on the couch. And then I dance around the big trash bags and into the kitchen, and no one is there. Just more trash and dish piles and open and empty cabinets. And then I go back to the hallway, our hallway, and the floor near Owen's door is clear. No broken cereal bowl, no mac and cheese, no shoe box. And his door is open halfway, so I walk toward it. And my stomach is in that ball of pain. And I don't want to go in his room now that it's open. I whisper yell, Owen, you still asleep? Nothing. It's time to get up. We don't want to miss school. Nothing. We'll get in trouble. Nothing. I'm coming in, okay? Nothing. I stand there, listening. Maybe I can hear Owen breathing or turning in the covers if I listen hard enough. And the weakest, saddest, scaredest, lostest, youngest part of me screams at me to go get dad, go get dad. But I will not, no matter what. And I shimmy through the open door, careful to not make contact with the wood, as my face passes by. I notice there's no evidence of last night's mac and cheese explosion. And I can't remember the last time I've been in Owen's room. And by the looks of it, maybe it has been since Mom left. Maybe it's been for as long as he's been alive. And I start crying because, as bad as the kitchen is, and the rest of the house is, his room is worse, because it smells like an unchanged hamster cage, and it smells like a dead thing, and I can't see the floor through a sea of trash and toys and torn up books and clothes and stained underwear and seeds and seeds and seeds. Empty shells spit out everywhere and half full plastic cups and over full cups on the windowsill and seeds and smaller seed-shaped pellets that I'm afraid aren't seeds and are mouse poops. I've seen plenty of those throughout the house. And water stains on the wallpaper. And his elevated bed frame has no box spring and mattress. They must be on the floor under everything else. And there are cans of Coke on the platform where the mattress used to be, and some cans are on their sides and caked in seeds and there's one can upside down stuck in the corner of the bed frame, and I can follow the syrupy stain leading down the frame and splashed black on the walls. And I turn away, and I see his closet behind me, and it has no door, and it's full of trash, and I see empty beer cans, and maybe full ones. Does Dad hide them in here? Does Owen hide them from Dad? And I can't possibly see at all. And now all I'm thinking is that I'm going to pull Owen out of here no matter what it takes and to not let him back in this place. And then the smell again. Like in the kitchen, when he brought in the shoebox and last night in the hallway. And I wade through the room, whispering Owen's name. And to where I think the box spring and mattress must be underneath the pile of bedding. And I pull away the blankets and it's the shoebox, but now it's the size of the mattress, and it's the same color with the same stains, but it can't be the same, it can't be. And without thinking, I scream for dad, nothing. And there's rustling inside the giant box, and so I open the cover, and the cover is heavy, but I can handle it and it feels wet, and damp, and cold. And that cold gets under the skin of my hands, and I hate touching it, but I don't let go. And inside is darkness, is all the darkness collected and saved. And way down inside I can hear noises, and they are faint. 
but I can hear the slurping, sloshing wet noises I heard when I held the box. And in the hallway last night, the dead thing noises. And I hold the cover open over my head and look down and down and down. Owen, are you in there? Nothing. Please, Owen. Nothing. We'll go away, okay? We'll run away to someplace better? We'll be okay there. Nothing. We won't get in trouble, I promise. Nothing. I'm coming in, okay? Nothing. This story originally appeared in New Fears 2, editor Mark Morris, Titan Books, 2018. Howard Sturgis and the letters and the van and what he found when he went back to his house. Howard Sturgis received the first perplexing letter from Searcy Group in early June. He was in the middle of final exams week. For the weary students, summer was no longer an impossible dream. For Howard, the end of another academic year was a clanging toll of a bell that would one day soon stop ringing. Howard taught mathematics at Bishop Fenwick, a Catholic high school in Danvers, Massachusetts. Having officially retired from public school teaching three years prior, Howard supplemented his modest retirement income by teaching part-time at the private school. Howard was 68 years old and was a slight, bird-like fusspot, but a kind one. He couldn't have been more out of touch with youth culture and his students' world, and to their delight, he used earnest phrases like, isn't that wonderful, after computing a derivative or integral. Howard arrived at school by 4.30 a.m. each day, thereby avoiding any traffic on his commute. And he spent the bulk of his before-school hours helping other teachers' students, and by help, we mean he would do their homework problems for them. He lived alone in a small ranch-style house on a wooded lot. He wore wool suits that he dry-cleaned three times a year. Howard told his newest colleagues nothing of his family or of his past. Suffice it to say, his joys and regrets were perhaps equal, but never felt equal. Dear Howard, parcel received, but no letter. Please advise. Regards, Terence Norton, Searcy Group. The second time Howard received a letter from the group was in early July. This letter was slid directly under his front door. He found it upon returning home from SAT tutoring. His student had aspirations of being a collegiate swimmer, but she needed to add at least 50 points to her math score, or so she was told by three coaches from three different schools in three different time zones. She wasn't sure if she wanted to swim in college, but she couldn't tell her parents that given the collective money and time spent and their emotional investment. And she couldn't tell her parents that she did not like working with Mr. Sturgis. Frankly, he smelled of body odor that lingered in the room like an angry ghost. His pale skin was too dry. His thin black hair was too black. And his hands were too long and she didn't like how, after presenting a problem, he turned his head and smiled in a way she interpreted to mean his intelligence was a gift he was sharing with her and she may not be worthy of it. Dear Howard, my CFO would kill me for putting this in writing. However, the astounding contents within your parcel, the old commercial jingle, a little dab will do you, comes to mind, changed everything for us. We're more than willing to discuss some form of remuneration or collaboration and or many other Asians. 
Help us help you help us more. We want to work with you. We, to be plain, want more. Please advise. With deepest regards and respect, Terence Norton, Searcy Group. A third letter arrived at the school on September 17th. Part of him was convinced students were playing a prank, given the prurient ending of the letter. The previous winter, a senior created a playful Wikipedia page outlining Howard's fabricated biography. Howard was the first television weatherman and creator of green screen technology. Howard created a mathematical model of a rat upon which the government tested with mathematical viruses. Howard financially supported a children's hospital in Nicaragua. Howard holds the world record for amount of clementines consumed within 24 hours. Howard discovered an 11th and 12th dimension when he was 13. And enumerated some of his more outre political theories. Howard proselytized a conspiracy-laden brand of politics whenever the opportunity presented. The students humored him as long as it resulted in a truncated class or a completed homework assignment or a better quiz grade. The faculty, in general, did not humor him, save for one man who had been at the school for 50 years and was now only allowed in classrooms to proctor study halls. Dear Howard, while the time, I'm sure, is not ideal, given the start of another academic year, but in another more important sense, the time has never been more perfect. The time has never been more now. You'll be astounded at our uses and applications, the discoveries and advances and designs and implementations and successes, and even our failures have been interesting. To wit, the libido rub, poorly named, I agree, was a terrible, disastrous idea, not because it didn't work, but because it worked too well. And our test subjects, well, they tested themselves on all manner of objects, animate and inanimate. Live and learn. Given any new discovery, where do our lizard brains tend to go at some point? Am I right? Regards, Terence Norton, Searcy Group. Howard thought of the letters as entities unto themselves, as existing without and beyond whomever their claimed author Terence Norton might be, as being capable of forethought, decision, and deception. He knew it was silly to think that way, but he also knew that this peculiar paranoia might, somehow, be closer to the truth. Despite the letters and treaties, none of them contained contact information or even a return address. The postmark was within the same state, but beyond that, he was unable to glean more information. Internet searches for Circe Group came up empty. He was surprised by the number of men named Terence Norton who lived in the New England area, and he didn't find any usable or actionable information from afternoons spent gawking at social media posts and pictures of spouses, kids, and pets belonging to the collective of thoroughly average Nortons. On his monthly call to his younger by 15 years sister Gretchen, she lived in California and had seven children spaced two years apart, and they all, unfortunately, looked like her husband, Gary. His facial features were the exaggerated and elongated balloons of a child's drawing made flesh. Howard deviated from his usual script of asking for an itemized update on the doings and goings-on with his nieces and nephews, and then breathlessly sharing his latest and greatest political conspiracies to which she was not a sympathetic ear. Gretchen once hung up on him when he told her she should discontinue any and all vaccines for her children. During this call, he asked his sister if she knew any Nortons, average or otherwise. He did not explain why he asked. Dear Howard, words are failing me, aren't they? 
Failing us? I understand. I do. We do. Yes, we. I do speak for a we, for the group. If corporations can be people too, to quote a contemporary American politician, then corporations can learn and dream and love and evolve. And we can evolve more quickly because we are a we. We are evolving together, and it's a more focused evolution. What takes nature millions of years to achieve, we've achieved in a blink. And we achieved this because of the miracle within the parcel you sent, Howard. You're to blame. Joking, of course. I've searched for inspirational quotes to send you, but nothing fits. See the enclosed photo of our most recent and most astounding R&D project. Evolutionarily yours, Terence Norton, Searcy Group. The photo, printed on cardstock, featured, of all things, a large blue van in an otherwise empty maroon-colored showroom. It was the blue that Howard fixated upon and the unnaturalness of its naturalness. Howard looked out his front bay window, through the glare of the sun and the dusty glass, at his own car, a small tan electric hybrid of which he kept detailed mileage statistics. He looked back at the photo and the van's swooping and smooth lines, no corners or edges or angles, as though it was molded and shaped instead of being constructed. And he was lost again in the van's azure blue, which shined like a beetle's carapace. There was something unmistakably biological about the color. Howard brought the photo with him to school, but he didn't show it to anyone else. Instead of eating lunch with faculty or helping students, he stayed in his classroom with the door shut and the pole shade closed over the door's portal glass and stared at the photo. He swore that the blue color changed ever so slightly, enough to keep him looking, staring, even running a fingertip across the photo, not only with the light of the room, but with his mood changes. The photo, in his mind, was proof that he wasn't being pranked by his students. The thing of it was, Howard had no memory of mailing a package or parcel to Circe Group, although he could not be sure he didn't mail them a letter of some sort. Howard spent his waking hours at home, hours that he would describe as lonely, but not desperately so, scribbling and then mailing, both the postal and electronic variety, all manner of consumer complaint, I'm on to you accusations, and promises of boycott, with dizzying detailed financial forecasts of the effect of his purported boycott to a diversified group of businesses, corporations, investment firms, health insurance providers, manufacturers, and even one chain of purportedly organic supermarkets, all according to the whims and rages of a political Reddit he followed and read religiously, but to which he did not ever contribute. It was possible that one of his letters intended for Corporation X was bureaucratically forwarded to this Circe group, but a package? When was the last time he mailed a parcel? He would have remembered that, wouldn't he? Howard was unable to imagine what might have been inside the parcel in question. His mind conjured only images of empty boxes, ranging in size from shoebox to large enough to hold a refrigerator. Howard, a peek at some of the current inner workings. The goal is to go to market. I love that quaint phrase, don't you? ASAP. Branding our R&D projects is not our strong suit. I've argued, in vain, that we need help from focus groups and or advertisement and PR firms, despite our need for a certain level of, shall we call it, strategic secrecy. Alas, 
This is confidential, and why we do not communicate via phone or computer, and I trust you'll keep it so. Respectfully and confidentially yours, Terence Norton, Circe Group. Below are my comments on the early go at proposed catalog copy. We cannot send copy to design or the digital team until there is final copy approval first, and waiting on word of a possible letter from the president to include as well. And I'm afraid we're far away from the final. We can slash have to do better. Terrence. Wundercar. Comment. Still sounds too kid-like to me, and too German. The world's first zero-emissions smart car that customizes itself. Check. A miracle of 21st century renewable engineering. Meet the revolutionary wonder car. Comment. Revolutionary is too on the nose. Don't want war association. Pioneering? Wonder Car's smooth lines of endless innovation fulfill the promise of the future while delivering unparalleled function and performance. Tires that conform to the environment. Comment, what needs? And even the weather. Seats that adjust. Comment, to millennial. To your body's needs. Comment, change to your body. Colors that change to reflect who you are. There's no end to the customization possibilities. With almost unlimited MPG and mileage, the only limitations to where you can drive Wonder Car is your imagination. Comment. Clunky. The sentence before it isn't great either. Text space reserved for specs and technical data. With all the talk of innovation and discovery and evolution, Howard had to admit he was disappointed they were preparing to sell, essentially, a van. However, after careful and deliberate, well, deliberation, Howard wrote a letter to the group. More of a note, really. He didn't use a full 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, as though using a full sheet were committing to something he wasn't prepared to commit to. He used one of his palm-sized reminder notes, a gift from his 1998 BC calculus class. There were only maybe 20 sheets left from the stack that had originally been thicker than a dictionary. The gray sheets had yellowed at the edges. All manner of mathematical symbols and operations danced across the heading like a child's fabled dream of sugar plum fairies. By responding, Howard feared he would be further entangling himself. As he composed the note, he feared saying too much or too little. That said, he'd never seen anything like the photo of the van, or more specifically, the van's color, which on this morning had a metallic green twinkle within the blue, and he wasn't sure, but it seemed like the shape of the van's front end was different. More sleek, more daring. It was a smile or a knowing smirk. A curled lip on one of the matinee idols he secretly adored as a teenager. And coupled with the barrage of strange letters, he no longer thought of his current situation as being a random harassment, as being a mistake. He instead thought perhaps this, whatever this was, was an opportunity for. He wasn't sure what. If nothing else, his answering the group with a note of his own would prolong these out-of-the-ordinary days of intrigue, which would be more than welcome. The phrase, this might be your last opportunity, rang in his head until a quieter voice, one that had been appearing more frequently as of late, whispered, this could be your last hurrah. He decided to be to the point, professional, worldly of the ways of business and marketing, and not a dusty, fearful academic. To be confident, but not overly so. To sound like he was already in the know. Dear Terence, 
I agree that Wundercar as a vehicle name doesn't work. I suggest the group search Greek mythology as you did for the name of your company, or search other myths and folktales for inspiration. Sincerely, Howard Sturgis. Howard left his note on his own front stoop. He placed it inside a plain envelope and the envelope inside a sealed plastic sandwich bag as he wasn't sure how long the letter would be outside and there was rain in the 10-day forecast. He considered calling in sick to school the next day, it would have been for the first time in over a decade, to wait and watch, but there was no guarantee his note would be retrieved while he was home. He considered purchasing some form of security surveillance for above his front door, and allowed himself to indulge in that scenario before dismissing it with a tinge of misplaced regret. Three days later, on a Thursday, upon returning home from school, his note was gone and was replaced by a new letter, the longest one yet, which was nestled in a padded envelope. Dear Howard, when the history of Circe Group is written, you will get a dedication. No, you will get your own chapter. New employees and trainees will forever be extolled to be like Howard Sturgis, though your genius and generosity, your spirit, will never be duplicated. T-shirts and bobblehead dolls will be fashioned in your likeness. I don't think a statue in one of our courtyards would be out of the question. And a fountain. Your statue within the fountain and the children of our employees will throw pennies and make wishes in your name. Nations will fall and nations will rise, and as our group endures and grows, our corporate songs will be forever sung in your name. Your suggestion to consult or reconsult mythology and or folklore is spot on. It's smart and wonderful and imbued with foresight and wisdom. If only I could convince the rest of us to see our folly and the importance of a name. A rose by another and all that. If it was up to me, I would have you named to our board of directors this instant. Howard, let me run this by you. Perhaps... If you were to come to our complex and make a presentation, it would change hearts and minds and collectively course-correct our branding vision. Maybe even our overall vision for the future of the group. We are not going to stop at simply producing smart vehicles, as I'm sure a man of your, frankly, historic intellect has already surmised. We are going to change all aspects of life and society with our products and improvements upon other products. Our products will become more than a lifestyle. Our products will be integrated within our consumers' very being. Entertainment, communication, fashion, health, exercise, the sleep we sleep, the dreams we dream, the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe the people we people, and more and more and more. In this, the dawn of our rise, you'll be our eyeglasses, Howard, so we can see 2020. Better than 2020. Your presence within our complex would be an event, sir. Standing room only. The cafeterias and break rooms would be empty. Metaphorical tumbleweeds would roll through the empty halls and offices and cubicles. The applause with which you'd be greeted would deafen strong ears. We would cheer, cry, hug our fellow co-workers, and exclaim in the exuberance of ensured victory. It would take minutes for the ovation to stop, and would stop only when you raised a hand. Then we would listen. We would be yours. Of course, you could begin your presentation by telling, showing us how you came to be in possession of the substance. You already know we struggle with branding, so yes, we call it simply, humbly, the substance. Where and how did you find it? Did you make it 
or discover it, or something else it? Did you realize what you'd discovered when you discovered it? Do you cultivate it on your land, or within your home, in the basement? We've found it grows best in a dark, dank environment. Are you a closet mycologist or any other ologist? Have you used it yourself and discovered its limitless benefits? Have you tried consuming any of the substance? Our results have been hit or miss, to be kind. Can you tell us how handling the substance has changed or improved you? Why did you mail it to us? Have you sent it to anyone else? Should we be worrying about competitors or corporate espionage? Are you looking to enter our group in a bidding war? We are nothing if not prepared to battle. Do you realize that you cannot and will not stop our progress should you decide to not give a literal or metaphorical blessing? We don't mean for that to sound like a threat. Have you told any family or friends or neighborhood busybodies about the substance? Loose lips at a local bar. We are not implying you have a problem with alcohol or substance, not that substance, abuse, or within your faculty room. Sharing some or all of that information would have us eating out of your hands. We would be your putty, no pun intended. Then you could present to us your ideas for naming the supervan, my suggestion, and we would all live happily ever after. And the group will grow and spread from there. I am not hyperbolizing. May I ask this of you, Howard? Don't answer. Allow me. I may. I may ask this of you, and I must ask this of you, given all that has transpired. We will pick you up in the van that has yet to be properly named, and you could experience its wonderness for yourself, and you will come to our complex, and you will have a tour, and you will be the first non-group member to see the growing room. And you will then give the ultimate presentation, a presentation to end all presentations, the one that exists within Plato's cave and the world of forms. And you will be rewarded handsomely, of course. Consultants often can name their own price, I'll name one for you so the group's answer won't be no or to haggle. We do so love to haggle. I've prattled on too long. Howard, we will be arriving tomorrow afternoon with tears of pride and anticipation in our shining eyes. Yours, always yours, Terence Norton, Circe Group. Howard fretted. He made the mistake of imagining their shining eyes. There was so much to parse from this letter in addition to the quirk of the last line. Tears of pride and anticipation in our shining eyes, instead of tears of pride and anticipation shining in our eyes. Was this a hurried error? Or was it purposeful, if not a literal representation of their eyes? Howard reread the letter's first page, and then he read it out loud twice. Terence employed an appealing and non threatening speech pattern and rhythm, the syntax and syllable count optimized. It was a symphony of language working in concert with the environment, the temperature, and dew point, and so on. The man hit the loftiest high points of flattery, all of which Howard greatly appreciated as empty as it likely was. Still, it was nice, while engendering an insidious curiosity about the group, of who they were and what they did, and what they had been sent. Howard was sitting in his computer nook, and he looked over his shoulder at his little empty house. He briefly took a mental tour of the interior, floating into and through the immaculate, spartanly decorated, lonely rooms. This vision suddenly had the terrible weight of premonition and futility, and a sadness swelled, 
similar to, but different in an ineffable way, the shade of sadness that overtook him whenever he considered the inevitable prospect of permanent retirement from education. There, in the near constant quietude of his home, his twilight home, Howard wanted to be picked up, wanted to ride in the magically blue van, and wanted to go to the complex and stand before their crowd and accept their adulation, whether or not it was warranted. What were Terence and the group going to say or do once they inevitably figured out that Howard was not the source of their parcel and the substance? The mycologist reference and Terence stating the substance grew best in dark, damp environs seemed to be tells or giveaways as to what the substance was. But how could organic fungal matter have yielded the wonder car? He shuddered, not entirely unpleasantly, at the thought of the libido rub. Perhaps now he had enough information to make the presentation. He could research various fungi online and fumble his way through a speech, maybe even a PowerPoint slideshow. Still, there was no way around there being unavoidable consequences once Circe Group figured out he had not sent them the substance. Howard tried deciding he didn't care, and he would deal with whatever he would have to deal with the moment that the reveal happened and not a moment before, which was so out of character, he laughed at himself. He imagined the wonder car arriving to pick him up, and Terence greeting him with a smile and a hug. Howard was not a hugger, did not like contact, but he would make an exception. Terence, looking like his old high school friend Woody Piacenza, he of the red hair and surprising baritone and freckles and bowl haircut, whom he hadn't seen or heard from in decades, but found himself thinking about at odd moments. He imagined the interior of the wonder car would be white and clean and soft as it self-navigated through private woods and secret unpaved access roads until they reached a clearing and the complex, which was a geodesic dome full of sparkling windows, and like the wonder car, it was made of arcs and smoothed lines, and its girder skeleton was visible and the same living blue as the Wonder Car. And inside, the complex floors and walls were white and clean, and the hallways were more like tubes, the passageways of a honeycomb, the secret paths within a living organism. And Terence's co-workers were happy to meet Howard, and everyone's eyes shined, Howard didn't like that, but once the image was in his head, he couldn't be rid of it. And the tour went below ground, and the tunnels were tinted red, a healthy red, a blood red. And to the cavernous growing room where the substance was kept in the dark so he couldn't see it, but he knew it was there, so he didn't linger there in the dark, the deepest of darks. And then he was led upstairs to a grand auditorium near the top of the complex, and the roof above them was made out of glass so refined it was as though there were no roof at all. And the group's applause at his introduction was a warm river. And then the lights would dim, the windows self-tinting and going dark, and a spotlight, and his presentation. Only there would be no presentation. Howard would not go with Terence or anyone else. He could not go. He knew this all could be an elaborate prank, a ruse with no greater purpose than amusement for the perpetrators. Or perhaps he was being set up and this group would be making a cash grab next. And yes, he was self-aware enough to realize he'd spent the better part of his later life researching and believing, or wanting to believe, which is the same thing, all manner of conspiracy. Howard considered all these things and more, but he decided what was in the letters was in fact the truth, because it felt like the truth a terrible one that should remain hidden. 
Howard folded the two-page letter and placed it back inside the envelope and suppressed the urge to hide it or destroy it so that he might be able to feign ignorance as to its existence. Howard then wrote his second and last note to the group. Dear Terence, It is with more than a little regret that I am writing to inform you that I did not mail the group a parcel, certainly not one with any sort of substance. I may have written a letter which somehow found its way to your desk, but not a parcel or a package. I apologize for not calling your attention to this mistake sooner. I cannot properly explain why I did not. It's, shall we say, complicated. For that, I also apologize. I wish you and the group all the best with your endeavors. Sincerely, Howard Sturgis. The next morning, Howard called in sick to school. It didn't feel like a lie because he felt ill. His stomach churned and stung. Nausea kept him from eating anything more daring than a plain English muffin. He split time pacing through his one-floor home and engaging in fruitless internet searches for information on the group until the morning became the afternoon, until he heard the high-pitched whine of an engine that sounded like his hybrid cars when powered solely by the battery. As the sound got closer, there was a lower-frequency growl at the edge of the audible range, and it made his nausea worse. The wonder car parked in front of his house. Howard only glanced out of his front window at the blue blur, afraid he would be spotted by the driver and or passengers. Howard had originally planned to hide in his bedroom and ignore the doorbell, their knocks, and their entreaties with the hope that once they read his note, they would leave him alone. Plan B. Howard crept through the kitchen and out the rear slider. It was the wonder car's sound that sent him scurrying across his leaf-filled backyard and into the brush. He crouched and quietly skulked among the fir trees before ducking behind the partially collapsed remains of a stone wall. About thigh high, he'd attempted to restore a missing section of the wall on his own a few years ago, but one afternoon of lifting stones had been too much for his back. That snaked off deeper into the woods delineating someone's long-forgotten property lines. Howard found a protected, he hoped, sightline to the wonder car with its glowing, sparkling blue that gave the appearance of movement, of rippling flesh. The sound of its engine, or the echo of the sound, or the outline of a frequency he couldn't identify or properly hear, or the sensation of the sound on his skin, which permeated into his tissue, into his very being, so that he was hearing without hearing, that unsound was worse now than it was when he fled the house. It blurred his vision and took root painfully in his head. As though sprung from a trap, Terence, He never identified himself as such, but he didn't have to. Shot out of the front passenger door and stood triumphantly on the front lawn. He was dressed in non-threatening tan khakis and a white polo shirt that showed off his fit, but not too fit, and tan, but not too tan, arms. His brown, red, and silver beard was perhaps too full, but it gave his vulpine face character. His eyes did indeed shine. Terence tapped the wonder car and the side panel swooped upward, unfurling like a wing. The van's interior shined an antiseptic white. There appeared to be an L-shaped cream-colored bench seat that traced the driver's side wall all the way to the rear of the vehicle. There were no other seats or chairs taking up the rear passenger space. Terence jogged to the house's front door, which wasn't visible from where Howard hid. After a moment or two of silence, the doorbell rang out. Then it rang out again. Terence did not knock. 
Howard held his breath and crouched lower behind the stones. Terence eventually emerged, walking slowly away from the house and reading, or rereading, the note Howard had left taped to his front door. When Terence was again standing beside the wonder car, he folded the note and slid it into a back pocket. He said something Howard couldn't hear, and two people spilled out from the van from out of the rear interior that was empty only moments ago. They were dressed the same as Terence, and their eyes shined, too. They marched down the thin cement walkway to Howard's house and opened the locked front door, roughly by the sound of it. Terence and his groupmates spent a considerable amount of time inside the house. Howard didn't have his phone or a watch, so he could mark time only with the dimming afternoon light, dropping temperature, and the worsening body aches from his protracted crouched position. They did eventually leave, though Howard remained in the woods for hours after they left. He remained in the woods, lying on the ground behind the stones until it was dark. He remained in the woods lying on the ground behind the stones and in the dark until the memory of the wonder car engine's nauseating, nerve-stripping pulse could do him no more harm. Howard shivered and staggered through his yard and slunk inside his home through the backslider. He walked through every room, turning on the lights, although he was afraid of what he might find with each flick of each switch. Nothing in the house looked amiss in the weak sepia glow of his energy-efficient light bulbs. He kept only one bulb instead of the two required within most of his lamps and fixtures. If the group had taken or moved anything, he couldn't tell. What had they been doing in his house for all that time? He checked his computer browser history, and there was no evidence that anyone else had logged on or had tampered with his files. He figured people like that probably knew how to leave no digital trail or evidence behind. And now he wondered if the group was a double-secret, deep-state government agency who were keeping tabs on him. So it was that everything in the house began to look staged and too normal as though Howard were outside and alone in the woods for an epoch before returning to a home he no longer recognized. There was something sinister in the sameness, or more subtly, the something sinister was revealed by the sameness. The futility of his choosing to continue to play out the string while giving up the opportunity for not-sameness offered by Terence and the group. As dim as the light was inside his house, the darkness outside his windows was extra inky and thick. Howard imagined the group uprooted his home and then painstakingly relocated it somewhere else, perhaps in the basement of their complex within their growing room. Howard shuffled to the front door, careful to not breathe too loudly. He hesitated with his fingers wrapped around the cold doorknob, but he eventually opened the door. There was more of the sinister sameness. The quiet street and neighbors' homes cloaked in autumn's heavy, soporific darkness. His uneven walkway path through his dying grass. But at his feet, on the front stoop, was a letter and an unsealed, cube-shaped cardboard box. The top flaps folded over each other to keep them closed. The box was not large or heavy, and he cradled it in the crook of one arm. He brought it inside. The letter was handwritten. The ink was black. Howard, you don't understand. You most certainly sent us the package. Even if you don't remember doing so, even if you sending us the package was somehow as accidental and unintentional and nonsensical as primordial life's initial spark from nothingness into being. 
No matter. We do not make mistakes. As I've already told you, we make improvements. T. Howard sat at his computer desk with the box in his lap. He read the note two more times. Then, unsure of what to do with it, he placed it within the nook of his computer desk in which he kept other forgotten scraps. He opened the box, the interior of which was lined with what appeared to be wax paper. At the bottom was a layer of a flaky, crumbly substance that looked like dried manure, but for its blue color. Howard didn't hesitate and filled the box with his hands. The substance didn't feel as dry as it looked. It was warm, moist, but not wet. And he luxuriated in passing the substance between his fingers and palms. He carefully lifted his hands out of the box. The blue substance was both granular and fibrous, and it filled in the jagged, cracked lines of his aged skin. His hands shined, and Howard felt as though he were falling away from himself and into something else. And it was what he wanted. Was that what he wanted? Howard held his breath and flexed his fingers and listened to the quiet of his house, which suddenly didn't sound so quiet. There might have been footsteps coming up his basement stairs, and the wonder car might have been pulling up to his house again. Before he would again lose his nerve, he scooped more of the substance from the box and applied it to his forearms, his neck, his face, and his eyes. His front door opened and closed, and so did the basement door, and people were excitedly discussing a Wunderkar guerrilla marketing campaign very close to where Howard was sitting now. But it was the unsound from hours earlier that Howard concentrated upon. It vibrated through vessel, tissue, organ, and bone, starting at his fingertips. The unsound wasn't unpleasant this time. It had been improved just as he was improved, just as we'll all be improved. This story originally appeared in Ten Word Tragedies, editors Christopher Golden and Tim Levin, P.S. Publishing, 2019. The Party I'm leaving my purse under the seat. Don't let me forget. Ugh, we're so late, Jackie says. She proclaimed they were going to be late every five minutes during the drive down from their apartment near Central Square in Cambridge. You're not driving fast enough, the unspoken accusation. With the prophecy fulfilled, they exit the car. Francis says, it's fine. No one is late to a party. Look at all the cars parked on the street and driveway. Everyone is here already. Jackie is a generally charming, socially anxious extrovert. When the anxiety builds toward a boil, Francis has found asking simple, borderline annoying questions helps Jackie to release some of the steam. Who is everyone? Francis asks. Jackie smirks and narrows her eyes. I know what you're doing. Thank you, and you can stop. She clutches the bottle of Merlot Francis picked out. Neither of them is sure if it will be to her boss's liking. I'll answer for you. Work people. People you see and talk to every day. People who like you and admire you and on occasion steal your lunch from the office fridge. Frances takes Jackie's free hand, her fingers are shockingly cold, and leads her up the long, woods-flanked driveway clogged with SUVs and luxury sedans. Jackie wriggles her hand free, nervously adjusts the scarf hanging loosely around her neck, and says, I didn't want us to be the last people here. Everyone's staring at us as we go in. Maybe we should stay outside. You can have a smoke until someone else shows up and we'll sneak in behind them. Frances runs a hand through her shoulder-length, graying hair. Oh, we're definitely the last ones here. She tries to say it with a smile, or to pluck one from Jackie. We should go home. 
Jackie says, we have this bottle of wine. I don't like wine. I meant from me. They have been living together for almost a year, dating for nearly two. They met when Jackie tornadoed into Francis's House of Brews, a small cafe by day and specialty beer bar by night. Jackie ordered a large black coffee to go and accidentally left her phone and purse on the counter. When she returned 20 minutes later, Francis was sitting at a small table with the phone and purse, along with pastries on two small plates. She had taken off her apron and put on a black blazer in an attempt to look more like the owner, and less like she'd been behind the counter for the prior 60 hours the place had been open. Jackie missed her conference call, and they sat and talked as she finished her coffee. Jackie returned later that night for a free beer at Francis's insistence. Francis is 51 years old, which is 15 years older than Jackie. There are times when that gap feels like an epoch. She knows Jackie's anxieties are the root of how she is reacting to their lateness, and it's not that she's embarrassed to be seen with an older woman at a work party. However, Francis is tired of the it-doesn't-matter-if-they-stare-at-us conversations and tired of her own teen-like insecurities that pick and nag and never seem to go away. Can't go home now. The work people. Francis pauses here, accentuating the playful, purposeful nickname, have seen us already. Jackie surprises Francis by laughing, as though reading her mind and purposefully tweaking it, she says, you're my old lady, and hauls up Francis's hand for a mock chivalrous kiss. The 70s style ranch sprawls atop the private hilly lot like an ink blot. Twin floodlights illuminate the cobblestone walkway at the end of the drive and the home's dark brown exterior, which shows, if not its age, then its yearly battles with the extremes of New England weather. Rigorously landscaped shrubs flank the front entrance. Francis says, cute, but smaller than I imagined. Wait until you see inside. She's shown me pictures. I bet she has. You're not funny. The front door is ajar, leaking conversation and laughter from the party. I guess we just go in. This is your party. You can cry if you want to. Before following Jackie inside, Francis looks behind them. Beyond the floodlights and walkway, there is only the dark. She cannot see the street or the length of the drive. It's a silly thought, one reflecting her own unspoken anxieties of having to be on, of having to, in her mind, justify who she is to a group of strangers. But it's as though nothing exists beyond the house and this point in time. Francis says, that's what I call an open floor plan. From what she can see from the foyer, the only walls in the house are the exterior walls. An expansive kitchen, dining room, and living room flow into each other and overlap, the boundaries ambiguous and arbitrary. The interior is brightly lit, almost garishly so. Yellows and golds mix with copper and other earthy tones. Elegant, modern light fixtures drop from the ceiling. The massive kitchen island is quartz-topped and has a deep farmer's sink. The wall to their left is all windows and glass, floor to ceiling, offering a view of the lantern-lit backyard. Bookshelves ivy the rear wall in the living room area. Well-dressed revelers fill this space, everyone drinking and showing their teeth. One of the guests rushes over, gives Jackie a hug, waves hi at Francis, and within the same breath of the greeting offers to take their coats and wine. The rules of the party house, always to be fumbled through and figured out as one stumbles along, Francis is about to ask if they should take off their shoes, but the younger woman disappears with her arms full of their coats. Jackie is stunning, as always, in her little black dress. Frances wears her threadbare blazer over an untucked white button-down and her best skinny jeans. An older man in a gray suit appears next to them with a tray of red-tinged drinks in tumblers. He explains that it's a cocktail made especially for the party. Four Roses bourbon, Campari, sweet vermouth, and orange zest. Frances asks if the drink has a name. It's called simply The End. 
As in, if you drink one, it'll be the end of your night? Jackie accepts a glass with a little bow of thanks. Festive, Francis says. She declines as she's driving. She asks if there's any beer, the hoppier the better. The man points her to a lonely table set up against the wall of windows. Upon returning to Jackie's side after the beer run, Jean Bishop, the owner of the house and the CFO of Jackie's company, stands in the middle of the great room and taps her glass with a fork until the party quiets. She says, thank you all for coming. I'm generally not one for speeches. The party laughs at the irony, or self-deprecation, as they are supposed to. Frances is self-aware enough to know her predisposition to not like Jean Bishop isn't entirely fair, but thinks, not without some satisfaction, that she is made of sharpened, uncompromising angles, and that she sounds as dry-cleaned as she looks. I'll keep it brief and to the point. Eat? Drink? Jean pauses to sip deeply from her half-empty glass. And fuck, for tomorrow we die. The party in the great room roars and claps its approval. Is the head of HR here? I'd like to lodge a complaint, Francis whispers into Jackie's ear. I don't think that line was in Corinthians, Jackie says. She's clearly more relaxed, having walked through the pre-party fire of anxiety, and she links arms with Francis. At the physical contact, Frances smiles. She can't help herself. She's using the New Living translation. Why are we here again? She's your boss. Right, you should have told me to say no. Really, you're supposed to protect me from things like this. I failed. That toast was kind of weird, right? Rich white people are weird. She's not like that in the office. Do you mean she's not rich and white, or she's not drunk in the office? Shh. We should go say hi. Those are the rules, right? They wait politely in an informal greeting line that has gathered around Jean, who wears a red sequin gown. A man in a gray suit, carrying what looks to be a straw-woven picnic basket, comes by asking for cell phones. Most of the people around them hold up empty hands, signifying they'd already complied with the demands of the basket. Jackie looks at Francis expectantly. Or is it questioningly? Francis cannot tell. Earlier, Jackie made a show of leaving her purse and, apparently, her phone under the passenger seat. Did she know this phone request would be made? Francis says, there's no way in hell I'm giving up my phone. Jean steps between them and says, putting phones out of reach is one of my office rules when we have meetings. I'd rather people fully engage with one another without distraction. Hello, my dear. Jean hugs Jackie quickly. I'm so glad you made it. She holds Jackie at arm's length and drinks her in. Jackie apologizes for being late, muttering something about the drive being longer than they anticipated. Jean turns her attention to Francis and says, I've heard so much about you, Francis. It's wonderful to finally meet. They hug, and Jackie widens her eyes, clearly enjoying Francis's discomfort. It's very nice to meet you too, Jean, Francis says. I'm sorry about the phone thing, but if something goes wrong in my cafe, like if it catches fire or something, she laughs at her own joke that she knows isn't all that funny. I need to know. Of course, of course. But even if it did go up in flames tonight, God forbid, we know it wouldn't matter since the world is ending tomorrow. Jean laughs. I guess that's one way of looking at it. Frances drinks from her beer bottle. She's either not in on the joke or is the butt of one. Oh, Jesus, Frances, I'm sorry. Jackie nervously darts her eyes between the two women. I don't know how I forgot, but I did. I didn't. She pauses, gestures at Frances, and speaks directly to Jean. I didn't tell her there's a theme to the party. Jean's rigid posture momentarily curls. You didn't tell her? Yeah. You didn't tell me? Frances's voice goes higher pitched than she intended. She did not want to sound so obviously hurt. Surprise? I'm sorry, I feel awful. Jean, I don't think I've told you, and it's not a big deal, really, but I tend to stress out and my brain can shut down before, before gatherings like this. Oh, Jackie, I'm sorry, I had no idea. 
No, it's okay. Please don't apologize. I'm fine. It just takes a little extra work to get me to the party. Once I'm there, I'm always fine, and I have a great time, and I'm usually the last one to leave, right, Francis? Jackie grabs Francis's hand and squeezes. Well, I'm glad you're here, Jackie, and please let me know if you need anything. And yes, Francis, the theme of the party is the end of the world. We're not celebrating apocalypse, per se, and I don't mean it to be morbid, but think of this as more a celebration of living in the here and now. Now that I'm talking about it this way, it's a terrible theme, isn't it? Francis says, no, not at all. Maybe we'll try it out at my cafe sometime, offer to serve everyone their last cup of coffee or pint of beer. Jackie says, Ugh, I'm the worst. I'm sorry to you both. Jean fusses and insists Jackie stop apologizing. Francis does not. After a silence of some length that wilts polite smiles and glows with the embers of confusion and resentment, Jean says, I am disappointed no one dressed up like Mad Max or Imperator Furiosa. Francis says, if I'd only known, I'm big into cosplaying. Jackie rolls her eyes and says, your home is absolutely gorgeous, Jean. I can't stop looking at that wall, all those beautiful windows. Thank you, Jackie, you're too kind. It was a lot of work. Worth it in the end, I think, but... She pauses to sip, and while swallowing, points a thin finger. With all that glass, we'll be totally exposed tomorrow when the world ends. Maybe we'll be kept as pets, like fish in an aquarium, and they'll watch us as we either slowly starve or go mad. I'm just kidding. Sorry. We're not planning on staying in this room too exposed. Okay, I'll stop joking. I do get into the spirit of my themes, perhaps too much. Jackie. I'm guessing you did not mention to Francis my offer to stay the night. I have plenty of room, and it's such a long drive back to the city. And for what? Why didn't you tell me the theme? Francis holds up quote fingers around the theme. Am I making too much of this? I don't think I am. You had weeks to tell me. I don't know. I'm sorry. What do you mean you don't know? There has to be a reason. Did you think I'd make fun of it or say I wouldn't want to go? I really don't know. I don't get how you don't know. I'm not lying to you. You could have told me when we got here. You could have told me when that guy brought you the end drink. Jesus, why not tell me then? Look, I'm sorry. You know how I get before social gatherings, and my answer isn't going to change even if you keep asking. What about the collecting phones thing? You left your phone in the car. I saw you do it. Why not warn me about that? I mean, it's like you brought me to a, to a secret cult party. Seriously? You're being ridiculous. Am I? Yes. Secret cult party was last year's theme. I knew it. Total cult. Work people cult. You have your glass of Jim Jones juice, plus that Caligula toast slash speech she made, and the shit about being in the aquarium is more than kind of fucked up. Now you're being a jerk. I can't even deal with you right now. Jackie's arms are crossed over her chest, and she smirks, likely trying to appear more bemused than she actually is. Fine, I'll stop. But there's no way we're culting here overnight. Yes, I know. Give me a little fucking credit. Francis has pushed far enough, if not too far. Their brief but intense argument ran its course from stung feelings to resigned attempts at humor, but is in danger of heading back out toward hurt again. She shakes her empty beer bottle regretfully. If I go outside to smoke, will I be the first one sacrificed? Only if we're lucky. Past the kitchen and down a narrow hallway, Francis finds the bedroom currently serving as the coat room. The ceiling lamp has been left on, but the fog of decorative frosted glass dims the light. The walls above the wainscoting are creamy yellow. The darkly stained headboard, a pirate's flag for the king-sized bed, spreads out before the rear wall. Guest coats and jackets have been carefully, if not obsessively, arranged atop the white duvet-covered mattress. The number of coats is overwhelming. Are there that many people here? And there's something about the way the coats are laid out, like trophied pelts. 
She makes a mental note to make a joke to Jackie later that she would have been back to the party sooner, but finding her coat was like finding a needle at an archaeologist's dig site. She finds her overcoat right away, though, and retrieves her cigarettes and lighter. Across from the bed, tucked into a corner of the room and beneath a large window, is a sitting area, plush chair, small bookcase, and a circular one-post wooden table. Atop the table is, well, she's not sure what it is. The red, lumpen, smooth-surfaced thing is shaped like a strawberry, yet is the size of a birthday cake. Bigger, actually. Frances decides it is a cake as she walks around the bed to the sitting area. With the cake designation clear in her mind, she assumes the red exterior is fondant icing. But upon closer inspection, the surface isn't smooth. The longer she looks, the more organic the thing appears, although there is no sign of stem or stalk. There are random patches with small raised bumps and with black dot-like pits or pores in its skin. She does think of the outer layer as a skin. Sitting briefly in the plush chair, she wonders if the skin would be as soft as the cushion beneath her or crusted and hard. There's a sickly sweet compost smell almost smoky, that stings her eyes with its unpleasantness initially. She quickly becomes used to it. Beneath the object is a porcelain platter or serving dish, and pooled at the object's base is a dark red, almost purple, glistening liquid. Frances leaves the chair but maintains a crouch and maneuvers to the other side of the table, the side facing the window. The skin here is acneed with pustules and weeping sores. Frances stands and shimmies a few fleeing steps away from the sitting area, wringing her hands absently. She doesn't turn on a heel and leave the bedroom. She instead returns to the chair, bends, and reaches a finger toward a section that appears the smoothest, the most unblemished. The surface breaks at her touch as though it were made of rice paper. Liquid saps out from a fingertip-sized hole. It felt like touching a rotted tomato only worse, because it is not a tomato. Outside the bedroom and standing in the middle of the hallway is Jean. Did you find everything you need? She asks. Frances says, yeah, and holds up her pack of cigarettes with one hand. She wipes her other hand on her jeans. Witty rejoinders die on the pad of her greased fingertip. You're welcome to go out back. I left a standing ashtray at the edge where the brick meets the grass. It looks like a tall, skinny birdbath. Can't miss it. The glass doors to the patio are unlocked. Thank you, I will. Frances walks past Jean, almost pressing against the wall to avoid any glancing contact with her. I know it's a lot, Jean says, but my offer stands for you and Jackie to stay overnight. You can have my bedroom if you like. I don't mind. It's a clear, cold night. Unlike being in the city, bubbled within its desert of light, there are stars visible in the sky. Some of the pinpricks of light are larger than others. Some flicker and waver. Others are hard, steadfast, unblinking. A breeze enables the grass and trees to speak. Standing at the edge of the bricked patio, but not on the grass, she will not step onto the grass, her back to the house, Frances stares into the wooded lot. The ankle-high grass leads to a thick grove of trees. She does not look at their heights and tops and wonder how long the trees have lived, how long they have left to live. She instead strains to identify the misshapen mounds crowding around the bases of their trunks until she can't bear to stare at them any longer. Can anyone from the party see her out here? Would she? undetected, be able to watch them revel while in, how did Jean put it, their aquarium? Francis mutters, shouldn't it be a terrarium, Jean? She throws the cigarette butt onto the grass and not the ashtray, a small act of defiance, one that twitches a smile. Francis turns around and looks inside the teeming, glowing house. Jean and Jackie are standing together by the patio doors and looking out into the yard, presumably at Francis. They are far enough away that their faces are featureless blurs. 
Judging by the hand gestures and her bobbing head, Jean is doing all the talking. The man with the drink tray comes by and offers Jackie another red glass of the end. She takes it. She raises the tumbler in the air, tipping it out toward Francis, toasting her. For Shirley Jackson. This story originally appeared in When Things Get Dark, stories inspired by Shirley Jackson, editor Ellen Datlow, Titan Books, 2021. The Beast You Are by Kay Bristle Book One The First Age One There were other First Ages before this one. A before a village archivist named Spire was a brown rabbit, self-conscious of her unevenly length, cornstalk ears, carefully folded under a floppy gray baker's hat that had once been her mom's. She kept meticulous records shelved within the dusty stacks of cavernous Ride Hall. The hall was named after two of the many who had died for before. Aspire often wondered what the old goats Kier and Tham Ride were really like. More specifically, she wanted to know what was inside their ride hearts when they stopped. The tireless rabbit had recently discovered within a basement chamber evidence of a twelfth counting backward, first age. The triptych carved into a block of wood was over 1,000 years old. The images told a familiar story in three ages. The twelfth was the oldest known first age. Aspire suspected there were more. Two. The morning of the ceremony, there were three children who didn't know their names would be called later. Mag was a dog, an athletic spitz mix, eight years old, bright-eyed, soft-mouthed, with thick chestnut fur. Mag ate her usual oatmeal breakfast at the kitchen table with her parents. She attacked the bottom of an orange ceramic bowl with a serious spoon and bobbed her right leg up and down tapping a code on the hardwood. Mom pretended to read a dissected newspaper. Dad leaned on the counter, interrogating a cup of coffee. Mom and Dad were nervous. Mag was too, in theory. Mag knew her classmates were already at the commons, planting family flags and claiming the best picnic spots. She wanted to be there chasing a frisbee with her friends. She daydreamed about how she would outrun them all. Can we please go early? I'm done eating. See? Meg held up her empty bowl like it was the winner's cup. Dad tilted his head. Glasses slid down his whitened snout. He said, there's no need to be in a rush. Today is a solemn day. Today is a dreadful day for some. Today is a dreadful day for many. He amended himself one more time, for most. Mag said, but not for all. She knew it was a horrible thing to say. The truth of it was the horror. Mom frowned and looked more sad than angry and said, your ears are always up, Mag, a saying normally uttered when Mag was being cheeky or a pill. When Mag was smaller, she would run her paws over the points of those rigid ears and curl a smile. I know, Mag said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Both parents raised brows and ears, silently questioning how she meant it. Mom said, we'll leave in an hour. I know you want to be with your friends, but there's no need to be early. Mag slumped shoulders, a silent protest. The kitchen smelled pleasantly of cinnamon, honey, and apple. Dad shuffled to the table, wincing at his dysplastic hip. He scratched the top of Mag's head and placed her empty bowl in the sink. The kitchen also smelled of more complex animal smells, ones that could not be described in a thousand hundred lines of poetry. Mag still imagined she was at the commons, outrunning everyone, outrunning everything. Joel was a toad, ten years old, with six siblings. He was the youngest, skinniest, shortest, quietest, fond of small hats and red stockings pulled over his gentle webbed feet. Joel blinked frequently, as though forever in disbelief. 
He loved being with his family, especially when he didn't disappoint them, but he preferred the company of books, the thickest ones he could find, even if he didn't understand all the words. This morning, Toll spent extra time in the locked bathroom, tilting a blue beret over his forehead, a slash of color in the mirror. Still getting ready, he said. His impatient father, a river dock foreman, a boisterous bullhorn of a toad, bellowed, you cannot live life afraid, and then laughed, an infectious laugh for most, but not for all. Toll did not think fear was a choice. He blinked more rapidly, even though he was the only one who could see him. His sister, Penn, 12 years old, was already outside, mining hopscotch on the grass, shouting to the open bathroom window, come on down. It'll be okay, my Tolly. When Toll didn't open the door, Dad left for the commons in accordance with the fevered will of his other children, pulling a wagon overflowing with food and games Toll didn't want to play. After a short time of grace, Mom gently rapped on the bathroom door. She was older than most moms and had seen more, which was why Toll assumed she was so kind. He opened the door, the beret twisted in his hands. She held out his favorite book, Tolliver's Travels, and said, we'll find a perfectly shady spot so you can better read this. I don't want to go. Neither do I, to be honest, but we have to. Toll said, I am afraid. I am too, said Mom. She always shared with her youngest son. Marith was a cat, 14 years old and unknown mix. When asked, she made claims to Ragdoll and Rex, Calico and Kimrick, among others. Her father had often accused her of being a liar, and worse. Orange splotches mottled Mara's black and white fur. When the younger children at school stared, she stared back until they looked away. Sometimes she told them her fur-covered skin was a map to a faraway, magical place. Other times, when she needed a reaction different from boring old wonder, she told the children their skins were maps too. And one day, she would collect them, every single one. Early morning, prior to the ceremony, Merith had one of her father's antique village maps dating from the prior first age unrolled on the floor of the great room, each cracked corner held down with a muddy shoe. The yellowed parchment was as long as she was tall. The funny and sad and disappointing part? Dad wouldn't even know the map was missing. Lately, many things in their large, empty house had gone missing, including an ice pick with a crow skull handle and an assassin's dagger, the blade as long and sharp as another lie. Marith kept most, but not all, trophies and secrets behind a loose baseboard in her room and a trick panel within her bedroom closet. At night, she took the dagger out, mimed parries and thrusts, twisting, turning, slashing, stabbing, learning what it could teach until the hungry blade grew tired of her games and tasted her blood. The weapons were two of nearly 100 collected and ignored by her father, a quote-unquote esteemed council member who greased as many palms as he shook, dear old dad slipped off his pre-ceremony debauch alone in his locked bedroom. Merith delighted in the possibility of dad missing his ceremonial speech. You embarrass the family name yet again. She rehearsed saying exactly this, using his peculiar and mocking intonation and tone. She excelled at mimicking voices. While perched on her elbows atop the memorized map that smelled like wet leaves in late autumn. She held a crumbling corn muffin in one hand and an eager red crayon in the other. Three. The commons was a sacred space, a literal and public square. If before it was a compass, the commons stamped due north. To the west, the impassable croning mountains. Their craggy snow-topped peaks sourced the Syme River, the village's carotid artery, and according to the farmer's almanac, the mountains insulated before from the greediest storms. To the east, the amenable and seemingly unending Limwood Forest, before source of lumber, passively accepting within its canopy anyone carrying a saw and axe. To the south, the green, 
a thick, lush network of marshes and swamps into which the Syme River emptied. Every school child in before learned the green cleaned the water pumped through the heart of the village. And that water journeyed until it fed the clouds and storms roiling in the distant southwest. And those storms flowed north and blessed the crowns of the croning mountains with rains and snows, so the water may continue to run free through before eternally. What is to the north? Well, there was a proverb with varied applications and meanings. Winds from the south die in the north wood. Four. The ceremony officially began at noon. Revelers arrived at first light. Villagers dressed in their finest, except for the cult of awe adherents who wore monochromatic robes, the colors correlating to enlightenment level achieved. And they carried white latex masks to wear later, featureless but for two eye holes and a small mouth slit for breathing and whispered conspiracy. Most villagers did not engage with cultists during the ceremony, ignoring their longtime friends and neighbors, because the cult used this day to aggressively recruit, their growing numbers impossible to ignore. With permission from the mayor, the council, the Rotary Club, the pernicious cult of on, the academics, the writers and actors guilds, the farmers, assorted labor groups, including the loggers, smiths, carpenters, and electricians, Spire the Archivist opened the afternoon-long ceremony marking the beginning of the end of this first age. Her speech, neither flashy nor falsely modest, detailed her momentous discovery of the previously unknown first age. The applause was neither reverent nor enthusiastic, and was somewhere in the disinterested middle. She thought no one appreciates the great and terrible yawn of history. Everyone gathered in the commons had only a mind for the monster. More speeches were made through crackling loudspeakers. Councilman Ford Grom arrived disheveled and late for his speech. He insisted on making his forgettable, regrettable remarks. The only laughter from the audience came from between his daughter's snarled lips. Throughout the afternoon, villagers shared food and drink and nervous well-wishes and aphorisms, promises of brighter days. In the bustling common, a temporary market filled baskets and mugs and emptied pockets. Performers plied their arts on ramshackle stages. The old complained about what entertained the young. The plays, songs, and dances were earnest, anxious expressions of joy, and there were biting satires and melancholic laments. The hope we associate with art and expression faded with the daylight hours as though the shadow of death would lengthen to encompass everyone on this day. Not some nebulous future day that could not be seen or believed. Mayor Gib Grine, a gray squirrel who favored an obstinate monocle that refused to remain properly pinched between brow and cheek, had earlier boasted about prosperity and a forthcoming technological golden age, a television in every home and rhubarb in every pot. Mayor Gib Grine his tail sprouting from the back of his tailored trousers, had endured the traditional good-natured jeers and grumbles from political rivals and the disruptive chants from cultists. Now, glowing in the fading sunlight, he again stood before the hushed village. By this time, tents had been dismantled, blankets folded, picnic baskets packed up. Carts and booths and anything on wheels retreated to the safer southern border of the commons. Mayor Gib Grine, sweat darkening the armpits of his pressed dress shirt, lifted his right paw. The bell above Ride Hall chimed thirteen times, once for every first age. With the last toll still ringing in heads, Mayor Gib Grine, his stentorian voice gone reedy, said, the names I will read have been determined by a lottery overseen by esteemed council and union heads. And with special thanks to Mrs. Clee Winster, our primary school's fearless and most capable principal, who has already coordinated a team of grief counselors for the students and their families. As is decreed, only residents under 18 years of age are eligible to mark this final day of the first age, and by doing so, their selfless sacrifice preserves our future ages. 
Mayor Gibb Grind paused when he didn't intend to. The duration of the pause grew, as though the gravity of silence was self-sustaining. Later that evening, he would weep while his wife did held him, and he would swear he didn't mean to drag it out like a carnival barker. After the pause, one that spelled his political doom in a recall election 37 days after the ceremony, Mayor Gib Grine announced the three finalists alphabetically by last name. Within the crowd, gasps of horror, relieved sobs, curses directed at their witless acquiescence to what was and would be, a terrible secret joy that good fortune viciously continued to smile on the smiled upon. Some villagers collapsed to their knees in thanks, some in shame. Parents hugged their children, their children gone still a stone under the gorgon gaze of truth. The monster finally reeled to them, even though it had yet to arrive. From two isolated families, tears and shrieks, and a repeated word, a command, negation, desperate plea. No. The cultists folded their heads into their masks, through which eyes bulged greedily, triumphantly. They linked arms in ecstatic, hopeful, fervent anticipation of a prophesied end. Five. At the northern edge of the commons, the three children were to stand on a brick dais and face the north woods. Toll's wailing mom and siblings engulfed him in quivering limbs. Dad shouted, threatened, and had to be restrained. Toll blinked, and he blinked, and said he was sorry, but no one heard him. He gave Mom a kiss, then he gave his blue beret to his sister Pen and whispered, it'll be okay. There was still a chance he wouldn't be chosen by the monster, but it would never be okay. He pulled his red socks up to his knees and wondered if the red would attract the monster. His walk across the common was long and lonely. The first child to take their place on the dais, Toll stepped onto the circle-shaped engraving on the left and blinked some more. Mag ran in circles, saying, What did I do? Did I do something? Did I do something? What did I do? Mag's mother slowed her down and said through tears, Be brave. Keep your ears up. Dad told her, you run if you can, if you get the chance. Never mind any of us, we're not worth it. Meg had to be pried away from her parents and carried by village police, two brawny Rottweilers and one warthog with a missing tusk. Meg was squirmy and strong, impossible to hold still. She stopped resisting when they allowed her to carry the frisbee she'd chased all afternoon. The disc was as yellow as the sun once was and maybe would never be again. She stepped onto the triangle on the right side of the dais, her legs twitching, itching to run. Yes, Merith was afraid, terrified, really. At the announcement of her name, her legs went liquid. A bowl of electricity pooled in her gut. Merith was also thrilled. Something interesting was finally happening to her. As the dim-witted and incompetent officers muscled that bratty, mouthy dog from the lower elementary class to the dais against her puny little will, and as her father, Councilman Ford Grom, pounded his narrow chest, pulled at bent whiskers, shouted the fix was in, demanded a recount, and oh, that hammiest, hackneyed, clod-hopping actor had the gall, the temerity to say no Grom would be chaff. Merith held her paws over her mouth, yet could not keep giggles from spilling out. Her father was an odious, ridiculous creature, one grafted together equal parts, family, money, ignorance, aimless, lazy cruelty. He could never focus beyond his own wants, a fatal flaw. Born to cheat and win in a broken system. But it didn't mean that dumbass doth protesting too much and too baldly wasn't right about the fix. Regardless, Merith sprinted nimbly to the square in the center of the dais. She bowed with a flourish of her arm and tail and a wink for Daddy. The promise of revenge boiled in her heart. Spire the archivist would record Merith's bow as protest 
defiance, a political act, and auspiciously as the true beginning of the next age. The cultists shouted a name, the secret origin of which they claimed to keep and honor. On. Six. The sky shaded purple above the hulking wall of the northwood trees. If the dazed and sleepy insects of early spring made any sounds, they could not be heard. The three children faced the darkening wall of the northwood trees. They could not be heard. The villagers cried and held each other and consoled and rationalized and said there was nothing we could do. And they covered their eyes and said, we can't watch and tell us when it's over. And peeked through their covered eyes and whispered, maybe this time it won't come back. And a few wondered, what would we do then? Marith said, where's your hat, Toad? Toll blinked and answered sincerely, I gave it to my sister, Pen. She'll keep it nice. He always answered sincerely, even to questions that didn't need to be answered. Mara said, you gonna ask it to play with you, dog? Ooh, maybe throw the disc like a decoy, help it chases? Meg wanted to growl. It came out a whine. She looked at her clutched frisbee, and for the last time in her life, felt like a child. Mara said, if it chooses me, I'm gonna fake like I passed out, oh dear, as it puts me into its mouth. Then it'll be all bite, scratch, and scratch bite, and bite scratch at tongue, gums, tonsils. I'll open a red line down the back of its throat and it'll taste its own stupid blood. She didn't say, but thought, maybe if I drink its blood, I will live. Her tail wavered like a cobra ready to strike. A rumbling rumor passed through the north wood. The villagers chorused a held breath. Cultists inched forward to be a little closer to eternity. Rhythmic tremors shook the grounds, percolating screams like kettle whistles. Fuck you, On, Maris shouted. Mag snickered and thought, run. Run, run, run. Toll smiled, resigned to not belonging here. Spire wrote in her notebook, the script hushed and thin. After 30 years and 30 more before that 30, and so on and so on and so on, the impossible happens again. The rounded shadow of a rogue mountain had lost its way and fogged over the sentinel line of the north wood. Branches and limbs cracked, infant leaves shuddered, loosened, and plumed, clouding the infant night. Trees swayed and bent and reluctantly parted. The monster, amorphously bipedal, some villagers would falsely remember it crawling on all fours. A Stygian protean mass adorned with the detritus of the living forest. Green, mossy, long hair obscured its eyes and maw and stalagmitic teeth, which existed in the long memory of middle-aged and older villagers, and in everyone's nightmares to be. Swinging arms, birthing zephyrs, it glaciered to the dais and the children, grinding the earth under its bulk, the scarring terrible and final. Villagers staggered and fell to their knees, Spire's mouth dropped, along with her pen and notebook. The monocle dripped from Mayor Gibgrind's cheek, the world's largest tear. Mag's parents held pause and watched their daughter's quivering legs and tail and lost hope for her, and for everyone. Toll's father wept and squeezed his children tightly to his chest. Toll's mother whispered, please. Councilman Ford Grom chewed on his claws, fretting over possible outcomes. Though, unlike the other parents, he had a hunch the monster would not choose his child just to spite him. Cultists mimicked the movement of the monster, and they opened silent mouths behind their masks as wide as their faces would allow, praying their god would do the same and swallow everything. 7. The monster bent, eclipsing the night. 
falling over the children. Its breath smelled of heat and decay. Toll thought it might be ill, that it might not live much longer. He was sad for it and sad for everyone, and the sadness momentarily filled his heart. But fear drained it again, as fear always had. Its breath smelled of epochs and ruin. Mag searched for its eyes through the tangled matted nest of green fur. It was important to see the monster seeing her. She could outrun it if she knew exactly where and at whom it was looking. She could outrun it if she could dodge the first low, long swipe. Its breath smelled of delirious, bargainless, gluttonous animal fear. Maybe Mara smelled Toll and Mag and the rest of the village. Her father once told her fear greased the world's gears. The first and last time in his life he wasn't full of shit. Merith extended her claws and shouted, Fucking decide already! The monster bent lower with speed, elasticity, and grace as fanciful as its size. A previously camouflaged neck telescoped the giant head. It hovered two and a half elephant trunks away from the children. The gravid mass fissured, a jagged crack split, oystered open, revealing its teeth. Oh, its teeth. Plague yellow, of ludicrous size and chaotic formation, sharpened cones, spires, needles, overlapped, an eager crowd shouldering for space, with thick foundational blocks blunted by chewing, gnashing, gnawing. Oh, its teeth. Puzzle pieces that shouldn't fit together. The cultists were blissfully horrified by the privilege of the toothsome night. Mag could not run after viewing an apocalypse. Toll hyperventilated and swayed, a wheat stalk waiting to be scythed. Marith hissed as she heard a voice in her head, the same as her own voice, but not the same. I choose you. The monster recoiled its neck stood at its previous height looming over the dais. Some villagers allowed themselves to hope the thing would return to the Northwood without eating any of the children. Others feared and cultists prayed the monster would reject their blood offer and would soon rampage through before. The monster swung one mighty arm, a blurring, whooshing pendulum that wiped Toll away from his circled spot. The village wailed, briefly unified. Mag fell backward, then slowly crawled toward the monster, making herself watch until there was nothing to see. Marith slumped, unable to understand why she was disappointed in another broken promise. The grieving moon rose empty and staring blankly as the monster receded into the north wood. Eight. The monster's plucking, squeezing hand battered Toll to near unconsciousness. Perhaps it's easier for us to believe the fleeting moments of his remaining life were mercifully confusing, disjointed, a dream in which he was both flying and falling. Jumbled kaleidoscopic images, the sky dappled with star streaks, the forest canopy rolling in waves, distant desolate mountains, and a dark yawing cave with teeth didn't fit together, didn't make sense. I am sorry to say, at the end, the shrinking, shriveling essence of Toll understood this was all real. Terribly real. Nine. As was tradition, Mag and Merith walked paw in paw from the dais. Having survived the ceremony, they were now Frera, sisters not by their own blood, but by someone else's. Two cultists broke from their coordinated ranks, rushing the new Frera. A teenage mallard duck named Acor offered his mask to Mag. Wide-eyed and earnest, green feathers tousled on his forehead, he breathlessly spoke of sharing honor, the memory of Toll's brave sacrifice, and how she knew more than anyone else the awesome power of on. Mag growled, broke her link with Marith, and sprinted to her parents. A fox named Siv, orange fur and ears slicked back, owner of the most beautiful tail in Bibor, just ask him twirled his blank mask on a paw, offered it to Marith, along with a smirking leer. I thought for sure you were a goner. Surprise, surprise, right? 
Siv was a village manager who hit the bars with Mara's dad on weekends and weekdays. Merith knocked the mask off his paw. Siv shrugged and leaned in, a conspirator, his bushy tail peacocking from beneath his forest green robe. No hard feelings on my end, little kitty. But if you join our merry band, it'll piss off your dad. Merith's inner voice, the new one, the same one, told her what to do. What she could do, what she will do. She listened, even though the voice had lied about the monster choosing her. She listened because she liked what it said. Merith stepped on the mask and flipped off Siv and the rest of the cultists. Ten. No more speeches. No more talk of prosperity. Now that for the moment the cost was unimpeachably clear. And once again the future was untenable. Parents carried their children home or pulled them in small red wagons, even the ones too big to be carried or pulled. Parents wished they could keep their children hidden in their pockets, as the question, what kind of world was this, was loudly followed by more questions they couldn't and didn't want to answer. The bars were closed for the rest of the evening, by order of Mayor Gib Grine. Some voters grumbled they needed a drink, or twelve. But what they meant was they didn't want to be alone. The cultists shed their masks, abandoned them, more than a hundred blank faces and stares on the trampled and torn grass. Then they milled aimlessly about the commons until they were cleared out. Some went to the home for further reflection. Most went home, doing their best to ignore the heavy eyes of their neighbors. Eleven. Mac's parents didn't know what to do when they returned to their quaint, warm house, haunted by unsure steps. They hugged Mag, consoled her, told her they loved her very much, asked if she wanted anything to eat. Did she want to watch something on television? Should Mom get a fire going in the fireplace? Mag said no to everything. Mom built a fire anyway. They sat on the hearth as a family, which was Mom's favorite phrase in idealized formation. We're eating dinner at the table as a family. We're going to the market as a family. We will get through this as a family. Basking in the fire's warm glow, no one dared say, this is nice. Because it was, and they felt guilty. Mag wondered, had they always been guilty as a family? Dad said, maybe we should talk about tonight, now, not let what happened fester. Mom said, in good time, when Mag is ready, no pressure, honey. Mag could not imagine the in good time. Dad struggled to stand, then limped to the kitchen. Are you okay, Dad? Mag asked. Just a cranky hip on a cool night. Mac couldn't believe how old and broken down he looked. Another sadness that could only be observed from within the greater sadness. Where did he go? Mom asked, raising the flag of her nose higher. Did he open the back door? Dad returned with a plate and puffy white marshmallows skewered atop three crooked sticks. Mom said, really? Inside. Why not? We're all marshmallow roasting experts here. Mag reached for the longest stick. Mom and Dad kept their marshmallows a cautious distance from the flames, rotating their sticks slowly, dutifully. Mag hugged her stick close to her chest and asked, How can I stop the monster from ever coming back? Mag meant her question sincerely, all the sincereness she could muster. She wanted it not to sound like a question a kid might reflexively ask about the unanswerable, like, Why am I me? or... Why do I have to sleep, or why do we feel pain, or why do we have to die? Mom said, you can't stop it. None of us can. Dad cleared his throat as though making room for something big. Instead, he nodded and patted Mag's twitching knee. The flames danced in the lenses of his glasses. I'm sorry, Mom added as though scolded by the silence. That's the truth of it. Her eyes were dark, shimmering pools. 
Mag said, I am going to stop it. I'll find a way, even if it takes all my years. I have to. She speared her marshmallow-tipped stick directly into the fire. The sugary skein blazed, then charred black. Twelve. Marith walked ahead of her lagging father. He jogged half-acidly to keep pace. They made their way south and over the Syme River. Marith reveled in the stares from the villagers she passed. While she heard their whispers, she only had ears for the inner voice. Back at their boring old lump of a decaying house that had been in the family for generations, Marith sprinted up the curled staircase to the second floor and her room. She shouted, hold my calls, slammed the bedroom door closed and locked it. If there were tears, Marith would contest this if given the chance. They were tears of anger, of consecrating rage. Councilman Ford Grom, pit-stopping first in the larder for a dram of wine, wandered to the second floor, wrapped a jaunty knock with furred knuckles on Marith's door, and cooed, I was so worried about you, my dear. Shocking, really. The whole thing, shocking. To be at all associated with that ugly mess. Heads will roll at the council meeting this week. Roll right off their dirty necks. I will give you one of their heads as a present, if you'd like, my little beastie. Marith stared daggers through the door and beyond. He added, oh, come now. You know as well as I do that you'll be over the drama after a good night's rest, if you're not over it already. I'll be in my room should you need me, dear. Mara sprawled on top of her covers, pressing the pads of one paw into the claw tips of another, counting clock ticks. At seven minutes past midnight, not a second more, Marith crawled out of her window, shimmied down the creaking vine-riddled trellis. Halfway down, she said, fuck this, and let go and fell to the professionally landscaped grass. Marith crept through quiet neighborhoods and empty streets and over the cobblestone Billhern Bridge. The windows of every house and tenement building were dark. Wooden shutters covered the bay windows of shops and restaurants. Vandals had smashed glass up and down David Street on the same night 30 years prior. A night that had ended the Third Age and had rebirthed the First. What age were they in right now? History decreed the next age, the Second Age, would begin at dawn. Yet the last age ended with the monster. So she figured this was the between time. The voice spoke in Marith's voice, even if it wasn't hers. This is your time. Marith agreed. This was her time. Tonight and the days and nights of the second age to come. She would take it all and make it hers. She would be as inevitable as the dead of night. Marith arrived at the commons, stalked through its heart on her way to the Northwood line. She ran her paws over trees, rent and bent. She lowered herself into the depth of a footprint sinking to its bottom without a wish, sinking into a coagulating mist, and she suffered the soul chill of the evening, a feeling of deja vu mixed with a goose walking over her grave, plus a devil's and a doppelganger's wink, iced the length of her spine and into her curling tail. Suddenly, unable to breathe, Merritt scrabbled out of the hole and retreated to the dais. She stood on the square and faced the commons, Spread out before her, the cultists' masks, those blank, disembodied heads. The masks would not be gathered and thrown away until DPW arrived for cleanup in the morning. Merith crawled on all fours, an act in public that, if witnessed, would have made her father furious. The better to see the masks with, dear daddy? She found the one that Fox Fox Siv offered, and she stepped on it again. The thought of Siv's mask going over her head made her wretch. She was no cultist, would be no cultist. Found them as odious, if not more so than the rest of the villagers, including her father. But a mask. 
The voice said, yes, a mask. She took her time prowling the commons in the between time, where she was convinced there was no time. She gave each mask a look and a sniff and a paw swipe. They all looked the same on the outside, but they weren't the same. She circled, patient, certain. Finally, the one, the right one. She must have somehow missed it before and before and before and before, because as soon as she laid eyes and paws and whiskers and tongue on it, I choose you. Thirteen. The next morning, villagers left flowers, notes, and candles beneath Tull's bedroom window. His mother, Lanik, collected the memorials in a wooden chest kept in his sister Penn's room. The next morning, Mag wrote a note to Toll's family, and she wrote a note to her parents, which she sealed and hid inside her music box. And she wrote a note to herself she would keep inside her pillowcase so she would hear the paper crinkle at night. Written on the notes, I promise to stop it from coming back. The next morning, Meredith stayed in her room and painted a lion's face on her mask. The next morning was the first day of the next 30 years. Book Two, The Second Age One, Year Five How he could have better spent his evening, let him count the ways, planning his mayoral run in two years, raising funds or his specialty, making the rounds at the bars, including his home turf, the watering hole, backroom deals to be had, sealed with folded bills and clinked glasses. Instead, Councilman Ford Grom moldered in the mildewy village hall basement meeting space, faking concern and empathy in the company of the popular jackass mayor, not an actual donkey. Wilt Mourned was an anteater of prominent profile, a former B-list star of stage and screen. He of the folksy sayings as empty as his promises, plus his legion of staffers, so much for small government, and volunteers. Think of the children do-gooders, performative grievers, the lot of them. They planned Bivor's fifth-year memorial service for Tol Salienti, the little boy the town insisted on remembering. The number of villagers who would attend the service would be less than the year before, and less than the year before that. Ford was so tired, demoralized, exasperated, he skipped the bars and hailed a cab arriving home nauseous from diesel fumes, with a rat chewing the cheese of his brain headache from the jarring ride over rutted, scarred, dug-up roads. The construction mess was a political and fiscal boondoggle to make way for the new pay-TV cable lines, a luxury service few residents could afford. It should be noted the cable contract lined the streets and Ford's and Siv the Fox's pockets. As Mayor Wilp Mourned was fond of saying, the price of a little pain today for the windfall of wonder tomorrow. Ah, progress. The cabbie, a ferret in a pork pie hat who had spent the trip laughing at his own non sequiturs about political life, quipped, What, are you afraid of the dark? I thought cats could see at night. As he pulled into Ford's driveway, every light in his damn house was on. Even the single pole chain bulb in the attic an attic you could only get to using a creaky ladder with a missing slat on step three. The house glowed. A beacon. A warning. A ghastly sight. Ford said, maybe I should tip you less, wise guy, so I can pay my electric bill. Both men laughed, though neither thought anything was particularly funny. Ford padded across the slate stone front walk. The chorus humming of light bulb filaments replaced the rat in his head. Inside, his anger and annoyance morphed to unease. He wandered through rooms as if entering them for the first time. Beyond the unusual sight and circumstance, having never seen nor been in the house with every fucking light on, overhead fixtures and table lamps and the library's corner floor lamp he could have sworn didn't work, and even the oven's interior yellow light. The air in the house was wrong. He resorted to authority. It was all he knew. Meredith, why are all the fucking lights on? 
What are you doing? He returned to the front foyer, then walked room to room, shutting lights off as he progressed and continued ranting. Is this supposed to be funny? I know, funny. I'm famous for knowing funny. You know they saved my speech for last at the Harvest Day Roasts. Note to the reader, not true. And this, this bullshit isn't funny. Get your own place and light it up if you want. You're fucking 19 years old. I had a job in my own midtown apartment when I was your age. Purchased by daddy, he conveniently left out. When he finally stopped flapping his gums in the vertiginously long dining room, he noticed in the other rooms through which he'd walked and darkened, the lights were on again. I've had a day. I don't need this. In the electric air, the humming air, his voice didn't carry. No echo, despite vaulted ceilings and empty spaces. He felt like a tree in the forest about to fall, with no one to hear him. Ford pawed for the closest wall switch, turned off the electric chandelier that hung like a swollen spider above the dusty wooden banquet table. He blinked in the new dark. The cabbie had said he should be able to see. Click. The chandelier lights splashed on. A masked, robed figure stood at the opposite end of the dining room, next to the other wall switch. Ford panicked, animal instinct, and flicked the light switch off again. This dark lasted longer. Ford convinced himself the figure was Marith. Wasn't it Marith? Had to be Marith. Wearing a cultist robe, a white beige color, a color he could only compare to a shaved mange riddled hide, and a garish painted mask, golden yellow, but for the dark eye holes, brown nose, white fur, and whiskers around a toothy red mouth. Did she join the goddamn cult? Why the painted mask? Was it supposed to be a lion? He shouted, what have you gotten into this time? He didn't pause to consider the more pressing, more appropriate question. If it was indeed Marith, why would that bring him comfort? Especially as he felt her grinning behind the mask in the dark. Click. The masked figure was in front of Ford, a whisker away. She had flicked the switch next to which Ford stood with the tip of an ice pick. In her other hand, flashed a dagger. He turned to run, but was knocked by unseen paws, spun around as though he were weightless, made of no matter, and shoved his back against the wall. A painting to be hung. The painted mask stared, but didn't change expression. Ford said, stop, and don't, and the last word he said was one he hadn't earned. Please. Her head tilted, mild interest or slight surprise or bemused indifference, and the dagger raised a cresting steel wave. A cobwebbed part of Ford's brain recognized the sinuous blade. He felt every curve as it slashed through the center of his chest and out his back into the drywall, pinning him like an exotically named butterfly. He tried to speak but had no air of his own. The ice pick was eager, and next. Placed point up a tent pole under his chin. Then she pushed and pressed. The metal sprouted into his mouth through his darting desperate tongue and the soft palate. Then bone, and higher still, until Councilman Ford Grom's light was turned off. She waited for the blood to stop. She took off her mask, draped it over one bloody paw. She imagined the lion head of death floating, speaking in her voice that was not her voice. The lion assured she would not be caught, not this time, or the next, 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 or the next. She would not even be a suspect. There would be no evidence of her involvement, or the police would be made blind to it. Merith thanked the lion for choosing her. The lion told her how and where to cut to make a new robe. Two. 
Year Eight. Mag and Marith continued the Frere tradition, sharing an annual meal. They met at Salmander's, a restaurant that would always save a table for the Frere. The special that night was balsamic largemouth bass, leafy greens, and roasted butternut squash. Marith strolled to their table, ten minutes late, wearing a cocktail dress and tiger's eyes. Hey there, sis, she said. Don't get up. Mag stood up anyway, too quickly, knocking into the table, rattling the forks and water glasses. They hugged. Mag felt the other diners watching. She didn't break the clinch first. Marith said, you look good enough to eat. Mag's ears dropped, and she brushed breadcrumbs. She had buzzed through the basket of dinner rolls, off her dusty jeans and orange Stum University hoodie. Sorry, I lost track of time. Couldn't change, and I came straight from studying at the library. Oh, you're fine. And that's right, you started uni a year early. You're so... She twirled a paw in the air, sifting the ether for a word. Ambitious? No, driven? Is there a word that means both? Either way, there are big things in your future. Big things. Marith laughed and loudly ordered a glass of wine from the turtle waiter. Mac thought she could smell and see through Marith's shock act, a cover for pain, grief, loneliness. Mag was committed to her own act, the public act of being Marith's sister. She didn't like her, didn't trust her. Marith said, I suppose, my brilliant sister, you've already chosen a major. Actually, too, sociology and history, with a concentration on folk tales. Because Mag didn't want to talk about why she chose those subjects, she asked, Are you still working at, oh, yes, tending bar part-time at the watering hole, full-time living off my inheritance, eagerly awaiting the fall of my house? So gothic, right? They small talked about Mag's parents, the bar, school, politics, the new music television cable channel, movies, dating, or lack thereof. After dinner, Merith asked if Mag would be walking back to the dorm alone. I'm living at home to save money, at least for this year, but yes, walking back alone. I hate the thought of you by yourself at night and the Bevor Butcher at large. With Merith's father being the first victim, it was difficult for Mag to dismiss Merith's interest, a subject that had come up at each of their prior three meals as garish or ghoulish. Perhaps more than anyone else, Mag understood obsession. It's terrifying, of course, but... I can take care of myself, Mag said. I'm sure my father and the four other victims, including the two students living off campus, thought similarly. I didn't mean to be insensitive. No need to apologize. I'm being a prat. But let me ask you, the budding sociologist, this. Isn't it strange the butcher removed the hides from my father and Councilman Siv, who between you and me was dreadful and a terrible influence on my father, and not for nothing, I'm surprised that more discoveries of his corrupt dealings haven't come to light. Anyway, where was I? Oh, why take their hides, but not the other more recent victims? Any thoughts? I can't say I have any thoughts on that. The waiter arrived with two plates of tiramisu, flutes of champagne, and a wink for the underaged Mag on the house. Mag drank a sip to be polite. Bubbles went up her nose. She sneezed three times into her sleeve. Mara said, I think the butcher is a cult member. Hearing whispers, he wears a robe and mask. Oh, I love tiramisu. Mara rubbed paws together as though warming over a fire. Mag couldn't help but feel like Marith was celebrating the gears of a Byzantine long con set in motion. Three. Year ten. In the northeast, an area we'd never deigned to call it a neighborhood, we named the Forge. Every year it grew and spread like an oil spill. The lumber and paper mills that had once marked the border of Limwood now had a barrier a swelling plateau of landfill plus three stump-pocked miles between mills and retreating forest. New land to expand was a slogan celebrated and derided, depending upon your lot and political stripe. A handful of blocks west of the mills, which had stood for a century, was Factory Row. Plastics, chemical, foundry, refineries, pharmaceuticals, textiles, canners, automotive, printers, and many more. 
stacks smoking and plots and fences chain-linked. Between the mammoth manufacturers, like bits of food caught between teeth, subsidized employee housing, concrete warrens and high-rise hives, brutalist dreams and blackened lungs, in this tenth year of the thirteenth recorded second age, one quarter of Bevor's population lived in the forge, where life was brutish and short. Its residents suffered from cancer, asthma, stroke, heart disease, lead poisoning, rabies, alcoholism, overdoses, and suicide at the highest rates. The butcher's seventh victim, Neural, was a penguin who worked maintenance at the toy factory. The Bevor Times spared a single personal quote about Neural from his foreman. He kept the assembly lines rolling. His aerated body was found in an alley between building 45 and 46. The press and assorted armchair sleuths insisted the numbers were code. Bevor lived in fear of the butcher, the kind of fear that sold newspapers and drove television ratings. Neural's missing eyes turned up, or looked up, a week after his murder, downtown, in the overnight return box of Hub Video Rental. Four. Year 12. The archivist's spire ferried a stack of scrolls and documents no bare paw was allowed to touch for fear of damaging oils to Ride Hall's sub-basement conference room, the one with the humming fluorescent bulbs within in the drop ceiling. After depositing the ancient cargo on an already cluttered table, the winded old rabbit retucked her ears under her jostled hat, straightened her cranky spine, and flittered a thought. She could retire now, live off her pension, but what would she do then? I'm sure one of us should have something better to do on a Friday night. She didn't say it unkindly. Mag said, not me. But I can lock up if you have a hot date with Hoyne. Again? Hoyne, a widower stoat who lived three doors down, had asked Spire to dinner and a movie once a week for nearly a year. Don't tease, Spire said. If I said yes every time he asked, where would we be? The question was not rhetorical. You should be outside, a crisp, clear fall night like this, walking the cobblestones downtown, or strolling along the river, enjoying the dry scent of dead leaves and the soured mash of fallen apples and pears, and after the bars let out, the tang of vomit splashing to the cobblestones. Such a brat. I know. The point being, my dear, you'll become an artifact yourself if you aren't careful. If Mag heard more regret than reproach, she didn't let on. Mag ceremoniously stretched and snapped latex gloves over her paws and set to the bliss of spelunking through decades and centuries. The documents were more valuable than treasure maps and religious tomes, written in the old languages, each letter and symbol scrutinized and compared their messages honored with her breath and blinks. Mag took notes, but didn't need to. She memorized every folktale and legend about the monster On, including On was made of the night sky and lived on the dark side of the moon. On hibernated somewhere in the croning range atop a missing mountain, veiled by perpetual clouds and snow and sorrow. On was a mountain turned monster, and would grow and grow and grow and someday consume the world. The first resident of Bevor was a bear or a bull or a panther, depending upon the translation, who lived for thirty years within the pristine forbidden Northwood, until cursed by the Creator. Deep in the Northwood was a hole in the ground that led to the underworld, and there, fattened on the bones of the dead, on slept, dreaming our nightmares. The last of a forgotten breed of animal, one so desperate for longer life, on consumed brothers and sisters, hoarding their collective strength and spirit. The creator, ego bloated by arrogance, made a terrible mistake, fashioning a creature with hungers and desires too closely mirroring its own. And instead of owning it, to use modern parlance, it turned its back on on, pretending on didn't exist. So On swore to exact revenge upon the creator's cute little pets, its furred and feathered chess pieces, as a price for On's existential loneliness. On was a warning, an agent of the Lion of Death, an omen, a portent, a parable, a threat, a mystery, a disaster, a plague of one. 
an embodiment of the horror of history doomed to repeat every 30 years. Mag also memorized each hero's journey, from primary to purported first-person accounts to barroom boasts and rumors of brave, foolish citizens who confronted the monster, including the first recorded sacrifice sparing the village from siege was a baby hedgehog and a mother who refused to let go. We have forgotten their names. Dreider, an adult swan chosen to end the fourth second age, ran and hid under Fanag's bridge, which On destroyed, and then, like a finicky eater removing hated peas from shepherd's pie, it carefully brushed aside debris for the feather, meat, and viscera. In the fifth first age, a week prior to the ceremony, a small army bearing fangs of blade and arrow, financed and led by the mercurial merchant goats Kier and Tham Ride, traveled deep into the north wood and never returned, and we still sing their songs. The Fliner Rebellion of the Twelfth First Age, spearheaded by anarchist Gretchy Fliner, a charismatic owl, dressed in a self-ascribed peasant's uniform, rallied farmers and factory workers to take up arms instead of filling the sacrificial spots on the dais with their children, their blood. But rakes, spades, clubs, and too few shotguns were no match for on. And 227 villagers died. Mag worked deep into the night. Past the hour, Spire locked the ride hall doors. Past the bars closing and the choreographed half-hearted fights in the streets. She walked home alone, vigilant, but not afraid. And if anyone watched, if anyone followed, unseen, they would have spied Meg shivering in a black denim vest, unbuttoned and opened, displaying a red t-shirt plastered with the iconic portrait of Fliner, wide owl eyes turned upward toward unseen heights, revenge dreams and better days. Five. Year 16. Despite having very little contact beyond their yearly meal, the two Frera grew to consider themselves real sisters. They enjoyed their time together and promised to meet more often, knowing the promises were doomed to be broken. They were wary, defensive, on alert. The other was an adversary to be respected and feared. Their thrilling, pleasurable duels sharpened who they were to fine points. Oh yes, they were sisters. After all, they joked, they'd put in the time. Do I call you Dr. Mags now? I demand it be so. Plus a slight bow at the head when you say it. Of course. Congratulations again on your PhD, my dear. All those years of hard work, you've made your older sister very proud. Raised glasses. Thank you, Marith. That means a lot. So now what do you do, right? The ink isn't even dry on the diploma, and I'm already hectoring. As a newly minted research professor, I don't have to teach, thank goodness. So I'll continue to haunt Ride Hall, and my parents' house, apparently. I've temporarily moved back home. How is your mom? Holding up? Their sisterhood had been sealed for Mag when Merith had attended her father's funeral, carrying one white rose for his grave. The easy answer is, she's okay, she's managing. But she's sad and broken. She openly talks like she's looking forward to it, about the day when her heart will stop like Dad's did. She eats like a bird now, sighs more than talks. If Dad were here, he'd be so worried. But I can't get her to do much of anything beyond putter about the house. Sorry, this time of year does it to me every time. Merith reached across the table, placed her paw over Mag's. It's okay. Your father was a lovely man, and he helped raise a lovelier daughter. Mag pulled her paw away, hid it in her lap. That's only half right. I'm sad and broken, too. Merith finished her glass of wine, ordered another. Aren't we a pair of sad and broken, doomed to eternity within our ancestral homes? You say that with a little too much glee. It's the wine. Also, I say everything with glee. Otherwise, I'd always be screaming. Fair enough. But your house, weren't you thinking of selling it? I was, I am, I do. It's a warm daydream, so easy to get lost in. 
But then I think about all the cleaning and packing. There's nothing worse than packing. The worst. And I think, where else would I go? Where else should I be? I get it. But, uh, hey, speaking of the past, were we talking about the past? We were. I thought we were discussing real estate, though I suppose we're always discussing the past, in a way. Don't try mind tricks on the good doctor. Perish the thought. I've become friends with Penn. Toll sister. Do you know her? Only by name. Like you, I don't think she has ever set foot in the watering hole, so she has good judgment. Yeah, well, she's very nice. We connected or reconnected in Wright Hall when she was putting up flyers for a charitable event to raise funds for the sick residents of the Forge who can't afford rabies vaccines or pay their doctor's bills. She plans to build and run a free clinic within the next five years. She sounds too good to be true. Perhaps you should petition the council to have Penn replace me as your frera. Stop it. No need to be jealous, says. You know I'm teasing. I'm overjoyed to hear of you branching beyond books and scrolls. How about you? What's new and exciting? Aside from the charming regulars at the watering hole, I did twist and accidentally break the forepaw of that pig, Wendig, when I caught him rooting through the till. Charming. Elsewhere, my butcher newsletter has really taken off. Over 2,000 subscribers. Oh, I keep meaning to... You can add me. I know it's not your bailiwick. I cannot believe the butcher hasn't been caught yet. What are we up to, 20 victims? 25. Fucking hell. I agree. Our police force is incompetent. However, the butcher's ability to evade being seen by anyone who is still among the living, to enter homes and buildings seemingly like a vapor, to leave no physical evidence or clues, purported feats of physical strength and manipulation and staging of the bodies. It's almost supernatural. You don't believe that, do you? Not you. Maybe there's more than one perpetrator, some sort of conspiracy, but nothing supernatural. I don't know what I believe, Mag. That's the truth of it. You're judging me, aren't you? No, I'm not. Really, I'm not. I will share with you that I certainly don't believe the butcher is in service for the cultists. Have you heard that rumor? I have. That the butcher might be a cultist makes sense to me. It's more complicated than that, I think. I have some moles within the cult. They tell me the butcher's exploits are being celebrated as a sign of the end to come. But at the same time, as their political aspirations rise with their numbers... They are preparing to mount a PR campaign, accusing the press of waging a disinformation war. And they will target any columnist or newscaster who opines the butcher is a cultist. They can't be serious about their political aspirations, can they? How can they be anything but fringe, a loose screw or two within the council? It's not a matter of if, but when we'll have a cultist mayor. No, no way. I hope I'm wrong. Aside from my small army of amateur sleuths gathering butcher information, for the good of the community, of course, my other agenda is to prevent the cult from gaining more political clout, more than they already have. And they do have a considerable amount, I'm afraid, given their considerable coffers. Damn it. Well, that's almost as terrifying as the butcher. Sign me up. How often do you send out newsletters? Weekly. I just bought a computer, so cutting edge, right? And I plan to supplement with short daily electronic updates and messages. I hope Ride Hall won't go all electronic, though I suppose it's inevitable. Is everything inevitable? Evolve or die, Dr. Mag? Six. Year 18. Four bridges curled their aging spines across the Syme River. The Flind Bridge, farthest north and west, abutted the hydroelectric and waterworks plants. In recent years, the water level of the Syme had dropped due to exponentially increased water demand and the changing climate. The electric plant relied less on hydro and more on coal harvested from the Croning Mountains. 
and more on oil and suck from the muck of the green swamps. The butcher's 33rd victim was not that pig named Wendig. He had been the 26th, his trotters scattered to the four bridges. As salaciously entertaining is that the right word, as it all is. Sometimes it's difficult to keep track of all the loss. Anyway, the 33rd victim was the fifth cult member to die. There were enough victims to have subsets of victims. Cliff the Pelican worked third shift security at the electric plant. Most nights he didn't leave the glass security booth, keeping one rolling eye on video monitors, the other on his regimented game of solitaire. He prided himself for having never cheated. His title and role within the cult was not known by the average villager. Judging by the royal blue of his robe, he was high-ranking. Cliff was the first victim to be found alive, drawing crude lion faces on the marbled steps of the Cult of Awn's sacred meeting place, the home. He'd suffered an ice pick lobotomy via an orbital socket. He couldn't speak, and he clicked his beak and grinded glottal nonsense, his throat pouch undulated, a tattered flag in a storm. Dipping a feather into the sap-like blood leaking from his right eye, he made his art. Many of us began to believe the butcher would never be caught, would never be overcome, like time. The Syme River was a hard line dividing before, separating Old Town, New Town, and the densely populated Industrial North from the affluent homes, farms, wineries, and fisheries of the South. We referred to the South as the farms, though independent family farmers had long ago sold or lost their land to one of the two corporate agricultural conglomerates. The family farmers could no longer afford to live in the farms. The water that ran clear and fast from the mountains turned sluggish with sediment and pollution by the time it oozed into Old Town. The gondolas and riverboats still paddled and peddled romantic water dreams. Depending on the time of day or night, upon the direction of the wind, the smell was chemical, tanging and itching deep in the sinuses, or the fecal smell of waste, the sewerage of today, the decay of tomorrow. There was a fragile hope for some, a sweeping, too expensive and restrictive and unbevorian, cried the congloms, commitment to cleaning the river, was to finally pass legislation prior to the next council elections. Old Town had been decreed the historically significant district, a thin rectangular strip along the river veined with cobblestone streets, huddled and crowded buildings over 200 years old. The sins of the past they'd witnessed, now charming secrets and lessons long forgotten. Stum University and Ride Hall marked the outer borders of Old Town. Like the rings of a tree, New Town and the fevered business hustle, concrete, steel, pavement, buses, trolleys, gritted streets, and shrinking, lotted green spaces and homes swelled around Old Town and threatened to consume it. On walks to and from Ride Hall, Spire imagined her tightening asthmatic chest as the municipal squeeze, part of why she hadn't retired. She could better ignore the expansion, the insatiable mandate of progress from the insides of her beloved library. Her last night closing Ride Hall was caught on surveillance cameras, the same cameras she'd described to anyone who'd listen, as ugly intrusionary eyesores pockmarking the sacred building. Spire, the great old rabbit, was still wearing the hat that hid her tired ears, toward the rooms and their stacks, time nor ultimate destination seemingly of concern. Spire held a breezy conversation with herself about the merits of her leftover squash and carrot stew waiting at home. Pinned under one arm, a slim volume on the barred apple bob, a quaint to some historical footnote. A drunk mob had dumped bushels of apples, along with Mayor Bard, into the syme to protest austerity measures. A camera with a blinking red motion-detecting eye followed her progress as she wraithed alongside blurring shelves of books the biography section, alphabetical by subject. That there could be so many books, their voices stilled, mostly forgotten, made some of us think of death and we were afraid. Made some of us think of death. And we leaned closer to the viewing screen. Then, from behind Spire, a book fell from a shelf about chest height, 
a single thudding clap, timed with her soft footfall. The jarring noise spurred her forward. Another book fell, and another, and more books spit out, their crash landings syncopated with each of her increasingly frantic steps. None of us can outrun every disaster. On the video, it appeared the books were pouring out of her back and bricking the floor, plating a path behind her heels, a path of where she was. One newscaster described the books as falling like leaves in an attempt to be poetic. But leaves didn't plummet. Their collision with the ground didn't echo a lament and then lay permanently stilled. The spire eventually stopped and straightened, resigned, perhaps. Behind spire, coiled within a shelf she just moments ago walked past. The butcher. This footage would be replayed and replayed and replayed and replayed and replayed and replayed and replayed. In one frame, the shelf was an empty space. The next, it was filled with the butcher, unfolding from the bookshelf to the floor in a herky-jerky stop-motion animated manner that made us wonder if there were more frames missing from the video. The butcher held an ice pick in one hand, a dagger in the other, wore what appeared to be a cultist's robe, its color indeterminable. The video quality was grainy and a ghostly green. Colors were not real colors on that night in Ride Hall. Upon closer inspection, the robe was not made from cloth and was stiff, striated with scars, and would later be identified by experts in such matters as being made of stitched animal hides. Spire was rooted in place, and she held out the book not as a weapon or a shield, but in the desperate way she always held out books. Come and see what I have. Come and see what was and wonder with me. Please. The butcher fell upon her, a storm of arms and steel. The networks blurred the images, muted the sounds. We have the luxury of looking away from the worst of it, for now. In a way, the blurring of the image was another desecration, the formless, then motionless pixelated blob sped up Spire's erasure from our plane. In all the other ways, the uncensored video and soundtrack was worse. Couldn't be unseen. Couldn't be unheard. The website hosting Merritt's wildly popular Butcher News Group hosted the leaked uncensored video which then was quickly downloaded and circulated on the infant internet, along with conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy. Those paranoid and ignorant viruses were our new folk tales. After Spire's death, the butcher, covered in blood, walked toward the camera, filling the screen, showing off the lion painted onto the mask. The video ended, blinking first. This horrible night at Ride Hall, incredibly, improbably, but not impossibly, marked an inflection point in the political ascendance of the cult of On. 7. Year 21. She was careful to follow quietly, to keep her distance, keep it from her sister, another secret hoarded, one that itched to escape. She didn't have her mask to protect her. The sun stalled high over the Limwood canopy. A full day's walk from the outskirts of before, the air was cleaner than her memory of clean air. Toll's older sister Pen, map and compass in hand, obsession pumping through her heart, navigated and drove their group of four east. This was the second day of her first week-long vacation, after eight months of working 60-hour weeks at the Rilt Sons Free Clinic and Palliative Care Co-op. The Rills were Voles who had lived in the forge, respected, if criminally underpaid, machinists, parents of four sons, all of whom died before the age of 19 from rare nervous disorders linked to mercury, lead, and a periodic table-length list of other toxins. The Rills won a landmark lawsuit against the industrialist Lund Runt, the rooster, owner of a quadrangle of chemical factories. Their wastewater and smokestacks choked the Rills' tenement building. 
The Rilts were terminally ill when the gavel miraculously dropped in their favor. With so many residents in the Fords without health insurance or the means for health, they founded and funded the clinic. Penn's husband, Paul, a tall and willowy fowler's toad, wilted under the weight of his pack, asked, Is it time for lunch yet? He was a mathematics teacher, unusually exacting and stern for someone of his appearance, fiercely forgiving and loyal outside of school when he wasn't in charge of anything. Penn said, When we find a clearing, and doused a path through the brown and green brush. Mag paused her march, stretched her neck, turned up her snout, attuned to the forest's olfactory syntax of long grass, wild flowers, leaves, pine needles, mildew, moss, lichen, bark, sap, and soil. There was underlying a hint, a familiar waft of musk, a breath of threat she'd previously associated with late, paranoid nights skulking home to Old Town. She had assumed then what she had smelled was the fermented vinegar of her own fear and excitement. To be in the verdant now, with that scent memory, misting in the hollows, was disorienting. Hunge was an Irish setter and retriever mix, Mag's partner of two years, professor of mycology at Stum University, equally reckless with enthusiasm for his own opinions as well as his attention to and affection for others. He asked, what is it? Then declared, I don't smell anything. Mag rolled her eyes at the question, growled at his preemptive dismissal. He bent, rooted under the grass, resurfaced with a chanterelle, bright orange and funnel-shaped, and he held it out to her like a forgive-me rose. I apologize. I know your nose knows. Mag ate the mushroom, said it tastes like shit. She didn't like mushrooms, which made Hunge that much more charming. He held a paw over his easy, unwounded heart, and they howled laughter. Mag sprinted headlong as fast as she'd always been in daydreams. Hunch chased but lacked the fearless, reckless commitment to speed. Mag overtook Paul and smacked his bony butt as she passed. She didn't bring a pack or a tent or a sleeping bag or food, yet was prepared to spend a night in the woods alone. A vigil and a fast, watching, listening dreaming. Penn found a suitable clearing a few sweeps of her watch's shorter arm past lunch. The foursome erected two tents, built a fire hemmed within a ring of stones. After dinner and tea, warmed by flame and whiskey, they waited for the stars to show off eternity. With a crooked stick, Paul traced mythic constellations. And after a few more drinks, he made some up. Later, Hunge and Paul staggered to their tents, singing a drunken song. Mag stirred the coals, conjuring new flames from the glowing embers, and asked Penn, Were you able to find where we are on your map? Two within a square foot. My geomatics and cartography degree is finally being put to use. Sorry, Mom and Dad. I suppose you don't get to use maps at the co-op clinic. Afraid not. How is it? I don't want to talk about it. Not out here. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. Don't be. I love my colleagues and the patients. As sad and infuriating and awful as it all is, the work we're doing is my life's work, at least for now. But when I'm away, I need to be fully away. Mag added another log to the fire. Gray smoke billowed from the loose, damp bark. When we do this again in the North, it won't be as easy a holiday. I am well aware. I know, I'm reminding myself. I too often fantasize about what it will be like in those woods and to see the monster again. And, and then I wonder what building a future generation might name for us in our failed attempt. Penn laughed. A new waste station, probably. Dare to dream. Have you found any usable northern maps? I found one with the Northwood painted as a vast green sea filled with serpents and monsters. That probably won't do. I'll keep looking. If you can believe it, there are stacks upon stacks of books and scrolls in Ride Hall that haven't been touched in hundreds of years. After sitting in silence, basking in the fire's warm glow, Penn pulled Toll's blue beret from her jacket.
now that we're here, I don't want to burn it, but I don't want to bring it back. I've always brought it back with me. I can't bring it back this time. She needed the tattered thinning fabric. Maybe it will disappear between my hands, like magic. Mag didn't say anything. She wasn't supposed to. Penn stood, approached the fire pit, tested the temperature of the stones with the toe of a boot. She lifted one of the larger rocks as though it were a trapdoor to the underworld, dropped the beret into its shadow, and closed the door. She straightened and stretched and asked, Do either of those chuckleheads know this is our grand practice run? I haven't told my chucklehead yet. What about Marith? Have you talked to her about coming with us? Your dinner with her is coming up again. I haven't, and I don't know if I will. I go back and forth. We need numbers. We do. You don't think she could handle it? I love him to pieces, but if we bring Paul, we could bring anyone. Oh, she could definitely handle it. Maybe too well, she thought. Mag thought it loud enough that 50 feet away, 15 feet up, hidden within the bicycle spokes of a tree, Marith heard it. Marith was both alarmed and pleased, and not for the first time, nor the last, wondered, how well do you know me? dear sister. The next morning, the Forsa moved their camp another day east toward the edge of Penn's map. They spent two more nights in the accommodating Limwood. Then the group headed home and passed through the footprint and the memory of their first camp. Penn stood at the outer ring of the Ashfield fire pit and asked, should we break this up? She didn't want Toll's hat, but she also didn't want it marked where she could easily find it again. In the light of a new day, she wasn't sure which of the rocks of the past covered it. Paul said, nah, let Mag tell one of her graduate students about a recently uncovered ritual site to be studied. Mag tugged Penn's elbow and gently led her away. If Penn had overturned every stone, she wouldn't have found the blue hat. 7. Year 25. Zant Lanra, a bear gone gray around the muzzle, managing editor of the Bivore Gazette's prize-winning investigative journalist unit, Moonlight, exposed avarice, corruption, fraud, malfeasance for more than two decades. She published a five-part series about the seven years since the murder of the archivist in Ride Hall, how the event spider-webbed into convoluted conspiracy to the benefit of the cult and politicians ravenous for power, and how much overlap there now was between those two circles. The final part of the scathing series outlines sweetheart real estate deals in Newtown, land grabs in the West, South, and Limwood, plus tax breaks for the cult. Mayor Izzy Flank, a warthog with only one tusk, former police chief, once charged but acquitted of racketeering, along with a growing majority of the council, a cadre of industrialists, the cult-owned media empire Todd News, and fearful villagers of a common political stripe, condemned Moonlight combating their impeccable and vetted sources with rumors and lies, referring to the Gazette as foul paper. Nine days after the finale of the series published, Zant Lanra was last seen enjoying an afternoon cup of tea and honey at Café Blue in Old Town. Three days later, in the dark of pre-dawn, a commuter gondola's oarsman and unpleasant twitchy otter named Nash, known around the old town dock for his pugilistic and reactionary leanings, rumored to be too ornery and unpleasant even for the cult, made his initial morning run without noticing Zant's body slashed and lashed to the prow of his gondola. Most objective Bivorians found his late discovery of the body hard to swallow. He returned to shore with a sardine smile after hundreds of Old Town residents and commuters witnessed the bear's riverboat humiliation. Nash was not charged with murder, but was fined for negligence and willfully disturbing a crime scene. He boasted to anyone who would listen, he wanted to give butcher victim number 47 a number in dispute, a proper send-off. The home was the oldest building in Newtown, 
a modest two-story clapboard and cedar shingle dwelling painted yellow and outcast of Old Town at the time of its construction. It initially hosted clandestine candlelit meetings. The low ceilings and thick walls hoarded survivors' tears and whispers from the fearful and fatalistic. The founding cult members driven and desperate to find meaning and solace within the incomprehensible awe and terror of acceptance and worship. Situated so, the dome of Ride Hall was visible from a second-floor hallway window, perhaps an unconscious symbol, the most honest telling kind, that the true knowledge they claimed to seek would remain beyond their reach while sequestered inside the home. During the prior Second Age, the first floor was gutted, repurposed, reshaped into a ceremonial hall. The home now dotted the center of a campus larger than Stum University, the cult's founding was a purposeful mystery, with multiple conflicting origin stories involving mysticism and supernatural acts defying interior logic, never mind regular logic, none of which are worth our time, frankly. The cult insulated information from non-members, they call this chaff, with insider jargon, wealth, court-backed legalese, peer intimidation, tactics that have always been successful. The Dawn Room, a perched hollow on the home's second floor, once boasted a view of the sun rising golden over a modest garden. Now, morning light didn't leak over the monolithic campus quad peaks until mid-morning. The Dawn Room was reserved for cult members who had gained Wana status, highest level of enlightenment. Four Wana sat at a round cottage oak table, the wood fabled to have come from the north, an avuncular fabrication the kind upon which faiths and empires were built. The Wana were so enlightened they didn't wear their robes. They served barrel-aged liquors they sipped moderately, as their quarterly review was a working lunch. They grazed from an autumn harvest-themed basket, a lousy veggie tray, according to the Brewster Lundrunt Jr., the youngest Wana. The others rolled their eyes and correctly interpreted his complaint as disappointment that there were no greasy fish sticks or fries. Go getting cult members wearing their stratified robes cycled through the dawn room, presenting reports on the newly installed wall-sized sharp screen. Colorful pie charts and potency point presentations displayed deep data analytics on recruitment numbers and trends, website and social media traffic, online search numbers, print and electronic media mentions, financials and funds, real estate holdings and developments, strategic planning of the capital campaign to fund a campus in the South to be tent-polled by increased donations from lower-tiered cult members, and lastly, the latest polling numbers on council members and an early, never too early, forecast of future mayoral candidates. The presentations ended, sharp screen logged off and powered down, handlers and assistants dismissed, food basket picked clean, tumblers empty. The four Wana ceremoniously shut off their phones and placed them face down on the oak table. A silver horse named Klompt adjusted his handsome plaid vest and said, Any other business? Zant Nanra was a mistake, said Melk, the eldest Wana, a self-described oilman, though his fortune had long since sourced from the crude. He was a roomy-eyed, graying brown bear and dyed his fur blonde. Take it up with the butcher. Ranks, a raccoon, owned three breweries and scores of bars, and was the mayor's deputy of the interior. Bored by the old bear's physical and mental softness, proud the journalist's murder was her idea, she added, the media has already turned in our favor. We finally get to dismiss the other side as being the batshit crazy conspiracy theorists. The murder of the journalist investigating the cult of On had been expertly spun like wheat into irony, to somehow mean the butcher endeavored to frame and cast the cult as the dastardly villain. The butcher did so in an attempt to foment fear into outrage directed at the cult and its myriad business partners and interests, which would set off a chain reaction to still the great grinding gears of the Bivorian economy. One side of the political aisle clamored for more protection from this bloodthirsty anarchist and his radical collectivist politics, more protection for the cult and its vested fiduciary concerns for the good of all. Lundrunt Jr. said, I want to discuss our terrible lunch. I'm not a grazer, a forager, or a garbage eater. Rank said, someone get this child a bag of fish sticks. If we're lucky, he'll choke. Lund huffed and puffed. The gall! 
that to Marinty. You're not nice. Nice has nothing to do with anything. Never has. Ranks raised a flask that had been hiding in her handbag. To kill the brain cells that locked you, saying to Marinty. It's temerity, by the way, you oaf. Go fuck yourself. Friends, that's enough. Klom didn't shout to be heard. He didn't need to. His timing, impeccable, his low voice placating. The blasts of air expelled from wide nostrils, threatening. Our future mayor will have fish sticks waiting for him once we finish here. It's not an unreasonable request. Once an orphaned foal of unknown origin, two kindly farming badgers adopted Klomp. He inherited the soy farm upon their passing when he was 18. In the years since, his rise has been impossible to map. The breadth of his portfolio and influence, associations with businesses large and small, associations with, as whispered by those who foolishly dared to do so, various and varying criminal enterprises were so clandestine, their cat's cradle interconnections so convoluted, a true accounting remains unknown, even to your humble author. Thank you, Klomp, for your uh, foresight. Lun smoothed his comb, which was not as tall as Daddy's. And with your support, I will mare like no one's ever mared in the history of before. Klomp and Ranks exchanged looks, dropping the temperature in the room. Melk said, if I may return us to the concerns of the present. He tried for dignity, but didn't achieve it. I know I'm the worrier of this group, as its oldest member. Rank said, certainly our blondest member. Melk was too old to be baited. I think it's a mistake. Please elaborate, said Klomp. The truth seeks light and all that. The otter talks too much. Lund grunted. He did that well. We've been through this. Rank stood and unsteadily paced the room. The river otter doesn't know anything, just like Lund. Which makes him all the more dangerous, said Melk. Do we disappear him, too? Lund smiled, satisfied that he'd contributed, then daydreamed about everyone he would disappear when mayor. Wait, did you mean him, him was dangerous, or me, him? Yes, Melk said. Rank showed her small nicotine-stained teeth. How about the other pronoun? By we, do you mean the royal we? Klomp's eyes, as large as apples, opaque as stone, unblinking, remained pinned to milk, staring into someone's bleak future. In time, he said. Mel couldn't parse the horse's carefully enunciated phrase. Had Klomp meant to say, in due time, all in good time, or that the otter's disappearance would occur in the nick of time? The two words by themselves left too much unsaid. Mel continued speaking, as though rationalizing his anxiety. We're risking further antagonizing the real butcher, who has already killed 18 of our brethren. That's an unofficial number, Rank said. It's more like 22. Lund said the number is overblown. Even if it isn't, he only kills losers. Besides, it's not like the butcher is going to tell on us, am I right? The latter phrase would become his insipid campaign slogan plastered on hats, t-shirts, buttons, and digital avatars. No, never, not once have you ever been right, Rank said. Klomp stood to his full height, eclipsing the room, looming over milk. Regardless of that number's accuracy or impending increase, the butcher is a tool we will use to trim the fat remove warts, or whatever metaphor you find the most palatable. Now, dear Melk, did you have any other concerns I might assuage? The horse could intimidate and threaten and follow through. Melk said, I wonder if the esteemed royal we might consider trimming Marith Grom. Her most recent podcast episode is causing quite the stir online. She argues Zant is not one of the butcher's victims. Terrified as he was, Melk would be damned if he rolled over and completely exposed his belly. Correctly, I might add. No. Why not? 
You're very astute, Melk, but in a reverse kind of way. Fancy astute, if there was such a word. Clomped Winnie to laugh. I enjoy her podcast, for one. It's irreverent, smart, and cruelly logical. Whether or not she knows anything about the butcher is immaterial. Oh, I suspect she knows quite a bit. I view her as a potential asset. If you three don't mind my having already taken the initiative, he paused and held out hooves to the room, and stared at each member until they looked away. No one objected. I've deemed Ms. Grom, with her considerable net worth, familial political legacy, and formidable digital platform, to be a recruit of interest. Lunn found his voice again. Shouldn't we vote on that? Rank said, oh, look who wants votes to be actually counted now. Lunn laughed, pointed a wing at the raccoon, and said, touche. Don't point those stubby feathers at me, and it's touche, dumbass. Clomp said, we've extended an invitation for Merith to join our merry band at an accelerated tier. She said yes. Eight. Year 30. Five days to the ceremony. The Chamber of Commerce, in tandem with the construction company owned by Mayor Lundrun Jr.'s oldest son, Bun, his employees called him Bunzo, were late in completing their work to prepare the commons for the biggest ceremony yet. Bun's company, having won the lucrative contracting bid, cut all corners, erecting the Runt Amphitheater. The mayor insisted it be large enough to accommodate the fawning audience for his address and monthly rallies. The abandoned, condemned Krolt Brothers ceramic tile factory sagged at the northeastern border of the Forge and Northwood like a deflated toadstool. Once a favored spot for teens and urban explorers, the factory was purportedly haunted. Ghosts of the butcher's victims collected in the darkest rooms, forgotten corners, under stairs and tables, their eyes and wounds glowing. If you locked eyes with one of the apparitions, you were to be the next victim. Hundreds of stories had been written and shared on online message boards and wiki pages, along with fake videos and video fakes of a trotterless Wendig ghost. Within Bevor's considerable homeless population, rumor had it the butcher used the factory as home base, performed blood rituals, palavered with the floating lion head of death. The night before their morning rendezvous, Mag turned rumor into legend, scaring away a group of squatters with yellow bedding linen worn like a robe and a well-timed growl. Pre-dawn, Mag, her one-time partner Hunge, and Penn met inside the tile factory. Others had quit the group two months ago. Their expedition, years in the planning, once had featured as many as seven members, was now apparently down to three. Penn's husband, Paul, stayed home with their two young children. The night before Penn left for the factory, she read two bedtime books to little Lata and Vil. Lata, as skinny and wriggly as a tadpole, sometimes slept under his bed with a flashlight. He wanted to see everything, even when he knew it would scare him. Vil might spend an hour sticking balled-up clothes and stuffed toys under her blanket to transform her bed into a relief map of a mountain range on the moon or another planet so that she might have better dreams. Born one year apart, they weren't twins, but they had their own language and a way to meld their two minds. They knew without knowing something big and scary was happening with Mom. So they asked her to read a third book, they asked for a story about Uncle Toll and his magic blue hat. They asked again where Mom was going. They wanted to go on an adventure, too. They insisted they were big enough, strong enough. Penn agreed they were strong, brave, and smart, which was why she needed them to look after Daddy, because he didn't do well by himself. They asked if Daddy was afraid of the dark. Penn zipped her lips shut, then nodded. They giggled. They said they were not afraid of anything, their eyes brimming tears. Phil insisted Mom give her sleep kisses. Lotta said he wanted some of those too. Penn asked what sleep kisses were. Phil sighed as if they were all so elementary. 
She said, sleep kisses or kisses, dry ones, no wet lips, please, on the top of the head. You give them to someone when they are asleep and dreaming, but you don't wake them up. They stay on your head longer if you don't wake up. Penn promised she would give them sleep kisses, lots of them. The hardest part was just one more sleep kiss pressed to a warm forehead before leaving. Mag, Conge, and Penn checked and rechecked their supply packs, which had been stored in the subflooring, hidden by a leaf pile of loose boards and tiles. Conge said, we're officially one hour overdue. The sun will be out soon. Now, can I ask where the fuck is Merith? I knew we couldn't rely on a cultist. Last week, Mag and Merith had their annual fair at dinner. The meal was dour, dampened by the outlandish expedition and their expectations of each other. There wasn't the usual banter, as chaotic and choreographed as a fencing match. Merith said she wasn't superstitious, but thought not meeting on the traditional day was bad luck. In the hours and days that followed, Merith ignored Mag's calls, texts, and knocks on her door. The two Frere did not have the shared mind of Penn's children, but Mag was not surprised Merith didn't show at the factory. Mag said maybe she got cold feet, just like your fawning little grad students. Mag knew that wasn't fair to Hunch, nor fair to Merith, but she said it anyway. Then to her dear friend, Penn, I'm sorry. No need to be sorry. It's not your fault. I'm still going in. This is our only chance. Penn opened Merith's pack, added ten more poison-tipped arrows to her quiver, and an automatic handgun. She said, even with her no-show, Merith did her job. She got us weapons. The group left the remains of Merith's pack behind, including two long blades, tamed and scarred leather scabbards. Light rain misted as they exited the haunted factory, weighed down with the ghosts of the past, present, and future, and slipped through a mouthy hole in the rusted chain-linked fence and into the primeval Northwood. From a third-floor window, the glass fogged and cracked. Marith watched Mag trudge into the green canopy through the eye holes of her mask. She wanted to go into the woods to fight alongside them, or to kill them at Aunt's feet. Why not both? Merith did not believe in destiny, not in the conventional sense. She'd learned blades and flesh were fickle, perfect partners. She was convinced dearest Mag, who Merith loved in a way a child might love a bug kept in a jar, would find her end awash in blood and she felt duty-bound to witness. It wasn't too late. Merith could gather her pack, the two blades, and maybe two more, and hunt into the woods after them. She could also haunt the woods, go in her own direction, one of her choosing. One left a chance. There was an undeniable appeal to slipping away unseen into the forest with nary a ripple in the branches and leaves. The lion mask reflected in the window. The mouth moved as though chewing. It said, remember, I chose you. Merith pulled off the mask and pirouetted away from the window, holding the lion at the highest height above her head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, lion face, have you ever thought maybe, just maybe, that I chose you? Merith was dizzy with fear and pleasure and a limb-thrumming want for the lion to speak more. The lion was patient. We make and will continue to make a good team. Go team. What do you want, Merith? Do you want to go north? Do you want to live alone with the trees and your memories for the rest of your long life? Do you want me to make it a short life instead? Do you want to die between Ons molars or toes? Do you want to die now? A ceiling collapse or something in town, something more splashy, something with a bit more public spectacle. 
Or do you want to continue our work and before? Tomorrow night is your night. It's the night I promised you almost thirty years ago. If you still want it. Merith knew what it was she wanted, and yet she wanted more. She said, want, want, want. Want is a tricky thing when coupled with the disappointment of getting. Oh, I promise you won't be disappointed. Not on this night. Not on your night. But you get to choose. You always get to choose. I only require you say what it is you want. Merith was not in a trap. At least she didn't believe she was. She said to the mask, If I were to flay you open, would you bleed too? What if I were to roll you up, leave you here, tuck you into a hole in the wall to never be found, unless you screamed for help loudly? The lion mask was silent. Merith could not abide silence. She said, I'm joking, of course. I would never disrespect you like that. Don't mind me, I'm having a midlife crisis. What does it all mean, you know? She was being more honest than she intended. The years of youth and blood suddenly seemed like something that had happened to someone else, as though she couldn't remember how the blood felt, smelled, and tasted. Now, sometimes it first appeared shy, clinging tightly to fur, feather, and hide. Other times, the eager blood was an explosion, a geyser, always rushing, always escaping from the present into the past. She put the mask on, fitting her mouth into the lion's, and listened to her own exaggerated breathing. There was no question she would stay in before. The big night was coming. The biggest night, as that sack of shit mayor might say. Four days to the ceremony. To mark the end of the second age, there was to be another lottery to select the three brave citizens who would stand on the dais and face on for the good of before. By rule, the chosen three were to be adults who were children at the time of the first age's ceremony. Breaking with the tradition of holding the lottery within council chambers, Mayor Lundrunt Jr. and his lead advisor, Klompt, invited hand-picked council members and CEOs to his office. This was the first lottery in modern memory not to be overseen by union heads, a now-dying breed. Police dispersed protesters who had gathered outside with the help of batons, shields, rubber bullets, and tear gas. The mayor said, We're all busy, and to save us time, my dad, a great man, a great, great man, taught me time is precious, and not to spend more than you have. I have already pulled three names from the lottery barrel. I almost got a splinter from that old thing. I think it's time for a new one. He waved a wing, as though the barrel was right there in the room. The lottery committee chortled. The one egregiously slimy sycophant thanked the mayor for risking grievous injury on everyone's behalf. The mayor pulled three balled-up scraps of paper from his trouser pocket, dropped them on the table like he was tossing pennies at a beggar. Each name had been written sloppily. Two names were misspelled, but... There was no doubt as to their identities. Three days to the ceremony. Mag woke with the sun. Unge and Pen asleep in their tents. She started a fire, boiled water for tea, and wrote in the blank pages of a new journal. Back at her house, hidden between her mattress and box spring, were three filled journals, each cover a different color. The first journal, golden yellow, a golem, made from her words, comprised solely of letters to her deceased parents, addressed to one or the other, rarely both. Her journaling has evolved to allow entries addressed to other animals who have been in and out of her life, practicing conversations she wanted to have, initiating conversations she wasn't brave enough to start. Dear Mom and Dad, 
The air is different here. Cleaner, obviously, yet thicker somehow. It's like breathing in the age of this place, which isn't quite what I mean, because like Dad would always say, every place is the same age. Not sure how the archaeologist feels about that. Okay, so it's more like I'm breathing the air of the past, the air from before us. There's not a hint of before. It's wonderfully disorienting. The ground is thick with moss, roots, lichen. The trees are greener, huddled closer, and they keep the sunlight to themselves. I miss home, the concept of home, of what it once was, of what it once meant, with a longing that is irrational. Yet I want to stay, although I know why I am here, and I know it's a matter of time before I am expelled. Love, Mag. Dear Spire, you'd be pleased to know of all the Northwood maps you'd cataloged, the most helpful is perhaps the most fanciful. The map of the Northwood Seas has been uncannily accurate in marking glacial boulders and streams. We are only five miles south of On's purported lair. Alas, the map's monstrous menagerie, including the winged serpent Bix, has been greatly exaggerated, much to our relief and disappointment. If On's lair is where it says it is, I'll be tempted to continue north to see the edge of the world and perhaps meet you there. Yours, Mag. Dear Merith, when I first proposed this expedition, you'd quipped it was a suicide mission. Death by on, or more likely, death by boredom. Camping wasn't your thing. Well, for the moment, I remain among the living, barely, and stubbornly. I am beyond thankful for your supply help, and Penn is as well. Never mind that cur, Hunge. You never cease to amaze, confound, and slightly terrify me. I lean, perhaps almost falling over, toward gullibility, but I never thought you were going to join us in this fight. You are engaged in a fight of your own. I don't know what it is. I fear it is an ugly one. Still, I had hoped against hope that you were going to come with us. If nothing else, I would have paid good money to see your cosmopolitan cat's feral reaction to this forest. I joke, but I've always admired how adaptable, how chameleon-like you are. I tell others when they ask about you, and I'm asked frequently, that given the number of citizens you know and the social strata borders you cross without a self-conscious thought, you are the real mayor of Bivore. If only, right? If I return from this, I wonder who we will be to each other and who we will be to ourselves. Yours, Mag. At the home, cultists buzzed in their hive, making final preparations for the biggest and most important meeting and sacred celebration of the Second Age. Kant, a squat, nervous you, head of the celebratory committee, was responsible for overseeing the decorations, the centerpieces, the appetizers and aperitifs, the candles and candelabras, stage construction in the garden quad for the two opening musical acts to be live-streamed on the Colts' website, the seating chart, the speaker order. Kant asked everyone and anyone she passed by, where is Merith with the programs? The programs needed to be numbered, QR-coded, and later scanned when they were to be collected at the end of the meeting. She had one job. Upstairs in the dawn room, clomped alone, smoked a cigar, and stamped out small brush fires, metaphorically speaking, via speakerphone. Assorted packs and big money contributors were not pleased with the mayor, or more accurately, were not pleased with their lack of mayoral agenda input. Clomped assured there was a solution to every problem, if they and their wallets were serious enough. Peter, a sweaty lemur, timed his entrance with the hang-up. He carried an open laptop as though it might explode. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. I think you need to see this. The latest episode of Merritt's Butcher podcast had just dropped. Title, Five Years Later, What Really Happened to Zant Lanra? 
Clomp said, I am aware. Marath and I already had a long, fascinating discussion about this episode not two days ago. I even bought ad time. Pricey, but it's sure to be worth the investment. Respectfully, sir, have you listened yet? You would said I need to see it. Oh, my apologies. It has a runtime of almost two hours, Peter. I'm a wee bit busy. He exhaled a cloud of smoke as billowing, choking, and dangerous as ego. Can you give me the gist? Merith speculates I really can't speak to the quality or uh, the identity of her sources at this time. That Zan was not a victim of the butcher, which of course we all know to be true, but was instead murdered at the behest of the cult. Is that so? I'm afraid this episode is trending. We have already received press inquiries asking for a response. She doesn't name names per se, but heavily implies, implicates. Peter didn't finish the sentence. He closed the laptop and scratched behind an ear. He stared at a wall, not at the war horse leavening from his chair, and he briefly indulged in a running away fantasy. This is unexpected. Clomp twirled a hoof, a speak now or forever hold your tongue as I might hold it for you, gesture. Yes, sir, and, um, libelous. Shall I alert legal? Is Maris on campus? Is she in the building? I assume she was to pitch in with the celebration committee, though it appears we probably should stop making assumptions about her. She is not here. I have checked myself. Thank you, Peter. That will be all. Leave your laptop with me. Peter placed the laptop on the table, wiped his hands on his thighs, and backed out of the room. Clomped pushed the computer to the floor and crushed it under a hoof. He called an associate who called three more, requesting they look for Merith at her place of employment and her house, requesting that they look hard. With the room quiet, the preparations in the hall below, a thrumming murmur. He mournfully snuffed out the glowing embers at the end of his cigar. Merith in her ancestral home, with the lights out, curtains closed. The unfolded programs fueled the flames in the fireplace. A communion. A ritual older than the cult. Older than before. Fire could be controlled until it couldn't. One of her father's many daggers, the blade provocatively curled, pinned the sole remaining program to the wall above the mantel. In the dimming firelight, the lion mask draped over one paw, a red pencil in the other, Merith set to working out where she would fit within the program. Her planning interrupted by a heavy pounding on her front door, followed by broken glass and other sounds associated with the brutish, amateurish entry. Merith put on the mask, eager to participate in pre-programmed festivities. Dusk. Mag, Pen, and Hunch set up camp in a clearing, the first they'd encountered since entering the Northwood. The trees parted reluctantly, exposing the base of a hill furred in short shrubs and long grasses. More of a hillock, said Hunge. Mag and Penn conspired with the map, took turns saying, well, this is the spot. The map outlined nothing but more forest to the north of On's crude silhouette. Hunge loosened the rifle strapped to his pack, wielded it like an ungainly extra limb. How are we supposed to track the fucking thing? He trudged up the hillock's incline. When there are no broken trees, no sunken footprints anywhere. Meg was suddenly overwhelmed by the years spent in school. The years spent in the Ride Hall archives. The years spent studying histories, secret histories, legends, and lies. Overwhelmed at her smallness, her finiteness. Hunge at the hilltop, twirled, weather-veined, shouted, shouldn't we be able to smell it or hear it? Penn smushed the map into Mag's chest. Are you saying the monster is not out here somewhere? Hunge jogged down the slope to join the huddle. Panting, he said, no, I'm frustrated and scared. And 
maybe relieved. Pen and Hunge rehashed an old argument about ambushing on during the ceremony, which perhaps might inspire others to fight back. With a waning commitment to Hunge, a waning commitment to her cause, to causes and ideas in general, Penn said they would not, under any circumstances, reenact the failed Fliner Rebellion and its hundreds of innocent dead. Hunge claimed no one was innocent, the desperate canard of the intellectually and morally outmatched. He lamented they were instead cosplaying Keir and Tham Ride, the famous disappearing goats, the hero fools or fool's heroes. Mag didn't engage, tilted her head at the hill, which struck her as odd-shaped, misplaced, unnatural, cruelly obvious. Mag asked, Hey, Mr. Mycologist, do you have a professional opinion on the surrounding flora? Hun said, What? Oh, well, given my lack of first-hand experience with this region and its moist mid-latitude climate, volleying to renew their battle, Penn said, I thought it felt more highland or highland adjacent. No. Anyway, a small glade, glade, a clearing like this could be the result of a long-ago fire or inconducive soil or more likely laminated root rot caused by fungus. It's always fungus with you. Mag said, I meant specifically the hill. Hillock. Whatever, Mag said and groaned. Look at it again, please. Tell us why there aren't any trees growing on it. It's probably a boulder or boulders covered in only a few inches of soil. Or... Exactly. Or... Mag continued pointing at the hill accusing it. The rifle in Hunge's hand shook as though he were preventing it from flying away. No. No. Right? Penn said, shit, we're idiots. The evening began with a video reenactment of the cult's fabled first meeting. Candlelit, somber, solemn. Animals in clay masks spoke in hushed, delicate voices, yet powerful enough to stir the dust of history, according to a full-throated narrator. The camera soft-focused on the humbled and reverent gathering. Then the image blurred, and the camera carried our eye to the wooden pioneer walls, built by forgotten hands that continue to hold us and point the way. The cultist's flickering shadows expanded, combined, grew into the shape of mighty on. Thank you, Digicity Lights and Effects. The narrator recited the opening line in the Book of On. We can only be we forever within your embrace. The lights turned up, an insidious four-chord pop song kicked in. The MC jogged onto the elevated stage, put on his mask, adjusted his wireless mic, and barked, Roll call! The members divided into regional chapters, competed to be named the chapter of the Second Age, applauded and chanted and held up signs. South Prime East will always bring it on. One chapter was not defined by region or neighborhood. These stridently pious members remained unnamed. Purposefully seated in the rear by the organizers, they held their books and assorted sacred artifacts or sat on their hands, refusing to applaud throughout the bloated event that, as it dragged on, spent more time talking about the cult's growing influence and plans to remake before than the promise and hope of On's final visit and their accompanying journey to the paradise beyond the North. The headline speaker, clomped, eventually strolled onto the stage in full regalia, impossibly tall, his robe black, magisterial. His shoed hooves gaveled the stage floor, echoes of the past, warnings from the future. Within the latex confines of his featureless white mask, there was no mistaking his equine profile, his piercing walnut eyes. The overhead lights dimmed, candles extinguished, but for stalagmitic ones adorning the lectern. A soft spotlight sunbeamed clomped. The hushed audience donned their own masks. 
Klomp thanked the organizers, the planners, the speakers, including Bivor's most famous film actor, which triggered light applause. Then he began his speech at a volume greater than the previous speakers, a volume amplified by the tech crew. Friends, new and old, I congratulate you at this precipice of a day, 30 years in the making, hundreds of years in the making. All the work, all the hope, all the worship and reverence and demonstration, the vigilant daily defense of our ideals, the defense of our identities, the defense of who we are, the defense of who we will be, all of it, everything. We don't do this for fleeting personal gain or individual wealth, those pernicious lies that so many in the press cynically clutch like swine pearls. Our selflessness, our sacrifice is for the promise, the promise guaranteed to be fulfilled. Our reason, our way, our why is about to return to teach us another lesson. And if we are blessed, the apotheosized lesson. The audience raised arms and held each other up. They let tears flow. They whispered please and yes and thank you. Some had their exaltation pierced by melancholia, thoughts of their families and former friends, and if only they could witness this, feel this, then they would understand. Others dreamed of gory, cosmic victory over enemies, real and imagined. The unnamed in the back rows, one by one, quietly gasped or coughed and slumped and knocked into the seats and the backs of other members as they bonelessly slid to the floor, pooled in their own collecting blood. Within that section of seats, one animal remained standing wearing a painted mask no one could yet see. During a dramatic pause within Klomp's speech, a pause he had practiced and timed, confused murmurs brush-fired through the audience. He couldn't see what the fuss was about. It took his considerable collected self-control to not diminish the heft of his speech by admonishing the gathered, who he thought of as needy, impulsive, impertinent children, as much in need of his discipline as his vision. However, he wasn't so self-absorbed to not sense a new heaviness and panicked charge. The atmosphere had changed, perhaps irrevocably. Klomp spat out his final lines, prickling with the first spines of fear. What grace, what glory, that our awesome, terrible God is tangible, that the earth trembles beneath its feet and we move in accordance with it. We, the blessed few, know this. Our future ends tomorrow. Our future begins tomorrow. Standing atop the backs of the dead, the butcher shouted what would be the only word the gathered would hear from her that evening. Lights. Then there were lights. The moon was full and bright enough to show them what they needed to see. Their headlamps did little more than identify the wearer. They unpacked, gathered, and loaded their weapons. Penn droned on with a familiar pep talk, one they'd heard for years. One in which they'd once believed, about how On wasn't a god, wasn't a supernatural creature. It was a beast, no more, no less. And that meant it could be stopped. It could be killed. Crossbow drawn, gloves insulated her hands from the concentrated fungal amatoxins coating the tips and shafts of the arrows. Penn asked, Does anyone bother poisoning my camper shovel? Mag laughed at the absurdity of their plight. Their chaotic, capricious lives and the collected history of Bivor somehow leading to, if not culminating in, this nighttime attack which was to be as obviously feckless as three mutinous fleas on her hide. Hunch said, none of our weapons will penetrate soil and then on's hide. And here I thought Merith wanting to bring swords was ridiculous. Ridiculous was a vicious word. Mag imagined Merith standing on the hilltop, 
arms and blades outstretched, victoriously stabbing both swords down to their hilts, then the earth shuddering, screaming, and Marith laughing. They made one last plan as a group. Hunge would dig into the hill, and if On was indeed hibernating under soil and shale, they would fire their weapons into its exposed flank point blank. They walked together in a line. Penn said, we're attacking a mountain. Hunge said, Club Mining Corps blows up tops of mountains, literally decapitates mountains to hollow out the coal. That horror seemed impossible to Mag in the face of another horror. Man, this is just a hillock, Penn said. A fucking trifle. Hunge skipped ahead. Nothing we can't handle in late stage, second age. Should we be whispering? Mag asked. Nervous giggles percolated. Hunge crept a few steps up the incline, gently probed the surface with the shovel tip. He looked over his shoulder at Penn and Mag, nodded, exhaled, slid the shovel into soil. He peeled up a layer of sod and moss, and after only a few more scrapes, he uncovered a thick mass of fur, shockingly green in the glow of his headlamp. He ungloved, reached down, and pressed against it with a shaking paw. Impenetrable, he said to himself, fell backwards, slid down the slope into Penn's and Mag's legs. They asked him a thousand unanswered questions as they pulled him upright. He unslung his shotgun and scrambled back up the hill. They told him to wait. They should fire together at the same time. He shouted, impenetrable, pressed his gun muzzle into what he'd uncovered, and fired. Because he was off balance, the recoil sent him back down the hill. The hill stood up. Penn and Mag fled the flash avalanche of dirt and rock. An instant dust storm erased the clear night sky. Mag coughed and choked, wiped furiously at her eyes with forearms. The crashing rubble settled into a light drizzle. Underneath, underworld, a low, guttural grumble thumped against and inside her chest. Mag was all turned around, but there was Penn her lamp piercing an accusatory ten paces to her left. Penn sent arrows hissing into the blotted out night. Mag pointed her handgun somewhere above her and shouted for Hunge. His headlamp flickered like a dying star from an impassable distance and depth. Mag heard his wild gunshots. They had to be his because she hadn't yet fired. Then his light cut out with a detonative tremble and roar and another dust cloud billowed into Mag. She fired into it, and she fired above her head. Even though she couldn't see on, couldn't see the forest, couldn't see the trees. This is the part. We've been waiting for this part. The audience shouted, recoiled, pressed toward the stage. The only exits, a fire hazard to be sure were behind the butcher. Some survivors would go on to describe the mask as its paint having faded, smeared, cracked, as an uncanny abstract nightmare and not a lion. Some survivors would go on to describe the mask not as a mask, but as a skein, as an actual lion's head. The butcher planted dagger and sword into the bodies at her foot. The blade stood at rigid attention by her side. She waved and waggled open paws, taunting the cowering crowd. Come closer. I don't bite. Two burly cultists edged up aisles and rushed her, a sloppy and obvious pincher attack. The butcher bent, retrieved both blades, and in a blink, the cultists lost their heads. She deftly volleyed one arcing it into the crowd with a rear paw kick. Klomp bellowed into the mic, conjuring cultists with earpieces and guns, 
His expedient position atop the cult's hierarchy notwithstanding, Klomp was not beholden to faith, superstition, or powers greater than his own. Yet he felt the eyes of the butcher's mask track him across the stage as he was whisked away, and feared he would feel them helplessly until his own eyes closed for the final time. Cultists from the lowly tiers, in their clean and bright colors, attempted to follow Klomp to safety. The doors stage left remained closed to them and barred by security officers. Countless cultists broke like water around the butcher. She hacked and slashed through the amorphous flagella of the crowd, the mindless superorganism. Short sword, long enough to skewer and sever two necks at once. The dagger blurred and stung, killing cultists who didn't realize they were dead. The air misted red, arteries fountained blood from desperate hearts. Dying paws and hooves anointed her path. The butcher kept count. That there never would be a number big enough was the first disappointment of the night. She quivered with want and promise and lamented the beating, benighted hearts that had somehow escaped through the exits. Two security members remained on stage, flanking the barricaded door through which Klomp had fled. Their unsure gunshots echoed in the hall, bullets probing the disintegrating crowd. The butcher killed a young badger by folding him in half backward, and then used him as a step to ascend onto the stage. She spun on a heel and faced the audience. Their future was here for all to see. The butcher danced briefly at the lectern, slicing the wax, twitching her wrists, flicking the flaming candle heads into the back wall covered in flags and tapestries. The flames were gluttonous upon their release. Burning strips of cloth fluttered to the stage like dying dragons as the butcher stalked toward the two security officers. They pulled their triggers, shooting without aiming waving their arms as though they were drowning, pleading to be saved. Bullets puckered the butcher's robe as though it were made of clay. She did not bleed, did not fall. The security shook and fumbled and whimpered. Did you hit it? It's not an animal. This isn't real. This is impossible. Before she pounced and shared her savage embrace, she cut the rope tight around her neck with the clever tip of her dagger. Rib cages and chest plates taken from the two who had foolishly entered her home earlier that evening, the two who had spent their adult lives trading in violence but had never learned anything about it, weaved and reshaped and refashioned into unholy armor, spilled out from under her robe clattered chitinously to the burning stage. The security's stomachs fell to their shoes as she zippered open their guts. She used their slackened but still breathing bodies to ram and batter through the stage door. She killed her way along the path upstairs, not noticing the path dimmed, faded, not once wondering if the otherworldly strength, skill, and fortune was hers or the lion's. She assumed they'd always been one. She threw another victim, one who cowered, covered his eyes, and had said simply, please, exploding into dawn room. When she followed inside, teeth bared, tongue quivering under her mask, there was no clump. The room was empty. For the first time that night, her breathing and her heart rate elevated. She shook her head and growled, this was wrong. How could he get away? He was supposed to be here. He was promised. He was the promise. The butcher tore apart the room as it filled with smoke from below. She leapt through the bay window, two stories down to the quad, landing on her feet, of course. The night wasn't over yet. She would not allow it to be over. How could it be over so soon? She brazenly stalked through the campus, not taking care to be unseen by approaching sirens and flashing lights, because no one would stop her. No one could stop her. There had to be more. This wasn't it. 
but the illuminated path she had followed was no more. She took random directionless turns and cut through alleys and lots and yards, trusting she would flow downstream to clomped. She washed up in a residential neighborhood, stood at the base of a crooked set of wooden stairs leading up to a modest bungalow. Somewhere inside, three glowing lights that only she could see. If she couldn't have clomped, she would have them. She would not be denied. She would have them all. Penn's husband, Paul, sat on the couch, Lotta and Bill drowsing under each arm. It was past their bedtime. On the TV played a movie populated with heroes and villains they'd seen enough times to memorize the lines. The front door opened a mournful creak. A bloody, masked figure clouded into their space. Paul recognized who had come for them. He stood to his full reedy height, filled his empty hands with a blunt, stubby poker from the fireplace. His children, fully awake, clung to Paul's legs. One asked, who is it? The other said, go away. Paul told his kids to run, run out the back door and keep running. And he added a lie. His children knew it was a lie by the quaver in his voice. Mommy is outside waiting for you. I will not detail, will not give a blow-by-blow -blow account. However, I'm not sure we deserve to be spared the truth of how languidly the family was killed by Merritt the Butcher, as we've been rooting for her all along. The day of the ceremony. The ceremony was to officially begin at noon. Protesters arrived at first light. They sat, linked limbs, formed living chains to block the main villager and vendor entryways to the common. They wore bloodied newspapers and white placards with the names of missing dissidents or dressed as miners and factory workers and farmers, with turned out pockets and red tape axing out their mouths, or wore gas masks and lugged clouded buckets of Syme River water labeled toxic. The protesters blocking the commons had only a mind for the mayor. It was after 2 p.m. by the time the police and the village guard violently cleared the protesters. The ceremony didn't begin for another hour. Mayor Lundrunt Jr. was furious when he made his speech. A final galling indignity? His brand new amphitheater was only half full. Half full, if you were an optimist. He would fire clomped for not filling those stands. The mayor half-heartedly read the brief speech clomped or some fucking intern hack fresh out of Stum Yu had written. We have suffered great, inexplicable losses in recent days. My continuing thoughts and prayers to the victims and their families. Take heart, my fellow Bivorians. We have found the butcher, and he is dead. I won't say his name. Here, the mayor paused and ad-libbed. Not that his name was a shock to anyone paying attention. I mean, I could have solved this myself. I practically did. I told the police chief weeks ago. Weeks ago? You know, you should keep an eye on that otter guy. He's a bad guy. The morning after the rash of butcher murders, the old riverboat otter Nash was found dead in the belly of his gondola, forearms slashed open from paw pad to elbow. He was dressed in the butcher's regalia. The blood spattered on his robe reportedly matched his most recent victims. But I won't say that bum's name. Not here, not today, not on this sacred day of celebration. We must not look fearfully backward or react in fear to our present, but move forward, look to the future, to our bright third age. It'll be the best third age anyone has ever seen. He paused for applause saluted those cheering from his amphitheater. What they lacked in numbers, they made up in zealotry. Let's get to it, then, the mayor said. The names I will read have been determined by a lottery overseen by esteemed council, our best business leaders, only the best. I choose only the best. And, of course, me. The names are, I feel like a game show host here. His son's braying laughter caught by his mic. He read the names. 
The raccoon, an excommunicated cultist, ranks Flimnit. Council's minority whip, Gil Grine, the squirrel daughter of the former mayor. And a blue heron named Bloon Samp, a journalist who'd taken over Zant Lanra's post. All three were vocal critics, the vocalist critics, of Mayor Runt Jr., obviously. The mayor performed to the can you still believe his appalling behavior gasps from pockets within the crowd, holding his wings out wide, shrugging, and said, that's the way the cookie crumbles, am I right? We thank the chosen for their bravery and honor. As the three citizens were forcibly escorted to the dais, Rank shouted obscenities. The whip and the journalist demanded transparency, requested an emergency legal injunction that would not be forthcoming. Drunk villagers booed and cheered and started half-hearted fights they didn't see to the end. Cultists, in their newly diminished numbers, wandered the common. Some walked in groups, flinching in fear that the butcher would still find them. Some took advantage of the newfound sympathetic public sentiment in their manic recruiting efforts. One, dressed in a sky-blue robe, was irrevocably lost in a fog of grief and pain. Waiting for the sun to sink into the Northwood, Mag and Maris stood next to each other. Their fellow villagers gave them a wide berth out of respect and superstition. They wore red sashes, as was stipulated by tradition, to represent the brave offer of sacrifice necessary for the well-being of Bevor. To represent all citizens having been granted a second chance, a second age. Were you successful? Marith asked, her voice hoarse from the recent hours of constant one-sided conversations with her silent lion mask. Meg said, we found on. Oh, wow, I mean, I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised. If anyone could have found on, it would have been the good Dr. Mag. Where exactly was Hunch was killed? I'm sorry. And I'm sorry about Penn's family, of course. Which is the worst thing I've ever heard. How is she? I couldn't tell if Marith was chastened or bored. To answer your first question, we'll find out shortly if we were successful. But no, I don't think we were. On had fled north after their attack. When the dirt and debris had settled and the night sky could again preen its cold infinity, they had searched the crater for Hunch's remains. Penn had found all but one of her arrows. Mag had allowed herself to hope maybe one arrow penetrated On's fur and hide. Maybe one stuck. Maybe all that was needed was for one arrow to stick. That hope had evaporated upon return to the village and to the horror of what had befallen Penn's family. Are you going to apologize for not coming with us? Mag asked. We needed you. I needed you. Mag stared at Merith. Her stare softened as the normally lithe kinetic figure Merith cut was diminished and wan. Fur matted, sleepless nights bagged under her eyes. I believe Merith was haunted by what she must have seen in the cult's home. Haunted by the news of what happened at Penn's house, haunted by an unnameable loss. Maybe her haggard look was longer than the recent days. Maybe it was 30 years in the making. How were we here at the ceremony again? How were we still here? Merith patchworked her imperviousness crooking a familiar smile, vexed with a you're better than that sneer. I think we should have tried killing the mayor instead. Bad joke, I know. But I have to joke. It's all... It's all too much, otherwise. Around them bubbled nervous and impatient giggles, boastful shouts of, am I right? Whispers of a fixed lottery of a hoax, disapproving murmurs. Fearful sighs that seemed to say, how can we fix any of this? Vendors shuttered their carts, packed their tents and wares. Blankets rolled under villager arms, parents ready to cover their youngest one's eyes when the moment came. Everyone waited for on. 
they waited more. Mag allowed herself to think, maybe. Then a rumbling tremor in the shrinking distance increased in volume at an unsustainable rate. It became rolling, cascading thunder. The sound itself living, breathing, growing, consuming shaking leaves from the treetops and screams from the villagers. Is it fucking sprinting here this time? Merith asked, a paw on Mag's shoulder, her claws out, primping, digging in. She pushed herself up to a greater height, better to see, better to whisper into an ear. I fear you pissed it off, dear sister, big time. Mag swiped Merith's paw away and bared her teeth. She had never been so angry and in the moment became another animal. Considered lunging, fitting Merit's neck between her open jaws, not to kill, but to squeeze a different look from Merit's eyes. The snarl was not enough to earn that change. Merit stumbled, ragdolled onto her haunches, and laughed. Mag held her quaking ground. Dawn approached, and the crowd retreated. She would bear witness to her calamitous failure. On the other side of the common, a cultist who was not a cultist broke from their huddled ranks, shed her mask and blue robe, the same blue as her little brother's hat. Penn pulled a bolt cutter from her belt loop, ran to the dais, determined not to be a complacent celebrant in yet another apocalypse. Police were slow to react to the mayor shouting from his private box adjacent to the amphitheater, Who the fuck is that? He might have been the only asshole in the commons who didn't recognize Bevor's most tragic figure. Mag barked and howled, tried to run through the crowd to stop Penn. Merith wrapped her arms around Mag's waist. If she didn't quite hold Mag in place, she slowed her down enough. On split the trees muscled through the Northwood line. The recurring generational nightmare swayed unsteadily. Legs lifted and feet jackhammered into the earth as though aiming to punch through to the other side. Thick arms flailed. It twitched and revolved its planetary head, moved too rashly for its bulk to remain balanced. That the monster lacked the measured movement and grace from cultural memory, from myth and legend made it more terrifying. Dawn's fur was no longer the uniformly lush, mossy green of 30 years ago, marbled with wide swaths of off-brown patches, the color of dried, dying grasses, and the whitish gray of diseased, exhausted tree bark. Mag paused in the struggle to be free of merit, wondered if Ahn's appearance was a form of epical camouflage. Did it always look this way at the end of the Second Age? or was the result of having been woken early from underground slumber, or did a little lucky poison from Penn's arrow swim in its blood? Penn snipped the chain at the journalist's ankle, pushed her off the dais, and yelled at her to run. Penn tossed the bolt cutter to minority whip grind and stood tall in the journalist's place, in Toll's old spot. What did everything that had happened in the time between Toll and now? was a beautiful, horrible dream. One in which she could live forever. One she could instantly forget when it ceased. Penn had planned to have her stand on the day's end after diving hands into her deep, dark pockets to retrieve the small t-shirts that belonged to her children and hold them against her nose, close her eyes, inhale what little of their scent lingered but she wasn't granted the time. On dropped to all fours, its head an asteroid crashing to Earth, an extinction event. Mouth opened, teeth flashed, clicked, and scraped against the brick dais, and Penn was gone. On gathered the whip and ranks into its maw, then backhand swiped the fleeing journalist, knocking the heron flying into the amphitheater. Her body punched a hole through the seats and bent a load-bearing stanchion. Villagers mobbed and climbed over one another. The wounded amphitheater creaked and swayed. Mag had fallen to her knees and crawled toward the monster. 
How are we here at the ceremony again? How are we still here? Vaughn stood, exhaled, slumped its shoulders, as though it were tired of the never-ending dream, and was disappointed in everyone. It gently batted at the trail of floating blue feathers left by the journalist. With each pass of the mighty paw, the feathers swirled, floated higher, and away. Unable to catch one, Vaughn turned and loped north into the woods. Into the future. Book Three, The Third Age. One. A brief guide to the village, 30 years into the Third Age. Syme River fishing and shelling licenses were reinstated, despite previously reported levels of nitrates, phosphates, cadmium. A temporary patch to boon the economy and the recalibrating but soon-to-be-thriving village food web, according to a press release. No mention of the rolling brownouts planned to ease the strain on the electrical grid. Summer, autumn, and spring droughts dried wells, decimated the farms, fueled Limwood wildfires. In the south, fisheries collapsed. The greens wetlands were drying up. Older estates within the southern gated communities remodeled in favor of open concept and new quartz countertops. North of the Syme, Newtown and the Industrial Forge were distinguishable only by lines on a map and postal codes. Most of Old Town's historic buildings, cobblestone walkways, and Stum University's campus had been washed away in winter floods. The roading banks and the river walk were replaced by storm walls and levees that Mayor Runt III touted as marvels of engineering, but were always one storm behind. At the construction site of Stormwall 4, at the base of the Billhorn Bridge, a 19th butcher copycat victim, the deer Blin Zorn, a small-time bookie, was found filling an excavator's bucket lift. The copycat butcher was a rat named Cobb. Ex-cop, ex-security, ex-rideshare driver. He went to the local bar next to his high-rise tenement, carrying one of Blin's sawed-off antlers, still wearing a store-bought lion mask replica and blood-spattered robe. He was easily apprehended, like the other copycats. Two. The night before her first day on the job, Cuts the Fox described Grom Manor as the bushiest assisted living home across the river. Her partner, Auntie, was a fiercely loyal coyote and tightly wound sociology major. Auntie said, how bougie are they if they hired you as an uncertified assistant? You can't even take your own temperature with an ear thermometer. The commute from graduate student housing via bus, rail, then another bus was more than 90 minutes. Cots could not face having to do that twice a day, could she? Cots studied geoengineering and had recently switched to part-time to get a job and save money and extend the timeline before the ruinous student loan payments kicked in. Her meager wages wouldn't be worth the hassle if she lost a sizable chunk of it to bus and rail fees. She wrote herself a phone memo to investigate rideshare scooters and bikes, though she'd never been steady on two wheels. Today, after work, she could walk home and not tell Auntie. Cots arrived 30 minutes early. She was always early to everything and walked the immaculate grounds that kept its green despite the water ban. Grom Manor was a repurposed family estate Two floors and 5,000 square feet of living space, lounging on three manicured acres. Once inside, Cots met the staff, signed some papers, put on a white overcoat, two sizes too big, and assisted Nurse Mill, a cheerfully stern muskrat who wasn't much younger than the patients on his rounds. The largest private room was upstairs, more than twice the size of other patient rooms, with its own full bath and a set of windows and padlocked French doors overlooking the entrance and tree-lined circular drive. As Millencotts entered, a graying elderly cat paced the hardwood, wringing her paws and muttering to herself. She wore an ankle-length white nightgown dotted with blue wildflowers. Upon seeing Cots, the cat stopped pacing, threw up her arms, and asked, where is my sister? Cot said, your sister, I don't, and looked to the nurse for help. Mill said, she is coming tomorrow. We're all very excited. 
He turned his back to the cat, winked, and mouthed the cuts. There is no sister. The cat pulled at the kinks and wrinkles in her nightgown. Yes, well, someone better clean up then. Clean up good. Tell everyone to stop sucking thumbs and puzzle pieces. Keep their paws out of their pantaloons. Maybe hide Ralph, <laughs> that fucking guy. He smells like shit. That's not very nice, Merrith, Mill said, and could not hide the amusement in his rebuke. He shepherded Merrith to a small table in the corner and sat her in a padded chair. Mill said, it's time for your medicine, and I brought along a new friend. Meet my assistant, Cots. She'll be helping us out now. Cots didn't know if she should extend a paw or wave or excuse herself and run from the room. Hi, Merith, it's lovely to meet you. She bent over as she said it, as though talking to a child. Merith twitched and bobbed her legs, bared and retracted chipped, ragged claws. Her whiskers were long and bent, extending her downturned mouth. A lip curled over a snaggle tooth. One eye milked over with a cataract. The other, well, the other could see. She said, my dear, I could just eat you up. Maybe after my sister visits. Something to look forward to. Mel said, she talks a mean game, but she likes you, Cots, I can tell. He wrapped knuckles on the tabletop, waggled a digit at Marith. Behave, ma'am. Just because you own the house doesn't mean we won't throw you out. Merith laughed. I'd like to see you try. Cots thought the elderly cat looked spry enough to climb the walls. Merith counted the pills inside the paper cup three times, swallowed them with one sip of water. She said, you both can help me then. I want this place to be nice, very nice. My sister is an important person, you know. A doctor, a smart one. Not like any of the quacks that come here. She's someone who really learned something. Three. Mag spent the better part of three decades continuing Penn's work caring for the sick and uninsured at the Rilt Sons Free Clinic and Palliative Care Co-op. She spent the better part of three decades preparing for her last chance. She knew that her 68th birthday would be her last. How odd it was now to be confronted by accumulating numbers ending. She was to meet her longtime on-again, off-again partner, Mlick, for a birthday dinner at Sal Manders. After the floods of 23, the famous restaurant had relocated from Old Town to the suburban south. The new owners replicated the footprint, interior decorations, and menu, but not the prices that once welcomed lunchtime and happy hour crowds of dock workers, students, and retirees, as well as serving would-be robber barons and starry-eyed cognoscenti in the evenings. Once the heart of the village, where its blood pumped and mixed, the restaurant was a mirage, serving nostalgia, the bill outrageous. Malik was early and ordered a bottle of wine, two bulbous glasses, one-third full, and waiting. Gray peppered his muzzle in black fur. He wore a black fedora, black tweed blazer, slate gray trousers, and a salmon-colored scarf. He sat with his legs crossed, which Mag knew was less a well-dressed gentleman's affect than a position that eased the pressure on his dysplastic hip. They had video chatted a few times, but... They hadn't seen each other in the flesh for more than six months. Malik was always such a handsome, warm, patient dog. Meg loved him in an arm's length way. And while there wasn't regret, per se, as she was content with their arrangement, for lack of a better term, she was sorry on his behalf that she wasn't able to be who he had wanted her to be. Maybe she wasn't being fair to either of them with the always insidious what could have been sentiment. There was both joy and the glistening sting of sadness in his brown eyes when she entered the dining room. They hugged and shared a brief kiss. Malik took off his hat with a flourish, hoping it distracted and hit his shock at Mag's wasted appearance. A year ago, she had been strong enough to hold him up while he'd rehabbed his bulky hip. Now, 
He wondered how she managed to walk across the room under her own power. She was gaunt, hunched, and frail. Her thinning fur hadn't grayed, but the chestnut color had faded, washed out. Her eyes were heavy, weighing down her head. It was all he could do to not ask, are you sick? He wanted to share more of their dwindling days together. That she was a mysterious part of his life, a comet that irregularly returned to flash through his sky, would have to be enough. She smiled, which seemed an act of extraordinary effort and resolve. And he sank into his chair, knowing whatever this evening was or would be, was beyond celebrating her birthday. This was goodbye. Why are you looking at me like that? She asked. You're a vision, and I stare in wonder at the vista. Oh, please. You're a terrible liar, but I appreciate it. They clinked glasses, the warm, silent toast to all the unsaid things they never needed to say. Mag said, this place is dreadful, isn't it? Sorry, I promised to not be a total wet blanket for once. No, it's a mockery, but the wine is decent. They placed their orders and caught up. Blick did most of the talking, giving her updates about his two adult children from a previous marriage. His son was an overwhelmed school teacher in the forge and was thinking of quitting but had no plan B. His daughter worked with a nonprofit that built sustainable rooftop vegetable gardens and composting. When their entrees arrived, they joked about the minuscule fish portions correlating to the restaurant's claim of having the lowest levels of mercury and plastics per serving. Their plates bust and dessert ordered. Lick said, I'm afraid to ask, but have you finally decreased the number of days or hours at the clinic? It was all pause on deck there for the past six months with the spike in H1N1 flu, trying to get as many animals vaccinated as we could. I was even going door to door at one point, trying to convince folks we weren't poisoning them. How'd that go? Do you have to ask? No, I don't suppose I do. However, as of two months ago, I mostly retired. Mostly. I go to the clinic twice a week. That is great news. Cheers. What have you been doing with your time off besides not visiting me? Mag stuck out her tongue. I've been spending time with my old partner, You've met him before, I'm sure. His name is Ride Hall. Malik fought to appear unflustered until he got the joke and then laughed too hard. He leaned forward, elbows on the table. To get Mag to offer even a crumb of her prior life as the archivist would be an achievement. Do tell. How has the old boy aged? He can't look as good as I do. I expend more resources and maintenance. <laughs> He looks as creaky as I feel. She would not admit how bittersweet the morning trips to Ride Hall were. Mag mourned her old life as much as she unwaveringly committed to this other one. And to its end. Do you ever think about what your life would have been like if you stayed there? Is that too maudlin of me to ask on your birthday? Yes and no. No and yes. The truth is, I was different then. And as I've discovered while wandering the stacks, that old me is almost unknowable to the now me. How many different animals do we carry around inside? One for every day we live. Do you really think so? No, but it sounded good. You're obnoxiously charming. I try. Oh, I try. They held on to a brief, warm silence as small dishes of raspberry gelato arrived. Malik asked, any interesting research or discoveries? A secret basement chamber, perhaps? Like anyone else who goes to Ride Hall, I'm not allowed into the areas I was once allowed. And you let that stop you? Of course not. The current archivist is a glorified accountant, too busy working to defund the place. His clueless sycophants hunt and remove texts critical of the run family and the cult. 
Luckily, they're incapable of processing allegory or metaphor. Mag paused for a shared, above-it-all laugh. The truth was, the stacks were being decimated. So much history and literature lost, and likely lost forever, was itself a metaphor she could not bear to face without using Gallo's humor and farce to declaw the pain and fear. She added, no one has time to stop and question an elderly dog who knows where she's going and what she wants. And what do you want, Mag? Mag's tale of biblioskullduggery was fiction, one for Malik's benefit, and fine, for her own benefit as well. She adored being the successful star of imagined adventures through his eyes. In this manner, she would tell Malik everything without telling him. Do you know the story of Mare Mithrid from the Fifth Third Age? I do not, Malik said and settled in his chair, raised a paw at the server, signaling for more wine. Not many do. He was an obscure, tragic comic figure, in the way history makes us all tragic comic figures, I suppose. Anyway, Mithrid was the son of a marriage arranged by two powerful families of landed gentry geese. As soon as he was of age, he was installed into the mayor's office to ease the family's tax burden. The frauded election was so ineptly bald-faced, sounds familiar, his enemies were legion. Mithrid became paranoid that different factions from low and lay animal to nobility, including members within both sides of his family, wanted to assassinate him. He wasn't wrong, which was both the tragic and comic part. During his 17-month stay in office, he never once appeared in public. He wore a thick helmet and chainmail day and night, sleeping in it when he did sleep. He had a small kitchen built in his chambers to oversee meal preparation. Toward the end of his reign, he cooked for himself or did not eat at all. Not satisfied with these safeguards, he sent his most trusted charges, a trio of nephews a few years younger than him, into Limwood to gather all the poisonous fungi and plants they could find. It was rumored Mithrid himself, on moonless nights, skulked into the Northwood for the same purpose. He ingested small amounts of the mushrooms and leaves each day to build the tolerance. Mag paused for dramatic effect. I can't believe I haven't heard this story before. Did it work? There was an attempt to poison Mithrid. He was gifted a bottle of wine from his family vineyard with a forged note from his father-in-law. It read, to a job well done. There is dispute as to whether the note was forged or not. One of the nephews with whom Mithrid shared a glass died. Mithrid, despite drinking a heroic amount, survived. Maybe I shouldn't have ordered another glass of wine. He'll be fine, I bet. What happened to Mithrid? Mithrid did not survive the office. His other two nephews blamed him for poisoning the third, as they'd been gathering the mushrooms and plants for him for months by that time. In the madness of their grief, and with the help of a rival whispering in their ears, they thought their uncle had used their brother to test the efficacy of his poison tolerance. His two nephews locked themselves within the mayor's chamber, wrestled him out of the chain mail, and stabbed him 32 times. That seems excessive. Legend has it, Mithrid's blood was highly poisonous, collected in vials, and subsequently used to great effect in the following year's quiet coup. 4. Marith didn't know where she was, but knew she should know. To keep from succumbing to incapacitating fear, she would be angry and remain angry. And she would plan. She insisted to herself that she had always been a planner, a schemer, one step ahead of everyone else who were two steps behind. She would escape this room, even though this was her house. They'd said it was her house, anyway. They'd hired a young fox to box her in. There used to be another fox she didn't trust. What was his name? She searched under the bed covers for his name. It was impossible to keep track of time. Things changed so quickly, yet remained the same. 
and all that was left, an inchoate animal sense that something was different, something was irrevocable. And it had happened behind her back without her input or permission. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to end like this. No, they kept things nice for her. They washed her clothes and sheets and body. They brought her food and drink. They played confusing card and dice games with her. She was never a good sport. They told her what she wanted to hear. Their words were as anesthetizing as the pills they brought. That was their greatest trick. She would stop taking their pills and words. She would tell her sister about everything, including the new fox, and ask about the other fox tomorrow. Her sister was the only one she trusted. Her sister's face was fixed in her mind from a time when she looked over her shoulder back at Marith while they were outside, penned in a crowd, the sky a toneless gray, her expression unreadable. Marith insisted to herself that her sister's expression was unreadable. Marith feared her sister saw something she should not have. Marith would tell her sister she was sorry tomorrow. Marith cried every night because she couldn't remember. How brutally frightening it was to not remember anything, to realize you were nothing but a collection of past events that changed and dissolved over time. Fucking time, time, time. She stopped looking for the old fox's name in her bed covers because she remembered there were hidey holes in the floor and in the baseboards. This was her room, after all. It always has been. That they had transformed it into her prison, she would make them pay. Marith climbed out of bed, careful to not make any noise. Her body did not forget how to be used. She crawled on the floor, tapped at the edges of the hardwood until she found a loose slat. She pried it up. Inside was a note written on a square of yellow paper. You must keep trying. She slunk and slithered, finding the other slats. Her body moved through the circuit. The other notes read, talk to the lion. The lion will come back. The lion promised. You won't always be alone. One slat revealed empty space with no note. She could have sworn there was supposed to be one more note, one that read, You are the lion. She walked the perimeter of her room. One paw kept contact with a wall. The closet was locked. Had she been found trapped inside once? She didn't want to remember. She moved on and tapped a foot against the baseboards, finding a loose one, a wiggly tooth under her bed's headboard. Back on her belly, she liked being close to the floor. She slid the wooden piece away, but could not see inside the space. Greedy for another note, she sent in a rough paw that recoiled from the bite and cold shock of tapered, sharpened steel. Marith replaced the board and returned to bed. She tried to summon the lion. She whispered, Hello? And... Please. And tears came again, despite her anger, because of her anger. It was clear the lion wasn't here. She would have to escape. Her arms and legs spasmed at the prospect, promised they were ready, still willing to be used and used well. She would be as violent as necessary, as violent and cruel as her enemy, time. She would make the attempt after her sister visited tomorrow. Five. Years ago, Mag had been forced to sell her parents' house to Bivor for pennies on the dollar. She had moved into a small third-floor apartment of a sagging triple-decker in central Newtown. When she had first moved in, the overwhelmed landlord was a kind, if not distant, red-breasted robin who had lived on the first floor and always had an unlit cigarette dangling from his beak. He had warned to boil the tap water before drinking or bathing. There were no such warnings from the current landlords, 
a real estate consortium impossible to reach by phone, email, or app. Mac had not left her apartment in the week since returning from the dinner with Malik. It was the day before the ceremony to mark the end of the third age. She was not feeling well, and that was the plan. Her round kitchen tabletop was cluttered, journals filled with observations, measurements, trials, and errors. Letters to family and friends that populated her past. Plastic baggies of her blend. An analog scale and its village of brass weights. Her tablet computer, which she used less and less. A paranoia that was a function of reality, dwindling time, and the side effect of induced chemical changes within her brain. And books, including Hunch's pun-filled guide to fungi, titled From Bloom to Shroom. The spine broken, pages yellowed, brittle, loosened, highlighted. Meg cupped her paws around a steaming mug of breakfast tea, closed her eyes to steady herself, to not be swept away by nausea and dizziness. She made marks on the calendar and a few lines of shaky script in an observation journal. She drank tea while it was too hot to drink, sifted through the pile of journals until she found the one with the red cover. It was almost full. Dear Merith, this morning I ate two times the amount of my blend than I had one week ago, which is probably pushing it too far. I need to push it past the edge. I'm still upright, or at least sitting upright. That I call my mushroom and leaf mix my blend is a joke for you. Your straight-laced, responsible mag using drug slang. Slang that's probably as old as we are. I think I'd get a smirk out of you. It has taken me over an hour and two cups of tea to write the above two paragraphs. Does anyone know what to write or say at the end? Without sounding like a self-important, melodramatic fool? How about this? Here is what I know. Whether or not Penn's poisoned arrow pierced On's hide, I believe it did. Bevor could stop On tomorrow if there was a collective will to do so. Bevor could have stopped On many ages ago. But for a few individuals here and there, Bevor has always chosen to do the easy thing. To do nothing. I don't write this to sound like a martyr. I don't want to be remembered for what I'm going to do. I don't want to be debated and discussed. Have I wasted my years, my decades? The hours and hours of study and experiments, the weekends of solo trips into Limwood and the Northwood. For what? Even if I am successful in killing on, I'm swapping one apocalypse for the next. The thought of starting over, beginning again with another first age, seems a horror. Before is dying, if not already dead. How many ages does it have left before the death rattle? By killing on now, who am I helping? Who would I be saving? A handful of animals, at most? I also know it's lazy and cowardly and cynically pithy to say nothing can be done, to say we don't deserve to survive. You might describe the sentiment as the quitter's lament. My years at clinic were certainly a worthy endeavor. I'm not patting my own back, or maybe I am. Did I counteract the worthiness because of intent, because of my end game, having unfettered access to rabies and flu patients, so that I could infect myself in the days before the ceremony? In addition to my becoming a poison pill, I got my viral plan B, let's call it idea, from you, Marith. When we had stood on the dais together as children, it seems impossible we were once children and I was a child yesterday. He'd said if chosen, you'd bite and scratch on's tongue, gums, throat. Do you remember? We were never sisters. But I was you, and you were me when we were younger. I don't know what my point is, 
or if I'm making sense or why I'm downplaying or negating what I'm going to do. Because I'm still going to do it. Noble or futile or selfish gesture be damned. My reasons are my own. Reasons that have always been who I was and who I am. My lifetime of choices and actions and loves and losses explained better than a few lines on paper. Now that we have that out of the way, dear, I wonder if someone from Grom Manor will bring you to the ceremony tomorrow. If so, I hope they remember your red sash. I know I've ended every note for 30 years with I should go see you. I could apologize. I could write that I've been meaning to visit, but I haven't. It has been better for both of us this way. That is not lazy, cowardly, or cynically pithy. That is not a quitter's lament. Time for a lie down. Fever, chills, and joints made of glass insist. Sincerely, Mag. Six. The common, Bevor's public square, was walled off from the rest of the village. To the west, the humbled, croning mountains and their strip-mined innards, nude peaks bereft of snow. To the east, the deforested Limwood, a cemetery of tombstone stumps and lumpen landfills. To the south, the degraded green no longer possessed the color of its name. To the north was the only promise the village ever kept. The ceremony officially began at noon. Revelers arrived early to be processed at gates A through D. The committed and enterprising could sneak in from behind the run amphitheater. None were allowed to bring their own food and drink. Each attendee granted one digital coin for a 12-ounce beverage. Ten bucks a pop after that. Cultivon adherents and Mayor Runt the third supporters, one and the same, were the village majority. Within the cult were factions, traditionalists patiently, wearily waiting for the end to come, pragmatists of the enlightened upper tiers, scheming to legislate power and influence into the next first age. Neo-cultists, neos for short, believed on would arrive to smite their enemies, a not-so-secret weapon in the coming civil war. And when the blood stilled, they would follow on and run the third north to paradise. Dissenting non-cultists, despairing villagers, herded into the muddy commons. Most could not afford the steep fines levied to non-attendees. Cult recruitment teams quickly spotted and surrounded any animal not wearing a robe. The ensnared were released back into the wild after enduring the strong-armed recruitment pitch, hollow bid, and a QR code tag. Cultists, in turn, despite heavy police and village guard presence, were harassed, sucker-punched, and had fake blood smeared on their regalia by villagers wearing replica butcher lion masks. A vendor managed to sell over 100 masks and blood packets before she was arrested. Whether or not the mask wearers believed the popular conspiracy theory, they'd co-opted on isn't real as their slogan, printed on flyers, graffitied on walls. A single sentence. Castigation and hope. With a nod to tradition, a cruel one, given Ride Hall would soon be defunded and shuttered, the archivist opened the afternoon-long ceremony, marking the beginning of the end of the Third Age. His speech, a forgettable hagiography of Mare Runt III. Throughout the dreary and damp afternoon, the spring sun did not burn through the layer of soot and smog. Villagers boxed out space in the common, resettled into a hazy acceptance of their roles and lots, shared nervous well wishes and whispered dreads of the diminishing days to come. Food and drink consumed, despite the exorbitant cost. An elderly dog wearing baggy jeans, galoshes, a waxed barn coat shuffled through the crowd. Few noticed. Animals of her age knew what it was to be invisible. Mag used it to her advantage. She approached the dais and its coterie of armed village guard. Their shared look of amusement changed when she slung a tattered red sash over her shoulder. One ram with a crow's voice said, Watch out for the crossing guard. 
The oldest of the group stepped forward to intercept, a balding middle-aged weasel who hated his job, himself, and everyone else. His laughter died at the edge of his whiskers. The old dog's eyes wept thick black discharge that stained her muzzle. Mucus leaked from her nostrils. Jaundice drool and dried white spittle clung to her sagging lips. She was clearly ill. The weasel said, Excuse me, ma'am. Are you lost? Do you need help finding your family? How about Wren takes you to the medical tent, okay? The ram Wren hid his snout inside his field jacket and said, You fucking take her. Mag said, No one is bringing me anywhere. I'm volunteering for a spot on the dais. She coughed, wet and loose. The guards hopped back a step. The weasel said, listen, lady, thanks for the offer and all. You're what, the tenth? Wren interrupted. Eleventh. Fine, eleventh. He turned and spoke to Wren. I wasn't asking. Bad luck to lie to an old dog. Or is it let old dogs lie? The guard pack howled laughter and pile on jokes. The weasel said to Mag, you're the eleventh villager who has volunteered today. The weasel failed to keep impatience from crouching within his voice. He was tired of hearing himself talk. Bevor appreciates it, but you can't volunteer. It's not allowed. The names have to be chosen. Rin added, village sanctioned suicide isn't a thing yet. Give it a couple more weeks. Mag pushed out her sash. It identified her as a ceremony legacy of having survived being chosen in the first age. She explained she was also a former archivist specializing in village law and exaggeration. Mag exhumed a scrolled parchment from inside her jacket, brandished it like a cudgel. An expert forgery, if she didn't say so herself. I am volunteering, and as you will see, it is my sole legal right to do so. Her gambit worked. The guards quieted and grew uneasy. They were so used to healing in any shadow of authority. Seven. At Grom Manor, the old cat hunched at her small table, worried over a puzzle of a famous painting, a meadow dying at the golden hour. The long yellow grass pieces forming crescent-shaped islands in a scattered archipelago refused her tectonic pleas. Cots the fox stared out the second floor window. A weeping willow slumped adjacent to the circular drive. Indifferent, it had yet to grow spring leaves. Merith asked, Cots the fox, are you there? Fox the cots. Cots was physically there in Merith's room, an essential healthcare worker designee. Cots was also in the common inside her head, frantically searching for family and friends. She worried most about Auntie, her wonderful and fearless and careless Auntie, who had planned to smuggle masks and blood packs. Auntie had not answered her texts. Had she been arrested? Or worse? Cots could too easily imagine worse. She felt guilty for the preceding days of honest relief at having to be at Grom Manor on ceremony day. Cots said, yes, I'm sorry. Do you need something? Mara's commitment to escape was the whetstone that left her freshly sharpened. No soft, rounded corners, no slurry, blurry thoughts. Her sister wasn't coming. The lion wasn't coming. Beautiful as they were, neither were real. Clarity. Lucidity. She could even finish the blasted puzzle if she wanted to. Merith asked, Is there something happening outside the window that I should know about? Her voice had long since settled into an older animal's register, and she delighted at the effect it had on the young fox. And this afternoon, the fox's delicious fear was not polluted with pity and disgust. Cots answered before she could censor herself. She wasn't supposed to talk about what happened outside the manor, as the world moving on without them upset the patients. Well, it's ceremony day, and I'm worried about my loved ones. And Nurse Mill, too. I probably shouldn't even say it, speak it into existence, but 
I don't want their names to be chosen. Being chosen is a lie, maybe the biggest. Cots assumed Merith made a pointed political statement. Yes, that's what I'm afraid of. I was chosen once. Merith squashed a puzzle piece into a space it did not fit. And then I wasn't. Cots wouldn't admit she already knew about Merith's turn on the dais, nor admit she'd plunged into an online Merith Grom deep dive after her first day on the job. I'm sorry, she said. That must have been a terrifying, scarring experience. It was the most exhilarating time of my life. Merith and Cots shared a look. A dare. Merith swept loose puzzle pieces off the table. They swarmed to the floor, then pinwheeled toward the darkened spaces under the table and bed. Oh, dear, I'm such a klutz, Merith said with a sing-song voice. Oh, okay, I think puzzle time is over, Cot said. Don't worry your pretty little head. I'll clean this up. Merith turned the liquid, poured out of the chair onto her belly. She flowed halfway under her bed before Kotz could say, Please, no, it's okay, Merith. Leave the pieces. I can get them later. No, now. I will get it now. Kotz crouched behind Merith, unsure of what to do. What if the old cat got stuck? Should she forcibly pull her out? Should she call for help? There was only one nurse and one attendant on the day's skeleton staff. Merith muttered to herself, an unsettling drone simultaneously muffled and amplified, the kind of words meant to stay trapped under a bed with all manner of lost and forgotten things. Cots jumped, her ears folding against her skull, when the incantation suddenly produced a hollow knock at the base of the wall behind the headboard, then a clatter of wood against wood. As the old cat knocked loose a bed slat, all Cots needed was for the mattress to collapse on her charge, Cot said, please, Merith, you must come out. Are you stuck? Let me help. Merith slid herself out from under the bed, muttering, back up, back up, backing up, backing up. Cot's maneuvered to the cat's flank and hauled Merith up by the waist. Once upright, Merith pirouetted, struck Cot's in the jaw with an elbow, and clicking teeth and tongue together, drawing blood. Cot staggered back but remained standing, her ears ringing. Merith had overspun, fell backward onto the bed, landed in a childlike pose, legs dangled over mattress's edge. Her blue sweatshirt and the fur around her eyes and mouth mossed in dust clumps and cobwebs, as though she'd been stored under the bed for years. She smiled. She wasn't missing any teeth. With her right paw, she clutched a dagger, the blade as long as the dying meadow's grass. Seven. The Minister of Data and Information was Finn Unter, a fastidious, ageless skunk fond of hats, cardigan sweaters, the slow Rube Goldbergian psychological torture of enemies. Whether or not Mag's document was a forgery, he suspected it was. He advised the mayor this straw could be spun into gold. That Mag, a well-known leftist, volunteered for the good of Bivor, demonstrated a political change of heart, a near-divine conversion. She so believed in the administration and the future of Bivor, she was willing to face the monster again. After her sacrifice, we'll find a treasure trove of diaries, emails, and videos detailing her support of our greatest mayor, she will be our hero. There will be songs and digital shrines and children's books written and assigned. It'll be perfect. The mayor waved a wing and said, Sure, why not? What happens if Vaughn doesn't take her? Do you have to ask? The bell above Ride Hall chimed thirteen times, once for every third age. Mayor Runt III, his sickle feathers bright and his comb lengthened, said, The names I will read have been determined by a lottery overseen by esteemed council and other important animals, with special thanks to Mr. Finn Hunter, who works almost as hard as I do. 
By decree, only villagers over the age of sixty, proud members of our greatest generation, are eligible to mark this last day of the third age. Their final selfless sacrifice preserves our future ages. Let's get right to it. He read two names. One belonged to a Stum University professor, a one-time vocal critic of Runt the Third's father and grandfather. The other name belonged to a writer who had been incarcerated for crimes against before. Mayor Runt the Third said, Our third brave soul will be making history, great history, by volunteering to again stand tallest when the hour is the darkest. He paused before he read Mag's name. The duration of the pause grew, along with the crowd's silence and weariness. Even the mayor's supporters and cultists knew the source of their unyielding faith was fickle, yet they resigned themselves to the bit parts they'd been assigned. Mag's name echoed across the common, causing a stir, a shift, a newly hungry growl, reminding the most hopeless within the crowd of their numbers. Mag was the first to approach the dais. She stood on the square in the middle, Marith's old spot. Mag did not personally know the professor or writer beyond having attended lectures and readings as a student. The writer was an ancient mole named Karen Bristle. Her most recent published work appeared a decade prior, a collection of free verse poetry and polemic essays titled One Fight to Life. The mole stared at Mag through thick, cloudy glasses. Perhaps Mag was projecting, but she feared the writer measured her for fit in a work that would likely never be written, and found her lacking morally and symbolically. Mag suddenly wanted others to know why she was back on the dais and the years of preparation and sacrifice and loss. If she were to say to the writer, I'm doing this for all of us, it would sound like the same villagist drivel dripping from the propaganda bastard's mouth. She channeled her inner Marith and said in a rush, this is all part of my plan, then paused. Her inner Marith lacked the soaring ego and accompanying linguistic acrobatics that always somehow hinted at a brutal glory. Back to herself, always herself, flawed and beautiful, and earnest in all matters. Mag added, I'm gonna kill on. The mole nodded, asked, with your bare paws. Mag could so clearly hear what Merith's response would have been, bare paws and bare claws. It reverberated like a cherished formative memory. Mag said, paws, teeth, and the rest of my mithridactic body. She tried to smile, her quivering curled lip was stuck on a canine. The writer gawped, adjusted her glasses, and said, Oh, then. She shuffled a few steps across the dais, reached out, and squeezed Mag's right forearm. The village guards swooped in, shouting, whooping, celebrating the chance to brandish their weapons, and separated the two animals. In time, somewhere behind the gray sky, the sun fell. The earth tremored as though the leaden, world-weary sun had crashed into it. Mag shivered in the throes of a spiking fever stoked by twin viruses. Her morning blend dose had been twice what it was the day prior. Her gummy eyelids wanted to close. The window of her perception blurred and shrank at the edges. She struggled to remain upright on the bones of brittle scaffolding. How much longer could she continue standing under the weight that eventually collapses every animal? On appeared, the reality within our collective fever dream. Had it always been this big? Had it always filled our world? Branches and earthen clods dripped from its height. The folly of Mag's ludicrous plan crashed around her like the falling sky. On bent to better inspect the offerings, the funny little creatures who made and make such a fuss. To be fair, kind reader, we are now supposing on things like we do. Its tendons creaked, joints popped, an echo of biological time. 
As its head crested over the dais, Mag searched for its eyes, prospecting the matted nest of green and brown fur. It was important to see the monster seeing her. She was eight years old again, and she was 800 years old. A long time ago, she had thought she could outrun it and continue running forever. How silly, how wonderfully silly that thought was. She couldn't outrun it, and she had stopped running. Could she kill it? Was she being equally silly now? Mag barked, spraying saliva onto her jacket and the brick dais. Perhaps Awn recognized her. Perhaps Awn was in possession of a shared, tethered will. Perhaps Awn's choice was what it always had been, whim and dumb chance. We will never know. We will have to learn to live with it. Witnesses, unreliable as they were, suffered from the converse of the observer effect, having been irrevocably changed by what they saw and what was to come. They described Dawn as carefully, lovingly lifting Mag away, then turning its back on the village, slipping into the stilled forest waters with nary a ripple, as all hell broke loose in the common. A band of lion-masked villagers formed protective circles around the writer and professor and whisked them away. Other lions threw rocks, batteries, and empty spray paint cans at the mayor's box, hitting village guard and wana level cultists. Rin the Ram was the first guard, but not the last, to fire into the crowd. Gunshots punctuated the Third Age's end. The bullets, indiscriminate, non-discerning, rapacious. The commons gated exits blocked and bottlenecked. Villagers penned inside the walls, screamed, brayed, shot, prayed, shouted, climbed, fought, grappled, huddled, cried, laughed, hated, collapsed, trampled, helped, held, fled, hoped, despaired, lived, died. The monster carried Mag farther north than she'd ever been. She drifted, her consciousness a branch floating downstream, sinking under, then breaching the surface. Left to wonder if the monster had been walking for hours, days, weeks, eons. The monster stopped at the edge of a clearing, marking the end of the north wood. The crisp air nipped at Mag's nose and panting tongue. The sky was no longer compact and gray, hovering close to the ground. Here, the sky was expanse, a vast, star-spotted, deep black and blue. Hemmed in by the night, flatland spread as far as she could see. Mac imagined that if they continued north or east or west, trudging beyond the rolling prairie of grasses and shrubs, there would be mountains and rivers and wetlands and trees, the land a turning wheel. Maybe this is what Bivora looked like before, she thought. She wished she could change the old map she'd saved from Ride Hall's purge. She had to settle with changing what was in her head. She wished to see her parents puttering about their kitchen, lost in their content and wordless dance and she wished to see Spire attending to the books and stacks, and she wished to see Penn in the forest alight with possibility, and she wished to see Merith's arch checkmate glare and Lick's patient adoration, and she wished to see everyone and everything she'd ever loved, even if fleetingly, including before itself, one last time. Maybe that burden would be too great to bear even greater than the loneliness she felt now. The monster lifted her up toward the night ocean. Mag growled and worked up foaming saliva, smeared it onto her palsying paws, hoping the viruses and poisons she'd ingested were crouched inside her, eager for release. She tumbled off the monster's paw and dropped into its mouth. 
Mag bit and scratched its hot sandpaper tongue and slicked gum line. She barked and whined and was very afraid that it would hurt terribly when On closed its mouth. And it did hurt, until it didn't. Eight. Merith breathed heavily, and her heart galloped. She blinked and shuddered, staring the dust clods tickling her nose and whiskers. She was aware enough to know there had been a break in the chain, of something happening, of something supposed to have happened. Where was her sister? Had she missed her? Why had her sister stopped speaking to her? Had she done something wrong to make her angry, to frighten her away? Maybe her sister had been here moments ago, had backed out of the room, had closed the door softly, a final latch clicked and then her footfalls, hesitant to leave, to tread the dangerous path away. Marith should warn her the path away was always dangerous. And Marith had listened, holding on, even after the footfalls could no longer cross the expanding distance. A fox held up her paws, approached Marith slowly, spoke in a low, soothing voice that wasn't soothing. It was terrifying. The dagger in Mara's paw meant something. The dagger in her paw meant she had done this before. There was creeping horror in the thought, as well as longing. She said, please, go away. Leave me alone, whoever you are. I want my sister. The fox said her name, an awful syllable Mara chose not to remember. The urge to flee was sudden and all-consuming. Her dangling legs flippered up and down, battering the mattress and box spring. Merith could, if she so desired, thrust the blade forward, but do it slowly, so the advancing fox could choose retreat. That would be fair. Or she could wait, like a loaded trap, wait for the fox to come closer, Swing her arm, swing the blade. A mighty arc, blurring image and sound. The fox jab stepped, reached, choked Merit's right arm at the wrist, pried at the dagger's hilt, speaking all the while, using pleas as her weapon. Merit watched the struggle as though from a remove. And it was a struggle. The fox grunted, cried out for help. Merith held the dagger tightly, clawed and scratched the fox, and she used her teeth to conjure blood from beneath the fox's orange fur. Nothing was real until there was blood. Despite the injuries, the damnable fox wouldn't let go. Then the door to her room exploded open. Merith laughed. She would no longer be alone. This was her sister, finally, come to save the day. After they'd saved the day together, they would burn it down to the bones. Two large animals charged into the room, to the bed. They wrapped themselves around Merit's flailing limbs. They were strong, too strong. Pulled her down, weighed her down, 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 sinking her into the mattress. Then a pinch and a needle sting in her shoulder. Merith could have kept fighting. She too was strong enough, and she had the dagger. She was still the trap. Yet she surrendered, because another promise had been broken. Merith's speech slurred as she asked if they wouldn't mind to hold the fox still so that she could show them how to make proper use of the dagger. Nine. This is how the story goes. The next morning, the sun rose over the flatlands. From the horizon line, there approached a great cat as large as on. Tawny brown and yellow gold fur, white in the chest. Broad muscular shoulders framed a thick skull and wide snout. Golden eyes hovered at the peak of symmetry above the triangular nose and patient mouth. The eyes did not judge, nor did they proclaim. They commanded compliance. 
Fawn was afraid, but it followed the great cat as it turned, swishing its tail. The grass under the great cat's paws wavered gently, as though enthralled to a light breeze. Fawn stumbled, plodded, gouging troughs, ruts, directionless paths with its leaden, numbed feet. Fawn's chest was tight. Breathing was a struggle. Everything was struggle. It needed to rest, to sleep. If only there were another forest, the next forest in which it could hide from open spaces. Fawn hoped the cat was pointed that way, but it knew better. Time passed, as it must. The sun was high, but cold crept deeper into Awn's bones. Adrift in the flatland, Awn fell, collapsed onto its stomach. If there was knowledge as to what and why this was happening, it was secondary to the fear that had always been inside, waiting, wanting, buried under days and dreams. Deeper still, a trickle of groundwater under thick layers of strata. Impossible memories from before, from what once was linked to an equally impossible emotion akin to relief. On twisted a side of its face out of the soil, stole another breath, and maybe a second. It had turned its head toward the right or wrong side, depending on your point of view. On did not see the great cat pounce, claws extended, jaws opened, canines long, sharp, and clean. 10. Marith awoke to the sound of her own voice, but not exactly her voice. Same timbre and intonation with the subtle oral imprint of another mind. A voice she hadn't heard in a very long time. Marith. The name wasn't a question, nor a mere statement of fact. Her name was spoken like a comma. Yeah, what? She couldn't hide her love, grief, and desperation with anger and annoyance. Did you forget? No. You forgot me. Marith lifted her head. That was all she could lift. Leather straps wrapped her wrists and ankles. I chose you. Did you now? Can't say I feel very chosen. A lion's head floated in the middle of her dark room, glowed in moonlight. Marith thought the moon must have been in the room with them, too. Marith continued talking to keep from screaming. You forgot me until the end, is that it? I'm an afterthought, like everyone else, aren't I? I, I could have done so much more. The lion's face did not change expression. Her eyes were golden and older than stone. She said, I choose you. The lion opened its mouth, teeth stretched to fill the entropic space. Mara thrashed against her restraints, shouted, no, 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 no and closed her eyes. The lion lifted Marith from her bed by the scruff, like a mother carrying a kitten. When Marith next opened her eyes, she stood in a clearing, and in the dark, she couldn't tell if it was a blasted land. She asked the lion, Will I get my mask back? And my other things? I miss them. No. You won't need them. They faced each other, unblinking, silent, until Marith understood. She said, well, wait a second, what's the point? Bivora is poisoning and tearing itself apart at the fucking seams. It has always been tearing itself apart, but now, fuck, is full on dying. Really dying, if not dead already. Will it even last another 30 years? I doubt it. Never mind 60 and 90 and on and on. Oh, there will be an end, and soon. But then they'll begin again. You'll be needed. Why? Again, what's the fucking point? The lion did not answer. Mara tried to goad the lion into giving one. You don't even know, do you? 
But sure, I'll be there. Yes, you will. How long will I have to wait? How long will that take? Again, the lion did not respond. While waiting impatiently for an answer that would never come, Lareth paced and muttered and flexed her claws, working out her next move, and she did not notice the physical transformation had already begun. And as some time during that eternal evening, Lareth stretched, swelled, crossed over, and ceased being who she had been, and became something else that someone else had already named. This story is original to this collection. Story Notes Ice Cold Lemonade 25 Cents Redacted Haunted House Tour 1 Per Person I don't recall selling sidewalk lemonade as a wee Paul, but my daughter did. Well, she was never a wee Paul, but you get the idea. This story notes section is off to a smashing start. The following is likely an exaggerated memory, but there was one summer it seemed like Emma was at the end of our driveway at least once a week, flanked by assorted friends and neighborhood hangers-on, hawking lemonade and other aid drinks. Not wanting to squash her entrepreneurial spirit, nor make her afraid of the weirdo public, we let her sell roadside beverages. What an odd kid tradition thing that is to want to do. Along with my paranoid fears of the weirdo public, I imagined scenarios in which she sold other things, strange things, like marshmallow peeps. I hate peeps. Or what if she offered to take people into our house and give tours as though it was haunted? The haunted house tour meets lemonade stand idea barnacled in my inner brain for a bit until Ellen Datlow asked me to write a ghost story for her epic 800-page ghost story anthology, Echoes. I fleshed out the story by making myself the main character, partially inspired by one of my favorite writers and people, Jeffrey Ford, who in recent years has penned a handful of tales in which he's essentially the main character, See his collections, A Natural History of Hell, and Big Dark Hole, and other stories. I also borrowed Emma's nightmare ghost creature for the story. Her illustration, drawn when she was 12, graces these pages. For a story about ghosts, real or imagined, personal or borrowed or self-inflicted, I thought the inclusion was apt. For the record, Mrs. Boutin, I'm still salty about that C-plus on my Ronnie Reagan project. Meantime For a limited hardcover edition run of my now-out-of-print 2010 collection, In the Meantime, I wrote this odd little story for the cover. As in, the story was printed slash presented in its entirety on the cover, I started with an image of an old man chalk lining his way home or around town. Definitely a trust and follow your subconscious kind of story, which will be a recurring theme of these story notes, and follow until those chalk lines go missing. I know you're there. This was a pandemic story, which is probably obvious. I wanted it to be about the pandemic without it being about the pandemic. How'd I do? Don't answer that. Also, it's a ghost story about grief. Aren't all ghost stories about grief? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I'm being noncommittal in what I say about this story, partly because it makes me terribly sad in an almost superstitious way, which also, oddly, made me want to write it. After surviving what we've survived in recent years, we're all dealing with a communal grief as well as personal grief. Grief changes you as an individual and as a society. Is that change for the better? Fuck if I know. But you can't fight change. Change is constant, and so is grief. Grief is the ghost of who we were and who we loved. The Postal Zone, The Possession Edition My younger brother Dan is a big horror fan. He has been his whole life. When we were kids, despite his being five years younger than me, he watched the goriest 80s movies that I was too chicken to watch. 
Not that it's a gore fest, but when Poltergeist ran on a near constant loop on HBO and the face tearing apart scene was about to come on, I would make a show of leading Dan out of the TV room like the responsible older brother I was, announcing that he was too young to see such an icky part and it would give him nightmares. The truth was, I wanted to leave the room, but couldn't admit it, so I used the younger brother cover. Won't somebody think of the children? Fast forward to our 20s, and Dan had a subscription to Fangoria magazine. It was almost like I had a subscription because I'd read them when I went over to his place. Thanks, Dan. With the recent reboot, relaunch of the magazine, editor and good egg Meredith Borders asked if I would write a short story for the pages of Fangoria. I said yes without hesitating, despite not knowing what I would write. Shortly after responding to Meredith's email, I took my dog Holly for a walk. By the time I made it home, I knew I wanted to bring back my fictional Fangoria employee, Karen Brissett, the blogger from my novel A Head Full of Ghosts, and have her answering letters within Fango's famous Postal Zone section. So meta, right? All the meta, meta in your face. Anyway, I hope it was fun visiting with Karen again. And hello, real Karen. I hope you enjoyed this story too. Red Eyes I wonder if you are reading a story's note after completing the story or if you're saving all the story notes until after the collection. I'm not judging either way. Regardless, and if it wasn't obvious already, I love giant monsters. This is the first of four stories in this collection featuring giant beasties. This was also another story featuring the sisters, Marjorie and Mary, from my novel A Head Full of Ghosts. If you haven't read that novel, don't worry, no spoilers here, and reading that novel wasn't necessary for this flash fiction piece. But go on, read that novel if you'd like. I won't stop you. Er, the above doesn't say much about red eyes, does it? It struck me as a story an older sibling would tell the younger one. I think Marjorie is admitting she loves and admires her younger sister, Mary, but is afraid of her, too. The Blog at the End of the World I wrote this story in 2008, and while it centered on one of my fears, pandemics, the story was more about online existence and the proliferation of misinformation. Sorry for the rhyme. The 2008 me never dreamed we'd be in the post-truth hellscape in which we find ourselves now, but I was fascinated by information how it was and would come to be consumed and verified. Themes and concerns I return to in my later novels, including the novel that borrowed a big chunk of this story's title. In the pre-social media days of the internet, I spent the bulk of my online time on horror message boards and on the LiveJournal blogosphere. LiveJournal was the evolutionary or devolutionary web step before social media, You'd have a feed of other LiveJournal users you'd follow, and you could comment on their blog posts. I spent a fair amount of time blogging and reading blogs while learning to be a writer. I'm still learning, of course. I got into my fair share of useless online arguments in which everyone was immovably correct. So why not write a story in which we argued about the end of the world as it was happening? As far as the pandemic aspect of the tale goes, it's more than a bit strange for me to revisit this story now, particularly the bit about masks, as its world feels like an oddly out-of-time, out-of-place dream I once had. I'm still inordinately proud of the gambling bot comment in the story. Them, a pitch. I held on to the idea for this short giant ant story, and yeah, Them and Phase 4 are two of my favorite films. To wit, I wrote an essay about Phase 4 for the book Lost Transmissions, thinking that maybe it could be a short comic, one without any dialogue. But I didn't and don't know anything about writing comic scripts. Gabino Iglesias happened to be guest editing the Southwest Review's October 2020 horror issue, and he asked me for a story. I couldn't say no. 
I took a small break from working on the early chapters of the Pallbearers Club, and I wrote this story in a few feverish sittings. I don't want to bore you, explain, or fail to explain why I wrote it with the comic pitch frame, but in the terrifying and rage-inducing June of 2020, the approach felt appropriate. House of Windows I spent the first 15 years of this century almost exclusively writing short stories and publishing with small, independent presses, the blip of The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland in 2009 to 2010 notwithstanding, given how little large publisher X put behind the latter of the two novels, it's really notwithstanding. Somewhere within those 15 years, I found my voice as a writer. I was also fortunate to meet incredible writers and make lifelong friends along the way. Two of those friends are tied up in this story. But before I get to them, the sad state of my bookshelves and lack of organization. I'm embarrassed to admit, as of the writing of this note, I can't find the physical copy of the zine in which this story first appeared. I know it's somewhere in the house, which only narrows things down a little. I have a tall but thin bookshelf that's dedicated to my books and the books of my closest friends. Yes, I have a partially obnoxious friends shelf. That bookshelf now overflows. Books and zines hidden behind other books and zines. I need more bookshelves. And I need to clean up and find a better organizational system. I think a dog walker commented on that once. Anyway, the magazine in which this story appeared was edited by my dear friend Laird Barron. Stop reading this and go read his books if you haven't. I named the story after another dear friend's novel, John Langan's House of Windows, even though my breezy story has nothing in common with John's brooding, weighty, Peter Straub-esque ghost story. My house began with a trip into New York City and the New York Public Library to meet my cousin Jennifer. My memory here is vague, but at the time of this visit in 2011-ish, there was a small building next to the library that I didn't recognize or remember being there during my prior visits. The building looked so off, despite me knowing it was me who was and always is off. A side note to this story note. I still owe John a tuckerization, fictionalization. In Ellen Datlow's Final Cuts anthology, John has a novella called Altered Beast, Altered Me, in which he and I are the main characters, and the name he gives my character is Fighting Words. He so nails my voice in the story, it's impressive and cringe-inducing for me. For now, borrowing his title is all I can offer. I'll get him eventually. I'll get him good. Also, Laird put me in his story near dark, so I owe them both a fictional comeuppance. The Last Conversation Yet another story I wrote upon an anthology invite. This time, Blake Crouch was the editor. There were six of us, and we were to write a science fiction story on the broad theme of discovery. I'm self-aware enough to know that I'm somewhat, strike that, I'm obsessed with self-discovery as it relates to memory and identity and the effect of environmental exterior forces. The mystery of the self. So that's where I went with the theme and story. I used second-person point of view and tried to write it in a way that the reader might more easily imagine themselves as the narrator. The opening occurred to me while walking in Borderland State Park. It struck me as a Brian Evanson-esque opening. Having previously tried and failed, see story note for The Dead Thing, at writing a story inspired by Brian's work, this was another kick at the Evanson can. He likes to be kicked when in can form. Big thanks to Blake and to editor Jason Heller, both of whom helped to mold this story into its weird shape. Mostly Size I wrote this story as a part of a charity ebook anthology in the UK to help raise money for Macmillan cancer support. The writers had a four-hour window to write a draft of a story. 
We were allowed to spend some time editing after that time period, but the bulk slash bones of the story had to be written in that one sitting. If I were to psychoanalyze the story, I'd say the kid is me and the monster is the horror genre. Or maybe as an educator, I fear being the monster to the student who needs help slash support. But also, I remain genuinely curious how a giant monster might sharpen a pencil. The Large Man Another strange story written after my two crime novels, but before A Head Full of Ghosts was published, a period in which I was licking my wounds from the butt-kicking I'd received with my first go-round with a Big Five publisher. During that four-year period, I didn't write as much, partly because I was upset and bitter at how things went down with the Mark Genovich novels. At times, I wallowed in self-pity and, worse, jealousy at other writers' successes, Indulging too much in those very natural feelings slash emotions are mind and page killers. It's okay to feel that way, but it's not okay to let it take over your writing or mental life. I had to find a way to acknowledge those emotions, but also to dismiss them. Easier said than done, of course. I don't think it's a coincidence that once I learned how to move on from failure, real or perceived, doesn't matter, the idea for A Head Full of Ghosts fell into my lap. The stories I did write during the bitter period, let's call it, were often me trying on other hats, including co-writing a now out-of-print YA novel with Stephen Graham Jones and or letting my imagination run amok. This story falls under both categories, so let's call it a hat amuck story. Mr. C may or may not be named after another friend and a genius writer, Michael Sisko, and I thank him for letting me borrow his large hat. Big thanks also to editors Maurice Broadus and Jerry Gordon for inviting me to write a story and including it in Streets of Shadows, an anthology of supernatural noir. The Dead Thing I'm not going to write about from where this story, as presented here, came from. Sorry. Instead, I'll tell you about the failed first attempt at a story with this title. I often have nightmares, but I rarely, if ever, use them or write about them, although I did use a recurring floating nightmare in my novel The Pallbearers Club. I usually can't recount my dreams in detail, However, my wife, Lisa, remembers her dreams vividly and often describes them to me. One morning, she told me her dream about a shoebox with a dead thing in it and how it would be left around the house almost innocuously, but it was there, always there. Man, it was creepy. Magpie writer that I am, I thought, oh, I have to use that. My first go at it was a failed attempt to write a Brian Evanson-esque story. Like I've said in a previous note, I like trying on other writerly hats. I wrote a story about the box being purchased at a yard sale. I can't remember if that was a bit from Lisa's dream. And then the story shifted to a kid building a weird diorama in his basement. And yeah, that story is nothing like the one included in this book. That other story is weirder, but makes no sense and had too much stuffed into it. I knew this when I was finished. I sent it to Stephen Graham Jones, asking if he'd give it a read. He asked if I wanted him to read it breezily or read with the same critical eye he focused on the work from his graduate students. Wincing, anticipating the blows to come, I asked for the critical eye. Stephen sent me a long, thoughtful email that said, Essentially, everything other than the opening paragraph sucked. He was right. I canned the story, but not the dead thing in the shoebox. I came back to it and found a way into the story by focusing more on who the story was about and less about the weirdness. Now it feels like one of my stories, I think. If I'm allowed to say so, I'm quite pleased with the result, as dour as it all is. Howard Sturgis and the letters and the van and what he found when he went back to his house. 
Christopher Golden and Tim Lebon asked me to write a story for their 10-word tragedies anthology, which was inspired by the musician Frank Turner. I'm not familiar with Frank's work, sorry Frank, but the anthology sounded like fun. After agreeing, they sent me some postcards, and I had to write a story inspired by one of them. The one I chose had a blue van on it, and some strange, out-of-context writing on the back of it. The rest of the story was a go-where-it-takes-you exercise. I got to work some math into the story, and I was happy to have the longest title in the anthology. Sometimes I'm a competitive bastard. The Party Ellen Datlow asked me to write a story for the Shirley Jackson-inspired When Things Get Dark anthology. I jumped at the chance to do so. What a great saying. Yes, imagine me jumping. Not too high, though. I have cranky knees now, thanks to my connective tissue issues that run on one side of the family. In fact, just last night, my sister Erin... Cousin Michael, daughter Emma, and I were standing in the kitchen, moving one another's kneecaps around. Don't all families do that when they get together? I'd had the general idea of an end-of-the-world eve party set in a house as described in the story. That house was one Lisa and I toured while house hunting in the spring of 2012. It was a modest brown ranch set back a bit from the main road, backyard abutting a forest, and it had a beautiful, updated kitchen and open space. The rest of the place was run down, hadn't been touched since the 70s. A cool house to write about, but we, mostly Lisa, didn't want to live there. So I had a party and a house, but I didn't have any characters or a story arc to go with it. With the Jackson Anthology invite, I immediately returned to that vague idea and spliced it together with Jackson's short story, The Intoxicated, one of my favorites, and her brilliant novel, The Sundial, plus my fear of accidentally stumbling upon a weird tomato-slash-strawberry thingy in a friend's house. Sure, that's an oddly specific fear, but what would you do if you found something like that in their bedroom? Never thought about that before, did you? You're welcome. The Beast You Are That was a thing, wasn't it? Named after an excellent record by Big Business. I was an impressionable youth at a time when anthropomorphic or talking animals starred in serious slash disturbing movies that were still kind of marketed for children because cartoon. I'm talking specifically of Watership Down, 1978, and The Secret of Nim, 1982. My father took me to Beverly's venerable Cabot Cinema for a double feature of Watership Down and the animated The Lord of the Rings, 1978. We didn't see those movies when they first hit the screens, but it, this was probably only two or three years after they were released. I was young, nine or ten, I went excited to see Lord of the Rings because I'd already seen the animated The Hobbit and we had the audio record of the film in the house too. My father was a card-carrying Tolkien fan, or button-carrying anyway. He had a button that read, Frodo lives. He also liked to smoke a pipe like Tolkien. I wouldn't find out until decades later what he was really smoking in his pipe. Despite my Tolkien leanings and how much I loved Smaug in The Hobbit, Watership Down stole the show. The realistic and yet trippy animation style, the story, the voice actors, the tonal gravity, all of it blew my little mind and did much to inform my nascent understanding of politics for the decade to come. Yeah, there was rabbit gore and the massacre of the Warren by the farmers and General Wormwort was scary, but the movie surprisingly didn't scar me or give me nightmares. I should apologize to my son Cole here as I showed him Watership Down when he was way too young. He broke down crying when Bigwig had the snare around his neck. Oops. But Bigwig lived. See, it's all okay. That movie and those rabbits took root in my head, and many years before, I'd read the novel. Later, my brother and I watched that movie repeatedly, and we still randomly quote, there's a dog loose in the wood, to each other. 
The secret of Nim was not as dark or violent as Watership Down, but it was close. The scene with Mrs. Brisby going to see the great owl remains tense and electrifying. And Nim played in the heaviest of HBO's heavy rotation in the 80s. All of this is to say I've long had the itch and the want to write an anthropomorphic animal story. Furthering that itch, can an itch further, was Chris Urban's excellent anthropomorphic animal novel, Ragged. This collection allowed me to scratch that, um, furthering itch. The other itch I scratched was naming the dog Mag after Marjorie from A Head Full of Ghosts and naming the cat Merith after Mary slash Meredith from the same book. And the story's author, Karen Bristle, well, you get the idea. As I mentioned previously, I've done a handful of Marjorie slash Mary stories, and I thought it only fair to give Marjorie a shot at being the protagonist in a longer form story. Why free verse? Aside from my adoration for Toby Barlow's novel Sharp Teeth, Packs of Werewolves in Los Angeles, and Beowulf, do check out Maria Devana Headley's recent translation, I really can't explain why, beyond a little voice saying, what the hell? Go ahead, try it. Nothing gets written without that voice. I've learned to trust it. So many of the stories in this book started with that voice. I typically listen because if I don't, I worry the voice will stop advocating for the story ideas. The hey, try this voice was obstinately persistent in this novella's case, even with me telling it, not now, Later, I promise, when I finish this novel, when I think I can convince someone to publish an anthropomorphic animal novella. Wait, now there are two voices. One is me, the other is also me, but that me is the subconscious story advocate voice. Never mind. I let those animals roll around in my inner ether for a few years. I never forgot them, though. Luckily, the story kept insisting on coming back, and usually with more detail. By the time I was ready to commit to writing it, the village, the two main characters, the giant monster, the slasher, and the cult were all there waiting for me. I only had to figure out how it all fit, how to build that monster. All stories are monsters, and how loudly and lovingly they smash through your town, your heart, and your head is up to you, the reader. March 29th, 2022. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of The Beast You Are, Stories by Paul Tremblay. Performed by Johnny Heller, Exy Sands, Ewan Chung, Graham Halstead, Helen Laser, Georgina Marie, Joy Osmansky, Keith Sellen Wright, Kirsten Potter, and Neil Shaw. And presented by William Morrow and Harper Audio. This program was produced by John Marshall Media. Executive producer, Suzanne Franco Mitchell. Text copyright 2023 by Paul Tremblay. Production copyright 2023 by Harper Collins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.